The Godfather by Mario Puzo. Copyright 1969 by Mario Puzo. All rights reserved. Author's dedication for Anthony Clary. Book One. Behind every great fortune, there is a crime. Balzac. Chapter One. Amerigo Bonacera sat in New York Criminal Court Number Three, and waited for justice, vengeance on the men who had so cruelly hurt his daughter, who had tried to dishonor her. The judge, a formidably heavy-featured man, rolled up the sleeves of his black robe as if to physically chastise the two young men standing before the bench. His face was cold with majestic contempt. But there was something false in all this that Amerigo Bonacera sensed, but did not yet understand. The judge said, "You acted like the worst kind of degenerates." Yes, yes, thought Amerigo Bonacera. Animals, animals. The two young men, glossy hair, crew cut, scrubbed, clean cut faces, composed into humble contrition, bowed their heads in submission. The judge went on. You acted like wild beasts in a jungle, and you are fortunate you did not sexually molest that poor girl, or I'd put you behind bars for twenty years. The judge paused. His eyes, beneath impressively thick brows, flickered slyly toward the sallow-faced Amerigo Bonacera, then lowered to a stack of probation reports before him. He frowned and shrugged, as if convinced against his own natural desire. He spoke again. But because of your youth, your clean records, because of your fine families, and because the law, in its majesty, does not seek vengeance, I hereby sentence you to three years' confinement to the penitentiary. Sentence to be suspended. Only forty years of professional mourning kept the overwhelming frustration and hatred from showing on Amerigo Bonacera's face. His beautiful young daughter was still in the hospital with her broken jaw wired together, and now these two animales went free. It had all been a farce. He watched the happy parents cluster around their darling sons. Oh, they were all happy now. They were smiling now. The black bile, sourly bitter, rose in Bonacera's throat, overflowed through tightly clenched teeth. He used his white linen pocket handkerchief and held it against his lips. He was standing, so when the two young men strode freely up the aisle, confident and cool-eyed, smiling, not giving him so much as a glance, he let them pass without saying a word, pressing the fresh linen against his mouth. The parents of the animales were coming by now, two men and two women his age, but more American in their dress. They glanced at him, shamefaced, yet in their eyes was an odd, triumphant defiance. Out of control, Bonacera leaned forward toward the aisle. The linen at his eyes now. You will weep as I have wept. I will make you weep as your children make me weep. The defense attorneys, bringing up the rear, swept their clients forward in a tight little band, enveloping the two young men who had started back down the aisle as if to protect their parents. A huge bailiff moved quickly to block the row in which Bonacera stood, but it was not necessary. All his years in America, Amerigo Bonacera had trusted in law and order, and he had prospered thereby. Now, though his brain smoked with hatred, the wild visions of buying a gun and killing the two young men jangled the very bones of his skull. Bonacera turned to his still uncomprehending wife and explained to her, "They have made the fools of us." He paused and then made his decision, no longer fearing the cost. For justice. We must go on our knees to Don Corleone. In a garishly decorated Los Angeles hotel suite, Johnny Fontaine was as jealously drunk as any ordinary husband. Sprawled on a red couch, he drank straight from the bottle of scotch in his hand, then washed the taste away by dunking his mouth in a crystal bucket of ice cubes and water. It was four in the morning, and he was spinning drunken fantasies of murdering his trampy wife when she got home. If she ever did come home, it was too late to call his first wife and ask about the kids, and he felt funny about calling any of his friends now that his career was plunging downhill. There had been a time when they would have been delighted, flattered by his calling them at four in the morning, but now he bored them. He could even smile a little to himself as he thought that on the way up 
Johnny Fontaine's troubles had fascinated some of the greatest female stars in America. Gulping at his bottle of scotch, he heard finally his wife's key in the door, but he kept drinking until she walked into the room and stood before him. She was to him so very beautiful, the angelic face, soulful, violet eyes, the delicately fragile but perfectly formed body. On the screen, her beauty was magnified, spiritualized. A hundred million men all over the world were in love with the face of Margot Ashton and paid to see it on the screen. Johnny Fontaine asked, Where the hell were you? Out fucking. She had misjudged his drunkenness. He sprang over the cocktail table and grabbed her by the throat. But close up to that magical face, the lovely violet eyes, he lost his anger and became helpless again. She made the mistake of smiling mockingly, saw his fist draw back. She screamed, Johnny, not in the face. I'm making a picture. She was laughing. He punched her in the stomach and she fell to the floor. He fell on top of her. He could smell her fragrant breath as she gasped for air. He punched her on the arms and on the thigh muscles of her silky, tanned legs. He beat her as he had beaten snotty smaller kids long ago when he'd been a tough teenager in New York's Hell's Kitchen. A painful punishment that would leave no lasting disfigurement of loosened teeth or broken nose. But he was not hitting her hard enough. He couldn't, and she was giggling at him. Spread-eagled on the floor, her brocaded gown hitched up above her thighs, she taunted him between giggles. Come on, stick it in. Stick it in, Johnny. That's what you really want. Johnny Fontaine got up. He hated the woman on the floor, but her beauty was a magic shield. Margot rolled away, and in a dancer's spring was on her feet facing him. She went into a childish mocking dance and chanted, Johnny never hurt me. Johnny never hurt me. Then, almost sadly, with grave beauty, she said, You poor, silly bastard, giving me cramps like a kid. Ah, Johnny, you always will be a dumb, romantic guinea. You even make love like a kid. You still think screwing is really like those dopey songs you used to sing. She shook her head. Poor Johnny. Goodbye, Johnny. She walked into the bedroom, and he heard her turn the key in the lock. Johnny sat on the floor with his face in his hands. The sick, humiliating despair overwhelmed him. And then the gutter toughness that had helped him survive the jungle of Hollywood made him pick up the phone and call for a car to take him to the airport. There was one person who could save him. He would go back to New York. He would go back to the one man with the power, the wisdom he needed, and the love he still trusted. His godfather, Corleone. The baker, Nazarini, pudgy and crusty as his great Italian loaves, still dusty with flour, scowled at his wife, his nubile daughter, Catherine, and his baker's helper, Enzo. Enzo had changed into his prisoner of war uniform with its green lettered armband, and was terrified that the scene would make him late reporting back to Governor's Island. One of the many thousands of Italian army prisoners paroled daily to work in the American economy, he lived in constant fear of that parole being revoked. And so, the little comedy being played now was, for him, a serious business. Nazarini asked fiercely, Have you dishonored my family? Have you given my daughter a little package to remember you by? Now that the war is over, and you know America will kick your ass back to your village full of shit in Sicily. Enzo, a very short, strongly built boy, put his hand over his heart and said almost in tears, yet cleverly, Padrone, I swear by the Holy Virgin, I have never taken advantage of your kindness. I love your daughter with all respect. I ask for her hand with all respect. I know I have no right, but if they send me back to Italy, I can never come back to America. I will never be able to marry Catherine. Nazarini's wife, Filomena, spoke to the point. She said to her pudgy husband, Stop all this foolishness. You know what you must do. Keep Enzo here. Send him to hide with our cousins in Long Island. Catherine was weeping. She was already plump, homely, and sprouting a faint mustache. She would never get a husband as handsome as Enzo, never find another man who touched her body in secret places with such respectful love. She screamed at her father. I'll go and live in Italy. I'll run away if you don't keep Enzo here. Nazarini glanced at her shrewdly. 
She was a hot number, this daughter of his. He had seen her brush her swelling buttocks against Enzo's front when the baker's helper squeezed behind her to fill the counter baskets with hot loaves from the oven. The young rascal's hot loaf would be in her oven, Nazarini thought lewdly, if proper steps were not taken. Enzo must be kept in America and be made an American citizen. And there was only one man who could arrange such an affair. The godfather, Don Corleone. All of these people and many others received engraved invitations to the wedding of Miss Constanzia Corleone to be celebrated on the last Saturday in August, 1945. The father of the bride, Don Vito Corleone, never forgot his old friends and neighbors, though he himself now lived in a huge house on Long Island. The reception would be held in that house, and the festivities would go on all day. There was no doubt it would be a momentous occasion. The war with the Japanese had just ended, so there would not be any nagging fear for their sons fighting in the army to cloud these festivities. A wedding was just what people needed to show their joy. And so, on that Saturday morning, the friends of Don Corleone streamed out of New York City to do him honor. They bore cream-colored envelopes stuffed with cash as bridal gifts, no checks. Inside each envelope, a card established the identity of the giver and the measure of his respect for the Godfather, a respect truly earned. Don Vito Corleone was a man to whom everybody came for help, and never were they disappointed. He made no empty promises nor the craven excuse that his hands were tied by more powerful forces in the world than himself. It was not necessary that he be your friend. It was not even important that you had no means with which to repay him. Only one thing was required, that you, you yourself, proclaim your friendship. And then, no matter how poor or powerless the supplicant, Don Corleone would take that man's troubles to his heart and he would let nothing stand in the way to a solution of that man's woe. His reward? Friendship, the respectful title of Don, and sometimes the more affectionate salutation of Godfather. And perhaps, to show respect only, never for profit, some humble gift, a gallon of homemade wine or a basket of peppered tarales, specially baked to grace his Christmas table. It was understood it was mere good manners to proclaim that you were in his debt and that he had the right to call upon you at any time to redeem your debt by some small service. Now, on this great day, his daughter's wedding day, Don Vito Corleone stood in the doorway of his Long Beach home to greet his guests, all of them known, all of them trusted. Many of them owed their good fortune in life to the Don, and on this intimate occasion felt free to call him godfather to his face. Even the people performing festal services were his friends. The bartender was an old comrade, whose gift was all the wedding liquors and his own expert skills. The waiters were the friends of Don Corleone's sons. The food on the garden picnic tables had been cooked by the Don's wife and her friends, and the gaily festooned one-acre garden itself had been decorated by the young girl chums of the bride. Don Corleone received everyone, rich and poor, powerful and humble, with an equal show of love. He slighted no one. That was his character. And the guests so exclaimed at how well he looked in his tux that an inexperienced observer might easily have thought that Don himself was the lucky groom. Standing at the door with him were two of his three sons. The eldest, baptized Santino, but called Sonny by everyone except his father, was looked at askance by the older Italian men, with admiration by the younger. Sonny Corleone was tall for a first-generation American of Italian parentage, almost six feet, and his crop of bushy, curly hair made him look even taller. His face was that of a gross cupid, the features even, but the bow-shaped lips thickly sensual, the dimpled, cleft chin in some curious way obscene. He was built as powerfully as a bull, and it was common knowledge that he was so generously endowed by nature that his martyred wife feared the marriage bed as unbelievers once feared the rack. It was whispered that when as a youth he had visited houses of ill fame, even the most hardened and fearless Poutin, after an awed inspection of his massive organ, demanded double price. Here at the wedding feast, some young matrons, wide-hipped, wide-mouthed, measured Sonny Corleone with coolly confident eyes. But on this particular day, they were wasting their time. 
Sonny Corleone, despite the presence of his wife and three small children, had plans for his sister's maid of honor, Lucy Mancini. This young girl, fully aware, sat at a garden table in her pink formal gown, a tiara of flowers in her glossy black hair. She had flirted with Sonny in the past week of rehearsals and squeezed his hand that morning at the altar. A maiden could do no more. She did not care that he would never be the great man his father had proved to be. Sonny Corleone had strength. He had courage. He was generous, and his heart was admitted to be as big as his organ. Yet he did not have his father's humility, but instead a quick, hot temper that led him into errors of judgment. Though he was a great help in his father's business, there were many who doubted that he would become the heir to it. The second son, Federico, called Fred or Fredo, was a child every Italian prayed to the saints for. Dutiful, loyal, always at the service of his father, living with his parents at age thirty. He was short and burly, not handsome, but with the same cupid head of the family, the curly helmet of hair over the round face and sensual bow-shaped lips. Only in Fred, these lips were not sensual, but granite-like, inclined to dourness, he was still a crutch to his father, never disputed him, never embarrassed him by scandalous behavior with women. Despite all these virtues, he did not have that personal magnetism, that animal force so necessary for a leader of men, and he too was not expected to inherit the family business. The third son, Michael Corleone, did not stand with his father and his two brothers, but sat at a table in the most secluded corner of the garden. But even there, he could not escape the attentions of the family friends. Michael Corleone was the youngest son of the Don and the only child who had refused the great man's direction. He did not have the heavy, cupid-shaped face of the other children, and his jet-black hair was straight rather than curly. His skin was a clear olive brown that would have been called beautiful in a girl. He was handsome in a delicate way. Indeed, there had been a time when the Don had worried about his youngest son's masculinity, a worry that was put to rest when Michael Corleone became seventeen years old. Now, this youngest son sat at a table in the extreme corner of the garden to proclaim his chosen alienation from father and family. Beside him sat the American girl everyone had heard about, but whom no one had seen until this day. He had, of course, shown the proper respect and introduced her to everyone at the wedding, including his family. They were not impressed with her. She was too thin. She was too fair. Her face was too sharply intelligent for a woman. Her manner too free for a maiden. Her name, too, was outlandish to their ears. She called herself Kay Adams. If she had told them that her family had settled in America two hundred years ago and her name was a common one, they would have shrugged. Every guest noticed that the Don paid no particular attention to his third son. Michael had been his favorite before the war, and obviously the chosen heir to run the family business when the proper moment came. He had all the quiet force and intelligence of his great father, the born instinct to act in such a way that men had no recourse but to respect him. But when World War II broke out, Michael Corleone volunteered for the Marine Corps. He defied his father's express command when he did so. Don Corleone had no desire, no intention of letting his youngest son be killed in the service of a power foreign to himself. Doctors had been bribed, secret arrangements had been made, a great deal of money had been spent to take the proper precautions. But Michael was twenty-one years of age, and nothing could be done against his own willfulness. He enlisted and fought over the Pacific Ocean. He became a captain and won medals. In 1944, his picture was printed in Life magazine with a photo layout of his deeds. A friend had shown Don Corleone the magazine. His family did not dare, and the Don had grunted disdainfully and said, he performs those miracles for strangers. When Michael Corleone was discharged early in 1945 to recover from a disabling wound, he had no idea that his father had arranged his release. He stayed home for a few weeks, then, without consulting anyone, entered Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and so he left his father's house. To return for the wedding of his sister and to show his own future wife to them, the washed-out rag of an American girl. Michael Corleone was amusing Kay Adams by telling her little stories about some of the more colorful wedding guests. He was, in turn, amused by her finding these people exotic, and, as always, charmed by her intense interest in anything new and foreign to her experience. Finally, her attention was caught by a small group of men gathered around a wooden barrel of homemade wine. The men were Amerigo Bonacera, 
Nazarene the baker, Anthony Capola, and Luca Brasi. With her usual alert intelligence, she remarked on the fact that these four men did not seem particularly happy. Michael smiled. No, they're not. They're waiting to see my father in private. They have favors to ask. And indeed, it was easy to see that all four men constantly followed the Don with their eyes. As Don Corleone stood greeting guests, a black Chevrolet sedan came to a stop on the far side of the paved mall. Two men in the front seat pulled notebooks from their jackets, and with no attempt at concealment, jotted down license numbers of the other cars parked around the mall. Sonny turned to his father. Those guys over there must be cops. Don Corleone shrugged. I don't know in the street. They can do what they please. Sonny's heavy, cupid face grew red with anger. Those lousy bastards, they don't respect anything. He left the steps of the house and walked across the mall to where the black sedan was parked. He thrust his face angrily close to the face of the driver, who did not flinch, but flapped open his wallet to show a green identification card. Sonny stepped back without saying a word. He spat so that the spittle hit the back door of the sedan and walked away. He was hoping the driver would get out of the sedan and come after him, on the mall, but nothing happened. When he reached the steps, he said to his father, Those guys are FBI men. They're taking down all the license numbers. Snotty bastards. Don Corleone knew who they were. His closest and most intimate friends had been advised to attend the wedding in automobiles not their own. And though he disapproved of his son's foolish display of anger, the tantrum served a purpose. It would convince the interlopers that their presence was unexpected and unprepared for. So Don Corleone himself was not angry. He had long ago learned that society imposes insults that must be borne, comforted by the knowledge that in this world there comes a time when the most humble of men, if he keeps his eyes open, can take his revenge on the most powerful. It was this knowledge that prevented the Don from losing the humility all his friends admired in him. But now in the garden behind the house, a four-piece band began to play. All the guests had arrived. Don Corleone put the intruders out of his mind and led his two sons to the wedding feast. There were now hundreds of guests in the huge garden, some dancing on the wooden platform bedecked with flowers, others sitting at long tables piled high with spicy food and gallon jugs of black homemade wine. The bride, Connie Corleone, sat in splendor at a special raised table with her groom, the maid of honor, bridesmaids, and ushers. It was a rustic setting in the old Italian style. Not to the bride's taste, but Connie had consented to a guinea wedding to please her father because she had so displeasured him in her choice of a husband. The groom, Carlo Rizzi, was a half-breed, born of a Sicilian father and the North Italian mother from whom he had inherited his blonde hair and blue eyes. His parents lived in Nevada, and Carlo had left the state because of a little trouble with the law. In New York he met Sonny Corleone, and so met the sister. Don Corleone, of course, sent trusted friends to Nevada, and they reported that Carlo's police trouble was a youthful indiscretion with a gun, not serious, that could easily be wiped off the books to leave the youth with a clean record. They also came back with detailed information on legal gambling in Nevada, which greatly interested the Don, and which he had been pondering ever since. It was part of the Don's greatness that he profited from everything. Connie Corleone was a not-quite-pretty girl, thin and nervous, and certain to become shrewish later in life. But today, transformed by her white bridal gown and eager virginity, she was so radiant as to be almost beautiful. Beneath the wooden table her hand rested on the muscular thigh of her groom. Her cupid bow mouth pouted to give him an airy kiss. She thought him incredibly handsome. Carlo Rizzi had worked in the open desert air while very young, heavy laborer's work. Now he had tremendous forearms, and his shoulders bulged the jacket of his tux. He basked in the adoring eyes of his bride and filled her glass with wine. He was elaborately courteous to her, as if they were both actors in a play. But his eyes kept flickering toward the huge silk purse the bride wore on her right shoulder, and which was now stuffed full of money envelopes. How much did it hold? Ten thousand? Twenty thousand? Carlo Rizzi smiled. It was only the beginning. He had, after all, married into a royal family. They would have to take care of him. In the crowd of guests, a dapper young man with the sleek head of a ferret was also studying the silk purse. From sheer habit, Pauli Gatto wondered just how he could go about hijacking that fat pocketbook. The idea amused him, but he knew it was idle, innocent dreaming, as small children dream of knocking out tanks with pop guns. He watched his boss... 
fat, middle-aged Peter Clemenza whirling young girls around the wooden dance floor in a rustic and lusty tarantella. Clemenza, immensely tall, immensely huge, danced with such skill and abandon, his hard belly lecherously bumping the breasts of younger, tinier women, that all the guests were applauding him. Older women grabbed his arm to become his next partner. The younger men respectfully cleared off the floor and clapped their hands in time to the mandolin's wild strumming. When Clemenza finally collapsed in a chair, Poligato brought him a glass of icy black wine and wiped the perspiring, jove-like brow with his silk handkerchief. Clemenza was blowing like a whale as he gulped down the wine. But instead of thanking Polly, he said curtly, Never mind being a dance judge. Do your job. Take a walk around the neighborhood and see everything is okay. Polly slid away into the crowd. The band took a refreshment break. A young man named Nino Valenti picked up a discarded mandolin, put his left foot up on a chair, and began to sing a coarse Sicilian love song. Nilo Valenti's face was handsome, though bloated by continual drinking, and he was already a little drunk. He rolled his eyes as his tongue caressed the obscene lyrics. The women shrieked with glee, and the men shouted the last word of each stanza with the singer. Don Corleone, notoriously straight-laced in such matters, though his stout wife was screaming joyfully with the others, disappeared tactfully into the house. Seeing this, Sonny Corleone made his way to the bride's table and sat down beside young Lucy Mancini, the maid of honor. They were safe. His wife was in the kitchen, putting the last touches on the serving of the wedding cake. Sonny whispered a few words in the young girl's ear, and she rose. Sonny waited a few minutes, and then casually followed her, stopping to talk with a guest here and there as he worked his way through the crowd. All eyes followed them. The maid of honor, thoroughly Americanized by three years of college, was a ripe girl who already had a reputation. All through the marriage rehearsal, she had flirted with Sonny Corleone in a teasing, joking way she thought was permitted because he was the best man and her wedding partner. Now, holding her pink gown up off the ground, Lucy Mancini went into the house, smiling with false innocence, ran lightly up the stairs to the bathroom. She stayed there for a few moments. When she came out, Sonny Corleone was on the landing above, beckoning her upward. From behind the closed window of Don Corleone's office, a slightly raised corner room. Thomas Hagen watched the wedding party in the festooned garden. The walls behind him were stacked with law books. Hagen was the Don's lawyer and acting consigliere, or counselor, and as such held the most vital subordinate position in the family business. He and the Don had solved many a knotty problem in this room, and so when he saw the Godfather leave the festivities and enter the house, he knew, wedding or no, there would be a little work this day. The Don would be coming to see him. Then Hagen saw Sonny Corleone whisper in Lucy Mancini's ear and their little comedy as he followed her into the house. Hagen grimaced, debated whether to inform the Don, and decided against it. He went to the desk and picked up a handwritten list of the people who had been granted permission to see Don Corleone privately. When the Don entered the room, Hagen handed him the list. Don Corleone nodded and said, Leave Bonacera to the end. Hagen used the French doors and went directly out into the garden to where the supplicants clustered around the barrel of wine. He pointed to the baker, the pudgy Nazarini. Don Corleone greeted the baker with an embrace. They had played together as children in Italy and had grown up in friendship. Every Easter, freshly baked clotted cheese and wheat germ pies, their crusts yolk gold, big around as truck wheels, arrived at Don Corleone's home. On Christmas, on family birthdays, Rich, creamy pastries proclaimed the Nazarini's respect. And all through the years, lean and fat, Nazarini cheerfully paid his dues to the bakery union organized by the Don in his salad days, never asking for a favor in return, except for the chance to buy black market OPA sugar coupons during the war. Now, the time had come for the baker to claim his rights as a loyal friend, and Don Corleone looked forward with great pleasure to granting his request. He gave the baker a Di Nobili cigar and a glass of yellow strega and put his hand on the man's shoulder to urge him on. That was the mark of the Don's humanity. He knew from bitter experience what courage it took to ask a favor from a fellow man. The baker told the story of his daughter in Enzo, a fine Italian lad from Sicily, captured by the American army, sent to the United States as a prisoner of war, given parole to help our war effort. A pure and honorable love had sprung up between honest Enzo and his sheltered Catherine. But now that the war was ended, the poor lad would be repatriated to Italy, and Nazarini's daughter would surely die of a broken heart. 
Only Godfather Corleone could help this afflicted couple. He was their last hope. The Don walked Nazarini up and down the room, his hand on the baker's shoulder, his head nodding with understanding to keep up the man's courage. When the baker had finished, Don Corleone smiled at him. My dear friend, put all your worries aside. He went on to explain very carefully what must be done. The congressman of the district must be petitioned. The congressman would propose a special bill that would allow Enzo to become a citizen. The bill would surely pass Congress, a privilege all those rascals extended to each other. Don Corleone explained that this would cost money. The going price was now $2,000. He, Don Corleone, would guarantee performance and accept payment. Did his friend agree? The baker nodded his head vigorously. He did not expect such a great favor for nothing. That was understood. A special act of Congress does not come cheap. Nazarini was almost tearful in his thanks. Don Corleone walked him to the door, assuring him that competent people would be sent to the bakery to arrange all details, complete all necessary documents. The baker embraced him before disappearing into the garden. Hagen smiled at the Don. That's a good investment for Nazarini, a son-in-law and a cheap lifetime helper in his bakery, all for $2,000. He paused. Who do I give this job to? Don Corleone frowned in thought. Not to our paisan. I give it to the Jew in the next district. Have the home addresses changed. I think there might be many such cases now the war is over. We should have extra people in Washington that can handle the overflow and not raise the price. Hagen made a note on his pad. Not Congressman Luteco. Try Fisher. The next man Hagen brought in was a very simple case. His name was Anthony Coppola, and he was the son of a man Don Corleone had worked with in the railroad yards in his youth. Coppola needed $500 to open a pizzeria for a deposit on fixtures and a special oven. For reasons not gone into, credit was not available. The Don reached into his pocket and took out a roll of bills. It was not quite enough. He grimaced and said to Tom Hagen, Loan me a hundred dollars. I'll pay you back Monday when I go to the bank. The supplicant protested that four hundred dollars would be ample, but Don Corleone patted his shoulder, saying apologetically, This fancy wedding left me a little short of cash. He took the money Hagen extended to him and gave it to Anthony Coppola with his own roll of pills. Hagen watched with quiet admiration. The Don always taught that when a man was generous, he must show the generosity as personal. How flattering to Anthony Coppola that a man like the Don would borrow to loan him money. Not that Coppola did not know that the Don was a millionaire, but how many millionaires let themselves be put to even a small inconvenience by a poor friend? The Don raised his head inquiringly. He's not on the list, but Luca Brasi wants to see you. He understands it can't be public, but he wants to congratulate you in person. For the first time, the Don seemed displeased. The answer was devious. Is it necessary? Hagen shrugged. You understand him better than I do, but he was very grateful that you invited him to the wedding. He never expected that. I think he wants to show his gratitude. Don Corleone nodded and gestured that Luca Brasi should be brought to him. In the garden, Kay Adams was struck by the violent fury imprinted on the face of Luca Brasi. She asked about him. Michael had brought Kay to the wedding so that she would slowly and perhaps without too much of a shock absorb the truth about his father. But so far, she seemed to regard the Don as a slightly unethical businessman. Michael decided to tell her part of the truth indirectly. He explained that Luca Brasi was one of the most feared men in the Eastern underworld. His great talent, it was said, was that he could do a job of murder all by himself without confederates, which automatically made discovery and conviction by the law almost impossible. Michael grimaced. I don't know whether all that stuff is true. I do know he is a sort of friend to my father. For the first time, Kay began to understand. She asked a little incredulously. You're not hinting that a man like that works for your father. The hell with it, he thought. He said straight out, Nearly 15 years ago, some people wanted to take over my father's oil importing business. They tried to kill him, and nearly did. Luca Brazzi went after them. The story is that he killed six men in two weeks, and that ended the famous olive oil war. He smiled as if it were a joke. Kay shuddered. You mean your father was shot by gangsters? Fifteen years ago. Everything's been peaceful since then. He was afraid he had gone too far. You're trying to scare me. You just don't want me to marry you. She smiled at him and poked his ribs with her elbow. Very clever. Michael smiled back at her. I want you to think about it. Did he really kill six men? That's what the newspapers claimed. Nobody ever proved it. 
But there's another story about him that nobody ever tells. It's supposed to be so terrible that even my father won't talk about it. Tom Hagen knows the story, and he won't tell me. Once I kidded him, I said, when will I be old enough to hear that story about Luca? And Tom said, when you're a hundred. Michael sipped his glass of wine. That must be some story. That must be some Luca. Luca Brasi was indeed a man to frighten the devil in hell himself. Short, squat, massive skulled, his presence set out alarm bells of danger. His face was stamped into a mask of fury. The eyes were brown, but with none of the warmth of that color, more a deadly tan. The mouth was not so much cruel as lifeless, thin, rubbery, and the color of veal. Brasi's reputation for violence was awesome, and his devotion to Don Corleone legendary. He was in himself one of the great blocks that supported the Don's power structure. His kind was a rarity. Luca Brasi did not fear the police, he did not fear society, he did not fear God, he did not fear hell, he did not fear or love his fellow man. But he had elected, he had chosen, to fear and love Don Corleone. Ushered into the presence of the Don, the terrible Brasi held himself stiff with respect. He stuttered over the flowery congratulations he offered, and his formal hope that the first grandchild would be masculine. He then handed the Don an envelope stuffed with cash as a gift for the bridal couple. So that was what he wanted to do. Hagen noticed the change in Don Corleone. The Don received Brasi as a king greets a subject, who had done him an enormous service, never familiar, but with regal respect. With every gesture, with every word, Don Corleone made it clear to Luca Brasi that he was valued. Not for one moment did he show surprise at the wedding gift being presented to him personally. He understood. The money in the envelope was sure to be more than anyone else had given. Brasi had spent many hours deciding on the sum, comparing it to what the other guests might offer. He wanted to be the most generous, to show that he had the most respect, and that was why he had given his envelope to the Don personally, a gaucherie the Don overlooked in his own flowery sentence of thanks. Hagen saw Luca Brasi's face lose its mask of fury, swell with pride and pleasure. Brasi kissed the Don's hand before he went out the door that Hagen held open. Hagen prudently gave Brasi a friendly smile, which the squat man acknowledged with a polite stretching of rubbery, veal-colored lips. When the door closed, Don Corleone gave a small sigh of relief. Brasi was the only man in the world who could make him nervous. The man was like a natural force, not truly subject to control. He had to be handled as gingerly as dynamite. The Don shrugged. Even dynamite could be exploded harmlessly if the need arose. He looked questioningly at Hagen. Is Bonacera the only one left? Hagen nodded. Don Corleone frowned in thought, then said, Before you bring him in, tell Santino to come here. He should learn some things. Out in the garden, Hagen searched anxiously for Sonny Corleone. He told the waiting Bonacera to be patient and went over to Michael Corleone and his girlfriend. Did you see Sonny around? Michael shook his head. Damn, Hagen thought, if Sonny was screwing the maid of honor all this time, there was going to be a mess of trouble. His wife, the young girl's family, it could be a disaster. Anxiously, he hurried to the entrance through which he had seen Sonny disappear almost a half hour ago. Seeing Hagen go into the house, Kay Adams asked Michael Corleone, Who is he? You introduced him as your brother, but his name is different, and he certainly doesn't look Italian. Tom lived with us since he was 12 years old. His parents died, and he was roaming around the streets with his bad eye infection. Sonny brought him home one night, and he just stayed. He didn't have any place to go. He lived with us until he got married. Kay Adams was thrilled. That's really romantic. Your father must be a warm-hearted person. To adopt somebody just like that when he had so many children of his own. Michael didn't bother to point out that immigrant Italians considered four children a small family. Tom wasn't adopted. He just lived with us. Oh. Kay said, then asked curiously. Why didn't you adopt him? Michael laughed. Because my father said it would be disrespectful for Tom to change his name. Disrespectful to his own parents. They saw Hagen shoo Sonny through the French door into the Don's office and then crook a finger at Amerigo Bonacera. Why do they bother your father with business on a day like this? Michael laughed again. Because they know that by tradition, no Sicilian can refuse a request on his daughter's wedding day. <laughs> and no Sicilian ever lets a chance like that go by. Lucy Mancini lifted her pink gown off the floor and ran up the steps. Sonny Corleone's heavy, cupid face, really obscene with whiny lust, frightened her. 
but she had teased him for the past week to just this end. In her two college love affairs, she'd felt nothing, and neither of them lasted more than a week. Quarreling, her second lover had mumbled something about her being too big down there. Lucy had understood, and for the rest of the school term had refused to go out on any dates. During the summer, preparing for the wedding of her best friend, Connie Corleone, Lucy heard the whispered stories about Sonny. One Sunday afternoon in the Corleone kitchen, Sonny's wife Sandra gossiped freely. Sandra was a coarse, good-natured woman who had been born in Italy, but brought to America as a small child. She was strongly built, with great breasts, and had already borne three children in five years of marriage. Sandra and the other women teased Connie about the terrors of the nuptial bed. My God, Sandra had giggled, when I saw that pole of Sonny's for the first time and realized he was going to stick it into me, I yelled bloody murder. After the first year, my insides felt as mushy as macaroni boiled for an hour. When I heard he was doing the job on other girls, I went to church and lit a candle. They'd all laughed, but Lucy had felt her flesh twitching between her legs. Now, as she ran up the steps toward Sonny, a tremendous flash of desire went through her body. On the landing, Sonny grabbed her hand and pulled her down the hall into an empty bedroom. Her legs went weak as the door closed behind them. She felt Sonny's mouth on hers, his lips tasting of burnt tobacco, bitter. She opened her mouth. At that moment, she felt his hand come up beneath her bridesmaid's gown, heard the rustle of material giving way, felt his large, warm hand between her legs, ripping aside the satin panties to caress her vulva. She put her arms around his neck and hung there as he opened his trousers. Then he placed both hands beneath her bare buttocks and lifted her. She gave a little hop in the air so that both her legs were wrapped around his upper thighs. His tongue was in her mouth, and she sucked on it. He gave a savage thrust that banged her head against the door. She felt something burning pass between her thighs. She let her right hand drop from his neck and reached down to guide him. Her hand closed around an enormous, blood-gorged pole of muscle. It pulsated in her hand like an animal, and almost weeping with grateful ecstasy, she pointed it into her own wet, turgid flesh. The thrust of its entering, the unbelievable pleasure made her gasp, brought her legs up almost around his neck, and then, like a quiver, her body received the savage arrows of his lightning-like thrusts, innumerable, torturing, arching her pelvis higher and higher, until for the first time in her life she reached a shattering climax, felt his hardness break, and then the crawly flood of semen over her thighs. Slowly, her legs relaxed from around his body, slid down until they reached the floor. They leaned against each other, out of breath. It might have been going on for some time, but now they could hear the soft knocking on the door. Sonny quickly buttoned his trousers, meanwhile blocking the door so that it could not be opened. Lucy frantically smoothed down her pink gown, her eyes flickering. But the thing that had given her so much pleasure was hidden inside sober black cloth. Then they heard Tom Hagen's voice, very low. Sonny, you in there? Sonny sighed with relief. He winked at Lucy. I yeah, Tom, what is it? Hagen's voice, still low, said, The Don wants you in his office. Now. They could hear his footsteps as he walked away. Sonny waited for a few moments, gave Lucy a hard kiss on the lips, and then slipped out the door after Hagen. Lucy combed her hair. She checked her dress and pulled around her garter straps. Her body felt bruised, her lips pulpy and tender. She went out the door, and though she felt the sticky wetness between her thighs, she did not go to the bathroom to wash, but ran straight on down the steps and into the garden. She took her seat at the bridal table next to Connie, who exclaimed petulantly, Lucy, where were you? You look drunk. Stay beside me now. The blonde groom poured Lucy a glass of wine and smiled knowingly. Lucy didn't care. She lifted the grapey, dark red juice to her parched mouth and drank. She felt the sticky wetness between her thighs and pressed her legs together. Her body was trembling. Over the glass rim, as she drank, her eyes searched hungrily to find Sonny Corleone. There was no one else she cared to see. Slyly, she whispered in Connie's ear, Only a few more hours and you'll know what it's all about. Connie giggled. Lucy demurely folded her hands on the table, treacherously triumphant, as if she had stolen a treasure from the bride. Amerigo Bonacera followed Hagen into the corner room of the house and found Don Corleone sitting behind a huge desk. Sonny Corleone was standing by the window, looking out into the garden. For the first time that afternoon, the Don behaved coolly. He did not embrace the visitor or shake hands. 
the sallow-faced undertaker, owed his invitation to the fact that his wife and the wife of the Don were the closest of friends. Amerigo Bonacera himself was in severe disfavor with Don Corleone. Bonacera began his request obliquely and cleverly. You must excuse my daughter, your wife's goddaughter, for not doing your family the respect of coming today. She is in the hospital still. He glanced at Sonny Corleone and Tom Hagen to indicate that he did not wish to speak before them. But the Don was merciless. We all know of your daughter's misfortune. If I can help her in any way, you have only to speak. My wife is her godmother, after all. I have never forgotten that honor. This was a rebuke. The Undertaker never called Don Corleone godfather, as custom dictated. Buonasera, ashen-faced, asked directly now, May I speak to you? Alone. Don Corleone shook his head. I trust these two men with my life. They are my two right arms. I cannot insult them by sending them away. The undertaker closed his eyes for a moment and then began to speak. His voice was quiet, the voice he used to console the bereaved. I raise my daughter in the American fashion. I believe in America. America has made my fortune. I gave my daughter her freedom and yet taught her never to dishonor her family. She found a boyfriend, not an Italian. She went to the movies with him. She stayed out late. But he never came to meet her parents. I accept all of this without a protest. The fault is mine. Two months ago, he took her for a drive. He had a masculine friend with him. They made her drink whiskey, and then... They tried to take advantage of her. She resisted. She kept her honor. They beat her like an animal. When I went to the hospital, she had two black eyes. Her nose was broken. Her jaw was shattered. And they had to wire it together. She wept through her pain. Father, father, why did I do it? Why did they do this to me? And I wept. Bonacera could not speak further. He was weeping now, though his voice had not betrayed his emotion. Don Corleone, as if against his will, made a gesture of sympathy, and Bonacera went on, his voice human with suffering. Why did I weep? She was the light of my life, an affectionate daughter, a beautiful girl. She trusted people, and now she will never trust them again. She will never be beautiful again. He was trembling, his sallow face flushed, an ugly, dark red. I went to the police, like a good American. The two boys were arrested. They were brought to trial. The evidence was overwhelming, and they pleaded guilty. The judge sentenced them to three years in prison, and suspended the sentence. They went free that very day. I stood in the courtroom like a fool, and those bastards smiled at me. And then I said to my wife, We must go to Don Coglione for justice. The Don had bowed his head to show respect for the man's grief. But when he spoke, the words were cold with offended dignity. Why did you go to the police? Why didn't you come to me at the beginning of this affair? What do you want of me? Tell me what you wish. But do what I beg you to do. There was something almost insolent in his words. And what is that? Buonasera glanced at Hagen and Sonny Corleone and shook his head. The Don, still sitting at Hagen's desk, inclined his body toward the undertaker. Buonasera hesitated, then bent down and put his lips so close to the Don's hairy ear that they touched. Don Corleone listened like a priest in the confessional, gazing away into the distance, impassive, remote. They stood so for a long moment, until Bonacera finished whispering and straightened to his full height. The Don looked up gravely at Bonacera. Bonacera, his face flushed, returned the stare unflinchingly. Finally, the Don spoke. That. I cannot do. You are being carried away. I will pay you anything you ask. On hearing this, Hagen flinched, 
a nervous flick of his head. Sonny Corleone folded his arms, smiled sardonically, as he turned from the window to watch the scene in the room for the first time. Don Corleone rose from behind the desk. His face was still impassive, but his voice rang like cold death. We have known each other many years, you and I. But until this day, you never came to me for counsel or help. I can't remember the last time you invited me to your house for coffee. Oh, my wife is godmother to your only child. Let us be frank. You spurned my friendship. You feared to be in my debt. I didn't want to get into trouble. But Don held up his hand. No, don't speak. You found America a paradise. You had a good trade. You made a good living. You thought the world a harmless place where you could take your pleasure as you willed. You never armed yourself with true friends. After all, the police guarded you. There were courts of law. You and yours could come to no harm. You did not need Don Corleone. Very well. My feelings were wounded, but I am not that sort of person who thrusts his friendship on those who do not value it, on those who think me of little account. The Don paused and gave the undertaker a polite, ironic smile. Now, you come to me and say, Don Corleone, give me justice. And you do not ask with respect. You do not offer me your friendship. You come into my home on the bridal day of my daughter, and you ask me to do murder, and you say, I will pay you anything. No, no, I'm not offended. But what have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? Bonacetta cried out in his anguish and his fear. America has been good to me. I wanted to be a good citizen. I wanted my child to be American. The Don clapped his hands together with decisive approval. Well spoken. Very fine. Then you have nothing to complain about. The judge has ruled. America has ruled. Bring your daughter flowers and a box of candy when you go visit her in the hospital. That will comfort her. Be content. After all, this is not a serious affair. The boys were young, high-spirited, and one of them was the son of a powerful politician. Oh, no, my dear Amerigo. You have always been honest. I must admit, though you spurn my friendship, that I would trust the given word of Amerigo Bonacera more than I would any other man's. So, give me a word that you will put aside this madness. It is not American. Forgive. Forget. Life is full of misfortunes. The cruel and contemptuous irony with which all of this was said, the controlled anger of the Don, reduced the poor undertaker to a quivering jelly. But he spoke up bravely again. I ask you for justice. The court gave you justice. Bonacera shook his head stubbornly. No. They gave the youth justice. They did not give me justice. The Don acknowledged this fine distinction with an approving nod. What is your justice? An eye for an eye. You ask for more. Your daughter is alive. Let them suffer as she suffers. The Don waited for him to speak further. Bonacera screwed up the last of his courage. How much shall I pay you? It was a despairing wail. Don Corleone turned his back. It was a dismissal. Bonacera did not budge. Finally, sighing, a good-hearted man who could not remain angry with an erring friend, Don Corleone turned back to the undertaker, who was now as pale as one of his corpses. Don Corleone was gentle, patient. Why do you fear to give your first allegiance to me? You go to the law courts and wait for months. You spend money on lawyers who know full well you are to be made a fool of. You accept judgment from a judge who sells himself like the worst whore in the streets. Years gone by, when you needed money, he went to the banks and paid ruinous interest, waited hat in hand like a beggar while they sniffed around, poked their noses up your very asshole to make sure you could pay them back. The Don paused. His voice became sterner. But if you had come to me, my purse would have been yours. If you had come to me for justice, those scum who ruined your daughter would be weeping bitter tears this day. If by some misfortune an honest man like yourself made enemies, they would become my enemies. The Don raised his arm, finger pointing at Bonacera. And then, believe me, 
they would fear you. Bonacera bowed his head and murmured in a strangled voice, Be my friend. I accept. Don Corleone put his hand on the man's shoulder. Good. You shall have your justice. Someday, and that day may never come, I will call upon you to do me a service in return. Until that day, consider this justice a gift from my wife, your daughter's godmother. When the door closed behind the grateful undertaker, Don Corleone turned to Hagen. Near this affair that commends in, tell him to be sure to use reliable people, people who will not be carried away by the smell of blood. After all, we're not murderers, no matter what that corpse valet dreams up in his foolish head. He noted that his first-born masculine son was gazing through the window at the garden party. It was hopeless, Don Corleone thought. If he refused to be instructed, Santino could never run the family business, could never become a Don. He would have to find somebody else. And soon, after all, he was not immortal. From the garden, startling all three men, there came a happy, roaring shout. Sonny Corleone pressed close to the window. What he saw made him move quickly toward the door, a delighted smile on his face. It's Johnny! He came to the wedding. What did I tell you? Hagen moved to the window. He said to Don Corleone, It's really your godson. Shall I bring him here? No, let the people enjoy him. Let him come to me when he's ready. He smiled at Hagen. You see? He's a good godson. Hagen felt a twinge of jealousy. It's been two years. He's probably in trouble again and wants you to help. And who should he come to if not his godfather? The first one to see Johnny Fontaine enter the garden was Connie Corleone. She forgot her bridal dignity and screamed, Johnny! Then she ran into his arms. He hugged her tight and kissed her on the mouth, kept his arm around her as others came up to greet him. They were all his old friends, people he'd grown up with on the west side. Then Connie was dragging him to her new husband. Johnny saw with amusement that the blonde young man looked a little sour at no longer being the star of the day. He turned on all his charm, shaking the groom's hand, toasting him with a glass of wine. A familiar voice called from the bandstand. How about giving us a song, Johnny? He looked up and saw Nino Valenti smiling down at him. Johnny Fontaine jumped up on the bandstand and threw his arms around Nino. They had been inseparable, singing together, going out with girls together, until Johnny had started to become famous and sing on the radio. When he had gone to Hollywood to make movies, Johnny had phoned Nino a couple of times just to talk and had promised to get him a club singing date, but he'd never done so. Seeing Nino now, his cheerful, mocking, drunken grin, all the affection returned. Nino began strumming on the mandolin. Johnny Fontaine put his hand on Nino's shoulder. This is for the bride, he said, and stamping his foot, chanted the words to an obscene Sicilian love song. As he sang, Nino made suggestive motions with his body. The bride blushed proudly. The throng of guests roared its approval. Before the song ended, they were all stamping with their feet and roaring out the sly, double-meaning tagline that finished each stanza. At the end, they would not stop applauding until Johnny cleared his throat to sing another song. They were all proud of him. He was of them, and he had become a famous singer, a movie star who slept with the most desired women in the world. And yet he had shown proper respect for his godfather by traveling 3,000 miles to attend this wedding. He still loved old friends like Nino Valenti. Many of the people there had seen Johnny and Nino singing together when they were just boys, when no one dreamed that Johnny Fontaine would grow up to hold the hearts of 50 million women in his hands. Johnny Fontaine reached down and lifted the bride up on the bandstand so that Connie stood between him and Nino. Both men crouched down, facing each other, Nino plucking the mandolin for a few harsh chords. It was an old routine of theirs, a mock battle and wooing, using their voices like swords, each shouting a chorus in turn. With the most delicate courtesy, Johnny let Nino's voice overwhelm his own. Let Nino take the bride from his arm. Let Nino swing into the last victorious stanza while his own voice died away. The whole wedding party broke into shouts of applause. The three of them embraced each other at the end. The guests begged for another song. Only Don Corleone, standing in the corner entrance of the house, sensed something amiss. Cheerily, with bluff good humor, careful not to give offense to his guests, he called out, My godson has come three thousand miles to do us honor, and no one thinks to wet his throat. At once, a dozen full wine glasses were thrust at Johnny Fontaine. He took a sip from all and rushed to embrace his godfather. As he did so, he whispered something into the older man's ear. Don Corleone led him into the house. Tom Hagen held out his hand when Johnny came into the room. Johnny shook it. How are you, Tom? But without his usual charm that consisted of a genuine warmth for people. 
Hagen was a little hurt by this coolness, but shrugged it off. It was one of the penalties for being the Don's hatchet man. Johnny Fontaine said to the Don, When I got the wedding invitation, I said to myself, My godfather isn't mad at me anymore. I called you five times after my divorce, and Tom always told me you were out or busy, so I knew you were sore. Don Corleone was filling glasses from the yellow bottle of Strega. That's all forgotten. Now can I do something for you still? You're not too famous, too rich that I can't help you? Johnny gulped down the yellow, fiery liquid and held out his glass to be refilled. He tried to sound jaunty. I'm not rich, Godfather. I'm going down. You were right. I should never have left my wife and kids for that tramp I married. I don't blame you for getting sore at me. The Don shrugged. I worried about you. You're my godson, that's all. Johnny paced up and down the room. I was crazy about that bitch. The biggest star in Hollywood. She looks like an angel. And you know what she does after a picture? If the makeup man does a good job on her face, she lets him bang her. If the cameraman made her look extra good, she brings him into her dressing room and gives him a screw. Anybody. She uses her body like I use the loose change in my pocket for a tip. A whore made for the devil. Don Corleone curtly broke in. How is your family? Johnny sighed. I took care of them. After the divorce, I gave Ginny and the kids more than the court said I should. I go see them once a week. I miss them. Sometimes I think I'm going crazy. He took another drink. Now my second wife laughs at me. She can't understand my being jealous. She calls me an old-fashioned guinea. She makes fun of my singing. Before I left, I gave her a nice beating, but not in the face because she was making a picture. I gave her cramps. I punched her on the arms and legs like a kid, and she kept laughing at me. He lit a cigarette. So, Godfather, right now, life doesn't seem worth living. These are troubles I can't help you with. He paused, then asked, What's the matter with your voice? All the assured charm, the self-mockery, disappeared from Johnny Fontaine's face. He said, almost brokenly, Godfather, I can't sing anymore. Something happened to my throat, the doctors don't know what. Hagen and the Don looked at him with surprise. Johnny had always been so tough. Fontaine went on, My two pictures made a lot of money. I was a big star. Now they throw me out. The head of the studio always hated my guts, and now he's paying me off. Don Corleone stood before his godson and asked grimly, Why doesn't this man like you? I used to sing those songs for the liberal organizations, you know, all that stuff you never liked me to do. Well, Jack Waltz didn't like it either. He called me a communist, but he couldn't make it stick. Then I snatched a girl he had saved for himself. It was strictly a one-night stand, and she came after me. What the hell could I do? Then my whore's second wife throws me out, and Ginny and the kids won't take me back unless I come crawling on my hands and knees, and I can't sing anymore. Godfather, what the hell can I do? Don Corleone's face had become cold, without a hint of sympathy. You can start by acting like a man. Suddenly anger contorted his face. He shouted, Like a man! He reached over the desk and grabbed Johnny Fontaine by the hair of his head in a gesture that was savagely affectionate. By Christ in heaven! Is it possible that you spent so much time in my presence and turned out no better than this? A Hollywood Finocchio who weeps and begs for pity, who cries out like a woman, Oh, what shall I do? Oh, what shall I do? The mimicry of the Don was so extraordinary, so unexpected, that Hagen and Johnny were startled into laughter. Don Corleone was pleased. For a moment he reflected on how much he loved this godson. How would his own three sons have reacted to such a tongue-lashing? Santino would have sulked and behaved badly for weeks afterward. Fredo would have been cowed. Michael would have given him a cold smile and gone out of the house, not to be seen for months. But Johnny, ah, what a fine chap he was, smiling now, gathering strength, knowing already the true purpose of his godfather. Don Corleone went on. You took the woman or your boss, a man more powerful than yourself, then you complain he won't help you. What nonsense! You left your family, your children without a father, to marry a whore and you weep because they don't welcome you back with open arms. The whore, you don't hit her in the face because she's making a picture. Then you're amazed because she laughs at you. You lived like a fool, and you have come to a fool's end. Don Corleone paused to ask in a patient voice, Are you willing to take my advice this time? Johnny Fontaine shrugged. I can't marry Ginny again, not the way she wants. I have to gamble. I have to drink. I have to go out with the boys. Beautiful broads run after me, and I never could resist them. Then I used to feel like a heel when I went back to Ginny. Christ, I can't go through all that crap again. It was rare that Don Corleone showed exasperation. I didn't tell you to get married again. Do what you want. It's good you wish to be a father to your children. 
A man who is not a father to his children can never be a real man. But then, you must make their mother accept you. Who says you can't see them every day? Who says you can't live in the same house? Who says you can't live your life exactly as you want to live it? Johnny Fontaine laughed. Godfather, not all women are like the old Italian wives. Ginny won't stand for it. Now, the Don was mocking. Because you acted like a Finocchio. You gave her more than the court said. You didn't hit the other in the face because she was making a picture. You let women dictate your actions, and they are not competent in this world. Though certainly they will be saints in heaven, while we men burn in hell. And then, I've watched you all these years. The Don's voice became earnest. You've been a fine godson. You've given me all the respect. But what of your other old friends? One year, you run around with this person, the next year with another person. That Italian boy who was so funny in the movies, he had some bad luck. You never saw him again because you were more famous. And how about your old, old comrade that you went to school with? Who was your partner singing? Nino. He drinks too much out of disappointment, but he never complains. He works hard driving the gravel truck and sings weekends for a few dollars. He never says anything against you. You couldn't help him a bit, why not? He sings well. Johnny Fontaine said with patient weariness, Godfather, he just hasn't got enough talent. He's okay, but he's not big time. Don Corleone lidded his eyes almost closed and then said, And you, Godson, you know you just don't have talent enough? Shall I give you a job on the gravel truck with Nino? When Johnny didn't answer, the Don went on. Friendship is everything. Friendship is more than talent. It is more than government. It is almost equal to family. Never forget that. If you had built up a wall of friendships, you wouldn't have to ask me to help. Now tell me, why can't you sing? You sang well in the garden, as well as Nino. Hagen and Johnny smiled at this delicate thrust. It was Johnny's turn to be patronizingly patient. My voice is weak. I sing one or two songs, and then I can't sing again for hours or days. I can't make it through the rehearsals or the retakes. My voice is weak. It's got some sort of sickness. So you have woman trouble. Your voice is sick. Now tell me the trouble you're having with this Hollywood the Pezzonavanti who won't let you work. The Don was getting down to business. He's bigger than one of your Pezzonavantes. He owns the studio. He advises the president on movie propaganda for the war. Just a month ago, he bought the movie rights to the biggest novel of the year, a bestseller. And the main character is a guy just like me. I wouldn't even have to act, just be myself. I wouldn't even have to sing. I might even win the Academy Award. Everybody knows it's perfect for me and I'd be big again, as an actor. But that bastard Jack Waltz is paying me off. He won't give it to me. I offered to do it for nothing, for a minimum price, and he still says no. He sent the word that if I come and kiss his ass in the studio commissary, maybe he'll think about it. Don Corleone dismissed this emotional nonsense with a wave of his hand. Among reasonable men, problems of business could always be solved. He patted his godson on the shoulder. You're discouraged. Nobody cares about you, so you think. And you've lost a lot of weight. You drink a lot, huh? You don't sleep and you take pills. He shook his head disapprovingly. Now, I want you to follow my orders. I want you to stay in my house for one month. I want you to eat well, to rest and sleep. I want you to be my companion. I enjoy your company. And maybe you can learn something about the world from your godfather that might even help you in the great Hollywood. But no singing, no drinking, and no women. At the end of the month, you can go back to Hollywood and this Metro Novante, this 90 caliber, will give you that job you want. Done? Johnny Fontaine could not altogether believe that the Don had such power. But his godfather had never said such and such a thing could be done without having it done. This guy is a personal friend of J. Edgar Hoover. You can't even raise your voice to him. He's a businessman? I'll make him an offer. He can't refuse. It's too late. All the contracts have been signed and they start shooting in a week. It's absolutely impossible. Go. Go back to the party. Your friends are waiting for you. Leave everything to me. He pushed Johnny Fontaine out of the room. Hagen sat behind the desk and made notes. The Don heaved a sigh and asked, Is there anything else? Salazzo can't be put off anymore. You'll have to see him this week. Hagen held his pen over the calendar. The Don shrugged. Now that the wedding is over, whatever you like. The answer told Hagen two things. Most important, that the answer to Virgil Salazzo would be no. 
The second, that Don Corleone, since he would not give the answer before his daughter's wedding, expected his no to cause trouble. Hagen said cautiously, Shall I tell Clemenza to have some men come live in the house? For what? I didn't answer before the wedding because on an important day like that, there should be no cloud, not even in the distance. Also, I wanted to know beforehand what he wanted to talk about. We know now. What he will propose is an infamita. Then you will refuse? The Don nodded. I think we should all discuss it, the whole family, before you give your answer. The Don smiled. You think so? Good. We will discuss it. When you come back from California. I want you to fly there tomorrow and settle this business for Johnny. See that movie, Petra Novante. Tell Salazzo I will see him when you get back from California. Is there anything else? The hospital called. Consigliere Abandando is dying. He won't last out the night. His family was told to come and wait. Hagen had filled the Consigliere's post for the past year, ever since the cancer had imprisoned Genco Abandando in his hospital bed. Now he waited to hear Don Corleone say the post was his permanently. The odds were against it. So high a position was traditionally given only to a man descended from two Italian parents. There had already been trouble about his temporary performance of the duties. Also, he was only thirty-five, not old enough, supposedly, to have acquired the necessary experience and cunning for a successful consigliere. But the Don gave him no encouragement. When does my daughter leave with her bridegroom? Hagen looked at his wristwatch. In a few minutes, they'll cut the cake, and then a half hour after that. That reminded him of something else. Your new son-in-law. Do we give him something important inside the family? He was surprised at the vehemence of the Don's answer. Never! The Don hit the desk with the flat of his hand. Never! Give him something done his living, a good living, but never let him know the family's business. Tell the others, Sonny, Fredo, Clemenza. The Don paused. And instruct my sons, all three of them, that they will accompany me to the hospital to see Porjenko. I want them to pay their last respects. Tell Freddy to drive the big car and ask Johnny if he will come with us as a special favor to me. He saw Hagen look at him questioningly. I want you to go to California tonight. You won't have time to go see Jenko. But don't leave until I come back from the hospital and speak with you. Understood? Understood. What time should Fred have the car waiting? When the guests have left. Jenko will wait for me. The senator called, apologizing for not coming personally, but that you would understand. He probably means those two FBI men across the street taking down license numbers. But he sent his gift over by special messenger. The Don nodded. He did not think it necessary to mention that he himself had warned the senator not to come. Did he send a nice present? Hagen made a face of impressed approval that was very strangely Italian on his German-Irish features. Antique silver, very valuable. The kids can sell it for a grand at least. The senator spent a lot of time getting exactly the right thing. For those kind of people, that's more important than how much it costs. Don Corleone did not hide his pleasure that so great a man as the senator had shown him such respect. The senator, like Luca Brasi, was one of the great stones in the Don's power structure, and he too, with this gift, had resworn his loyalty. When Johnny Fontaine appeared in the garden, Kay Adams recognized him immediately. She was truly surprised. You never told me your family knew Johnny Fontaine. Now I'm sure I'll marry you. Do you want to meet him? Not now. She sighed. I was in love with him for three years. I used to come down to New York whenever he sang at the Capitol and scream my head off. He was so wonderful. We'll meet him later. When Johnny finished singing and vanished into the house with Don Corleone, Kay said archly to Michael, Don't tell me a big movie star like Johnny Fontaine has to ask your father for a favor. He's my father's godson. And if it wasn't for my father, he might not be a big movie star today. Kay Adams laughed with delight. That sounds like another great story. Michael shook his head. I can't tell that one. Trust me. This is the end of disc number one. Please insert disc number two. This is disc number two. Kay said archly to Michael, Don't tell me a big movie star like Johnny Fontaine has to ask your father for a favor. He's my father's godson. And if it wasn't for my father, he might not be a big movie star today. Kay Adams laughed with delight. That sounds like another great story. Michael shook his head. I can't tell that one. Trust me. He told her. He told her without being funny. He told it without pride. He told it without any sort of explanation, except that eight years before, his father had been more impetuous 
and because the matter concerned his godson, the Don considered it an affair of personal honor. The story was quickly told. Eight years ago, Johnny Fontaine had made an extraordinary success singing with a popular dance band. He had become a top radio attraction. Unfortunately, the band leader, a well-known show business personality named Les Halley, had signed Johnny to a five-year personal services contract. It was a common show business practice. Les Halley could now loan Johnny out and pocket most of the money. Don Corleone entered the negotiations personally. He offered Les Halley $20,000 to release Johnny Fontaine from the personal services contract. Halley offered to take only 50% of Johnny's earnings. Don Corleone was amused. He dropped his offer from $20,000 to $10,000. The band leader, obviously not a man of the world outside his beloved show business, completely missed the significance of this lower offer. He refused. The next day, Don Corleone went to see the band leader personally. He brought with him his two best friends, Genco Avandando, who was his consigliere, and Luca Brasi. With no other witnesses, Don Corleone persuaded Les Halley to sign a document giving up all rights to all services from Johnny Fontaine upon payment of a certified check to the amount of $10,000. Don Corleone did this by putting a pistol to the forehead of the band leader and assuring him with the utmost seriousness that either his signature or his brains would rest on that document in exactly one minute. Les Halley signed. Don Corleone pocketed his pistol and handed over the certified check. The rest was history. Johnny Fontaine went on to become the greatest singing sensation in the country. He made Hollywood musicals that earned a fortune for his studio. His records made millions of dollars. Then he divorced his childhood sweetheart wife and left his two children to marry the most glamorous blonde star in motion pictures. He soon learned that she was a whore. He drank, he gambled, he chased other women, he lost his singing voice. His record stopped selling. The studio did not renew his contract. And so now he had come back to his godfather. Kay said thoughtfully, Are you sure you're not jealous of your father? Everything you've told me about him shows him doing something for other people. He must be good-hearted. She smiled wryly. Of course, his methods are not exactly constitutional. Michael sighed. I guess that's the way it sounds. But let me tell you this. You know those Arctic explorers who leave caches of food scattered on the route to the North Pole? Just in case they may need them someday? That's my father's favors. Someday he'll be at each one of those people's houses, and they had better come across. It was nearly twilight before the wedding cake was shown, exclaimed over, and eaten, specially baked by Nazarini. It was cleverly decorated with shells of cream so dizzyingly delicious that the bride greedily plucked them from the corpse of the cake before she whizzed away on her honeymoon with her blonde groom. The Don politely sped his guest's departure, noting meanwhile that the black sedan with its FBI men was no longer visible. Finally, the only car left in the driveway was the long black Cadillac with Freddy at the wheel. The Don got into the front seat, moving with quick coordination for his age and bulk. Sonny, Michael, and Johnny Fontaine got into the back seat. Don Corleone said to his son Michael, Your girlfriend, she'll get back to the city by herself, all right? Michael nodded. Tom said he'd take care of it. Don Corleone nodded with satisfaction at Hagen's efficiency. Because of the gas rationing still in effect, there was little traffic on the Belt Parkway to Manhattan. In less than an hour, the Cadillac rolled into the street of French Hospital. During the ride, Don Corleone asked his youngest son if he was doing well in school. Michael nodded. Then, Sonny, in the back seat, asked his father. Johnny says you're getting them squared away with that Hollywood business. Do you want me to go out there and help? Don Corleone was curt. Tom is going tonight. He won't need any help. It's a simple affair. Sonny Corleone laughed. Johnny thinks you can't fix it. That's why I thought you might want me to go out there. Don Corleone turned his head. He asked Johnny Fontaine, Why do you doubt me? Hasn't your godfather always done what he said he would do? Have I ever been taken for a fool? Johnny apologized nervously. Godfather, the man who runs it is a real 90 caliber Pezza Novante. You can't budge him, not even with money. He has big connections, and he hates me. I just don't know how you can swing it. The Don spoke with affectionate amusement. I say to you, you shall have it. He nudged Michael with his elbow. We won't disappoint my godson now, Michael. Michael, who never doubted his father for a moment, shook his head. As they walked toward the hospital entrance, Don Corleone put his hand on Michael's arm so that the others forged ahead. When you get through with college, come and talk to me. I have some plans you will like. Michael didn't say anything. Don Corleone grunted in exasperation. I know how you are. I won't ask you to do anything you don't approve of. This is something special. Go your own way now. 
You're a man, after all. But come to me as a son should, when you are finished with your schooling. The family of Genko Abandando, wife and three daughters dressed in black, clustered like a flock of plump crows on the white tile floor of the hospital corridor. When they saw Don Corleone come out of the elevator, they seemed to flutter up off the white tiles in an instinctive surge toward him for protection. The mother was regally stout and black, the daughters fat and plain. Mrs. Abandando pecked at Don Corleone's cheek, sobbing, wailing. Oh, what a saint you are to come here on your daughter's wedding day. Don Corleone brushed these thanks aside. Don't I owe respect to such a friend? A friend who has been my right arm for twenty years? He had understood immediately that the soon-to-be widow did not comprehend that her husband would die this night. Genko Abandando had been in this hospital for nearly a year dying of his cancer, and the wife had come to consider his fatal illness almost an ordinary part of life. Tonight was just another crisis. She babbled on. Go in and see my poor husband. He asks for you. Poor man. He wanted to come to the wedding to show his respect, but the doctor would not permit it. Then he said you would come to see him on this great day, but I did not believe it possible. Oh, men understand friendship more than we women. Go inside. You will make him happy. A nurse and a doctor came out of Genko Abandando's private room. The doctor was a young man, serious-faced, and with the air of one born to command. That is to say, the air of one who has been immensely rich all his life. One of the daughters asked timidly, Dr. Kennedy, can we go see him now? Dr. Kennedy looked over the large group with exasperation. Didn't these people realize that the man inside was dying and dying in torturous pain? It would be much better if everyone let him die in peace. I think just the immediate family, he said in his exquisitely polite voice. He was surprised when the wife and daughters turned to the short, heavy man, dressed in an awkwardly fitted tuxedo, as if to hear his decision. The heavy man spoke. There was just the slightest trace of an Italian accent in his voice. My dear doctor, is it true he is dying? Yes. Then there is nothing more for you to do. We will take up the burden. We will comfort him. We will close his eyes. We will bury him and weep at his funeral, and afterwards... We will watch over his wife and daughters. At hearing things put so bluntly, forcing her to understand, Mrs. Abandando began to weep. Dr. Kennedy shrugged. It was impossible to explain to these peasants. At the same time, he recognized the crude justice in a man's remarks. His role was over. Still exquisitely polite, he said, Please wait for the nurse to let you in. She has a few necessary things to do with the patient. He walked away from them down the corridor, his white coat flapping. The nurse went back into the room, and they waited. Finally, she came out again, holding the door for them to enter. She whispered, He's delirious with the pain and fever. Try not to excite him. And you can stay only a few minutes, except for the wife. She recognized Johnny Fontaine as he went by her, and her eyes opened wide. He gave her a faint smile of acknowledgement, and she stared at him with frank invitation. He filed her away for future reference, then followed the others into the sick man's room. Genko Abandando had run a long race with death, and now, vanquished, he lay exhausted on the raised bed. He was wasted away to no more than a skeleton, and what had once been vigorous black hair had turned into obscene stringy wisps. Genko, dear friend, I have brought my sons to pay their respects, and look, even Johnny, all the way from Hollywood. The dying man raised his fevered eyes gratefully to the dawn. He let the young men clasp his bony hand in their fleshy ones. His wife and daughters ranged themselves along his bed, kissing his cheek, taking his other hand in turn. The Don pressed his old friend's hand. He said comfortingly, Hurry up and get better, and we'll take a trip back to Italy together to our old village. We'll play bocce in front of the wine shop, like our fathers before us. The dying man shook his head. He motioned the young men and his family away from the bedside, with the other bony claw, he hung fast to the Don. He tried to speak. The Don put his head down and then sat on the bedside chair. Genko Abandando was babbling about their childhood. Then his coal black eyes became sly. He whispered. The Don bent closer. The others in the room were astonished to see tears running down Don Corleone's face as he shook his head. The quavering voice grew louder, filling the room. With a tortured, superhuman effort, Abandando lifted his head off his pillow, eyes unseeing, and pointed a skeletal forefinger at the Don. 
Godfather, Godfather, save me from death, I beg of you. My flesh is burning off my bones, and I can feel the worms eating away my brain. Godfather, cure me. You have the power. Dry the tears of my poor wife. In Corleone, we played together as children. And now, will you let me die when I fear hell for my sins? The Don was silent. It is your daughter's wedding day. You cannot refuse me. The Don spoke quietly, gravely, to pierce through the blasphemous delirium. Old friend, I have no such powers. If I did, I would be more merciful than God, believe me. But don't fear death, and don't fear hell. I will have a mass said for your soul every night and every morning. Your wife and your children will pray for you. How can God punish you with so many pleas for mercy? The skeleton face took on a cunning expression that was obscene. It's been arranged, then. When the Don answered, his voice was cold, without comfort. You blaspheme. Resign yourself. Abandando fell back on the pillow. His eyes lost their wild gleam of hope. The nurse came back into the room and started shooing them out in a very matter-of-fact way. The Don got up, but Abandando put out his hand. Godfather, stay here with me and help me meet death. Perhaps if he sees you near me, he will be frightened and leave me in peace. Or perhaps you can say a word full of few things. The dying man winked as if he were mocking the Don, now not really serious. Your brother's in blood, after all. Then, as if fearing the Don would be offended, he clutched at his hand. Stay with me. Let me hold your hand. We outweed that bastard as we outweed it on us. Godfather, don't betray me. The Don motioned the other people out of the room. They left. He took the withered claw of Jenko Abandando in his own two broad hands. Softly, reassuringly, he comforted his friend as they waited for death together. As if the Don could truly snatch the life of Jenko Abandando back from that most foul and criminal traitor to man. The wedding day of Connie Corleone ended well for her. Carlo Rizzi performed his duties as a bridegroom with skill and vigor, spurred on by the contents of the bride's gift purse, which totaled up to over $20,000. The bride, however, gave up her virginity with a great deal more willingness than she gave up her purse. For the latter, he had to blacken one of her eyes. Lucy Mancini waited in her house for a call from Sonny Corleone, sure that he would ask her for a date. Finally, she called his house, and when she heard a woman's voice answer the phone, she hung up. She had no way of knowing that nearly everyone at the wedding had remarked the absence of her and Sonny for that fatal half hour, and the gossip was already spreading that Santino Corleone had found another victim, that he had done the job on his own sister's maid of honor. Amerigo Bonacera had a terrible nightmare. In his dreams, he saw Don Corleone in peaked cap, overalls, and heavy gloves, unloading bullet-riddled corpses in front of his funeral parlor and shouting, Remember, Amerigo, not a word to anyone, and bury them quickly. He groaned so loud and long in his sleep that his wife shook him awake. Oh, what a man you are to have a nightmare only after a wedding. Kay Adams was escorted to her New York City hotel by Paul Gatto and Clemenza. The car was large, luxurious, and driven by Gatto. Clemenza sat in the back seat, and Kay was given the front seat next to the driver. She found both men wildly exotic. Their speech was movie Brooklynese, and they treated her with exaggerated courtliness. During the ride, she chatted casually with both men and was surprised when they spoke of Michael with unmistakable affection and respect. He had led her to believe that he was an alien in his father's world. Now, Clemenza was assuring her in his wheezing, guttural voice that the old man thought Mike was the best of his sons, the one who would surely inherit the family business. What business is that? Kay asked in the most natural way. Paulie Gatto gave her a quick glance as he turned the wheel. Behind her, Clemenza said in a surprised voice, Didn't Mike tell you? Mr. Corleone is the biggest importer of Italian olive oil in the States. Now that the war's over, the business could get real rich. You'll need a smart boy like Mike. 
At the hotel, Clemenza insisted on coming to the desk with her. When she protested, he said simply, The boss said to make sure you got home okay. I gotta do it. After she received her room key, he walked her to the elevator and waited until she got in. She waved to him, smiling, and was surprised at his genuine smile of pleasure in return. It was just as well she did not see him go back to the hotel clerk and ask what name she registered under. The hotel clerk looked at Clemenza coldly. Clemenza rolled the little green spitball he was holding in his hand across to the clerk, who picked it up and immediately said, Mr. and Mrs. Michael Corleone. Back in the car, Paul Gatto said, Nice dame. Clemenza grunted. <laughs> Mike is doing a job on her. Unless, he thought, they were really married. Pick me up early in the morning. Hagen got some deal for us. It gotta be done right away. It was late Sunday night before Tom Hagen could kiss his wife goodbye and drive out to the airport. With his special number one priority, a grateful gift from a Pentagon staff general officer, he had no trouble getting on a plane to Los Angeles. It had been a busy but satisfying day for Tom Hagen. Genco Abandando had died at three in the morning. And when Don Corleone returned from the hospital, he had informed Hagen that he was now officially the new consigliere to the family. This meant that Hagen was sure to become a very rich man, to say nothing of power. The Don had broken a long-standing tradition. The consigliere was always a full-blooded Sicilian, and the fact that Hagen had been brought up as a member of the Don's family made no difference to that tradition. It was a question of blood. Only a Sicilian, born to the ways of omerta, the law of silence, could be trusted in the key post of consigliere. Between the head of the family, Don Corleone, who dictated policy, and the operating level of men who actually carried out the orders of the Don, there were three layers, or buffers. In that way, nothing could be traced to the top, unless the consigliere turned traitor. That Sunday morning, Don Corleone gave explicit instructions on what should be done to the two young men who had beaten the daughter of Amerigo Bonacera but he had given those orders in private to Tom Hagen. Later in the day, Hagen had, also in private, without witnesses, instructed Clemenza. In turn, Clemenza had told Poligato to execute the commission. Poligato would now muster the necessary manpower and execute the orders. Poligato and his men would not know why this particular task was being carried out or who had ordered it originally. Each link of the chain would have to turn traitor for the Don to be involved, and though it had never yet happened, there was always the possibility. The cure for that possibility also was known. Only one link in the chain had to disappear. The consigliere was also what his name implied. He was the counselor to the Don, his right-hand man, his auxiliary brain. He was also his closest companion and his closest friend. On important trips, he would drive the Don's car. At conferences, he would go out and get the Don refreshments, coffee and sandwiches, fresh cigars. He would know everything the Don knew, or nearly everything, all the cells of power. He was the one man in the world who could bring the Don crashing down to destruction. But no consigliere had ever betrayed a Don, not in the memory of any of the powerful Sicilian families who had established themselves in America. There was no future in it, and every consigliere knew that if he kept the faith, he would become rich, wield power, and win respect. If misfortune came, his wife and children would be sheltered and cared for as if he were alive or free, if he kept the faith. In some matters, the consigliere had to act for his Don in a more open way, and yet not involve his principal. Hagen was flying to California on just such a matter. He realized that his career as consigliere would be seriously affected by the success or failure of this mission. By family business standards, whether Johnny Fontaine got his coveted part in the war movie or did not, was a minor matter. Far more important was the meeting Hagen had set up with Virgil Solazzo the following Friday. But Hagen knew that to the Don, both were of equal importance, which settled the matter for any good consigliere. The piston plane shook Tom Hagen's already nervous insides, and he ordered a martini from the hostess to quiet them. Both the Don and Johnny had briefed him on the character of the movie producer, Jack Waltz. From everything that Johnny said, Hagen knew he would never be able to persuade Waltz, but he also had no doubt whatsoever that the Don would keep his promise to Johnny. His own role was that of negotiator and contact. Lying back in his seat, Hagen went over all the information given to him that day. Jack Waltz was one of the three most important movie producers in Hollywood, owner of his own studio with dozens of stars under contract. He was on the president of the United States Advisory Council for War Information, cinematic division, which meant simply that he helped make propaganda movies. 
He had had dinner at the White House. He had entertained J. Edgar Hoover in his Hollywood home. But none of this was as impressive as it sounded. They were all official relationships. Waltz didn't have any personal political power, mainly because he was an extreme reactionary, partly because he was a megalomaniac who loved to wield power wildly without regard to the fact that by so doing, legions of enemies sprang up out of the ground. Hagen sighed. There would be no way to handle Jack Waltz. He opened his briefcase and tried to get some paperwork done, but he was too tired. He ordered another martini and reflected on his life. He had no regrets. Indeed, he felt that he had been extremely lucky. Whatever the reason, the course he had chosen ten years ago had proved to be right for him. He was successful, he was as happy as any grown man could reasonably expect, and he found life interesting. Tom Hagen was thirty-five years old, a tall, crew-cut man, very slender, very ordinary-looking. He was a lawyer, but did not do the actual detailed legal work for the Corleone family business, though he had practiced law for three years after passing the bar exam. At the age of eleven, he had been a playmate of eleven-year-old Sonny Corleone. Hagen's mother had gone blind and then died during his eleventh year. Hagen's father, a heavy drinker, had become a hopeless drunkard. A hard-working carpenter, he had never done a dishonest thing in his life, but his drinking destroyed his family and finally killed him. Tom Hagen was left an orphan who wandered the streets and slept in hallways. His younger sister had been put in a foster home. But in the 1920s, the social agencies did not follow up cases of 12-year-old boys who were so ungrateful as to run from their charity. Hagen, too, had an eye infection. Neighbors whispered that he had caught or inherited it from his mother, and so therefore it could be caught from him. He was shunned. Sonny Corleone, a warm-hearted and imperious 11-year-old, had brought his friend home and demanded that he be taken in. Tom Hagen was given a hot dish of spaghetti with oily, rich tomato sauce, the taste of which he had never forgotten, and then given a metal folding bed to sleep on. In the most natural way, without a word being spoken or the matter discussed in any fashion, Don Corleone had permitted the boy to stay in his household. Don Corleone himself took the boy to a special doctor and had his eye infection cured. He sent him to college and law school. In all this, the Don acted not as a father, but rather as a guardian. There was no show of affection, but oddly enough, the Don treated Hagen more courteously than his own sons, did not impose a parental will upon him. It was the boy's decision to go to law school after college. He had heard Don Corleone say once, a lawyer with his briefcase can steal more than a hundred men with guns. Meanwhile, much to the annoyance of their father, Sonny and Freddie insisted on going into the family business after graduation from high school. Only Michael had gone on to college, and he had enlisted in the Marines the day after Pearl Harbor. After he passed the bar exam, Hagen married to start his own family. The bride was a young Italian girl from New Jersey, rare at that time for being a college graduate. After the wedding, which was, of course, held in the home of Don Corleone, the Don offered to support Hagen in any undertaking he desired, to send him law clients, furnish his office, start him in real estate. Tom Hagen had bowed his head and said to the Don, I would like to work for you. The Don was surprised, yet pleased. You know who I am? he asked. Hagen nodded. He hadn't really known the extent of the Don's power, not then. He did not really know in the ten years that followed until he was made the acting consigliere after Genco Abandando became ill, but he nodded and met the Don's eyes with his own. I would like to work for you like your sons, Hagen said, meaning with complete loyalty, with complete acceptance of the Don's parental divinity. The Don, with that understanding, which was even then building the legend of his greatness, showed the young man the first mark of fatherly affection since he had come into his household. He took Hagen into his arms for a quick embrace, and afterward treated him more like a true son, though he would sometimes say, Tom, never forget your parents, as if he were reminding himself as well as Hagen. There was no chance that Hagen would forget. His mother had been near moronic and slovenly, so ridden by anemia she could not feel affection for her children or make a pretense of it. His father, Hagen, had hated. His mother's blindness before she died had terrified him, and his own eye infection had been a stroke of doom. He had been sure he would go blind. When his father died, Tom Hagen's eleven-year-old mind had snapped in a curious way. He had roamed the streets like an animal, waiting for death, until the fateful day Sonny found him sleeping in the back of a hallway and brought him to his home. What had happened afterward was a miracle. But for years, Hagen had had nightmares, dreaming he had grown to manhood, blind, tapping a white cane, his blind children behind him, tap-tapping with their little white canes as they begged in the streets. 
Some mornings when he woke, the face of Don Corleone was imprinted on his brain in that first conscious moment, and he would feel safe. But the Don had insisted that he put in three years of general law practice in addition to his duties for the family business. This experience had proved invaluable later on, and also removed any doubts in Hagen's mind about working for Don Corleone. He had then spent two years of training in the offices of a top firm of criminal lawyers in which the Don had some influence. It was apparent to everyone that he had a flair for this branch of the law. He did well, and when he went into the full-time service of the family business, Don Corleone had not been able to reproach him once in the six years that followed. When he had been made the acting consigliere, the other powerful Sicilian families referred contemptuously to the Corleone family as the Irish Gang. This had amused Hagen. It had also taught him that he could never hope to succeed the Don as the head of the family business. But he was content. That had never been his goal. Such an ambition would have been a disrespect to his benefactor and his benefactor's blood family. It was still dark when the plane landed in Los Angeles. Hagen checked into his hotel, showered and shaved, and watched dawn come over the city. He ordered breakfast and newspapers to be sent up to his room and relaxed until it was time for his 10 a.m. appointment with Jack Waltz. The appointment had been surprisingly easy to make. The day before, Hagen had called the most powerful man in movie labor unions, a man named Billy Goff. Acting on instructions from Don Corleone, Hagen had told Goff to arrange an appointment on the next day for Hagen to call on Jack Waltz, that he should hint to Waltz that if Hagen was not made happy by the results of the interview, there could be a labor strike at the movie studio. An hour later, Hagen received a call from Goff. The appointment would be at 10 a.m. Waltz had gotten the message about the possible labor strike, but hadn't seemed too impressed, Goff said. He added, If it really comes down to that, I gotta talk to the Don myself. If it comes to that, he'll talk to you. By saying this, he avoided making any promises. He was not surprised that Goff was so agreeable to the Don's wishes. The family empire, technically, did not extend beyond the New York area, but Don Corleone had first become strong by helping labor leaders. Many of them still owed him debts of friendship. But the 10 a.m. appointment was a bad sign. It meant that he would be first on the appointment list, that he would not be invited to lunch. It meant that Waltz held him in small worth. Goff had not been threatening enough, probably, because Waltz had him on his graft payroll. And sometimes the Don's success in keeping himself out of the limelight worked to the disadvantage of the family business, in that his name did not mean anything to outside circles. His analysis proved correct. Waltz kept him waiting for a half hour past the appointed time. Hagen didn't mind. The reception room was very plush, very comfortable, and on a plum-colored couch opposite him sat the most beautiful child Hagen had ever seen. She was no more than eleven or twelve, dressed in a very expensive but simple way as a grown woman. She had incredibly golden hair, huge, deep sea-blue eyes, and a fresh raspberry-red mouth. She was guarded by a woman, obviously her mother, who tried to stare Hagen down with a cold arrogance that made him want to punch her in the face. The angel child and the dragon mother, Hagen thought, returning the mother's cold stare. Finally, an exquisitely dressed but stout middle-aged woman came to lead him through a string of offices to the office apartment of the movie producer. Hagen was impressed by the beauty of the offices and the people working in them. He smiled. They were all shrewdies, trying to get their foot in the movie door by taking office jobs, and most of them would work in these offices for the rest of their lives or until they accepted defeat and returned to their hometowns. Jack Waltz was a tall, powerfully built man with a heavy paunch almost concealed by his perfectly tailored suit. Hagen knew his history. At ten years of age, Waltz had hustled empty beer kegs and push carts on the east side. At twenty, he helped his father sweat garment workers. At thirty, he had left New York and moved west, invested in the Nickelodeon, and pioneered motion pictures. At forty-eight, he had been the most powerful movie magnate in Hollywood, still rough-spoken, rapaciously amorous, a raging wolf ravaging helpless flocks of young starlets. At fifty, he transformed himself. He took speech lessons, learned how to dress from an English valet, and how to behave socially from an English butler. When his first wife died, he married a world-famous and beautiful actress who didn't like acting. Now, at the age of sixty, he collected old master paintings, was a member of the President's Advisory Committee, and had set up a multi-million dollar foundation in his name to promote art in motion pictures. His daughter had married an English lord, his son an Italian princess. His latest passion, as reported dutifully by every movie columnist in America, was his own racing stables, on which he had spent ten million dollars in the past year. 
He had made headlines by purchasing the famed English racing horse Khartoum for the incredible price of $600,000, and then announcing that the undefeated racer would be retired and put to stud exclusively for the waltz stables. He received Hagen courteously, his beautifully, evenly tanned, meticulously barbered face contorted with a grimace meant to be a smile. Despite all the money spent, despite the ministrations of the most knowledgeable technicians, his age showed. The flesh of his face looked as if it had been seamed together. But there was an enormous vitality in his movements, and he had what Don Corleone had, the air of a man who commanded absolutely the world in which he lived. Hagen came directly to the point, that he was an emissary from a friend of Johnny Fontaine that this friend was a very powerful man who would pledge his gratitude and undying friendship to Mr. Waltz if Mr. Waltz would grant a small favor. The small favor would be the casting of Johnny Fontaine in the new war movie the studio planned to start next week. The seamed face was impassive, polite. Waltz asked, What favors can your friend do me? There was just a trace of condescension in his voice. Hagen ignored the condescension. You've got some labor trouble coming up. My friend can absolutely guarantee to make that trouble disappear. You have a top male star who makes a lot of money for your studio, but he just graduated from marijuana to heroin. My friend will guarantee that your male star won't be able to get any more heroin. And if some other little things come up over the years, a phone call to me can solve your problems. Jack Waltz listened to this as if he were hearing the boasting of a child. Then he said harshly, his voice deliberately all east side, you trying to put muscle on me? Absolutely not. I've come to ask a service for a friend. I've tried to explain that you won't lose anything by it. Almost as if he willed it, Waltz made his face a mask of anger. The mouth curled, his heavy brows dyed black, contracted to form a thick line over his glinting eyes. He leaned over the desk toward Hagen. All right, you smooth son of a bitch. Let me lay it on the line for you, and your boss, whoever he is. Johnny Fontaine never gets that movie. I don't care how many Guinea Mafia Goombas come out of the woodwork. He leaned back. A word of advice to you, my friend. J. Edgar Hoover, I assume you've heard of him. Waltz smiled sardonically. Is a personal friend of mine. If I let him know I'm being pressured, you guys will never know what hit you. Hagen listened patiently. He had expected better from a man of Waltz's stature. Was it possible that a man who acted this stupidly could rise to the head of a company worth hundreds of millions? That was something to think about, since the Don was looking for new things to put money into. And if the top brains of this industry were so dumb, movies might be the thing. The abuse itself bothered him not at all. Hagen had learned the art of negotiation from the Don himself. Never get angry, the Don had instructed. Never make a threat. Reason with people. The word reason sounded so much better in Italian. Rajuna, to rejoin. The art of this was to ignore all insults, all threats, to turn the other cheek. Hagen had seen the Don sit at a negotiating table for eight hours, swallowing insults, trying to persuade a notorious and megalomaniac strong-armed man to mend his ways. At the end of the eight hours, Don Corleone had thrown up his hands in a helpless gesture and said to the other men at the table, but no one can reason with this fellow, and had stalked out of the meeting room. The strong-armed man had turned white with fear. Emissaries were sent to bring the Don back into the room. An agreement was reached, but two months later, the strong-armed man was shot to death in his favorite barbershop. So Hagen started again, speaking in the most ordinary voice. Look at my card. I'm a lawyer. Would I stick my neck out? Have I uttered one threatening word? Let me just say that I am prepared to meet any condition you name to get Johnny Fontaine that movie. I think I've already offered a great deal for such a small favor. A favor that I understand it would be in your interest to grant. Johnny tells me that you admit he would be perfect for that part. And let me say that this favor would never be asked if that were not so. In fact, if you're worried about your investment, my client would finance the picture. But please, let me make myself absolutely clear. We understand your no is no. Nobody can force you or is trying to. We know about your friendship with Mr. Hoover, I may add, and my boss respects you for it. He respects that relationship very much. Waltz had been doodling with a huge red feathered pen. At the mention of money, his interest was aroused, and he stopped doodling. This picture is budgeted at five million. Hagen whistled softly to show that he was impressed. Then he said very casually, My boss has a lot of friends who back his judgment. For the first time, Waltz seemed to take the whole thing seriously. He studied Hagen's card. I never heard of you. 
I know most of the big lawyers in New York, but just who the hell are you? I have one of those dignified corporate practices. I just handle this one account. He rose. I won't take up any more of your time. He held out his hand. Waltz shook it. Hagen took a few steps toward the door and turned to face Waltz again. I understand you have to deal with a lot of people who try to seem more important than they are. In my case, the reverse is true. Why don't you check me out with our mutual friend? If you reconsider, call me at my hotel. He paused. This may be sacrilege to you, but my client can do things for you that even Mr. Hoover might find out of his range. He saw the movie producer's eyes narrowing. Waltz was finally getting the message. By the way, I admire your pictures very much. I hope you can keep up the good work. Our country needs it. Late that afternoon, Hagen received a call from the producer's secretary that a car would pick him up within the hour to take him out to Mr. Waltz's country home for dinner. She told him it would be about a three-hour drive, but that the car was equipped with a bar and some hors d'oeuvre. Hagen knew that Waltz made the trip in his private plane and wondered why he hadn't been invited to make the trip by air. The secretary's voice was adding politely, Mr. Waltz suggested you bring an overnight bag, and he'll get you to the airport in the morning. I'll do that. That was another thing to wonder about. How did Waltz know he was taking the morning plane back to New York? He thought about it for a moment. The most likely explanation was that Waltz had set private detectives on his trail to get all possible information. Then Waltz certainly knew he represented the Don, which meant he knew something about the Don, which in turn meant he was now ready to take the whole matter seriously. Something might be done after all, Hagen thought. And maybe Waltz was smarter than he had appeared this morning. The home of Jack Waltz looked like an implausible movie set. There was a plantation-type mansion, huge grounds girdled by a rich black dirt bridal path, stables and pasture for a herd of horses. The hedges, flower beds, and grasses were as carefully manicured as a movie star's nails. Waltz greeted Hagen on a glass panel, air-conditioned porch. The producer was informally dressed in blue silk shirt, open at the neck, mustard-colored slacks, soft leather sandals. Framed in all this color and rich fabric, his seamed, tough face was startling. He handed Hagen an outsized martini glass and took one for himself from the prepared tray. He seemed more friendly than he had been earlier in the day. He put his arm over Hagen's shoulder. We have a little time before dinner. Let's go look at my horses. As they walked toward the stables, he said, I checked you out, Tom. You should have told me your boss is Corleone. I thought you were just some third-rate hustler Johnny was running in to bluff me. And I don't bluff. Not that I want to make enemies. I never believed in that. But let's just enjoy ourselves now. We can talk business after dinner. Surprisingly, Waltz proved to be a truly considerate host. He explained his new methods, innovations that he hoped would make his stable the most successful in America. The stables were all fireproofed, sanitized to the highest degree, and guarded by a special security detail of private detectives. Finally, Waltz led him to a stall which had a huge bronze plaque attached to its outside wall. On the plaque was the name Khartoum. The horse inside the stall was, even to Hagen's inexperienced eyes, a beautiful animal. Khartoum's skin was jet black, except for a diamond-shaped white patch on his huge forehead. The great brown eyes glinted like golden apples. The black skin over the taut body was silk. Waltz said with childish pride, The greatest racehorse in the world. I bought him in England last year for six hundred grand. I bet even the Russian czars never paid that much for a single horse. But I'm not going to race him. I'm going to put him to stud. I'm going to build the greatest racing stable this country has ever known. He stroked the horse's mane. Khartoum, Khartoum. There was real love in his voice, and the animal responded. Walt said to Hagen, I'm a good horseman, you know. And the first time I ever rode, I was 50 years old. He laughed. Maybe one of my grandmothers in Russia got raped by a Cossack, and I got his blood. He tickled Khartoum's belly. Look at that cock on him. I should have such a cock. They went back to the mansion to have dinner. It was served by three waiters under the command of a butler. The table linen and ware were all gold thread and silver. But Hagen found the food mediocre. Waltz obviously lived alone, and just as obviously was not a man who cared about food. Hagen waited until they had both lit up huge Havana cigars before he asked Waltz, Does Johnny get it or not? I can't. I can't put Johnny into that picture even if I wanted to. The contracts are all signed for all the performers, and the cameras roll next week. There's no way I can swing it. Mr. Waltz, the big advantage of dealing with a man at the top is that such an excuse is not valid. You can do anything you want to do. He puffed on his cigar. Don't you believe my client can keep his promises? I believe that I'm going to have labor trouble. 
Goff called me up on that, that son of a bitch. And the way he talked to me, you'd never guess. I pay him a hundred grand a year under the table. And I believe you can get that fag He-Man star of mine off heroin. But I don't care about that. And I can finance my own pictures. Because I hate that bastard Fontaine. Tell your boss this is one favor I can't give. But that he should try me again on anything else. Anything at all. Hagen thought, you sneaky bastard, then why the hell did you bring me all the way out here? The producer had something on his mind. I don't think you understand the situation. Mr. Corleone is Johnny Fontaine's godfather. That is a very close, a very sacred religious relationship. Waltz bowed his head in respect at this reference to religion. Hagen went on. Italians have a little joke, that the world is so hard a man must have two fathers to look after him, and that's why they have godfathers. Since Johnny's father died, Mr. Corleone feels his responsibility even more deeply. As for trying you again, Mr. Corleone is much too sensitive. He never asks a second favor where he has been refused the first. Waltz shrugged. I'm sorry. The answer is still no. But since you're here, what will it cost me to have that labor trouble cleared up? In cash, right now. That solved one puzzle for Hagen. Why Waltz was putting in so much time on him when he had already decided not to give Johnny the part. And that could not be changed at this meeting. Waltz felt secure. He was not afraid of the power of Don Corleone. And certainly Waltz, with his national political connections, his acquaintanceship with the FBI chief, his huge personal fortune, and his absolute power in the film industry, could not feel threatened by Don Corleone. To any intelligent man, even to Hagen, it seemed that Waltz had correctly assessed his position. He was impregnable to the Don if he was willing to take the losses the labor struggle would cost. There was only one thing wrong with the whole equation— Don Corleone had promised his godson he would get the part, and Don Corleone had never, to Hagen's knowledge, broken his word in such matters. You are deliberately misunderstanding me. You are trying to make me an accomplice to extortion. Mr. Corleone promises only to speak in your favor on this labor trouble as a matter of friendship in return for your speaking in behalf of his client. A friendly exchange of influence, nothing more. But I can see you don't take me seriously. Personally, I think that is a mistake. Waltz, as if he had been waiting for such a moment, let himself get angry. I understood perfectly. That's the Mafia style. It's all olive oil and sweet talk, when what you're really doing is making threats. So let me lay it on the line. Johnny Fontaine will never get that part, and he's perfect for it. It would make him a great star, but he never will be. Because I hate that pinko punk, and I'm going to run him out of the movies. And I'll tell you why. He ruined one of my most valuable protégés. For five years, I had this girl under training, singing, dancing, acting lessons. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I was going to make her a star. I'll be even more frank, just to show you that I'm not a hard-hearted man, that it wasn't all dollars and cents. That girl was beautiful, and she was the greatest piece of ass I've ever had. And I've had him all over the world. She could suck you out like a water pump. Then Johnny comes along with that olive oil voice and guinea charm, and she runs off. She threw it all away just to make me ridiculous. A man in my position, Mr. Hagen, can't afford to look ridiculous. I have to pay Johnny off. For the first time, Walt succeeded in astounding Hagen. He found it inconceivable that a grown man of substance would let such trivialities affect his judgment in an affair of business, and one of such importance. In Hagen's world, the Corleone's world, the physical beauty, the sexual power of women, carried not the slightest weight in worldly matters. It was a private affair, except, of course, in matters of marriage and family disgrace. Hagen decided to make one last try. You're absolutely right, Mr. Waltz. But are your grievances that major? I don't think you've understood how important this very small favor is to my client. Mr. Corleone held the infant Johnny in his arms when he was baptized. When Johnny's father died, Mr. Corleone assumed the duties of parenthood. Indeed, he is called godfather by many, many people who wish to show their respect and gratitude for the help he has given them. Mr. Corleone never lets his friends down. Waltz stood up abruptly. I've listened to about enough. Thugs don't give me orders. I give them orders. If I pick up this phone, you'll spend the night in jail. And if that mafia goomba tries any rough stuff, you'll find out I'm not a band leader. Yeah, I heard that story too. Listen, your Mr. Corleone 
will never know what hit him, even if I have to use my influence at the White House. The stupid, stupid son of a bitch. How the hell did he get to be a pezzo novante, Hagen wondered. Advisor to the president, head of the biggest movie studio in the world. Definitely the Don should get into the movie business, and the guy was taking his words at their sentimental face value. He was not getting the message. Thank you for the dinner and a pleasant evening. Could you give me transportation to the airport? I don't think I'll spend the night. He smiled coldly at Waltz. Mr. Corleone is a man who insists on hearing bad news at once. While waiting in the floodlit colonnade of the mansion for his car, Hagen saw two women about to enter a long limousine already parked in the driveway. They were the beautiful twelve-year-old blonde girl and her mother he had seen in Waltz's office that morning. But now the girl's exquisitely cut mouth seemed to have smeared into a thick, pink mass. Her sea-blue eyes were filmed over, and when she walked down the steps toward the open car, her long legs tottered like a crippled foal's. Her mother supported the child, helping her into the car, kissing commands into her ear. The mother's head turned for a quick, furtive look at Hagen, and he saw in her eyes a burning, hawk-like triumph. Then she, too, disappeared into the limousine. So that was why he hadn't got the plane ride from Los Angeles, Hagen thought. The girl and her mother had made the trip with the movie producer. That had given Waltz enough time to relax before dinner and do the job on the little kid. And Johnny wanted to live in this world? Good luck to him, and good luck to Waltz. Pauly Gatto hated quickie jobs, especially when they involved violence. He liked to plan things ahead. And something like tonight, even though it was punk stuff, could turn into serious business if somebody made a mistake. Now, sipping his beer, he glanced around, checking how the two young punks were making out with the two little tramps at the bar. Pauly Gatto knew everything there was to know about those two punks. Their names were Jerry Wagner and Kevin Moonen. They were both about twenty years old, good-looking, brown-haired, tall, well-built. Both were due to go back to college out of town in two weeks. Both had fathers with political influence, and this, with their college student classification, had so far kept them out of the draft. They were both also under suspended sentences for assaulting the daughter of Amerigo Bonacera. The lousy bastards, Pauli Gatto thought, draft-dodging, violating their probation by drinking in a bar after midnight, chasing floozies, young punks. Pauli Gatto had been deferred from the draft himself because his doctor had furnished the draft board with documents showing that this patient, male, white, age 26, unmarried, had received electrical shock treatments for a mental condition. All false, of course, but Pauli Gatto felt that he had earned his draft exemption. It had been arranged by Clemenza after Gatto had made his bones in the family business. It was Clemenza who had told him that this job must be rushed through before the boys went to college. Why the hell did it have to be done in New York, Gatto wondered. Clemenza was always giving extra orders instead of just giving out the job. Now, if those two little tramps walked out with the punks, it would be another night wasted. He could hear one of the girls laughing and saying, Are you crazy, Jerry? <laughs> I'm not going any car with you. I don't want to wind up in the hospital like that other poor girl. Her voice was spitefully rich with satisfaction. That was enough for Gatto. He finished up his beer and walked out into the dark street. Perfect. It was after midnight. There was only one other bar that showed light. The rest of the stores were closed. The precinct patrol car had been taken care of by Clemenza. They wouldn't be around that way until they got a radio call, and then they'd come slow. He leaned against the four-door Chevy sedan. In the back seat, two men were sitting, almost invisible, although they were very big men. Pauly said, Take them when they come out. He still thought it had all been set up too fast. Clemenza had given him copies of the police mug shots of the two punks, the dope on where the punks went drinking every night to pick up bar girls. Pauly had recruited two of the strong arms in the family and fingered the punks for them. He'd also given them their instructions. No blows on the top or the back of the head. There was to be no accidental fatality. Other than that, they could go as far as they liked. He had given them only one warning. If those punks get out of the hospital in less than a month, you guys go back to driving trucks. The two big men were getting out of the car. They were both ex-boxers who had never made it past the small clubs and had been fixed up by Sonny Corleone with a little loan shark action so that they could make a decent living. They were, naturally, anxious to show their gratitude. When Jerry Wagner and Kevin Moonen came out of the bar, they were perfect setups. The bar girl's taunts had left their adolescent vanity prickly. Paul Gatto, leaning against the fender of his car, called out to them with a teasing laugh. Hey, Casanova, those broads really brushed you off. The two young men turned on him with delight. 
Polygato looked like a perfect outlet for their humiliation. Ferret-faced, short, slightly built, and a wise guy in the bargain. They pounced on him eagerly and immediately found their arms pinned by two men grabbing them from behind. At the same moment, Polygato had slipped onto his right hand a specially made set of brass knuckles studded with one sixteenth-inch iron spikes. His timing was good. He worked out in the gym three times a week. He smashed the punk named Wagner right on the nose. The man holding Wagner lifted him up off the ground, and Paulie swung his arm, uppercutting into the perfectly positioned groin. Wagner went limp, and the big man dropped him. This had taken no more than six seconds. Now, both of them turned their attention to Kevin Moonen, who was trying to shout. The man holding him from behind did so easily with one huge muscled arm. The other hand he put around Moonen's throat to cut off any sound. Paulie Gatto jumped into the car and started the motor. The two big men were beating Moonen to jelly. They did so with frightening deliberation, as if they had all the time in the world. They did not throw punches in flurries, but in timed, slow-motion sequences that carried the full weight of their massive bodies. Each blow landed with a splat of flesh splitting open. Gatto got a glimpse of Moonen's face. It was unrecognizable. The two men left Moonen lying on the sidewalk and turned their attention to Wagner. Wagner was trying to get to his feet, and he started to scream for help. Someone came out of the bar, and the two men had to work faster now. They clubbed Wagner to his knees. One of the men took his arm and twisted it, then kicked him in the spine. There was a cracking sound, and Wagner's screams of agony brought windows open all along the street. The two men worked very quickly. One of them held Wagner up by using his two hands around Wagner's head like a vice. The other man smashed his huge fist into the fixed target. There were more people coming out of the bar, but none tried to interfere. Paulie Gatto yelled, Come on, enough! The two big men jumped into the car, and Paulie gunned it away. Somebody would describe the car and read the license plates, but it didn't matter. It was a stolen California plate, and there were 100,000 black Chevy sedans in New York City. Chapter 2 Tom Hagen went to his law office in the city on Thursday morning. He planned to catch up on his paperwork so as to have everything cleared away for the meeting with Virgil Salazzo on Friday. A meeting of such importance that he had asked the Don for a full evening of talk to prepare for the proposition they knew Salazzo would offer the family business. Hagen wanted to have all little details cleared away so that he could go to that preparatory meeting with an unencumbered mind. The Don had not seemed surprised when Hagen returned from California late Tuesday evening and told him the results of the negotiations with Waltz. He had made Hagen go over every detail and grimaced with distaste when Hagen told about the beautiful little girl and her mother. He had murmured, Infamita, his strongest disapproval. He had asked Hagen one final question. Does this man have real balls? Hagen considered exactly what the Don meant by this question. Over the years he had learned that the Don's values were so different from those of most people that his words also could have a different meaning. Did Waltz have character? Did he have a strong will? He most certainly did, but that was not what the Don was asking. Did the movie producer have the courage not to be bluffed? Did he have the willingness to suffer heavy financial loss delay on his movies would mean? The scandal of his big star exposed as a user of heroin? Again, the answer was yes. But again, this was not what the Don meant. Finally, Hagen translated the question properly in his mind. Did Jack Waltz have the balls to risk everything, to run the chance of losing all on a matter of principle, on a matter of honor, for revenge? Hagen smiled. He did it rarely. But now he could not resist jesting with the Don. You're asking if he is a Sicilian. The Don nodded his head pleasantly, acknowledging the flattering witticism and its truth. No. That had been all. The Don had pondered the question until the next day. On Wednesday afternoon, he had called Hagen to his home and given him his instructions. The instructions had consumed the rest of Hagen's working day and left him dazed with admiration. There was no question in his mind that the Don had solved the problem, that Waltz would call him this morning with the news that Johnny Fontaine had the starring part in his new war movie. At that moment, the phone did ring, but it was Amerigo Bonacera. The undertaker's voice was trembling with gratitude. He wanted Hagen to convey to the Don his undying friendship. The Don had only to call on him. He, Amerigo Bonacera, would lay down his life for the blessed Godfather. Hagen assured him that the Don would be told. The Daily News had carried a middle-page spread of Jerry Wagner and Kevin Moonen lying in the street. The photos were expertly gruesome. 
They seemed to be pulps of human beings. Miraculously, said the news, they were both still alive, though they would both be in the hospital for months and would require plastic surgery. Hagen made a note to tell Clemenza that something should be done for Pauli Gatto. He seemed to know his job. Hagen worked quickly and efficiently for the next three hours, consolidating earning reports from the Don's real estate company, his olive oil importing business, and his construction firm. None of them were doing well, but with the war over, they should all become rich producers. He had almost forgotten the Johnny Fontaine problem when his secretary told him California was calling. He felt a little thrill of anticipation as he picked up the phone. Hagen here. The voice that came over the phone was unrecognizable with hate and passion. You fucking bastard. I'll have you all in jail for a hundred years. I'll spend every penny I have to get you. I'll get that Johnny Fontaine's balls cut off, you hear me? You guinea fuck! I'm German-Irish. There was a long pause, and then a click of the phone being hung up. Hagen smiled. Not once had Waltz uttered a threat against Don Corleone himself. Genius had its rewards. Jack Waltz always slept alone. He had a bed big enough for ten people, and a bedroom large enough for a movie ballroom scene. But he had slept alone since the death of his first wife ten years before. This did not mean he no longer used women. He was physically a vigorous man, despite his age. But he could be aroused now only by very young girls, and had learned that a few hours in the evening were all the youth of his body and his patience could tolerate. On this Thursday morning, for some reason, he awoke early. The light of dawn made his huge bedroom as misty as a foggy meadowland. Far down at the foot of his bed was a familiar shape, and Waltz struggled up on his elbows to get a clearer look. It had the shape of a horse's head. Still groggy, Waltz reached and flicked on the night table lamp. The shock of what he saw made him physically ill. It seemed as if a great sledgehammer had struck him on the chest. His heartbeat jumped erratically, and he became nauseous. His vomit spluttered on the thick flare rug. Severed from its body, the black, silky head of the great horse Khartoum was stuck fast in a thick cake of blood. White, reedy tendons showed. Froth covered the muzzle, and those apple-sized eyes that had glinted like gold were mottled the color of rotting fruit with dead, hemorrhaged blood. Waltz was struck by a purely animal terror, and out of that terror he screamed for his servants, and out of that terror he called Hagen to make his uncontrolled threats. His maniacal raving alarmed the butler, who called Waltz's personal physician and his second-in-command at the studio, but Waltz regained his senses before they arrived. He had been profoundly shocked. What kind of man could destroy an animal worth $600,000? Without a word of warning, without any negotiation to have the act, its order countermanded. The ruthlessness, the sheer disregard for any values, implied a man who considered himself completely his own law, even his own God, and a man who backed up this kind of will with the power and cunning that held his own stable security force of no account. For by this time, Waltz had learned that the horse's body had obviously been heavily drugged before someone leisurely hacked the huge triangular head off with an axe. The men on night duty claimed that they had heard nothing. To Waltz, this seemed impossible. They could be made to talk. They had been bought off, and they could be made to tell who had done the buying. Waltz was not a stupid man. He was merely a supremely egotistical one. He had mistaken the power he wielded in his world to be more potent than the power of Don Corleone. He had merely needed some proof that this was not true. He understood this message, that despite all his wealth, despite all his contacts with the President of the United States, despite all his claims of friendship with the director of the FBI, an obscure importer of Italian olive oil would have him killed, would actually have him killed, because he wouldn't give Johnny Fontaine a movie part he wanted. It was incredible. People didn't have any right to act that way. There couldn't be any kind of world if people acted that way. It was insane. It meant you couldn't do what you wanted with your own money, with the companies you owned, the power you had to give orders. It was ten times worse than communism. It had to be smashed. It must never be allowed. Waltz let the doctor give him a very mild sedation. It helped him calm down again and to think sensibly. What really shocked him was the casualness with which this man Corleone had ordered the destruction of a world-famous horse worth $600,000. $600,000! And that was just for openers. Waltz shuddered. He thought of this life he had built up, 
He was rich. He could have the most beautiful women in the world by crooking his finger and promising a contract. He was received by kings and queens. He lived a life as perfect as money and power could make it. It was crazy to risk all this because of a whim. Maybe he could get to Corleone. What was the legal penalty for killing a racehorse? He laughed wildly, and his doctor and servants watched him with nervous anxiety. Another thought occurred to him. He would be the laughingstock of California merely because someone had contemptuously defied his power in such arrogant fashion. That decided him. That and the thought that maybe, maybe they wouldn't kill him. That they had something much more clever and painful in reserve. Waltz gave the necessary orders. His personal confidential staff swung into action. The servants and the doctor were sworn to secrecy on pain of incurring the studio and Waltz's undying enmity. Word was given to the press that the racehorse Khartoum had died of an illness contracted during his shipment from England. Orders were given to bury the remains in a secret place on the estate. Six hours later, Johnny Fontaine received a phone call from the executive producer of the film telling him to report for work the following Monday. That evening, Hagen went to the Don's house to prepare him for the important meeting the next day with Virgil Salazzo. The Don had summoned his eldest son to attend and Sonny Corleone, his heavy, cupid-shaped face drawn with fatigue, was sipping at a glass of water. He must still be humping that maid of honor, Hagen thought, another worry. Don Corleone settled into an armchair, puffing his Dinobili cigar. Hagen kept a box of them in his room. He had tried to get the Don to switch to Havana's, but the Don claimed they hurt his throat. The Don asked, Do we know everything necessary for us to know? Hagen opened the folder that held his notes. The notes were in no way incriminating. Merely cryptic reminders to make sure he touched on every important detail. Solazzo is coming to us for help. He will ask the family to put up at least a million dollars and to promise some sort of immunity from the law. For that, we get a piece of the action. Nobody knows how much. Solazzo is vouched for by the Tatalia family, and they may have a piece of the action. The action is narcotics. Solazzo has the contacts in Turkey, where they grow the poppy. From there, he ships to Sicily. No trouble. In Sicily, he has the plant to process into heroin. He has safety valve operations to bring it down to morphine and bring it up to heroin if necessary. But it would seem that the processing plant in Sicily is protected in every way. The only hitch is bringing it into this country and then distribution. Also initial capital. A million dollars cash doesn't grow on trees. Hagen saw Don Corleone grimace. The old man hated unnecessary flourishes in business matters. He went on hastily. They call Salazzo the Turk. Two reasons. He spent a lot of time in Turkey and is supposed to have a Turkish wife and kids. Second, he's supposed to be very quick with the knife, or was when he was young. Only in matters of business, though, and with some sort of reasonable complaint. A very competent man, and his own boss. He has a record. He's done two terms in prison, one in Italy, one in the United States. And he's known to the authorities as a narcotics man. This could be a plus for us. It means that he'll never get immunity to testify, since he's considered the top, and of course because of his record. Also, he has an American wife and three children, and he's a good family man. He'll stand still for any rap as long as he knows that they will be well taken care of for living money. The Don puffed on his cigar. Santino, what do you think? Hagen knew what Sonny would say. Sonny was chafing at being under the Don's thumb. He wanted a big operation of his own. Something like this would be perfect. Sonny took a long slug of scotch. Uh, there's a lot of money in that white powder, but it could be dangerous. Some people could wind up in jail for 20 years. I'd say that if we kept out of the operations and just stuck to protection and financing, it might be a good idea. Hagen looked at Sonny approvingly. He had played his cards well. He had stuck to the obvious, much the best course for him. The Don puffed on his cigar. And you, Tom, what do you think? Hagen composed himself. To be absolutely honest, he had already come to the conclusion that the Don would refuse Salazzo's proposition. But what was worse, Hagen was convinced that for one of the few times in his experience, the Don had not thought things through. He was not looking far enough ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Not even a Sicilian consigliere always agrees with the boss. They all laughed. I think you should say yes. You know all the obvious reasons, but the most important one is this. There is more money potential in narcotics than in any other business. If we don't get into it, somebody else will. Maybe the Tatalia family. With the revenue they earn, they can amass more and more police and political power. 
Their family will become stronger than ours. Eventually they will come after us to take away what we have. It's just like countries. If they arm, we have to arm. If they become stronger economically, they become a threat to us. Now we have the gambling and we have the unions, and right now they are the best things to have. But I think narcotics is the coming thing. I think we have to have a piece of that action or we risk everything we have. Not now, but maybe ten years from now. The Don seemed enormously impressed. He puffed on his cigar and murmured, That's the most important thing, of course. He sighed and got to his feet. What time do I have to meet this infidel tomorrow? Hagen said, hopefully. He'll be here at ten in the morning. Maybe the Don would go for it. I want you both here with me. The Don rose, stretching, and took his son by the arm. Santino, get some sleep tonight. You look like that devil himself. Take care of yourself. You won't be young forever. Sonny, encouraged by this sign of fatherly concern, asked the question Hagen did not dare to ask. Pop, what's your answer going to be? Don Corleone smiled. How do I know? Until I hear the percentages and other details. Besides, I have to have time to think over the advice given here tonight. After all, I'm not a man who does things rashly. As he went out the door, he said casually to Hagen, Do you have in your notes that the Turk made his living from prostitution before the war? As the Tatalia family does now, write that down before you forget. There was just a touch of derision in the Don's voice, and Hagen flushed. He had deliberately not mentioned it, legitimately, so since it really had no bearing, but he had feared it might prejudice the Don's decision. He was notoriously straight-laced in matters of sex. Virgil the Turk Salazzo was a powerfully built, medium-sized man of dark complexion who could have been taken for a true Turk. He had a scimitar of a nose and cruel black eyes. He also had an impressive dignity. Sonny Corleone met him at the door and brought him into the office where Hagen and the Don waited. Hagen thought he had never seen a more dangerous-looking man except for Luca Brasi. There were polite handshakings all around. If the Don ever asks me if this man has balls, I would have to answer yes, Hagen thought. He had never seen such force in one man, not even the Don. In fact, the Don appeared at his worst. He was being a little too simple, a little too peasant-like in his greeting. Salazzo came to the point immediately. The business was narcotics. Everything was set up. Certain poppy fields in Turkey had pledged him certain amounts every year. He had a protected plant in France to convert into morphine. He had an absolutely secure plant in Sicily to process into heroin. Smuggling into both countries was as positively safe as such matters could be. Entry into the United States would entail about 5% losses, since the FBI itself was incorruptible, as they both knew. But the profits would be enormous, the risk non-existent. The Don asked politely. Then why do you come to me? How have I deserved your generosity? Salazzo's dark face remained impassive. I need two million dollars cash. Equally important, I need a man who has powerful friends in the important places. Some of my couriers will be caught over the years. That is inevitable. They will all have clean records, that I promise. So it will be logical for judges to give light sentences. I need a friend who can guarantee that when my people get in trouble, they won't spend more than a year or two in jail. Then they won't talk. But if they get ten and twenty years, who knows? In this world, there are many weak individuals. They may talk. They may jeopardize more important people. Legal protection is a must. I hear, Don Corleone, that you have as many judges in your pocket as a boot black has pieces of silver. Don Corleone didn't bother to acknowledge the compliment. What percentage for my family? Salazzo's eyes gleamed. Fifty percent. He paused and then said in a voice that was almost a caress, in the first year, your share would be three or four million dollars. Then it would go up. And what is the percentage of the Tatalia family? For the first time, Salazzo seemed to be nervous. They will receive something from my share. I need some help in the operations. Oh, so, I receive 50% merely for finance and legal protection, huh? I have no worries about operations, is that what you tell me? Salazzo nodded. If you think two million dollars in cash is merely finance, I congratulate you, Don Corleone. I, uh, consented to see you out of my respect for the Tatarias, and because I've heard you are a serious man to be treated also with respect, I must say no to you. But I must give you my reasons. The profits in your business are huge, but so are the risks. Your operation, if I were part of it, could damage my other interests. 
It's true I have many, many friends in politics, but they would not be so friendly if my business were narcotics instead of gambling. They think gambling is something like liquor, a harmless vice. And they think narcotics are dirty business. No, don't protest. I'm telling you their thoughts, not mine. How a man makes his living is not my concern. And what I am telling you is that this business of yours is too risky. All the members of my family have lived well the last ten years. Without danger, without harm. I can't endanger them or their livelihoods out of greed. The only sign of Salazzo's disappointment was a quick flickering of his eyes around the room, as if he hoped Hagen or Sonny would speak in his support. Then he said, Are you worried about security for your two million? The Don smiled coldly. No. Salazzo tried again. The Tatalia family will guarantee your investment also. It was then that Sonny Corleone made an unforgivable error in judgment and procedure. He said eagerly, The Tatalia family guarantees the return of our investment without any percentage from us? Hagen was horrified at this break. He saw the Don turn cold, malevolent eyes on his eldest son, who froze in uncomprehending dismay. Salazzo's eyes flickered again, but this time with satisfaction. He had discovered a chink in the Don's fortress. When the Don spoke, his voice held a dismissal. Young people are greedy, and today they have no manners. They interrupt their elders, they meddle. But I have a sentimental weakness for my children, and I have spoiled them, as you see. <laughs> Senor Salazzo, my no is final. Let me say that I myself wish you good fortune in your business. It has no conflict with my own. I'm sorry that I had to disappoint you. Salazzo bowed, shook the Don's hand, and let Hagen take him to his car outside. There was no expression on his face when he said goodbye to Hagen. Back in the room, Don Corleone asked Hagen, What did you think of that man? He's a Sicilian. The Don nodded his head thoughtfully. Then he turned to his son. Santino, never let anyone outside the family know what you were thinking. Never let them know what you have under your fingernails. I think your brain is going soft from all that comedy you play with that young girl. Stop it and pay attention to business. Now get out of my sight. Hagen saw the surprise on Sonny's face, then anger at his father's reproach. Did he really think the Don would be ignorant of his conquest? Hagen wondered. And did he really not know what a dangerous mistake he had made this morning? If that were true, Hagen would never wish to be the consigliere to the Don of Santino Corleone. Don Corleone waited until Sonny had left the room. Then he sank back into his leather armchair and motioned brusquely for a drink. Hagen poured him a glass of anisette. The Don looked up at him. San Luca Blasi to see me. Three months later, Hagen hurried through the paperwork in his city office, hoping to leave early enough for some Christmas shopping for his wife and children. He was interrupted by a phone call from a Johnny Fontaine, bubbling with high spirits. The picture had been shot, the rushes, whatever the hell they were, Hagen thought, were fabulous. He was sending the Don a present for Christmas that would knock his eyes out. He'd bring it himself, but there were some little things to be done in the movie. He would have to stay out on the coast. Hagen tried to conceal his impatience. This is the end of disc number two. Please insert disc number three. This is disc number three. He was interrupted by a phone call from a Johnny Fontaine, bubbling with high spirits. The picture had been shot, the rushes, whatever the hell they were, Hagen thought, were fabulous. He was sending the Don a present for Christmas that would knock his eyes out. He'd bring it himself, but there were some little things to be done in the movie. He would have to stay out on the coast. Hagen tried to conceal his impatience. Johnny Fontaine's charm had always been lost on him, but his interest was aroused. What is it? Johnny Fontaine chuckled and said, I can't tell. That's the best part of a Christmas present. Hagen immediately lost all interest and finally managed, politely, to hang up. Ten minutes later, his secretary told him that Connie Corleone was on the phone and wanted to speak to him. Hagen sighed. As a young girl, Connie had been nice. As a married woman, she was a nuisance. She made complaints about her husband. She kept going home to visit her mother for two or three days. And Carlo Rizzi was turning out to be a real loser. He had been fixed up with a nice little business and was running it into the ground. 
He was also drinking, whoring around, gambling, and beating his wife up occasionally. Connie hadn't told her family about that, but she had told Hagen. He wondered what new tale of woe she had for him now. But the Christmas spirit seemed to have cheered her up. She just wanted to ask Hagen what her father would really like for Christmas. And Sonny, and Fred, and Mike. She already knew what she would get her mother. Hagen made some suggestions, all of which she rejected as silly. Finally, she let him go. When the phone rang again, Hagen threw his papers back into the basket. The hell with it, he'd leave. It never occurred to him to refuse to take the call, however. When his secretary told him it was Michael Corleone, he picked up the phone with pleasure. He'd always liked Mike. Tom, I'm driving down to the city with Kay tomorrow. There's something important I want to tell the old man before Christmas. Will he be home tomorrow night? Sure. He's not going out of town until after Christmas. Anything I can do for you? Michael was as close-mouthed as his father. No. I guess I'll see you Christmas. Everybody's going to be out at Long Beach, right? Right. He was amused when Mike hung up on him without any small talk. He told his secretary to call his wife and tell her he would be home a little late, but to have some supper for him. Outside the building, he walked briskly downtown toward Macy's. Someone stepped in his way. To his surprise, he saw it was Salazzo. Salazzo took him by the arm and said quietly, Don't be frightened. I just want to talk to you. A car parked at the curb suddenly had its door open. Salazzo said urgently, Get in. I want to talk to you. Hagen pulled his arm loose. He was still not alarmed, just irritated. I haven't got time. At that moment, two men came up behind him. Hagen felt a sudden weakness in his legs. Salazzo said softly, Get in the car. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead now. Trust me. Without a shred of trust, Hagen got into the car. Michael Corleone had lied to Hagen. He was already in New York, and he had called from a room in the Hotel Pennsylvania, less than ten blocks away. When he hung up the phone, Kay Adams put out her cigarette. Mike, what a good fibber you are. Michael sat down beside her on the bed. All for you, honey. If I told my family we were in town, we'd have to go there right away. Then we couldn't go out to dinner, we couldn't go to the theater, and we couldn't sleep together tonight. Not in my father's house, not when we're not married. He put his arms around her and kissed her gently on the lips. Her mouth was sweet, and he gently pulled her down on the bed. She closed her eyes, waiting for him to make love to her, and Michael felt an enormous happiness. He had spent the war years fighting in the Pacific, and on those bloody islands he had dreamed of a girl like Kay Adams, of a beauty like hers, a fair and fragile body, milky-skinned and electrified by passion. She opened her eyes and then pulled his head down to kiss him. They made love until it was time for dinner and the theater. After dinner, they walked past the brightly lit department stores full of holiday shoppers, and Michael said to her, What shall I get you for Christmas? She pressed against him. Just you. Do you think your father will approve of me? That's not really the question. Will your parents approve of me? Kay shrugged. I don't care. I even thought of changing my name, legally. But if something happened, that wouldn't really help. You sure you want to be a Corleone? He said it only half-jokingly. Yes. She said without smiling. They pressed against each other. They had decided to get married during Christmas week, a quiet civil ceremony at City Hall with just two friends as witnesses. But Michael had insisted he must tell his father. He had explained that his father would not object in any way as long as it was not done in secrecy. Kay was doubtful. She said she could not tell her parents until after the marriage. Of course they'll think I'm pregnant. Michael grinned. So will my parents. What neither of them mentioned was the fact that Michael would have to cut his close ties with his family. They both understood that Michael had already done so to some extent, and yet they both felt guilty about this fact. They planned to finish college, seeing each other weekends and living together during summer vacations. It seemed like a happy life. The play was a musical called Carousel, and its sentimental story of a braggart thief made them smile at each other with amusement. When they came out of the theater, it had turned cold. Kay snuggled up to him. After we're married, will you beat me and then steal a star for a present? Michael laughed. I'm going to be a mathematics professor. Do you want something to eat before we go to the hotel? Kay shook her head. She looked up at him meaningfully. As always, he was touched by her eagerness to make love. He smiled down at her, and they kissed in the cold street. Michael felt hungry, and he decided to order sandwiches sent up to the room. In the hotel lobby, Michael pushed Kay toward the newsstand. Get the papers while I get the key. He had to wait in a small line. The hotel was still short of help despite the end of the war. Michael got his room key and looked around impatiently for Kay. 
She was standing by the newsstand, staring down at a newspaper she held in her hand. He walked toward her. She looked up at him. Her eyes were filled with tears. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. He took the paper from her hands. The first thing he saw was a photo of his father lying in the street, his head in a pool of blood. A man was sitting on the curb, weeping like a child. It was his brother, Freddy. Michael Corleone felt his body turning to ice. There was no grief, no fear, just cold rage. He said to Kay, Go up to the room. But he had to take her by the arm and lead her into the elevator. They rode up together in silence. In their room, Michael sat down on the bed and opened the paper. The headline said, Vito Corleone shot, alleged racket chief, critically wounded, operated on under heavy police guard, bloody mob war feared. Michael felt the weakness in his legs. He's not dead. The bastards didn't kill him. He read the story again. His father had been shot at five in the afternoon. That meant that while he had been making love to Kay, having dinner, enjoying the theater, his father was near death. Michael felt sick with guilt. Shall we go down to the hospital now? Michael shook his head. Let me call the house first. The people who did this are crazy. And now that the old man's still alive, they'll be desperate. Who the hell knows what they'll pull next? Both phones in the Long Beach house were busy, and it was almost 20 minutes before Michael could get through. He heard Sonny's voice saying, Yeah? Sonny, it's me. He could hear the relief in Sonny's voice. Jesus, kid. You had us worried. Where the hell are you? I've sent people to that hick town of yours to see what happened. How's the old man? How bad is he hurt? Pretty bad. They shot him five times, but he's tough. Sonny's voice was proud. The doctor said he'll pull through. Listen, kid, I'm busy. I can't talk. Where are you? In New York. Didn't Tom tell you I was coming down? They snatched Tom. That's why I was worried about you. His wife is here. She don't know and neither do the cops. I don't want him to know. The bastard who pulled this must be crazy. I want you to get out here right away and keep your mouth shut, okay? Okay. Do you know who did it? Sure. And as soon as Luca Brasi checks in, they're going to be dead meat. We still have all the horses. I'll be out in an hour, in a cab. He hung up. The papers had been on the streets for over three hours. There must have been radio news reports. It was almost impossible that Luca hadn't heard the news. Thoughtfully, Michael pondered the question. Where was Luca Brasi? It was the same question that Hagen was asking himself at that moment. It was the same question that was worrying Sonny Corleone out in Long Beach. At a quarter to five that afternoon, Don Corleone had finished checking the papers the office manager of his olive oil company had prepared for him. He put on his jacket and wrapped his knuckles on his son Freddy's head to make him take his nose out of the afternoon newspaper. Tell Gatto to get the car from the lot. I'll be ready to go home in a few minutes. Freddy grunted. I'll have to get it myself. Paulie called in sick this morning. Got a cold again. Don Corleone looked thoughtful for a moment. That's the third time this month. I think maybe you'd better get a healthier fella for this job. Tell Tom. Fred protested. Paulie's a good kid. If he says he's sick, he's sick. I don't mind getting the car. He left the office. Don Corleone watched out the window as his son crossed Ninth Avenue to the parking lot. He stopped to call Hagen's office, but there was no answer. He called the house at Long Beach, but again, there was no answer. Irritated, he looked out the window. His car was parked at the curb in front of his building. Freddy was leaning against the fender, arms folded, watching the throng of Christmas shoppers. Don Corleone put on his jacket. The office manager helped him with his overcoat. Don Corleone grunted his thanks and went out the door and started down the two flights of steps. Out in the street, the early winter light was failing. Freddy leaned casually against the fender of the heavy Buick. When he saw his father come out of the building, Freddy went out into the street to the driver's side of the car and got in. Don Corleone was about to get in on the sidewalk side of the car when he hesitated and then turned back to the long, open fruit stand near the corner. This had been his habit lately. He loved the big out-of-season fruits, yellow peaches and oranges that glowed in their green boxes. The proprietor sprang to serve him. Don Corleone did not handle the fruit. He pointed. The fruit man disputed his decisions only once to show him that one of his choices had a rotten underside. Don Corleone took the paper bag in his left hand and paid the man with a five-dollar bill. He took his change, and as he turned to go back to the waiting car, two men stepped from around the corner. Don Corleone knew immediately what was to happen. The two men wore black overcoats and black hats, pulled low to prevent identification by witnesses. They had not expected Don Corleone's alert reaction. He dropped the bag of fruit and darted toward the parked car with startling quickness for a man of his bulk. 
At the same time he shouted, Fredo! Fredo! It was only then that the two men drew their guns and fired. The first bullet caught Don Corleone in the back. He felt the hammer shock of its impact, but made his body move toward the car. The next two bullets hit him in the buttocks and sent him sprawling in the middle of the street. Meanwhile, the two gunmen, careful not to slip on the rolling fruit, started to follow in order to finish him off. At that moment, perhaps no more than five seconds after the Don's call to his son, Federico Corleone appeared out of his car, looming over it. The gunman fired two more hasty shots at the Don lying in the gutter. One hit him in the fleshy part of his arm, and the second hit him in the calf of his right leg. Though these wounds were the least serious, they bled profusely, forming small pools of blood beside his body. But by this time, Don Corleone had lost consciousness. Freddy had heard his father shout, calling him by his childhood name, and then he had heard the first two loud reports. By the time he got out of the car, he was in shock. He had not even drawn his gun. The two assassins could easily have shot him down but they too panicked. They must have known the son was armed, and besides, too much time had passed. They disappeared around the corner, leaving Freddy alone in the street with his father's bleeding body. Many of the people thronging the avenue had flung themselves into doorways or on the ground. Others had huddled together in small groups. Freddy still had not drawn his weapon. He seemed stunned. He stared down at his father's body lying face down on the tarred street, lying now in what seemed to him a blackish lake of blood. Freddy went into physical shock. People eddied out again, and someone, seeing him start to sag, led him to the curbstone and made him sit down on it. A crowd gathered around Don Corleone's body, a circle that shattered when the first police car sirened a path through them. Directly behind the police was the Daily News radio car, and even before it stopped, a photographer jumped out to snap pictures of the bleeding Don Corleone. A few moments later, an ambulance arrived. The photographer turned his attention to Freddy Corleone who was now weeping openly, and this was a curiously comical sight because of his tough, cupid-featured face, heavy nose, and thick mouth smeared with snot. Detectives were spreading through the crowd, and more police cars were coming up. One detective knelt beside Freddy, questioning him, but Freddy was too deep in shock to answer. The detective reached inside Freddy's coat and lifted his wallet. He looked at the identification inside and whistled to his partner. In just a few seconds, Freddy had been cut off from the crowd by a flock of plainclothesmen. The first detective found Freddy's gun in its shoulder holster and took it. Then they lifted Freddy off his feet and shoved him into an unmarked car. As that car pulled away, it was followed by the Daily News radio car. The photographer was still snapping pictures of everybody and everything. In the half hour after the shooting of his father, Sonny Corleone received five phone calls in rapid succession. The first was from Detective John Phillips, who was on the family payroll and had been in the lead car of plain clothesmen at the scene of the shooting. First thing he said to Sonny over the phone was, Do you recognize my voice? Yeah. He was fresh from a nap, called to the phone by his wife. Phillips said quickly, without preamble, Somebody shot your father outside his place 15 minutes ago. He's alive, but hurt, bad. They've taken him to French Hospital. They got your brother Freddy down at the Chelsea precinct. You better get him a doctor when they turn him loose. I'm going down to the hospital now to help question your old man if he can talk. I'll keep you posted. Across the table, Sonny's wife, Sandra, noticed that her husband's face had gone red with flushing blood. His eyes were glazed over. She whispered, What's the matter? He waved at her impatiently to shut up, swung his body away so that his back was toward her, and said into the phone, You sure he's alive? Yeah, I'm sure. A lot of blood, but I think maybe he's not as bad as he looks. Thanks. Be home tomorrow morning, eight sharp. You got a grand coming. Sonny cradled the phone. He forced himself to sit still. He knew that his greatest weakness was his anger, and this was one time when anger could be fatal. The first thing to do was get Tom Hagen, but before he could pick up the phone, it rang. The call was from the bookmaker, licensed by the family to operate in the district of the Don's office. The bookmaker had called to tell him that the Don had been killed, shot dead in the street. After a few questions to make sure that the bookmaker's informant had not been close to the body, Sonny dismissed the information as incorrect. Phillips' dope would be more accurate. The phone rang almost immediately a third time. It was a reporter from the Daily News. As soon as he identified himself, Sonny Corleone hung up. He dialed Hagen's house and asked Hagen's wife, Did Tom come home yet? She said no, that he was not due for another twenty minutes, but she expected him home for supper. Have him call me. He tried to think things out. 
he tried to imagine how his father would react in a like situation. He had known immediately that this was an attack by Salazzo, but Salazzo would never have dared to eliminate so high-ranking a leader as the Don unless he was backed by other powerful people. The phone, ringing for the fourth time, interrupted his thoughts. The voice on the other end was very soft, very gentle. Santino Corleone? Yeah. We have Tom Hagen. In about three hours, he'll be released with our proposition. Don't do anything rash until you've heard what he has to say. It could only cause a lot of trouble. What's done is done. Everybody has to be sensible now. Don't lose that famous temper of yours. The voice was slightly mocking. Sonny couldn't be sure, but it sounded like Salazzo. He made his voice sound muted, depressed. Oh, wait. He heard the receiver on the other end click. He looked at his heavy, gold-banded wristwatch and noted the exact time of the call and jotted it down on the tablecloth. He sat at the kitchen table, frowning. His wife asked, Sonny, what is it? They shot the old man. He saw the shock on her face. Don't worry, he's not dead, and nothing else is going to happen. He did not tell her about Hagen. And then the phone rang for the fifth time. It was Clemenza. The fat man's voice came wheezing over the phone in grunt-like gasps. You hear about your father? Yeah, but he's not dead. There was a long pause over the phone, and then Clemenza's voice came, packed with emotion. Thank God, thank God. You sure? I got word he was dead in the street. He's alive. He was listening intently to every intonation in Clemenza's voice. The emotion had seemed genuine, but it was part of the fat man's profession to be a good actor. You all have to carry the ball, Sonny. What do you want me to do? Get over to my father's house. Bring Paulie Gatto. That's all? Don't you want me to send some people to the hospital in your place? No, I just want you and Paulie Gatto. There was a long pause. Clemenza was getting the message. To make it a little more natural, Sonny asked, Where the hell was Paulie anyway? What the hell was he doing? There was no longer any wheezing on the other end of the line. Clemenza's voice was guarded. Paulie was sick. He had a cold, so he stayed home. He's been a little sick all winter. Sonny was instantly alert. How many times did he stay home the last couple of months? Maybe three or four times. I always asked Freddy if he wanted another guy, but he said no. There's been no cause. The last ten years, things has been smooth, you know. Yeah. I'll see you at my father's house. Be sure you bring Paulie. Pick him up on your way over. I don't care how sick he is. You got that? He slammed down the phone without waiting for an answer. His wife was weeping silently. He stared at her for a moment, then said in a harsh voice, Any of our people call, tell them to get me in my father's house on a special phone. Anybody else call, you don't know nothing. If Tom's wife calls, tell her that Tom won't be home for a while. He's on business. He pondered for a moment. A couple of our people will come to stay here. He saw her look of fright. You don't have to be scared. I just want them here. Do whatever they tell you to do. If you want to talk to me, give me on Pop's special phone. But don't call me unless it's really important. And don't worry. He went out of the house. Darkness had fallen, and the December wind whipped through them all. Sonny had no fear about stepping out into the night. All eight houses were owned by Don Corleone. At the mouth of the mall, the two houses on either side were rented by family retainers with their own families and star boarders, single men who lived in the basement apartments. Of the remaining six houses that formed the rest of the half circle, one was inhabited by Tom Hagen and his family, his own, and the smallest and least ostentatious, by the Don himself. The other three houses were given rent-free to retired friends of the Don, with the understanding that they would be vacated whenever he requested. The harmless-looking mall was an impregnable fortress. All eight houses were equipped with floodlights, which bathed the grounds around them and made them all impossible to lurk in. Sonny went across the street to his father's house and let himself inside with his own key. Ma, where are you? His mother came out of the kitchen. Behind her rose the smell of frying peppers. Before she could say anything, Sonny took her by the arm and made her sit down. I just got a call. Now don't get worried. Pop's in the hospital. He's hurt. Get dressed and get ready to get down there. I'll have a car and a driver for you in a little while, okay? His mother looked at him steadily for a moment and then asked in Italian, Have they shot him? Sonny nodded. His mother bowed her head for a moment. Then she went back into the kitchen. Sonny followed her. He watched her turn off the gas under the pan full of peppers and then go out and up to the bedroom. He took peppers from the pan and bread from the basket on the table and made a sloppy sandwich with hot olive oil dripping from his fingers. He went into the huge corner room that was his father's office and took the special phone from a locked cabinet box. 
The phone had been especially installed and was listed under a phony name and a phony address. The first person he called was Luca Brasi. There was no answer. Then he called the safety valve Capo Regimi in Brooklyn, a man of unquestioned loyalty to the Don. This man's name was Tessio. Sonny told him what had happened and what he wanted. Tessio was to recruit 50 absolutely reliable men. He was to send guards to the hospital. He was to send men out to Long Beach to work there. Tessio asked, Did they get Clemenza, too? I don't want to use Clemenza's people right now. Tessio understood immediately. There was a pause, and then he said, Excuse me, Sonny. I say this as your father would say it. Don't move too fast. I can't believe Clemenza would betray us. Thanks. I don't think so, but I have to be careful, right? Right. Another thing. My kid brother Mike goes to college in Hanover, New Hampshire. Get some people we know in Boston to go up and get them and bring them down here to the house until this blows over. I'll call them up so we'll expect them. Again, I'm just playing the percentages just to make sure. Okay. I'll be over your father's house as soon as I get things rolling. Okay? You know my boys, right? Yeah. He hung up. He went over to a small wall safe and unlocked it. From it, he took an indexed book bound in blue leather. He opened it to the T's until he found the entry he was looking for. It read, Ray Farrell, $5,000, Christmas Eve. This was followed by a telephone number. Sonny dialed the number and said, Farrell? The man on the other end answered, Yes? This is Santino Corleone. I want you to do me a favor and I want you to do it right away. I want you to check two phone numbers and give me all the calls they got and all the calls they made for the last three months. He gave Farrell the number of Paul Gatto's home and Clemenza's home. This is important. Get it to me before midnight, and you'll have an extra very Merry Christmas. Before he settled back to think things out, he gave Luca Brasi's number one more call. Again, there was no answer. This worried him, but he put it out of his mind. Luca would come to the house as soon as he heard the news. Sonny leaned back in the swivel chair. In an hour, the house would be swarming with family people, and he would have to tell them all what to do. And now that he finally had time to think, he realized how serious the situation was. It was the first challenge to the Corleone family and their power in ten years. There was no doubt that Salazzo was behind it, but he would never have dared attempt such a stroke unless he had support from at least one of the five great New York families. And that support must have come from the Tatalias, which meant a full-scale war or an immediate settlement on Salazzo's terms. Sonny smiled grimly. The wily Turk had planned well, but he had been unlucky. The old man was alive, and so it was war. With Luca Brasi and the resources of the Corleone family, there could be but one outcome. But again, the nagging worry. Where was Luca Brasi? Chapter 3 Counting the driver, there were four men in the car with Hagen. They put him in the back seat in the middle of the two men who had come up behind him in the street. Salazzo sat up front. The man on Hagen's right reached over across his body and tilted Hagen's hat over his eyes so that he could not see. Don't even move your pinky. It was a short ride, not more than twenty minutes. And when they got out of the car, Hagen could not recognize the neighborhood because darkness had fallen. They led him into a basement apartment and made him sit on a straight-backed kitchen chair. Salazzo sat across the kitchen table from him. His dark face had a peculiarly vulturean look. I don't want you to be afraid. I know you're not in the muscle end of the family. I want you to help the Corleones, and I want you to help me. Hagen's hands were shaking as he put a cigarette in his mouth. One of the men brought a bottle of rye to the table and gave him a slug of it in a china coffee cup. Hagen drank the fiery liquid gratefully, steadied his hands, and took the weakness out of his legs. Your boss is dead. He paused, surprised at the tears that sprang to Hagen's eyes. Then he went on. We got him outside his office, in the street. As soon as I got the word, I picked you up. You have to make the peace between me and Sonny. Hagen didn't answer. He was surprised at his own grief, and the feeling of desolation mixed with his fear of death. Salazzo was speaking again. Sonny was hot for my deal, right? You know it's a smart thing to do, too. Narcotics is a coming thing. There's so much money in it that everybody can get rich just in a couple of years. The Don was an old mustache, Pete. His day was over, but he didn't know it. Now he's dead. Nothing can bring him back. I'm ready to make a new deal. I want you to talk Sonny into taking it. Hagen said, You haven't got a chance. Sonny will come after you with everything he's got. That's going to be his first reaction. You have to talk some sense to him. 
the Tatalia family stands behind me with all their people. The other New York families will go along with anything that will stop a full-scale war between us. Our war has to hurt them and their businesses. If Sonny goes along with the deal, the other families in the country will consider it none of their affair, even at Don's oldest friends. Hagen stared down at his hands, not answering. Salazzo went on persuasively. The Don was slipping. In the old days, I could never have gotten to him. The other families distrust them because he made you his consigliere, and you're not even Italian, much less Sicilian. If it goes to all-out war, the Corleone family will be smashed, and everybody loses, me included. I need the family political contacts more than I need the money, even. So talk to Sonny. Talk to the capo regimes. You'll save a lot of bloodshed. Hagen held out his china cup for more whiskey. I'll try. But Sonny's strong-headed. And even Sonny won't be able to call off Luca. You have to worry about Luca. I'll have to worry about Luca if I go for your deal. I'll take care of Luca. You take care of Sonny and the other two kids. Listen, you can tell them that Freddy would have gotten it today with his old man, but my people had strict orders not to gun him. I didn't want any more hard feelings than necessary. You can tell them that. Freddy's alive because of me. Finally, Hagen's mind was working. For the first time, he really believed that Salazzo did not mean to kill him or hold him as a hostage. The sudden relief from fear that flooded his body made him flush with shame. Salazzo watched him with a quiet, understanding smile. Hagen began to think things out. If he did not agree to argue Salazzo's case, he might be killed. But then he realized that Salazzo expected him only to present it, and present it properly, as he was bound to do as a responsible consigliere. And now, thinking about it, he also realized that Salazzo was right. An unlimited war between the Tatalias and the Corleones must be avoided at all costs. The Corleones must bury their dead and forget, make a deal. And then, when the time was right, they could move against Salazzo. But glancing up, he realized that Salazzo knew exactly what he was thinking. The Turk was smiling, and then it struck Hagen. What had happened to Luca Brasi that Salazzo was so unconcerned? Had Luca made a deal? He remembered that on the night Don Corleone had refused Salazzo, Luca had been summoned into the office for a private conference with the Don. But now was not the time to worry about such details. He had to get back to the safety of the Corleone family fortress in Long Beach. I'll do my best. I believe you're right. It's even what the Don would want us to do. Salazzo nodded gravely. I don't like bloodshed. I'm a businessman, and blood costs too much money. At that moment, the phone rang and one of the men sitting behind Hagen went to answer it. He listened and then said curtly, Okay, I'll tell him. He hung up the phone, went to Salazzo's side, and whispered in the Turk's ear. Hagen saw Salazzo's face go pale, his eyes glitter with rage. He himself felt a thrill of fear. Salazzo was looking at him speculatively, and suddenly Hagen knew that he was no longer going to be set free, that something had happened that might mean his death. Salazzo said, the old man is still alive. Five bullets in a Sicilian hide, and he's still alive. He gave a fatalistic shrug. Bad luck. Bad luck for me. Bad luck for you. Chapter 4 When Michael Corleone arrived at his father's house in Long Beach, he found the narrow entrance mouth of the mall blocked off with a linked chain. The mall itself was bright with the floodlights of all eight houses, outlining at least ten cars parked along the curving cement walk. Two men he didn't know were leaning against the chain. One of them asked in a Brooklyn accent, Who are you? He told them. Another man came out of the nearest house and peered at his face. That's the Don's kid, he said. I'll bring him inside. Mike followed this man to his father's house, where two men at the door let him and his escort pass inside. The house seemed to be full of men he didn't know, until he went into the living room. There, Michael saw Tom Hagen's wife, Teresa, sitting stiffly on the sofa, smoking a cigarette. On the coffee table in front of her was a glass of whiskey. On the other side of the sofa sat the bulky Clemenza. The capo regime's face was impassive, but he was sweating, and the cigar in his hand glistened slickly black with his saliva. Clemenza came to wring his hand in a consoling way, muttering, Your mother's at the hospital with your father. He's going to be all right. Paulie Gatto stood up to shake hands. Michael looked at him curiously. He knew Paulie was his father's bodyguard, but did not know that Paulie had stayed home sick that day. But he sensed tension in the thin, dark face. 
He knew Gatto's reputation as an up-and-coming man, a very quick man who knew how to get delicate jobs done without complications, and today he had failed in his duty. He noticed several other men in the corners of the room, but he did not recognize them. They were not of Clemenza's people. Michael put these facts together and understood. Clemenza and Gatto were suspect. Thinking that Pauly had been at the scene, he asked the ferret-faced young man, How's Freddy? Is he okay? Doctor gave him a shot. He's sleeping. Michael went to Hagen's wife and bent down to kiss her cheek. They had always liked each other. He whispered, Don't worry. Tom will be okay. Have you talked to Sonny yet? Teresa clung to him for a moment and shook her head. She was a delicate, very pretty woman, more American than Italian, and very scared. He took her hand and lifted her off the sofa. Then he led her into his father's corner room office. Sonny was sprawled out in his chair behind the desk, holding a yellow pad in one hand and a pencil in the other. The only other man in the room with him was the capo regime, Tessio, whom Michael recognized and immediately realized that it must be his men who were in the house and forming the new palace guard. He, too, had a pencil and pad in his hands. When Sonny saw them, he came from behind the desk and took Hagen's wife in his arms. Don't worry, Teresa. Tom's okay. They just want to give him the proposition. They said they'd turn him loose. He's not on the operating end. He's just our lawyer. There's no reason for anybody to do him harm. He released Teresa, and then, to Michael's surprise, he, too, got a hug and a kiss on the cheek. He pushed Sonny away and said, grinning, After I get used to you beating me up, I gotta put up with this. They had often fought when they were younger. Sonny shrugged. Listen, kid, I was worried when I couldn't get a hold of you in that hick town. Not that I gave a crap if they knocked you off, but I didn't like the idea of bringing the news to the old lady. I had to tell her about Pop. How'd she take it? Good. She's been through it before. Me too. You were too young to know about it, and then things got pretty smooth while you were growing up. He paused and then said, She's down at the hospital with the old man. He's got to pull through. How about us going down? Sonny shook his head and said dryly, I can't leave this house until it's all over. The phone rang. Sonny picked it up and listened intently. While he was listening, Michael sauntered over to the desk and glanced down at the yellow pad Sonny had been writing on. There was a list of seven names. The first three were Salazzo, Philip Tatalia, and John Tatalia. It struck Michael with full force that he had interrupted Sonny and Tessio as they were making up a list of men to be killed. When Sonny hung up the phone, he said to Teresa Hagen and Michael, Can you two wait outside? I got some business with Tessio we have to finish. Was that call about Tom? She said it almost truculently, but she was weeping with fright. Sonny put his arm around her and led her to the door. I swear he's going to be okay. Wait in the living room. I'll come out as soon as I hear something. He shut the door behind her. Michael had sat down in one of the big leather armchairs. Sonny gave him a quick, sharp look and then went to sit down behind the desk. You hang around me, Mike. You're going to hear things you don't want to hear. Michael lit a cigarette. I can help out. No, you can't. The old man would be sore as hell if I let you get mixed up in this. Michael stood up and yelled, You lousy bastard! He's my father! I'm not supposed to help him? I can help. I don't have to go out and kill people, but I can help. Stop treating me like, like a kid brother. I was in the war. I, I got shot, remember? I killed some Japs. What the hell do you think I'll do when you knock somebody off? Faint? Sonny grinned at him. Pretty soon you want me to put up my dukes. Okay, stick around. You can handle a phone. He turned to Tessio. That call I just got gave me dope we needed. He turned to Michael. Somebody had to finger the old man. It could have been Clemenza, it could have been Pauly Gatto, who was very conveniently sick today. I know the answer now. Let's see how smart you are, Mike. You're the college boy. Who sold out to Salazzo? Michael sat down again and relaxed back into the leather armchair. He thought everything over very carefully. Clemenza was a capo regime in the Corleone family structure. Don Corleone had made him a millionaire, and they had been intimate friends for over 20 years. He held one of the most powerful posts in the organization. What could Clemenza gain for betraying his Don? More money? He was rich enough, but then men are always greedy. More power? Revenge for some fancied insult or slight? That Hagen had been made the consigliere? Or perhaps a businessman's conviction that Salazzo would win out? No, it was impossible for Clemenza to be a traitor. And then, Michael thought sadly, it was only impossible because he didn't want Clemenza to die. The fat man had always brought him gifts when he was growing up, had sometimes taken him on outings when the Don had been too busy. He could not believe that Clemenza was guilty of treachery. 
but on the other hand, Salasso would want Clemenza in his pocket more than any other man in the Corleone family. Michael thought about Pauli Gatto. Pauli, as yet, had not become rich. He was well thought of, his rise in the organization was certain, but he would have to put in his time like everybody else. Also, he would have wilder dreams of power, as the young always do. It had to be Pauli. And then Michael remembered that in the sixth grade, he and Pauli had been in the same class in school, and he didn't want it to be Pauli either. He shook his head. Neither one of them. But he said it only because Sonny had said he had the answer. If it had been a vote, he would have voted Pauli guilty. Sonny was smiling at him. Don't worry, Clemenza is okay. It's Pauli. Michael could see that Tessio was relieved. As a fellow capo regime, his sympathy would be with Clemenza. Also, the present situation was not so serious if treachery did not reach so high. Tessio said cautiously, Then I can send my people home tomorrow? The day after tomorrow. I don't want anybody to know about this until then. Listen, I want to talk some family business with my brother, personal. Wait out in the living room, eh? We can finish our list later. You and Clemenza will work together on it. Sure. Tessio went out. How do you know for sure it's Pauly? We have people in the telephone company, and they track down all of Pauly's phone calls, in and out. Clemenza's, too. On a three days Pauly was sick this month, he got a call from a street booth across from the old man's building. Today, too. They were checking to see if Pauly was coming down or somebody was being sent down to take his place. Or for some other reason. It doesn't matter. Sonny shrugged. Thank God it was Pauly. We'll need Clemenza bad. Is it going to be an all-out war? Sonny's eyes were hard. That's how I'm going to play it as soon as Tom checks in. Until the old man tells me different. So why don't you wait until the old man can tell you? Sonny looked at him curiously. How the hell did you win those combat medals? We are under the gun, man. We gotta fight. I'm just afraid they won't let Tom go. Michael was surprised at this. Why not? Again, Sonny's voice was patient. They snatched Tom because they figured the old man was finished and they could make a deal with me and Tom would be the sit-down guy in the preliminary stages, carry the proposition. Now with the old man alive, they know I can't make a deal. So Tom's no good to them. They can turn him loose or dump him, depending how Salazzo feels. If they dump him, it would be just to show us they really mean business, trying to bulldoze us. What made Salazzo think he could get a deal with you? Sonny flushed, and he didn't answer for a moment. Then he said, We had a meeting a few months ago. Salazzo came to us with a proposition on drugs. The old man turned him down, but during the meeting I shot off my mouth a little. I showed I wanted a deal, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. If there's one thing the old man hammered into me, it's never to do a thing like that to let other people know there's a split of opinion in the family. So Salazzo figures he gets rid of the old man, I have to go in with him on the drugs. With the old man gone, the family power is cut at least in half. I would be fighting for my life anyway to keep all the businesses the old man got together. Drugs are the common thing. We should get into it. And his knocking off the old man is purely business, nothing personal. As a matter of business, I would go in with him. Of course, he would never let me get too close. He'd make sure I'd never get a clean shot at him, just in case. But he also knows that once I accepted the deal, the other families would never let me start a war a couple of years later just for revenge. Also, the Tatalia family is behind him. If they had gotten the old man, what would you have done? Salazzo is dead meat. I don't care what it costs. I don't care if we have to fight all the five families in New York. The Tatalia family is going to be wiped out. I don't care if we all go down together. That's not how Pop would have played it. Sonny made a violent gesture. I know I'm not the man he was, but I'll tell you this, and he'll tell you too. When it comes to real action, I can operate as good as anybody, short range. Salazzo knows that, and so do Clemenza and Tessio. I made my bones when I was 19, the last time the family had a war, and I was a big help to the old man, so I'm not worried now. And our family has all the horses in a deal like this. I just wish we could get contact with Luca. Is Luca that tough, like they say? Is he that good? Sonny nodded. He's in a class by himself. I'm going to send him after the three Tatalias. I'll get Salazzo myself. Michael shifted uneasily in his chair. He looked at his older brother. He remembered Sonny as being sometimes casually brutal, but essentially warm-hearted. A nice guy. It seemed unnatural to hear him talking this way. It was chilling to see the list of names he had scribbled down, men to be executed, as if he were some newly crowned Roman emperor. He was glad that he was not truly part of all this, 
that now his father lived, he did not have to involve himself in vengeance. He'd help out, answering the phone, running errands and messages. Sonny and the old man could take care of themselves, especially with Luca behind them. At that moment, they heard a woman scream in the living room. Oh, Christ, Michael thought. It sounded like Tom's wife. He rushed to the door and opened it. Everybody in the living room was standing, and by the sofa, Tom Hagen was holding Teresa close to him, his face embarrassed. Teresa was weeping and sobbing, and Michael realized that the scream he had heard had been her calling out her husband's name with joy. As he watched, Tom Hagen disentangled himself from his wife's arms and lowered her back onto the sofa. He smiled at Michael grimly. Glad to see you, Mike. Really glad. He strode into the office without another look at his still sobbing wife. He hadn't lived with the Corleone family ten years for nothing, Michael thought, with a queer flush of pride. Some of the old man had rubbed off on him, as it had on Sonny, and he thought, with surprise, even on himself. Chapter 5 It was nearly four o'clock in the morning as they all sat in the corner room office, Sonny, Michael, Tom Hagen, Clemenza, and Tessio. Teresa Hagen had been persuaded to go to her own home next door. Pauli Gatto was still waiting in the living room, not knowing that Tessio's men had been instructed not to let him leave or let him out of their sight. Tom Hagen relayed the deal Salazzo offered. He told how, after Salazzo had learned the Don still lived, it was obvious that he meant to kill Hagen. Hagen grinned. If I ever plead before the Supreme Court, I'll never plead better than I did with that goddamn Turk tonight. I told him I'd talk the family into the deal even though the Don was alive. I told him I could wrap you around my finger, Sonny, how we were buddies as kids. And don't get sore, but I let him get the idea that maybe you weren't too sorry about getting the old man's job, God forgive me. He smiled apologetically at Sonny, who made a gesture signifying that he understood that it was of no consequence. Michael, leaning back in his armchair with the phone at his right hand, studied both men. When Hagen had entered the room, Sonny had come rushing to embrace him. Michael realized with a faint twinge of jealousy that in many ways Sonny and Tom Hagen were closer than he himself could ever be to his own brother. Sonny said, Let's get down to business. We have to make plans. Take a look at this list me and Tessio made up. Tessio, give Clemenza your copy. Michael said, If we make plans, Freddy should be here. Freddy is no use to us. The doctor says he's in shock so bad he has to have complete rest. I don't understand that. Freddy was always a pretty tough guy. I guess seeing the old man gunned down was hard on him. He always thought the Don was God. It wasn't like you and me, Mike. Okay, leave Freddy out. Leave him out of everything. Absolutely everything. Now, Sonny, until this is all over, I think you should stay in the house. I mean, never leave it. You're safe here. Don't underrate Salazzo. He's got to be a pezza navante, a real 90 caliber. Is the hospital covered? Sonny nodded. The cops have it locked in, and I got my people there visiting Pop all the time. What do you think of that list, Tom? Hagen frowned down at the list of names. Jesus Christ, Sonny, you're really taking this personal. The Don would consider it a purely business dispute. Salazzo is the key. Get rid of Salazzo and everything falls in line. You don't have to go after the Tatalias. Sonny looked at his two capo regime. Tissio shrugged. It's tricky. Clemenza didn't answer at all. Sonny said to Clemenza, One thing we can take care of without discussion. I don't want Pauly around here anymore. Make that first on your list. The fat capo regime nodded. What about Luca? Salazzo didn't seem worried about Luca. That worries me. If Lucas sold us out, we're in real trouble. That's the first thing we have to know. Has anybody been able to get in touch with him? No. I've been calling him all night. Maybe he's shacked up. No, he never sleeps over with a broad. He always goes home when he's through. Mike, keep ringing his number until you get an answer. Michael dutifully picked up the phone and dialed. He could hear the phone ringing on the other end, but no one answered. Finally, he hung up. Keep trying every 15 minutes. Okay, Tom. You're the consigliere. How about some advice? What the hell do you think we should do? Hagen helped himself to the whiskey bottle on the desk. We negotiate with Salazzo until your father is in shape to take charge. We might even make a deal if we have to. When your father gets out of bed, he can settle the whole business without a fuss, and all the families will go along with him. You think I can't handle this guy, Salazzo? Tom Hagen looked him directly in the eye. Sonny, sure you can outfight him. The Corleone family has the power. You have Clemenza and Tessio here, and they can muster a thousand men if it comes to an all-out war. But at the end, there will be a shambles over the whole East Coast, and all the other families will blame the Corleones. We'll make a lot of enemies. And that's something your father never believed in. Michael, watching Sonny, thought he took this well. But Sonny said to Hagen, What if the old man dies? What do you advise then, consigliere? I know you won't do it. 
but I would advise you to make a real deal with Salazzo on the drugs. Without your father's political contacts and personal influence, the Corleone family loses half its strength. Without your father, the other New York families might wind up supporting the Titalias and Salazzo just to make sure there isn't a long, destructive war. If your father dies, make the deal. Then wait and see. Sonny was white-faced with anger. That's easy for you to say. It's not your father they killed. I was as good a son to him as you or Mike, maybe better. I'm giving you a professional opinion. Personally, I want to kill all those bastards. The emotion in his voice shamed Sonny. Ah, Christ, Tom, I didn't mean it that way. But he had, really. Blood was blood, and nothing else was its equal. Sonny brooded for a moment as the others waited in embarrassed silence. Then he sighed. Okay, we'll sit tight until the old man can give us the lead. But, Tom, I want you to stay inside the mall, too. Don't take any chances. Mike, you be careful, though I don't think even Salazzo would bring personal family into the war. Everybody would be against them then. But be careful. Tessio, you hold your people in reserve, but have them nosing around the city. Clemenza, after you settle the Pauli Gatto thing, you move your men into the house and the mall to replace Tessio's people. Tessio, you keep your men at the hospital, though. Tom, start negotiation over the phone or by messenger with Salazzo and the Tatayas the first thing in the morning. Mike, tomorrow you take a couple of Clemenza's people and go to Luca's house and wait for him to show up or find out where the hell he is. The crazy bastard might be going after Salazzo right now if he's heard the news. I can't believe he'd ever go against his Don, no matter what the Turk offered him. Hagen said reluctantly, Maybe Mike shouldn't get mixed up in this so directly. Right. Forget that, Mike. Anyway, I need you on the phone here in the house. That's more important. Michael didn't say anything. He felt awkward, almost ashamed. And he noticed Clemenza and Tessio with faces so carefully impassive that he was sure that they were hiding their contempt. He picked up the phone and dialed Luca Brasi's number and kept the receiver to his ear as it rang and rang. Chapter 6 Peter Clemenza slept badly that night. In the morning, he got up early and made his own breakfast of a glass of grappa, a thick slice of Genoa salami with a chunk of fresh Italian bread that was still delivered to his door as in the old days. Then he drank a great plain china mug filled with hot coffee that had been lashed with anisette. But as he padded about the house in his old bathrobe and red felt slippers, he pondered on the day's work that lay ahead of him. Last night, Sonny Corleone had made it very clear that Paul Gatto was to be taken care of immediately. It had to be today. Clemenza was troubled, not because Gatto had been his protege and had turned traitor. This did not reflect on the Capo Regime's judgment. After all, Pauli's background had been perfect. He came from a Sicilian family. He had grown up in the same neighborhood as the Corleone children, had indeed even gone to school with one of the sons. He had been brought up through each level in the proper manner. He had been tested and not found wanting. And then, after he had made his bones, he had received a good living from the family, a percentage of an east side book and a union payroll slot. Clemenza had not been unaware that Paul Gatto supplemented his income with freelance stick-ups, strictly against the family rules, but even this was a sign of the man's worth. The breaking of such regulations was considered a sign of high-spiritedness, like that shown by a fine racing horse fighting the reins. And Paulie had never caused trouble with his stick-ups. They had always been meticulously planned and carried out with a minimum of fuss and trouble, with no one ever getting hurt. A $3,000 Manhattan Garment Center payroll a small Chinaware factory payroll in the slums of Brooklyn. After all, a young man could always use some extra pocket money. It was all in the pattern. Who could ever foretell that Paul Gatto would turn traitor? What was troubling Peter Clemenza this morning was an administrative problem. The actual execution of Gatto was a cut-and-dried chore. The problem was, who should the Capo Regime bring up from the ranks to replace Gatto in the family? It was an important promotion, that to button man, one not to be handed out lightly. The man had to be tough, and he had to be smart. He had to be safe, not a person that would talk to the police if he got in trouble, one well saturated in the Sicilian's law of omerta, the law of silence. And then, what kind of a living would he receive for his new duties? Clemenza had several times spoken to the Don about better rewards for the all-important button man who was first in the front line when trouble arose, but the Don had put him off. If Pauli had been making more money, he might have been able to resist the blandishments of the wily Turk, Salazzo. Clemenza finally narrowed down the list of candidates to three men. The first was an enforcer who worked with the colored policy bankers in Harlem, a big, brawny brute of a man of great physical strength, 
a man with a great deal of personal charm who could get along with people and yet, when necessary, make them go in fear of him. But Clemenza scratched him off the list after considering his name for a half hour. This man got along too well with the black people, which hinted at some flaw of character. Also, he would be too hard to replace in the position he now held. The second name Clemenza considered and almost settled on was a hard-working chap who served faithfully and well in the organization. This man was the collector of delinquent accounts for family-licensed Shylocks in Manhattan. He had started off as a bookmaker's runner, but he was not quite yet ready for such an important promotion. Finally, he settled on Rocco Lampone. Lampone had served a short but impressive apprenticeship in the family. During the war, he had been wounded in Africa and had been discharged in 1943. Because of the shortage of young men, Clemenza had taken him on, even though Lampone was partially incapacitated by his injuries and walked with a pronounced limp. Clemenza had used him as a black market contact in the garment center and with government employees controlling OPA food stamps. From that, Lampone had graduated to troubleshooter for the whole operation. What Clemenza liked about him was his good judgment. He knew that there was no percentage in being tough about something that would only cost a heavy fine or six months in jail, small prices to pay for the enormous profits earned. He had the good sense to know that it was not an area for heavy threats, but light ones. He kept the whole operation in a minor key, which was exactly what was needed. Clemenza felt the relief of a conscientious administrator who has solved a knotty personnel problem. Yes, it would be Rocco Lampone who would assist for Clemenza planned to handle this job himself, not only to help a new, inexperienced man make his bones, but to settle a personal score with Pauli Gatto. Pauli had been his protege. He had advanced Pauli over the heads of more deserving and more loyal people. He had helped Pauli make his bones and furthered his career in every way. Pauli had not only betrayed the family, he had betrayed his padrone, Peter Clemenza. This lack of respect had to be repaid. Everything else was arranged. Pauli Gatto had been instructed to pick him up at three in the afternoon and to pick him up with his own car, nothing hot. Now, Clemenza took up the telephone and dialed Rocco Lampone's number. He did not identify himself. He simply said, Come to my house. I have an errand for you. He was pleased to note that, despite the early hour, Lampone's voice was not surprised or dazed with sleep, and he simply said, Okay. Good man. Clemenza added, no rush. Have your breakfast and lunch first before you come see me, but not later than two in the afternoon. There was another laconic OK on the other end, and Clemenza hung up the phone. He had already alerted his people about replacing Capo Regimi Tessio's people in the Corleone Mall, so that was done. He had capable subordinates and never interfered in a mechanical operation of that kind. He decided to wash his Cadillac. He loved the car. It gave him such a quiet, peaceful ride and its upholstery was so rich that he sometimes sat in it for an hour when the weather was good because it was more pleasant than sitting in the house. And it always helped him think when he was grooming the car. He remembered his father in Italy doing the same thing with donkeys. Clemenza worked inside the heated garage. He hated cold. He ran over his plans. You had to be careful with Polly. The man was like a rat. He could smell danger. And now, of course, despite being so tough, he must be shitting in his pants because the old man was still alive. He'd be as skittish as a donkey with ants up his ass. But Clemenza was accustomed to these circumstances, usual in his work. First, he had to have a good excuse for Rocco to accompany them. Second, he had to have a plausible mission for the three of them to go on. Of course, strictly speaking, this was not necessary. Paul Gatto could be killed without any of these frills. He was locked in. He could not run away. But Clemenza felt strongly that it was important to keep good working habits and never give away a fraction of a percentage point. You never could tell what might happen. And these matters were, after all, questions of life and death. As he washed his baby blue Cadillac, Peter Clemenza pondered and rehearsed his lines, the expressions of his face. He would be curt with Polly, as if displeased with him. With a man so sensitive and suspicious as Gatto, this would throw him off the track, or at least leave him uncertain. Undue friendliness would make him wary. But, of course, the curtness must not be too angry. It had to be rather an absent-minded sort of irritation. And why Lampone? Pauli would find that most alarming, especially since Lampone had to be in the rear seat. Pauli wouldn't like being helpless at the wheel with Lampone behind his head. Clemenza rubbed and polished the metal of his Cadillac furiously. It was going to be tricky, very tricky. For a moment he debated whether to recruit another man, but decided against it. Here he followed basic reasoning. 
In years to come, a situation might arise where it might be profitable for one of his partners to testify against him. If there were just one accomplice, it was one's word against the other. But the word of a second accomplice could swing the balance. No, they would stick to procedure. What annoyed Clemenza was that the execution had to be public, that is, the body was to be found. He would have much preferred having it disappear. Usual burying grounds were the nearby ocean or the swamplands of New Jersey on land owned by friends of the family or by other more complicated methods. But it had to be public so that embryo traitors would be frightened and the enemy warned that the Corleone family had by no means gone stupid or soft. Salazzo would be made wary by this quick discovery of his spy. The Corleone family would win back some of its prestige. It had been made to look foolish by the shooting of the old man. Clemenza sighed. The Cadillac gleamed like a huge blue steel egg, and he was nowhere near the solving of his problem. Then the solution hit him, logical and to the point. It would explain Rocco Lampone, himself and Pauli being together, and give them a mission of sufficient secrecy and importance. He would tell Pauli that their job today was to find an apartment in case the family decided to go to the mattresses. Whenever a war between the families became bitterly intense, the opponents would set up headquarters in secret apartments where the soldiers could sleep on mattresses scattered through the rooms. This was not so much to keep their families out of danger, their wives and little children, since any attack on non-combatants was undreamed of. All parties were too vulnerable to similar retaliation, but it was always smarter to live in some secret place where your everyday movements could not be charted, either by your opponents or by some police who might arbitrarily decide to meddle. And so, usually, a trusted capo regime would be sent out to rent a secret apartment and fill it with mattresses. That apartment would be used as a sally port into the city when an offensive was mounted. It was natural for Clemenza to be sent on such an errand. It was natural for him to take Gatto and Lamponi with him to arrange all the details, including the furnishing of the apartment. Also, Clemenza thought with a grin, Pauli Gatto had proved he was greedy, and the first thought that would pop into his head was how much he would get from Salazzo for this valuable intelligence. Rocco Lamponi arrived early, and Clemenza explained what had to be done and what their roles would be. Lamponi's face lit up with surprised gratitude, and he thanked Clemenza respectfully for the promotion allowing him to serve the family. Clemenza was sure he had done well. He clapped Lamponi on the shoulder and said, Hey, you'll get something better for your living after today. We'll talk about that later. You understand, the family now is occupied with more critical matters, more important things to do. Lamponi made a gesture that said he would be patient, knowing his reward was certain. Clemenza went to his den safe and opened it. He took out a gun and gave it to Lamponi. Use this one. They can never trace it. Leave it in the car with Pauli. When this job is finished, I want you to take your wife and children on a vacation to Florida. Use your own money now, and I'll pay you back later. Relax. Get the sun. Use the family hotel in Miami Beach so I'll know where I can get you when I want. Clemenza's wife knocked on the door of the den to tell him that Pauli Gatto had arrived. He was parked in the driveway. Clemenza led the way through the garage, and Lamponi followed him. When Clemenza got into the front seat with Gatto, he merely grunted in greeting, an exasperated look on his face. He looked at the wristwatch, as if he expected to find that Gatto was late. The ferret-faced button man was watching him intently, looking for a clue. He flinched a little when Lamponi got into the rear seat behind him and said, Rocco, sit on the other side. A big guy like you blocks up my rearview mirror. Lamponi shifted dutifully so that he was sitting behind Clemenza, as if such a request was the most natural thing in the world. Clemenza said sourly to Gatto, Damn, that's Sonny. He's running scared. He's already thinking of going to the mattresses. We have to find a place on the west side. Paulie, you and Rocco got a staff and supply it until the word comes down for the rest of the soldiers to use it. You know a good location? As he had expected, Gatto's eyes became greedily interested. Paulie had swallowed the bait, and because he was thinking how much the information was worth to Salazzo, he was forgetting to think about whether he was in danger. Also, Lamponi was acting his part perfectly, staring out the window in a disinterested, relaxed way. Clemenza congratulated himself on his choice. Gatto shrugged. I'd have to think about it. Clemenza grunted. Drive while you think. I want to get to New York today. Pauli was an expert driver, and traffic going into the city was light at this time in the afternoon. So the early winter darkness was just beginning to fall when they arrived. There was no small talk in the car. Clemenza directed Pauli to drive up to the Washington Heights section.
He checked a few apartment buildings and told him to park near Arthur Avenue and wait. He also left Rocco Lamponi in the car. He went into the Vera Mario restaurant and had a light dinner of veal and salad, nodding his hellos to some acquaintances. After an hour had gone by, he walked the several blocks to where the car was parked and entered it. Gatto and Lamponi were still waiting. Shit, they want us back in Long Beach. They got some other job for us now. Sonny says we can let this one go until later. Rocco, you live in the city. Can we drop you off? I have my car at your place. And my old lady needs it first thing in the morning. That's right. And you have to come back with us after all. Again on the ride back to Long Beach, nothing was said. On the stretch of road that led into the city, Clemenza said suddenly, Paulie, pull over. I gotta take a leak. From working together so long, Gatto knew the fat capo regime had a weak bladder. He had often made such a request. Gatto pulled the car off the highway onto the soft earth that led to the swamp. Clemenza climbed out of the car and took a few steps into the bushes. He actually relieved himself. Then, as he opened the door to get back into the car, he took a quick look up and down the highway. There were no lights. The road was completely dark. Clemenza said, Go ahead. A second later, the interior of the car reverberated with the report of a gun. Pauli Gatto seemed to jump forward, his body flinging against the steering wheel and then slumping over to the seat. Clemenza had stepped back hastily to avoid being hit with fragments of skull bone and blood. Rocco Lampone scrambled out of the back seat. He still held the gun, and he threw it into the swamp. He and Clemenza walked hastily to a car parked nearby and got in. Lampone reached underneath the seat and found the key that had been left for them. He started the car and drove Clemenza to his home. Then, instead of going back by the same route, he took the Jones Beach Causeway right on through to the town of Merrick and onto the Meadowbrook Parkway, until he reached the Northern State Parkway. He rode that to the Long Island Expressway, and then continued on to the Whitestone Bridge and through the Bronx to his home in Manhattan. Chapter 7 On the night before the shooting of Don Corleone, his strongest and most loyal and most feared retainer prepared to meet with the enemy. Luca Brasi had made contact with the forces of Salazzo several months before. He had done so on the orders of Don Corleone himself. He had done so by frequenting the nightclubs controlled by the Tataglia family and by taking up with one of their top call girls. In bed with this call girl, he grumbled about how he was held down in the Corleone family, how his worth was not recognized. After a week of this affair with the call girl, Luca was approached by Bruno Tataglia, manager of the nightclub. Bruno was the youngest son and ostensibly not connected with the family business of prostitution. But his famous nightclub with its dancing line of long-stemmed beauties was the finishing school for many of the city hookers. The first meeting was all above board, Tatalia offering him a job to work in the family business as enforcer. The flirtation went on for nearly a month. Luca played his role of man infatuated with a young, beautiful girl. Bruno Tatalia the role of a businessman, trying to recruit an able executive from a rival. At one such meeting, Luca pretended to be swayed, then said, but one thing must be understood. I will never go against the Godfather. Don Corleone is a man I respect. I understand that he must put his sons before me in the family business. Bruno Tataglia was one of the new generation, with a barely hidden contempt for the old mustache peats, like Luca Brasi, Don Corleone, and even his own father. He was just a little too respectful. Now, he said... My father wouldn't expect you to do anything against the Corleones. Why should he? Everybody gets along with everybody else now. It's not like the old days. It's just that if you're looking for a new job, I can pass along the word to my father. There's always need for a man like you in our business. It's a hard business, and it needs hard men to keep it running smooth. Let me know if you ever make up your mind. Luca shrugged. It's not so bad where I'm at. And so they left it. The general idea had been to lead the Tatalias to believe that he knew about the lucrative narcotics operation and that he wanted a piece of it freelance. In that fashion, he might hear something about Salazza's plans, if the Turk had any, or whether he was getting ready to step on the toes of Don Corleone. After waiting for two months with nothing else happening, Luca reported to the Don that obviously Salazzo was taking his defeat graciously. The Don had told him to keep trying, but merely as a sideline, not to press it. Luca had dropped into the nightclub the evening before Don Corleone's being shot. Almost immediately, Bruno Tataglia had come to his table and sat down. I have a friend who wants to talk to you. Bring him over. I'll talk to any friend of yours. No, he wants to see you in private. 
Who is he? Just a friend of mine. He wants to put a proposition to you. Can you meet him later on tonight? Sure. What time and where? The club closes at four in the morning. Why don't you meet in here while the waiters are cleaning up? They knew his habits, Luca thought. They must have been checking him out. He usually got up about three or four in the afternoon and had breakfast, and then amused himself by gambling with cronies in the family or had a girl. Sometimes he saw one of the midnight movies, and then would drop in for a drink at one of the clubs. He never went to bed before dawn, so the suggestion of a 4 a.m. meeting was not as outlandish as it seemed. Sure, sure. I'll be back at four. He left the club and caught a cab to his furnished room on 10th Avenue. He boarded with an Italian family to which he was distantly related. His two rooms were separated from the rest of their railroad flat by a special door. He liked the arrangement because it gave him some family life and also protection against surprise where he was most vulnerable. The sly Turkish fox was going to show his bushy tail, Luca thought. If things went far enough, if Salazzo committed himself tonight, maybe the whole thing could be wound up as a Christmas present for the Don. In his room, Luca unlocked the trunk beneath the bed and took out a bulletproof vest. It was heavy. He undressed and put it on over his woolen underwear, then put his shirt and jacket over it. He thought for a moment of calling the Don's house at Long Beach to tell him of this new development, but he knew the Don never talked over the phone to anyone, and the Don had given him this assignment in secret, and so did not want anyone, not even Hagen or his eldest son, to know about it. Luca always carried a gun. He had a license to carry a gun, probably the most expensive gun license ever issued any place, any time. It had cost a total of $10,000, but it would keep him out of jail if he was frisked by the cops. As a top executive operating official of the family, he rated the license. But tonight, just in case he could finish off the job, he wanted a safe gun, one that could not possibly be traced. But then, thinking the matter over, he decided that he would just listen to the proposition tonight and report back to the godfather, Don Corleone. He made his way back to the club, but he did not drink anymore. Instead, he wandered out to 48th Street, where he had a leisurely late supper at Patsy's, his favorite Italian restaurant. When it was time for his appointment, he drifted uptown to the club entrance. The doorman was no longer there when he went in. The hat check girl was gone. Only Bruno Tattaglia waited to greet him and lead him to the deserted bar at the side of the room. Before him he could see the desert of small tables with the polished yellow wood dance floor gleaming like a small diamond in the middle of them. In the shadows was the empty bandstand. Out of it grew the skeleton metal stalk of a microphone. Luca sat at the bar, and Bruno Tattaglia went behind it. Luca refused the drink offered to him and lit a cigarette. It was possible that this would turn out to be something else, not the Turk. But then he saw Salazzo emerge out of the shadows at the far end of the room. Salazzo shook his hand and sat at the bar next to him. Tatalia put a glass in front of the Turk, who nodded his thanks. Salazzo asked, Do you know who I am? Luca nodded. He smiled grimly. The rats were being flushed out of their holes. It would be his pleasure to take care of this renegade Sicilian. Do you know what I am going to ask of you? Luca shook his head. There's big business to be made. I mean millions for everybody at the top level. On a first shipment, I can guarantee you fifty thousand dollars. I'm talking about drugs. It's a common thing. Why come to me? You want me to talk to my Don? Salazzo grimaced. I've already talked to the Don. He wants no part of it. All right, I can do without him. But I need somebody strong to protect the operation physically. I understand you're not happy with your family. You might make a switch. Luca shrugged. If the offer's good enough. Salazzo had been watching him intently and seemed to have come to a decision. Think about my offer for a few days and then we'll talk again. He put out his hand, but Luca pretended not to see it and busied himself putting a cigarette in his mouth. Behind the bar, Bruno Tattaglia made a lighter appear magically and held it to Luca's cigarette. And then he did a strange thing. He dropped the lighter on the bar and grabbed Luca's right hand, holding it tight. Luca reacted instantly his body slipping off the bar stool and trying to twist away. But Salazzo had grabbed his other hand at the wrist. Still, Luca was too strong for both of them and would have broken free, except that a man stepped out of the shadows behind him and threw a thin silken cord around his neck. The cord pulled tight, choking off Luca's breath. His face became purple, the strength in his arms drained away. 
Tatalia and Salazzo held his hands easily now, and they stood there curiously childlike as the man behind Luca pulled the cord around Luca's neck tighter and tighter. Suddenly, the floor was wet and slippery. Luca's sphincter, no longer under control, opened. The waist of his body spilled out. There was no strength in him anymore, and his legs folded. His body sagged. Salazzo and Tatalia let his hands go, and only the strangler stayed with the victim, sinking to his knees to follow Luca's falling body, drawing the cord so tight that it cut into the flesh of the neck and disappeared. Luca's eyes were bulging out of his head, as if in the utmost surprise, and this surprise was the only humanity remaining to him. He was dead. Salazzo said, I don't want him found. It's important that he not be found right now. He turned on his heel and left, disappearing back into the shadows. Chapter 8 The day after the shooting of Don Corleone was a busy time for the family. Michael stayed by the phone, relaying messages to Sonny. Tom Hagen was busy trying to find a mediator satisfactory to both parties so that a conference could be arranged with Salazzo. The Turk had suddenly become cagey. Perhaps he knew that the family button men of Clemenza and Tessio were ranging far and wide over the city in an attempt to pick up his trail. But Salazzo was sticking close to his hideout, as were all top members of the Tatalia family. This was expected by Sonny, an elementary precaution he knew the enemy was bound to take. Clemenza was tied up with Pauli Gatto. Tessio had been given the assignment of trying to track down the whereabouts of Luca Brasi. Luca had not been home since the night before the shooting, a bad sign. But Sonny could not believe that Brasi had either turned traitor or had been taken by surprise. Mama Corleone was staying in the city with friends of the family so that she could be near the hospital. Carlo Rizzi, the son-in-law, had offered his services, but had been told to take care of his own business that Don Corleone had set him up in, a lucrative bookmaking territory in the Italian section of Manhattan. Connie was staying with her mother in town so that she, too, could visit her father in the hospital. Freddy was still under sedation in his own room of his parents' house. Sonny and Michael had paid him a visit and had been astonished at his paleness, his obvious illness. When they left Freddy's room, Sonny said to Michael, Christ, he looks like he got plugged worse than the old man. Michael shrugged. He had seen soldiers in the same condition on the battlefield, but he had never expected it to happen to Freddy. He remembered the middle brother as being physically the toughest one in the family when all of them were kids. But he had also been the most obedient son to his father. This is the end of disc number three. Please insert disc number four. This is disc number four. When they left Freddy's room, Sonny said to Michael, Christ. He looks like he got plugged worse than the old man. Michael shrugged. He had seen soldiers in the same condition on the battlefield, but he had never expected it to happen to Freddy. He remembered the middle brother as being physically the toughest one in the family when all of them were kids. But he had also been the most obedient son to his father. And yet everyone knew that the Don had given up on this middle son ever being important to the business. He wasn't quite smart enough, and failing that, not quite ruthless enough. He was too retiring a person, did not have enough force. Late in the afternoon, Michael got a call from Johnny Fontaine in Hollywood. Sonny took the phone. Nah, Johnny, no use coming back here to see the old man. He's too sick and it would give you a lot of bad publicity. And I know the old man wouldn't like that. Wait until he's better and we can move him home, then come see him. Okay. Now I'll give him your regards. Sonny hung up the phone. He turned to Michael. That'll make Pop happy that Johnny wanted to fly from California to see how he was. Late that afternoon, Michael was called to the listed phone in the kitchen by one of Clemenza's men. It was Kay. Is your father all right? Her voice was a little strained, a little unnatural. Michael knew that she couldn't quite believe what had happened, that his father really was what the newspapers called a gangster. He'll be okay. Can I come with you when you visit him in the hospital? Michael laughed. She had remembered him telling her how important it was to do such things if you wanted to get along with the old Italians. This is a special case. If the newspaper guys get a hold of your name and background, you'll be on page three of the Daily News. Girl from old Yankee family mixed up with son of a big mafia chief. How would your parents like that? My parents never read the Daily News. Again, there was an awkward pause, and then she said, 
You're okay, aren't you, Mike? You're not in any danger. Mike laughed again. Uh, I'm known as the sissy of the Corleone family. No threat. So they don't have to bother coming after me. Now it's all over, Kay. There won't be any more trouble. It was all sort of an accident, anyway. I'll explain when I see you. When will that be? Michael pondered. How about late tonight? We'll have a drink and supper in your hotel, and then I'll go to the hospital and see my old man. I'm getting tired of hanging around here answering phones. Okay? But don't tell anybody. I don't want newspaper photographers snapping pictures of us together. No kidding, Kay. It's damn embarrassing. Especially for your parents. All right. I'll be waiting. Can I do any Christmas shopping for you, or anything else? No. Just be ready. She gave a little excited laugh. I'll be ready. Aren't I always? Yes, you are. That's why you're my best girl. I love you. Can you say it? Michael looked at the four hoods sitting in the kitchen. No. Tonight, okay? Okay. He hung up. Clemenza had finally come back from his day's work and was bustling around the kitchen, cooking up a huge pot of tomato sauce. Michael nodded to him and went to the corner office, where he found Hagen and Sonny waiting for him impatiently. Is Clemenza out there? Michael grinned. He's cooking up spaghetti for the troops, just like the army. Tell him to cut out that crap and come on in here. I have more important things for him to do. Get Tessio in here with him. In a few minutes, they were all gathered in the office. Sonny said curtly to Clemenza, You take care of him? Clemenza nodded. You won't see him anymore. With a slight electric shock, Michael realized they were talking about Polly Gatto, and the little Polly was dead, murdered by that jolly wedding dancer, Clemenza. Sonny asked Hagen, Do you have any luck with Salazzo? Hagen shook his head. He seems to have cooled off on the negotiation idea. Anyway, he doesn't seem to be too anxious. Or maybe he's just being very careful so that our button men won't nail him. Anyway, I haven't been able to set up a top-notch go-between you'll trust. But he must know he has to negotiate now. He missed his chance when he let the old man get away from him. He's a smart guy. The smartest our family ever came up against. Maybe he figured we're just stalling until the old man gets better or we can get a line on him. Hagen shrugged. Sure, he figures that. But he still has to negotiate. He has no choice. I'll get it set up tomorrow, that's certain. One of Clemenza's men knocked on the office door and then came in. He said to Clemenza, It just came over the radio. The cops found Policado, dead in his car. Clemenza nodded and said to the man, Don't worry about it. The button man gave his capo regime an astonished look, which was followed by a look of comprehension before he went back to the kitchen. The conference went on as if there had been no interruption. Sonny asked Hagen, Any change in Adon's condition? Hagen shook his head. He's okay, but he won't be able to talk for another couple of days. He's all knocked out, still recovering from the operation. Your mother spends most of the day with him. Connie, too. There's cops all over the hospital, and Tessio's men hang around, too, just in case. In a couple of days, he'll be all right, and then we can see what he wants us to do. Meanwhile, we have to keep Salazzo from doing anything rash. That's why I want to start you talking deals with him. Sonny grunted. Until he does, I've got Clemenza and Tessio looking for him. Maybe we'll get lucky and solve the whole business. You won't get lucky. Salazzo is too smart. Hagen paused. He knows once he comes to the table, he'll have to go our way, mostly. That's why he's stalling. I'm guessing he's trying to line up support from the other New York families so that we won't go after him when the old man gives us the word. Sonny frowned. Why the hell should they do that? To avert a big war which hurts everybody and brings the papers and government into the act. Also, Salazzo will give him a piece of the action. And you know how much dough there is in drugs. The Corleone family doesn't need it. We have the gambling, which is the best business to have. But the other families are hungry. Salazzo's a proven man. They know he can make the operation go on a big scale. Alive, he's money in their pockets. Daddy's trouble. Sonny's face was as Michael had never seen it. The heavy, cupid mouth and bronzed skin seemed gray. I don't give a fuck what they want. They better not mess in this fight. Clemenza and Tessio shifted uneasily in their chairs. Infantry leaders who hear their general rave about storming an impregnable hill, no matter what the cost. Hagen said a little impatiently, Come on, Sonny, your father wouldn't like you thinking that way. You know what he always says. That's a waste. Sure, we're not going to let anybody stop us if the old man says we go after Salazzo. But this is not a personal thing. This is business. If we go after the Turk and the families interfere, we'll negotiate the issue. If the families see that we're determined to have Salazzo, they'll let us. The Don will make concessions in other areas to square things. But don't go blood crazy on a thing like this. It's business. Even the shooting of your father was business, not personal. You should know that by now. Sonny's eyes were still hard. Okay, I understand all that. Just so long as you understand that nobody stands in our way when we want Salazzo. 
Sonny turned to Tessio. Any leads on Luca? Tessio shook his head. None at all. Salazzo must have snatched him. Salazzo wasn't worried about Luca, which struck me as funny. He's too smart not to worry about a guy like Luca. I think he maybe got him out of the picture, one way or the other. Christ, I hope Luca isn't fighting against us. That's the one thing I'd be afraid of. Clemenza, Tessio, how do you two guys figure it? Anybody could go wrong. Look at Paulie. But with Luca, he was a man who could only go one way. The Godfather was the only thing he believed in, the only man he feared. But not only that, Sonny, he respected your father as no one else respected him, and the Godfather has earned respect from everyone. No, Luca would never betray us. And I find it hard to believe that a man like Salazzo, no matter how cunning, could surprise Luca. He was a man who suspected everyone and everything. He was always ready for the worst. I think maybe he just went off someplace for a few days. We'll be hearing from him any time now. Sonny turned to Tessio. The Brooklyn Capo Regime shrugged. Any man could turn traitor. Luca was very touchy. Maybe the Don offended him some way. That could be. I think, though, that Salazzo gave him a little surprise. That fits in with what the Consigliere says. We should expect the worst. Sonny said to all of them, Salazzo should get the word soon about Pauli Gatto. How will that affect them? It'll make them think. He'll know the Corleone family are not fools. He will realize that he was very lucky yesterday. That wasn't luck. Salazzo was planning that for weeks. They must have tailed the old man to his office every day and watched his routine. Then they bought Pauli off and maybe Luca. They snatched Tom right on the button. They did everything they wanted to do. They were unlucky, not lucky. Those button men they hired weren't good enough, and the old man moved too quick. If they had killed him, I would have had to make a deal, and Salazzo would have won. For now. I would have waited, maybe, and got him five, ten years from now. But don't call him lucky, Pete. That's underrating him. And we've done that too much lately. One of the button men brought a bowl of spaghetti in from the kitchen, and then some plates, forks, and wine. They ate as they talked. Michael watched in amazement. He didn't eat, neither did Tom. But Sonny, Clemenza, and Tessio dug in, mopping up sauce with crusts of bread. It was almost comical. They continued their discussion. Tessio didn't think that the loss of Poligato would upset Salazzo. In fact, he thought that the Turk might have anticipated it, indeed might have welcomed it. A useless mouth off the payroll. And he would not be frightened by it. After all, would they be in such a situation? Michael spoke up diffidently. I know I'm an amateur in this, but from everything you guys have said about Salazzo, plus the fact that all of a sudden he's out of touch with Tom, I guess he has an ace up his sleeve. He might be ready to pull off something real tricky that would put him back on top. Now, if we could figure out what that would be, we'd be in the driver's seat. Yeah, I thought of that. And the only thing I can figure is Luca. The word is already out that he's to be brought here before he's allowed any of his old rights in the family. The only other thing I can think of is that Salazzo has made his deal with the families in New York, and we'll get the word tomorrow that they will be against us in a war. That we'll have to give the Turk his deal. Right, Tom? Hagen nodded. That's what it looks like to me. And we can't move against that kind of opposition without your father. He's the only one who can stand against the families. He has the political connections they always need, and he can use them for the trading. If he wants to badly enough. Clemenza said a little arrogantly for a man whose top button man had recently betrayed him. Salazzo will never get near this house, boss. You don't have to worry about that. Sonny looked at him thoughtfully for a moment. Then he said to Tessio, How about the hospital? Your men got it covered? For the first time during the conference, Tessio seemed to be absolutely sure of his ground. Outside and inside. Right around the clock. The cops have it covered pretty good, too. Detectives at the bedroom door waiting to question the old man. <laughs> That's a laugh. The Don is still getting that stuff in the tubes, no food, so we don't have to worry about the kitchen, which would be something to worry about with those Turks. They believe in poison. They can't get at the Don. Not in any way. Sonny tilted back in his chair. It wouldn't be me. They have to do business with me. They need the family machine. He grinned at Michael. I wonder if it's you. Maybe Salazzo figures to snatch you and hold you for a hostage to make a deal. Michael thought ruefully, there goes my date with Kay. Sonny wouldn't let him out of the house. But Hagen said impatiently, No, he could have snatched Mike any time if he wanted insurance. But everybody knows that Mike is not in the family business. He's a civilian, and if Salazzo snatches him, then he loses all the other New York families. Even the Tatalias would have to help hunt him down. No, it's simple enough. 
Tomorrow we'll get a representative from all the families who will tell us we have to do business with a Turk. That's what he's waiting for. That's his ace in the hole. Michael heaved a sigh of relief. Good. I have to go into town tonight. Why? Michael grinned. I figure I'll drop into the hospital, visit the old man, see Mom and Connie, and I got some other things to do. Like the Don, Michael never told his real business, and now he didn't want to tell Sonny he was seeing Kay Adams. There was no reason not to tell him. It was just habit. There was a loud murmur of voices in the kitchen. Clemenza went out to see what was happening. When he came back, he was holding Luca Brasi's bulletproof vest in his hands. Wrapped in the vest was a huge, dead fish. Turk has heard about his spy, Pauli Gatto. And now we know about Luca Brasi. Sonny lit a cigar and took a shot of whiskey. Michael, bewildered, said, What the hell does that fish mean? It was Hagen, the Irisher, the consigliere, who answered him. The fish means that Luca Brasi is sleeping on the bottom of the ocean. It's an old Sicilian message. Chapter 9 When Michael Corleone went into the city that night, it was with a depressed spirit. He felt that he was being enmeshed in the family business against his will, and he resented Sonny using him even to answer the phone. He felt uncomfortable being on the inside of the family councils, as if he could be absolutely trusted with such secrets as murder. And now going to see Kay, he felt guilty about her also. He had never been completely honest with her about his family. He had told her about them, but always with little jokes and colorful anecdotes that made them seem more like adventurers in a Technicolor movie than what they really were. And now his father had been shot down in the street, and his eldest brother was making plans for murder. That was putting it plainly and simply but that was never how he would tell it to Kay. He had already said his father being shot was more like an accident and that all the trouble was over. Hell, it looked like it was just beginning. Sonny and Tom were off-center on this guy Salazzo. They were still underrating him, even though Sonny was smart enough to see the danger. Michael tried to think what the Turk might have up his sleeve. He was obviously a bold man, a clever man, a man of extraordinary force. You had to figure him to come up with a real surprise. But then... Sonny and Tom and Clemenza and Tessio were all agreed that everything was under control, and they all had more experience than he did. He was the civilian in this war, Michael thought wryly, and they'd have to give him a hell of a lot better medals than he'd gotten in World War II to make him join this one. Thinking this made him feel guilty about not feeling more sympathy for his father. His own father shot full of holes. And yet, in a curious way, Michael, better than anyone else, understood when Tom had said it was just business not personal. That his father had paid for the power he had wielded all his life, the respect he had extorted from all those around him. What Michael wanted was out, out of all this, to lead his own life. But he couldn't cut loose from the family until the crisis was over. He had to help in a civilian capacity. With sudden clarity, he realized that he was annoyed with the role assigned to him, that of the privileged non-combatant, the excused conscientious objector. That was why the word civilian kept popping into his skull in such an irritating way. When he got to the hotel, Kay was waiting for him in the lobby. A couple of Clemenza's people had driven him into town and dropped him off at a nearby corner after making sure they were not followed. They had dinner together and some drinks. What time are you going to visit your father? Michael looked at his watch. Visiting hours end at 8.30. I think I'll go after everybody has left. They'll let me up. He has a private room and his own nurses, so I can just sit with him for a while. I don't think he can talk yet, or even know if I'm there, but I have to show respect. I feel so sorry for your father. He seemed like such a nice man at the wedding. I can't believe the things the papers are printing about him. I'm sure most of it's not true. I don't think so either. He was surprised to find himself so secretive with Kay. He loved her. He trusted her. But he would never tell her anything about his father or the family. She was an outsider. What about you? Are you going to get mixed up in this gang war the papers are talking about so gleefully? Michael grinned, unbuttoned his jacket, and held it wide open. Look, no guns. Kay laughed. It was getting late, and they went up to their room. She mixed a drink for both of them and sat on his lap as they drank. Beneath her dress, she was all silk until his hand touched the glowing skin of her thigh. They fell back on the bed together and made love with all their clothes on, their mouths glued together. When they were finished, they lay very still, feeling the heat of their bodies burning through their garments. Kay murmured, Is that what you soldiers call a quickie? Yeah. It's not bad. 
They dozed off until Michael suddenly started up anxiously and looked at his watch. Dan, it's nearly ten. I have to get down to the hospital. He went to the bathroom to wash up and comb his hair. Kay came in after him and put her arms around his waist from behind. When are we going to get married? Whenever you say. As soon as this family thing quiets down and my old man gets better. I think you'd better explain things to your parents, though. What should I explain? Michael ran the comb through his hair. Just say that you've met a brave, handsome guy of Italian descent, top marks at Dartmouth, distinguished service cross during the war, plus the Purple Heart, honest, hard-working, but his father is a mafia chief who has to kill bad people, sometimes bribe high government officials, and in his line of work gets shot full of holes himself. But that has nothing to do with his honest, hard-working son. You think he remember all that? Kay let go his body and leaned against the door of the bathroom. Is he really... Well, does he really... She paused. Kill people? Michael finished combing his hair. I don't really know. Nobody really knows. But I wouldn't be surprised. Before he went out the door, she asked, When will I see you again? Michael kissed her. I want you to go home and think things over in that little hick town of yours. I don't want you to get mixed up in this business in any way. After the Christmas holidays, I'll be back at school and we'll get together up in Hanover. Okay? Okay. She watched him go out the door, saw him wave before he stepped into the elevator. She had never felt so close to him, never so much in love. And if someone had told her she would not see Michael again until three years passed, she would not have been able to bear the anguish of it. When Michael got out of the cab in front of the French hospital, he was surprised to see that the street was completely deserted. When he entered the hospital, he was even more surprised to find the lobby empty. Damn it, what the hell were Clemenza and Tessio doing? Sure, they never went to West Point, but they knew enough about tactics to have outposts. A couple of their men should have been in the lobby, at least. Even the latest visitors had departed. It was almost 10.30 at night. Michael was tense and alert now. He didn't bother to stop at the information desk. He already knew his father's room number up on the fourth floor. He took the self-service elevator. Oddly enough, nobody stopped him until he reached the nurse's station on the fourth floor. But he strode right past her query and on to his father's room. There was no one outside the door. Where the hell were the two detectives who were supposed to be waiting around to guard and question the old man? Where the hell were Tessio and Clemenza's people? Could there be someone inside the room? But the door was open. Michael went in. There was a figure in the bed, and by the December moonlight, straining through the window, Michael could see his father's face. Even now it was impassive. The chest heaved shallowly with his uneven breath. Tubes hung from steel gallows beside the bed and ran into his nose. On the floor was a glass jar receiving the poisons emptied from his stomach by other tubes. Michael stayed there for a few moments to make sure his father was all right, then backed out of the room. He told the nurse, My name is Michael Corleone. I just want to sit with my father. But what happened to the detectives who were supposed to be guarding him? The nurse was a pretty young thing with a great deal of confidence in the power of her office. Oh, your father just had too many visitors. It interfered with the hospital service. The police came and made them all leave about ten minutes ago, and then just five minutes ago I had to call the detectives to the phone for an emergency alarm from their headquarters, and then they left too. But don't worry, I look in on your father often, and I can hear any sound from his room. That's why we leave the doors open. Thank you. I'll sit with him for a little while, okay? She smiled at him. Just for a little bit, and then I'm afraid you'll have to leave. It's the rules, you know. Michael went back into his father's room. He took the phone from its cradle and got the hospital operator to give him the house in Long Beach, the phone in the corner office room. Sonny answered. Sonny, I'm down at the hospital. I came down late. Sonny, there's nobody here. None of Tessio's people, no detectives at the door. The old man was completely unprotected. His voice was trembling. There was a long silence, and then Sonny's voice came, low and impressed. This is Salazzo's move you were talking about. That's what I figured, too. But how did he get the cops to clear everybody out, and where did they go? What happened to Tessio's men? Jesus Christ, has that bastard Salazzo got the New York Police Department in his pocket, too? Take it easy, kid. Sonny's voice was soothing. We got lucky again with you going to visit the hospital so late. Stay in the old man's room. Lock the door from the inside. I'll have some men there inside of 15 minutes, soon as I make some calls. Just sit tight and don't panic. Okay, kid? I won't panic. For the first time since it had all started, he felt a furious anger rising in him, a cold hatred for his father's enemies. He hung up the phone and rang the buzzer for the nurse. He decided to use his own judgment and disregard Sonny's orders. When the nurse came in, he said, 
I don't want you to get frightened, but we have to move my father right away to another room or another floor. Can you disconnect all these tubes so we can wheel the bed out? Well, that's ridiculous. We have to get permission from the doctor. Michael spoke very quickly. You've read about my father in the papers. You've seen that there's no one here tonight to guard him. Now, I've just gotten word some men will come into the hospital to kill him. Please believe me and help me. He could be extraordinarily persuasive when he wanted to be. We don't have to disconnect the tubes. We can wheel the stand with the bed. Do you have an empty room? At the end of the hall. It was done in a matter of moments, very quickly and very efficiently. Stay here with him until help comes. If you're outside at your station, you might get hurt. At that moment, he heard his father's voice from the bed, hoarse but full of strength. Michael? Is it you? What happened? What is it? Michael leaned over the bed. He took his father's hand in his. It's Mike. Don't be afraid. Now listen, don't make any noise at all, especially if somebody calls out your name. Some people want to kill you, understand? But I'm here, so don't be afraid. Don Corleone, still not fully conscious of what had happened to him the day before, in terrible pain, yet smiled benevolently on his youngest son, wanting to tell him, but it was too much effort. Why should I be afraid now? Strange men have come to kill me ever since I was twelve years old. Chapter 10 The hospital was small and private, with just one entrance. Michael looked through the window down into the street. There was a curved courtyard that had steps leading down into the street, and the street was empty of cars. But whoever came into the hospital would have to come through that entrance. He knew he didn't have much time, so he ran out of the room and down the four flights and through the wide doors of the ground floor entrance. Off to the side, he saw the ambulance yard, and there was no car there, no ambulances either. Michael stood on the sidewalk outside the hospital and lit a cigarette. He unbuttoned his coat and stood in the light of a lamppost so that his features could be seen. A young man was walking swiftly down from Ninth Avenue, a package under his arm. The young man wore a combat jacket and had a heavy shock of black hair. His face was familiar when he came under the lamplight, but Michael could not place it. But the young man stopped in front of him and put out his hand, saying in a heavy Italian accent, Don Michael, do you remember me? Enzo, the baker's helper to Nazarene at the Penitera, his son-in-law. Your father saved my life by getting the government to let me stay in America. Michael shook his hand. He remembered him now. I've come to pay my respects to your father. Will they let me into the hospital so late? Michael smiled and shook his head. No, but thanks anyway. I'll tell the Don you came. A car came roaring down the street, and Michael was instantly alert. Leave here quickly. There may be trouble. You don't want to get involved with the police. He saw the look of fear on the young Italian's face. Trouble with the police might mean being deported or refusal of citizenship. But the young man stood fast. He whispered in Italian, If there's trouble, I'll stay to help. I owe it to the Godfather. Michael was touched. He was about to tell the young man to go away again, but then he thought, why not let him stay? Two men in front of the hospital might scare off any of Salazzo's crew sent to do a job. One man almost certainly would not. He gave Enzo a cigarette and lit it for him. They both stood under the lamppost in the cold December night. The yellow panes of the hospital, bisected by the greens of Christmas decorations, twinkled down on them. They had almost finished their cigarettes when a long, low, black car turned into 30th Street from 9th Avenue and cruised toward them, very close to the curb. It almost stopped. Michael peered to see their faces inside, his body flinching involuntarily. The car seemed about to stop, then speeded forward. Somebody had recognized him. Michael gave Enzo another cigarette and noticed that the baker's hands were shaking. To his surprise, his own hands were steady. They stayed in the street, smoking, for what was no more than ten minutes, when suddenly the night air was split by a police siren. A patrol car made a screaming turn from Ninth Avenue and pulled up in front of the hospital. Two more squad cars followed right behind it. Suddenly, the hospital entranceway was flooded with uniformed police and detectives. Michael heaved a sigh of relief. Good old Sonny must have gotten through right away. He moved forward to meet them. Two huge, burly policemen grabbed his arms. Another frisked him. A massive police captain, gold braid on his cap, came up the steps, his men parting respectfully to leave a path. He was a vigorous man for his girth, and despite the white hair that peeked out of his cap, his face was beefy red. He came up to Michael. I thought I got all you guinea hoods locked up. Who the hell are you and what are you doing here? One of the cops standing beside Michael said, Here's Clayne, Captain. Michael didn't answer. 
He was studying this police captain, coldly searching his face, the metallic blue eyes. A detective in plain clothes said, That's Michael Corleone, the Don's son. What happened to the detectives who were supposed to be guarding my father? Who pulled him off that detail? The police captain was choleric with rage. You fucking hood! Who the hell are you to tell me my business? I pulled him off. I don't give a shit how many Dago gangsters kill each other. If it was up to me, I wouldn't lift a finger to keep your old man from getting knocked off. Now get the hell out of here. Get out of this street, you punk, and stay out of this hospital when it's not visiting hours. Michael was still studying him intently. He was not angry at what this police captain was saying. His mind was racing furiously. Was it possible that Salazzo had been in that first car and had seen him standing in front of the hospital? Was it possible that Salazzo had then called this captain and said, How come the Corleone's men are still around the hospital when I paid you to lock them up? Was it possible that all had been carefully planned, as Sonny had said? Everything fitted in. Still cool, he said to the captain, I'm not leaving this hospital until you put guards around my father's room. The captain didn't bother answering. He said to the detective standing behind him, Phil, lock this punk up. The kid is clean, Captain. He's a war hero. He's never been mixed up in the rackets. The papers could make us stink. The captain started to turn on the detective, his face red with fury. God damn it, I said lock him up! Michael, still thinking clearly, not angry, said with deliberate malice, How much is the Turk paying you to set my father up, Captain? The police captain turned to him. He said to the two burly patrolmen, Hold him! Michael felt his arms pinned to his sides. He saw the captain's massive fist arching toward his face. He tried to weave away, but the fist caught him high on the cheekbone. A grenade exploded in his skull, his mouth filled with blood and small, hard bones that he realized were his teeth. He could feel the side of his head puff up as if it were filling with air. His legs were weightless, and he would have fallen if the two policemen had not held him up. But he was still conscious. The plainclothes detective had stepped in front of him to keep the captain from hitting him again. Jesus Christ, Captain, you really hurt him. I didn't touch him. He attacked me and he fell. You understand that? He resisted arrest. Through a red haze, Michael could see more cars pulling up to the curb. Men were getting out. One of them he recognized as Clemenza's lawyer, who was now speaking to the police captain, suavely and surely. The Corleone family has hired a firm of private detectives to guard Mr. Corleone. These men with me are licensed to carry firearms, Captain. If you arrest them, you'll have to appear before a judge in the morning and tell him why. The lawyer glanced at Michael. Do you want to prefer charges against whoever did this to you? Michael had trouble talking. His jaws wouldn't come together, but he managed to mumble. I slipped. I sl slipped and fell. He saw the captain give him a triumphant glance, and he tried to answer that glance with a smile. At all costs, he wanted to hide the delicious, icy chilliness that controlled his brain, the surge of wintry, cold hatred that pervaded his body. He wanted to give no warning to anyone in this world as to how he felt at this moment, as the Don would not. Then he felt himself carried into the hospital, and he lost consciousness. When he woke up in the morning, he found that his jaw had been wired together, and that four of his teeth along the left side of his mouth were missing. Hagen was sitting beside his bed. Did they drug me up? Yeah. They had to dig some bone fragments out of your gums, and they figured it'd be too painful. Besides, you were practically out anyway. Is there anything else wrong with me? No. Sonny wants you out at the Long Beach house. Think you can make it? Sure. Is it done all right? Hagen flushed. I think we've solved the problem now. We have a firm of private detectives, and we have the whole area loaded. I'll tell you more when we get in the car. Clemenza was driving. Michael and Hagen sat in the back. Michael's head throbbed. So what the hell really happened last night? Did you guys ever find out? Sonny has an inside man, that Detective Phillips, who tried to protect you. He gave us the scoop. The police captain, McCluskey, is a guy who's been on the take very heavy ever since he's been a patrolman. Our family has paid him quite a bit, and he's greedy and untrustworthy to do business with. But Salazzo must have paid him a big price. McCluskey had all Tessio's men around and in the hospital arrested, right after visiting hours. It didn't help that some of them were carrying guns. Then McCluskey pulled the official guard detectives off the Don's door, claimed he needed them and that some other cops were supposed to go over and take their place, but they got their assignments bollocksed. Baloney. He was paid off to set the Don up. And Philip said he's the kind of guy who'll try it again. So Lotso must have given him a fortune for openers and promised him the moon to come. Was Mike getting hurt in the papers? No, we kept that quiet. Nobody wants that known. Not the cops, not us. Good. That boy... Enzo, get away. 
Yeah, he was smarter than you. When the cops came, he disappeared. He claims he stuck with you while Salatza's car went by. Is that true? Yeah. He's a good kid. He'll be taken care of. You feeling okay? His face was concerned. You look lousy. I'm okay. What was that police captain's name? McCluskey. By the way, it might make you feel better to know that the Corleone family finally got up on the scoreboard. Bruno Tatalia, four o'clock this morning. How come? I thought we were supposed to sit tight. Hagen shrugged. After what happened at the hospital, Sonny got hard. The button men are out all over New York and New Jersey. We made the list last night. I'm trying to hold Sonny in, Mike. Maybe you can talk to him. This whole business can still be settled without a major war. I'll talk to him. Is there a conference this morning? Yeah. Salazzo finally got in touch and wants to sit down with us. A negotiator is arranging the details. That means we win. Salazzo knows he's lost and he wants to get out with his life. Hagen paused. Maybe he thought we were soft, ready to be taken because we didn't strike back. Now with one of the Tatalia sons dead, he knows we mean business. He really took an awful gamble bucking the Don. By the way, we got the confirmation on Luca. They killed him the night before they shot your father. In Bruno's nightclub. Imagine that. No wonder they got him off guard. At the houses in Long Beach, the entrance to the mall was blocked by a long black car parked across its mouth. Two men leaned against the hood of the car. The two houses on each side, Michael noticed, had opened windows on their upper floors. Christ, Sonny must really mean business. Clemenza parked the car outside the mall, and they walked inside it. The two guards were Clemenza's men, and he gave them a frown of greeting that served as a salute. The men nodded their heads in acknowledgment. There were no smiles, no greetings. Clemenza led Hagen and Michael Corleone into the house. The door was opened by another guard before they rang. He had obviously been watching from a window. They went to the corner office and found Sonny and Tessio waiting for them. Sonny came to Michael, took his younger brother's head in his hands. Beautiful, beautiful. Michael knocked his hands away and went to the desk and poured himself some scotch, hoping it would dull the ache in his wired jaw. The five of them sat around the room, but the atmosphere was different than their earlier meetings. Sonny was gayer, more cheerful, and Michael realized what that gaiety meant. There were no longer any doubts in his older brother's mind. He was committed, and nothing would sway him. The attempt by Salazzo the night before was the final straw. There could no longer be any question of a truce. Sonny said to Hagen, We got a call from the negotiator while you were gone. The Turk wants a meeting now. Sonny laughed. The ball's on that son of a bitch. After he crapped out last night, he wants a meeting today or the next day. Meanwhile, we're supposed just to lay back and take everything he dishes out. What fucking nerve? What did you answer? Sonny grinned. I said, sure, why not? Anytime he says, I'm in no hurry. I've got a hundred button men out on the street, 24 hours a day. If Salazzo shows one hair on his asshole, he's dead. Let them take all the time they want. Was there a definite proposal? Yeah. He wants us to send Mike to meet him to hear his proposition. The negotiator guarantees Mike's safety. Salazzo doesn't ask us to guarantee his safety. He knows he can't ask that. No point. So the meeting will be arranged on his side. His people will pick Mike up and take Mike to the meeting place. Mike will listen to Salazzo and then they'll turn him loose. But the meeting place is secret. The promise is the deal will be so good we can't turn it down. What about the Tatalias? What will they do about Bruno? That's part of the deal. The negotiator says the Tatalia family has agreed to go along with Salazzo. They'll forget about Bruno Tatalia. He pays for what they did to my father. One cancels out the other. Sonny laughed again. The nervy bastards. We should hear what they have to say. Sonny shook his head from side to side. No, no, consigliere, not this time. His voice held a faint trace of Italian accent. He was consciously mocking his father just to kid around. No more meetings. No more discussions. No more Salazzo tricks. When the negotiator gets in touch with us again for our answer... I want you to give him one message. I want Salazzo. If not, it's all out war. We'll go to the mattresses and we'll put all the button men out on the street. Business will just have to suffer. The other families won't stand for an all out war. It puts too much heat on everybody. Sonny shrugged. They have a simple solution. Give me Salazzo. Or fight the Corleone family. Sonny paused, then said roughly, No more advice on how to patch it up, Tom. The decision is made. Your job is to help me win. Understand? 
Hagen bowed his head. He was deep in thought for a moment. Then he said, I spoke to your contact in the police station. He says that Captain McCluskey is definitely on Salazzo's payroll and for big money. Not only that, but McCluskey is going to get a piece of the drug operation. McCluskey has agreed to be Salazzo's bodyguard. The Turk doesn't poke his nose out of his hole without McCluskey. When he meets Mike for the conference, McCluskey will be sitting beside him, in civilian clothes but carrying his gun. Now what you have to understand, Sonny, is that while Salazzo is guarded like this, he's invulnerable. Nobody has ever gunned down a New York police captain and gotten away with it. The heat in this town would be unbearable, what with the newspapers, the whole police department, the churches, everything. That would be disastrous. The families would be after you. The Corleone family would become outcasts. Even the old man's political protection would run for cover, so take that into consideration. Sonny shrugged. McCluskey can't stay with the Turk forever. We'll wait. Tissio and Clemenza were puffing on their cigars uneasily, not daring to speak, but sweating. It would be their skins that would go on the line if the wrong decision was made. Michael spoke for the first time. He asked Hagen, Can the old man be moved out of the hospital under the mall here? Hagen shook his head. That's the first thing I asked. Impossible. He's in very bad shape. He'll pull through, but he needs all kinds of attention. Maybe some more surgery. Impossible. Then you have to get Salazzo right away. We can't wait. The guy's too dangerous. He'll come up with some new idea. Remember, the key is still that he gets rid of the old man. He knows that. Okay, he knows that now it's very tough, so he's willing to take defeat for his life. But if he's going to get killed anyway, he'll have another crack at the Don. And with that police captain helping him, who knows what the hell might happen. We can't take that chance. We have to get Salazzo right away. Sonny was scratching his chin thoughtfully. You're right, kid. You got right to the old nuts. We can't let Salazzo get another crack at the old man. What about Captain McCluskey? Sonny turned to Michael with an odd little smile. Yeah, kid. What about that tough police captain? Okay. It's an extreme. But there are times when the most extreme measures are justified. Let's think now that we have to kill McCluskey. The way to do it would be to have him heavily implicated so that it's not an honest police captain doing his duty, but a crooked police official mixed up in the rackets who got what was coming to him, like any crook. We have newspaper people on our payroll. We can give that story to them with enough proof so that they can back it up. That should take some of the heat off. How does that sound? Michael looked around deferentially to the others. Tessio and Clemenza had gloomy faces and refused to speak. Sonny said with the same odd smile, Go on, kid. You're doing great. Out of the mouths of infants, as Adon always used to say. Go ahead, Mike. Tell us more. Hagen was smiling, too, a little, and averting his head. Michael flushed. Well, they want me to go to a conference with Salazzo. It will be me, Salazzo, and McCluskey all on our own. Set up the meeting for two days from now. Then get our informers to find out where the meeting will be held. Insist that it has to be a public place that I'm not going to let them take me to any apartments or houses. Let it be a restaurant or a bar at the height of the dinner hour, something like that, so that I'll feel safe. They'll feel safe, too. Even Salazzo won't figure that we'll dare to gun the captain. They'll frisk me when I meet them, so I'll have to be clean then. Figure out a way you can get a weapon to me while I'm meeting them. Then I'll take both of them. All four heads turned and stared at him. Clemenza and Tessio were gravely astonished. Hagen looked a little sad, but not surprised. He started to speak and thought better of it. But Sonny, his heavy Cupid's face twitching with mirth, suddenly broke out in loud roars of laughter. It was deep belly laughter, not faking. He was really breaking up. He pointed a finger at Michael, trying to speak through gasps of mirth. You, the high-class college kid, you never wanted to get mixed up in a family business. Now you want to kill a police captain and a Turk just because you got your face smashed by McCluskey. You're taking it personal. It's just business and you're taking it personal. You want to kill these two guys just because you got slapped in the face? It was all a lot of crap. All these years it was just a lot of crap. Clemenza and Tessio, completely misunderstanding, thinking that Sonny was laughing at his young brother's bravado for making such an offer, were also smiling broadly and a little patronizingly at Michael. Only Hagen warily kept his face impassive. Michael looked around at all of them, then stared at Sonny, who still couldn't stop laughing. You'll take both of them? Hey, kid, they won't give you medals. 
They put you in the electric chair, you know that? This is no hero business, kid. You don't shoot people from a mile away. You shoot when you see the whites of their eyes like we got taught in school, remember? You gotta stand right next to them and blow their heads off, and their brains get all over your nice Ivy League suit. How about that, kid? You want to do that just because some dumb cop slapped you around? He was still laughing. Michael stood up. You better stop laughing. The change in him was so extraordinary that the smiles vanished from the faces of Clemenza and Tessio. Michael was not tall or heavily built, but his presence seemed to radiate danger. In that moment, he was a reincarnation of Don Corleone himself. His eyes had gone a pale tan, and his face was bleached of color. He seemed at any moment about to fling himself on his older and stronger brother. There was no doubt that if he had had a weapon in his hands, Sonny would have been in danger. Sonny stopped laughing, and Michael said to him in a cold, deadly voice, Don't you think I can do it, you son of a bitch? Sonny had got over his laughing fit. I know you can do it. I wasn't laughing at what you said. I was just laughing at how funny things turn out. I always said you were the toughest one in the family, tougher than Adon himself. You were the only one who could stand off the old man. I remember you when you were a kid. What a temper you had then. Hell, you even used to fight me, and I was a lot older than you. And Freddy had to beat the shit out of you at least once a week. And now Salazzo has you figured for the soft touch in the family, because you let McCluskey hit you without fighting back, and you wouldn't get mixed up in a family fight. He figures he got nothing to worry about if he meets you head to head. And McCluskey, too. He's got you figured for a yellow guinea. Sonny paused, and then said softly, But you're a Corleone after all, you son of a bitch. And I was the only one who knew it. I've been sitting here waiting for the last three days, ever since the old man got shot, waiting for you to crack out of that Ivy League war hero bullshit character you've been wearing. I've been waiting for you to become my right arm so we could kill those fucks that are trying to destroy our father and our family. And all it took was a sock on a jaw. How do you like that? Sonny made a comical gesture, a punch. How do you like that? The tension had relaxed in the room. Mike shook his head. Sonny, I'm doing it because it's the only thing to do. I can't give Salazzo another crack at the old man. I seem to be the only one who could get close enough to him, and I figured it out. I don't think you can get anybody else to knock off a police captain. Maybe you would do it, Sonny, but you have a wife and kids and you have to run the family business until the old man is in shape. So that leaves me and Freddy. Freddy is in shock and out of action. Finally, that leaves just me. It's all logic. This sack on the jaw has nothing to do with it. Sonny came over and embraced him. I don't give a damn what your reasons are, just so long as you're with us now. And I'll tell you another thing. You're right all the way. Tom, what's your say? Hagen shrugged. The reasoning is solid. What makes it so is that I don't think the Turk is sincere about a deal. I think he'll still try to get at the Don. Anyway, on his past performance, that's how we have to figure him. So we try to get Salazzo. We get him even if we have to get the police captain. But whoever does the job is going to get an awful lot of heat. Does it have to be Mike? I could do it. Hagen shook his head impatiently. Salazzo wouldn't let you get within a mile of him if he had ten police captains. And besides, you're the acting head of the family. You can't be risked. Hagen paused and said to Clemenza and Tessio, Do either one of you have a top button man, someone really special, who would take on this job? He wouldn't have to worry about money for the rest of his life. Clemenza spoke first. Nobody that Solotso wouldn't know would catch on right away. He'd catch on if me or Tessio went too. What about somebody really tough who hasn't made his rep yet? A good rookie. Both Capo Regimes shook their heads. Tessio smiled to take the sting out of his words. That's like bringing a guy up from the minors to pitch a World Series. It has to be Mike, for a million different reasons. Most important, they got him down as faggy. And he can do the job. I guarantee that. And that's important because this is the only shot we'll get at that sneaky bastard Turk. So now we have to figure out the best way to back him up. Tom, Clemenza, Tessio... Find out where Salazzo will take him for the conference. I don't care how much it costs. When we find that out, we can figure out how we can get a weapon into his hands. Clemenza, I want you to get him a really safe gun out of your collection. The coldest one you got. Impossible to trace. Try to make it short barrel with a lot of blasting power. It doesn't have to be accurate. 
He'll be right on top of him when he uses it. Mike, as soon as you've used the gun, drop it on the floor. Don't be caught with it on you. Clemenza, tape the barrel and the trigger with that special stuff you got so he won't leave prints. Remember, Mike, we can square everything, witnesses and so forth. But if they catch you with the gun on you, we can't square that. We'll have transportation and protection, and then we'll make you disappear for a nice long vacation until the heat wears off. You'll be gone a long time, Mike, but I don't want you saying goodbye to your girlfriend or even calling her. After it's all over and you're out of the country, I'll send her word that you're okay. Those are orders. Now stick with Clemenza and get used to handling the gun he picks out for you. Maybe even practice a little. We'll take care of everything else. Everything. Okay, kid? Again, Michael Corleone felt that delicious, refreshing chilliness all over his body. You didn't have to give me that crap about not talking to my girlfriend about something like this. What the hell did you think I was going to do? Call her up to say goodbye? Okay, but you're still a rookie, so I spell things out. Forget it. With a grin, Michael said. What the hell do you mean, a rookie? I listened to the old man just as hard as you did. How do you think I got so smart? They both laughed. Hagen poured drinks for everyone. He looked a little glum. The statesman forced to go to war. The lawyer forced to go to law. Well, anyway, now we know what we're going to do. Chapter 11 Captain Mark McCluskey sat in his office, fingering three envelopes bulging with betting slips. He was frowning and wishing he could decode the notations on the slips. It was very important that he do so. The envelopes were the betting slips that his raiding parties had picked up when they had hit one of the Corleone family bookmakers the night before. Now, the bookmaker would have to buy back the slips so that players couldn't claim winners and wipe him out. It was very important for Captain McCloskey to decode the slips because he didn't want to get cheated when he sold the slips back to the bookmaker. If there was 50 grand worth of action, then maybe he could sell it back for 5 grand. But if there were a lot of heavy bets and the slips represented 100 grand or maybe even 200 grand, then the price should be considerably higher. McCluskey fiddled with the envelope and then decided to let the bookie sweat a little bit and make the first offer. That might tip off what the real price should be. McCluskey looked at the station house clock on the wall of his office. It was time for him to pick up that greasy Turk, Salazzo, and take him to wherever he was going to meet the Corleone family. McCluskey went over to his wall locker and started to change into his civilian clothes. When he was finished, he called his wife and told her he would not be home for supper that night, that he would be out on the job. He never confided in his wife on anything. She thought they lived the way they did on his policeman's salary. McCluskey grunted with amusement. His mother had thought the same thing, but he had learned early. His father had shown him the ropes. His father had been a police sergeant, and every week father and son had walked through the precinct, and McCluskey Sr. had introduced his six-year-old son to the storekeepers, saying, and this is my little boy. The storekeepers would shake his hand and compliment him extravagantly and ring open their cash registers to give the little boy a gift of five or ten dollars. At the end of the day, little Mark McCluskey would have all the pockets of his suit stuffed with paper money, would feel so proud that his father's friends liked him well enough to give him a present every month they saw him. Of course, his father put the money in the bank for him, for his college education, and little Mark got at most a fifty-cent piece for himself. Then, when Mark got home and his policeman uncles asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up and he would lisp childishly, a policeman, they would all laugh uproariously. And of course, later on, though his father wanted him to go to college first, he went right from high school to studying for the police force. He had been a good cop, a brave cop. The tough young punks terrorizing street corners fled when he approached and finally vanished from his beat altogether. He was a very tough cop and a very fair one. He never took his son around to the storekeepers to collect his money presents for ignoring garbage violations and parking violations. He took the money directly into his own hand, direct because he felt he earned it. He never ducked into a movie house or goofed off into restaurants when he was on foot patrol, as some of the other cops did, especially on winter nights. He always made his rounds. He gave his stores a lot of protection, a lot of service. When winos and drunks filtered up from the Bowery to panhandle on his beat, he got rid of them so roughly that they never came back. The tradespeople in his precinct appreciated it, and they showed their appreciation. He also obeyed the system. The bookies in his precinct knew he would never make trouble to get an extra payoff for himself, that he was content for his share of the station house bag. His name was on the list with the others, and he never tried to make extras. He was a fair cop who took only clean graft 
and his rise in the police department was steady, if not spectacular. During this time, he was raising a large family of four sons, none of whom became policemen. They all went to Fordham University, and since by that time Mark McCluskey was rising from sergeant to lieutenant and finally to captain, they lacked for nothing. It was at this time that McCluskey got the reputation for being a hard bargainer. The bookmakers in his district paid more protection money than the bookmakers in any other part of the city. But maybe that was because of the expense of putting four boys through college. McCluskey himself felt there was nothing wrong with clean graft. Why the hell should his kids go to CCNY or a cheap southern college just because the police department didn't pay its people enough money to live on and take care of their families properly with? He protected all these people with his life, and his record showed his citations for gun duels with stick-up men on his beat. Strong-arm protection guys would be pimps. He had hammered them into the ground. He had kept his little corner of the city safe for ordinary people, and he sure as hell was entitled to more than his lousy one C-note a week. But he wasn't indignant about his low pay. He understood that everybody had to take care of themselves. Bruno Tatalia was an old friend of his. Bruno had gone to Fordham with one of his sons. And then Bruno had opened his nightclub, and whenever the McCluskey family spent an infrequent night on the town, they could enjoy the cabaret with liquor and dinner on the house. On New Year's Eve, they received engraved invitations to be guests of the management, and always received one of the best tables. Bruno always made sure they were introduced to the celebrities who performed in his club some of them famous singers and Hollywood stars. Of course, sometimes he asked a little favor, like getting an employee with a record cleared for a cabaret work license, usually a pretty girl with a police dossier as a hustler or roller. McCluskey would be glad to oblige. McCluskey made it a policy never to show that he understood what other people were up to. When Salazzo had approached him with a proposition to leave old man Corleone uncovered in the hospital, McCluskey didn't ask why. He asked price. When Salazzo said ten grand, McCluskey knew why. He didn't hesitate. Corleone was one of the biggest mafia men in the country with more political connections than Capone had ever had. Whoever knocked him off would be doing the country a big favor. McCluskey took the money in advance and did the job. When he received a call from Salazzo that there were still two of Corleone's men in front of the hospital, he had flown into a rage. He had locked up all of Tessio's men. He had pulled the detective guards off the door of Corleone's hospital room. And now, being a man of principle, he would have to give back the ten grand money he had already earmarked to ensure the education of his grandchildren. It was in that rage that he had gone to the hospital and struck Michael Corleone. But it had all worked out for the best. He had met with Salazzo in the Tatalia nightclub, and they had made an even better deal. Again, McCluskey didn't ask questions, since he knew all the answers. He just made sure of his price. It never occurred to him that he himself could be in any danger, that anyone would consider, even for a moment, killing a New York City police captain was too fantastic. The toughest hood in the Mafia had to stand still if the lowliest patrolman decided to slap him around. There was absolutely no percentage in killing cops, because then, all of a sudden, a lot of hoods were killed resisting arrest or escaping the scene of a crime, and who the hell was going to do anything about that? McCluskey sighed and got ready to leave the station house. Problems, always problems. His wife's sister in Ireland had just died after many years of fighting cancer, and that cancer had cost him a pretty penny. Now the funeral would cost him more. His own uncles and aunts in the old country needed a little help now and then to keep their potato farms, and he sent the money to do the trick. He didn't begrudge it, and when he and his wife visited the old country, they were treated like a king and queen. Maybe they would go again this summer, now that the war was over, and with all this extra money coming in. McCluskey told his patrolman clerk where he would be if he was needed. He did not feel it necessary to take any precautions. He could always claim Salazzo was an informer he was meeting. Outside the station house, he walked a few blocks and then caught a cab to the house where he would meet with Salazzo. It was Tom Hagen who had to make all the arrangements for Michael's leaving the country. His false passport, his seaman's card, his berth on an Italian freighter that would dock in a Sicilian port. Emissaries were sent that very day by plane to Sicily to prepare a hiding place with the Mafia chief in the hill country. Sonny arranged for a car and an absolutely trustworthy driver to be waiting for Michael when he stepped out of the restaurant where the meeting would be held with Salazzo. The driver would be Tessio himself, who had volunteered for the job. It would be a beat-up-looking car, but with a fine motor. It would have phony license plates, and the car itself would be untraceable. It had been saved for a special job requiring the best. Michael spent the day with Clemenza, practicing with a small gun that would be gotten to him. It was a twenty-two filled with soft-nosed bullets that made pinpricks going in and left insulting, gaping holes when they exited from the human body. 
he found that it was accurate up to five of his steps away from a target. After that, the bullets might go anywhere. The trigger was tight, but Clemenza worked on this with some tools so that it pulled easier. They decided to leave it noisy. They didn't want an innocent bystander misunderstanding the situation and interfering out of ignorant courage. The report of the gun would keep them away from Michael. Clemenza kept instructing him during the training session. Drop the gun as soon as you finish using it. Just let your hand drop to your side and the gun slip out. Nobody will notice. Everybody will think you're still armed. They'll be staring at your face. Walk out of the place very quickly, but don't run. Don't look anybody directly in the eye, but don't look away from them either. Remember, they'll be scared of you. Believe me, they'll be scared of you. Nobody will interfere. As soon as you're outside, Tessio will be in the car waiting for you. Get in and leave the rest to him. Don't be worried about accidents. You'd be surprised how well these affairs go. Now, put this hat on and let's see how you look. He clapped a gray fedora on Michael's head. Michael, who never wore a hat, grimaced. Clemenza reassured him. It helps against identification, just in case. Mostly, it gives witnesses an excuse to change their identification when we make them see the light. Remember, Mike, don't worry about prints. The button trigger affixed with special tape. Don't touch any other part of the gun. Remember that. Has Sonny found out where Salazzo has taken me? Clemenza shrugged. Not yet. Salazzo's being very careful. But don't worry about him harming you. The negotiator stays in our hands until you come back safe. If anything happens to you, the negotiator pays. Why the hell should he stick his neck out? He gets a big fee. A small fortune. Also, he is an important man in the families. He knows Salazzo can't let anything happen to him. Your life is not worth the negotiator's life to Salazzo. Very simple. You'll be safe, all right. We're the ones who catch hell afterwards. How bad will it be? Very bad. It means an all-out war with the Tatalia family against the Corleone family. Most of the others will line up with the Tatalias. The sanitation department will be sweeping up a lot of dead bodies this winter. He shrugged. These things have to happen once every ten years or so. Gets rid of the bad blood. And then, if we let him push us around on the little things, they want to take over everything. You got to stop them at the beginning, like they should have stopped Hitler at Munich. They should never let him get away with that. They were just asking for big trouble when they let him get away with that. Michael had heard his father say the same thing before, only in 1939, before the war actually started. If the families had been running the State Department, there would never have been World War II, he thought with a grin. They drove back to the mall and to the Don's house, where Sonny still made his headquarters. Michael wondered how long Sonny could stay cooped up in the safe territory of the mall. Eventually, he would have to venture out. They found Sonny taking a nap on the couch. On the coffee table was the remains of his late lunch, scraps of steak and breadcrumbs, and a half-empty bottle of whiskey. His father's usually neat office was taking on the look of a badly kept furnished room. Michael shook his brother awake and said, Why don't you stop living like a bum and get this place cleaned up? Sonny yawned. What the hell are you, inspecting the barracks? Mike, we haven't got the word yet where they plan to take you, those bastards Salazzo and McCloskey. If we don't find that out, how the hell are we going to get that gun to you? Can I carry it on me? Maybe they won't frisk me. Then even if they do, maybe they'll miss it if we're smart enough. Then even if they find it, so what? They'll just take it off me, no harm done. Sonny shook his head. Nah, we have to make this a sure hit on that bastard Salazzo. Remember, get him first if you possibly can. McCluskey is slower and dumber. You should have plenty of time to take him. Did Clemenza tell you to be sure to drop the gun? A million times. Sonny got up from the sofa and stretched. How does your jaw feel, kid? Well, I was... The left side of his face ached, except those parts that felt numb because of the drugged wire holding it together. He took the bottle of whiskey from the table and swigged directly from it. The pain eased. Easy, Mike. Now is no time to get slowed up by booze. Oh, Christ, Sonny, stop playing the big brother. I've been in combat against tougher guys in Salazzo and under worse conditions. Where the hell are his mortars? Has he, has he got air cover? Heavy artillery? Landmines? He's just a wise son of a bitch with a big wheel cop sidekick. Once anybody makes up their mind to kill him, there's no other problem. That's the hard part, making up your mind. They'll never know what hit them. Tom Hagen came into the room. He greeted them with a nod and went directly to the falsely listed telephone. He called a few times and then shook his head at Sonny. Not a whisper. Salazzo is keeping it to himself as long as he can. The phone rang. Sonny answered it, and he held up a hand as if to signal for quiet, though no one had spoken. He jotted some notes down on a pad, and then said, Okay, he'll be there, and hung up the phone. Sonny was laughing. 
That son of a bitch, Salazzo. He really is something. Here's the deal. At eight tonight, he and Captain McCluskey pick up Mike in front of Jack Dempsey's bar on Broadway. They go someplace to talk. And get this. Mike and Salazzo talk in Italian so that the Irish cop don't know what the hell they are talking about. He even tells me, don't worry. He knows McCluskey doesn't know one word in Italian unless it's soldi. And he's checked you out, Mike, and knows you can understand Sicilian dialect. I'm pretty rusty, but we won't talk long. We don't let Mike go until we have the negotiator. Is that arranged? Clemenza nodded. The negotiator's at my house playing pinochle with three of my men. They wait for a call from me before they let him go. Sonny sank back in the leather armchair. Now how the hell do we find out the meeting place? Tom, we've got informers with the Tatalia family. How come they haven't given us the word? Hagen shrugged. So Otso is really damn smart. He's playing this close to the vest, so close that he's not using any men as a cover. He figures the captain will be enough and that security is more important than guns. He's right, too. We'll have to put a tail on Mike and hope for the best. Sonny shook his head. Nah, anybody can lose a tail when they really want to. That's the first thing they'll check out. By this time, it was five in the afternoon. Sonny, with a worried look on his face, said, Maybe we should just let Mike blast whoever's in the car when it tries to pick him up. Hagen shook his head. What if Solazzo is not in the car? We've tipped our hand for nothing. Damn it, we have to find out where Solazzo is taking him. Clemenza put in. Maybe we should start trying to figure why he's making it such a big secret. Because it's a percentage. Why should he let us know anything if he can prevent it? Besides, he smells danger. He must be leery as hell, even with that police captain for his shadow. Hagen snapped his fingers. That detective, that guy Phillips. Why don't you give him a ring, Sonny? Maybe he can find out where the hell the captain can be reached. It's worth a try. McCluskey won't give a damn who knows where he's going. Sonny picked up the phone and dialed a number. He spoke softly into the phone, then hung up. He'll call us back. They waited for nearly another 30 minutes, and then the phone rang. It was Phillips. Sonny jotted something down on his pad and then hung up. His face was taut. I think we've got it. Captain McCluskey always has to leave word on where it can be reached. From 8 to 10 tonight, he'll be at the Luna Azur up in the Bronx. Anybody know it? I do. It's perfect for us. A small family place with big booths, where people can talk in private, good food. Everybody minds their own business. Perfect. He leaned over Sonny's desk and arranged stubbed-out cigarettes into map figures. This is the entrance. Mike, when you finish, just walk out and turn left. Then turn the corner. I'll spot you and put on my headlights and catch you on the fly. If you have any trouble, yell, and I'll try to come in and get you out. Clemenza, you gotta work fast. Send somebody up there to plant the gun. They got an old-fashioned toilet with a space between the water container and the wall. Have your man tape the gun behind there. Mike, after they frisk you in the car and find you're clean, they won't be too worried about you. In the restaurant, wait a bit before you excuse yourself. No, better still. Ask permission to go. Act a little in trouble first. Very natural. They can't figure anything. But when you come out again, don't waste any time. Don't sit down again at the table. Start blasting. And don't take chances. In the head, two shots apiece, and out as fast as your legs can travel. Sonny had been listening judiciously. He told Clemenza, I want somebody very good, very safe to plant that gun. I don't want my brother coming out of that toilet with just his dick in his hand. The gun will be there. Okay. Everybody get rolling. Tessio and Clemenza left. Tom Hagen said, Sonny, should I drive Mike down to New York? No, I want you here. When Mike finishes, then our work begins and I'll need you. Have you got those newspaper guys lined up? Hagen nodded. I'll be feeding them info as soon as things break. Sonny got up and came to stand in front of Michael. He shook his hand. Okay, kid. You're on. I'll square it with Mom you're not seeing her before you left. And I'll get a message to your girlfriend when I think the time is right, okay? Okay. How long do you think before I can come back? At least a year. The Don might be able to work faster than that, Mike, but don't count on it. The time element hinges on a lot of factors. How well we can plant stories with a newsman. How much the police department wants to cover up. How violently the other families react. There's going to be a hell of a lot of heat and trouble. That's the only thing we can be sure of. Michael shook Hagen's hand. Do your best. I don't want to do another three-year stretch away from home. It's not too late to back out, Mike. We can get somebody else. We can go back over our alternatives. Maybe it's not necessary to get rid of Salazzo. Michael laughed. We can talk ourselves into any viewpoint, but we figured it right the first time. I've been riding the gravy train all my life. About time I paid my dues. You shouldn't let that broken jaw influence you. 
McCluskey's a stupid man and it was business, not personal. For the second time, he saw Michael Corleone's face freeze into a mask that resembled uncannily the Don's. Tom, don't let anybody kid you. It's all personal, every bit of business. Every piece of shit every man has to eat every day of his life is personal. They call it business, okay, but it's personal as hell. You know where I learned that from? The Don, my old man, the Godfather. If a bolt of lightning hit a friend of his, the old man would take it personal. He took my going into the Marines personal. That's what makes him great. The great Don. He takes everything personal. Like God. He knows every feather that falls from the tail of a sparrow or however the hell it goes, right, huh? And you know something? Accidents don't happen to people who take accidents as a personal insult. So I came late. Okay, but I'm coming all the way. Damn right. I take that broken jaw personal. Damn right. I take so lots of trying to kill my father personal. He laughed. Tell the old man I learned it all from him. And then I'm glad I had this chance to pay him back for all he did for me. He was a good father. He paused, and then he said thoughtfully to Hagen, You know, I can never remember him hitting me. Or Sonny, or Freddy. And of course Connie, he wouldn't even yell at her. And tell me the truth, Tom. How many men do you figure the Don killed, or had killed? Tom Hagen turned away. I'll tell you one thing you didn't learn from him, talking the way you're talking now. There are things that have to be done, and you do them, and you never talk about them. You don't try to justify them. They can't be justified. You just do them. Then you forget it. Michael Corleone frowned. It's a conciliary. You agree that it's dangerous to the Don and our family to let Salazzo live? Yes. Okay. Then I have to kill him. Michael Corleone stood in front of Jack Dempsey's restaurant on Broadway and waited for his pickup. He looked at his watch. It said five minutes to eight. Salazzo was going to be punctual. Michael had made sure he was there in plenty of time. He'd been waiting fifteen minutes. All during the ride from Long Beach into the city, he'd been trying to forget what he had said to Hagen. For if he believed what he had said, then his life was set on an irrevocable course. And yet, could it be otherwise after tonight? He might be dead after tonight if he didn't stop all his crap, Michael thought grimly. He had to keep his mind on the business at hand. Salazzo was no dummy, and McCluskey was a very tough egg. He felt the ache in his wired jaw and welcomed the pain. It would keep him alert. Broadway wasn't that crowded on this cold winter night, even though it was near theater time. Michael flinched as a long black car pulled up to the curb, and the driver, leaning over, opened the front door and said, Get in, Mike. He didn't know the driver, a young punk with slick black hair and an open shirt, but he got in. In the back seat were Captain McCluskey and Salazzo. Salazzo reached a hand over the back of the seat, and Michael shook it. The hand was firm, warm, and dry. I'm glad you came, Mike. I hope we can straighten everything out. All this is terrible. It's not the way I wanted things to happen at all. It should never have happened. I hope we can settle things tonight. I don't want my father bothered anymore. He won't be. I swear to you by my children, he won't be. Just keep an open mind when we talk. I hope you're not a hothead like your brother, Sonny. It's impossible to talk business with him. Captain McCluskey grunted. Hey, he's a good kid. He's all right. He leaned over to give Michael an affectionate pat on the shoulder. I'm sorry about the other night, Mike. I'm getting too old for my job, too grouchy. I guess I'll have to retire pretty soon. Can't stand the aggravation. All day I get aggravation. You know how it is. Then, with a doleful sigh, he gave Michael a thorough frisk for a weapon. Michael saw a slight smile on the driver's lips. The car was going west with no apparent attempt to elude any trailers. It went up on the west side highway, speeding in and out of traffic. Anyone following would have had to do the same. Then, to Michael's dismay, it took the exit for the George Washington Bridge. They were going over to New Jersey. Whoever had given Sonny the info on where the meeting was to be held had given him the wrong dope. The car threaded through the bridge approaches and then was on it, leaving the blazing city behind. Michael kept his face impassive. Were they going to dump him into the swamps, or was it just a last-minute change in meeting place by the wily Salazzo? But when they were nearly all the way across, the driver gave the wheel a violent twist. The heavy automobile jumped into the air when it hit the divider and bounced over into the lanes going back to New York City. Both McCluskey and Salazzo were looking back to see if anyone had tried doing the same thing. The driver was really hitting it back to New York, and then they were off the bridge and going toward the East Bronx. They went through side streets with no cars behind them. By this time, it was nearly nine o'clock. They had made sure there was no one on their tail. 
Salazzo lit up a cigarette after offering his pack to McCluskey and Michael, both of whom refused. Salazzo said to the driver, Nice work. I'll remember it. Ten minutes later, the car pulled up in front of a restaurant in a small Italian neighborhood. There was no one on the streets, and because of the lateness of the hour, only a few people were still at dinner. Michael had been worried that the driver would come in with them, but he stayed outside with his car. The negotiator had not mentioned a driver. Nobody had. Technically, Salazzo had broken the agreement by bringing him along, but Michael decided not to mention it, knowing they would think he would be afraid to mention it, afraid of ruining the chances for the success of the parley. The three of them sat at the only round table, Salazzo refusing a booth. There were only two other people in the restaurant. Michael wondered whether they were Salazzo plants, but it didn't matter. Before they could interfere, it would be all over. McCluskey asked with real interest, Is the Italian food good here? Salazzo reassured him, Try the veal. It's the finest in New York. The solitary waiter had brought a bottle of wine to the table and uncorked it. He poured three glasses full. Surprisingly, McCluskey did not drink. I must be the only Irishman who don't take the booze. I've seen too many good people get in trouble because of the booze. Salazzo said placatingly to the captain, I am going to talk Italian to Mike. Not because I don't trust you, but because I can't explain myself properly in English. And I want to convince Mike that I mean well. But it's to everybody's advantage for us to come to an agreement tonight. Don't be insulted by this. It's not that I don't trust you. Captain McCluskey gave them both an ironic grin. Sure. You two go right ahead. I'll concentrate on my veal and spaghetti. Salazzo began speaking to Michael in rapid Sicilian. You must understand that what happened between me and your father was strictly a business matter. I have a great respect for Don Corleone and would beg for the opportunity to enter his service. But you must understand that your father is an old-fashioned man. This is the end of disc number four. Please insert disc number five. This is disc number five. Salazzo began speaking to Michael in rapid Sicilian. You must understand that what happened between me and your father was strictly a business matter. I have a great respect for Don Corleone and would beg for the opportunity to enter his service. But you must understand that your father is an old-fashioned man. He stands in the way of progress. The business I am in is the coming thing, the wave of the future. There are untold millions of dollars for everyone to make. But your father stands in a way because of certain unrealistic scruples. By doing this, he imposes his will on men like myself. Yes, yes, I know. He says to me, go ahead, it's your business. But we both know that is unrealistic. We must tread on each other's corns. What he is really telling me is that I cannot operate my business. I am a man who respects himself and cannot let another man impose his will on me. So what had to happen, did happen. Let me say that I had the support, the silent support, of all the New York families. And the Tatalia family became my partners. If this quarrel continues, then the Corleone family will stand alone against everyone. Perhaps if your father were well, it could be done. But the eldest son is not the man the godfather is, no disrespect intended. And the Irish consigliere Hagen is not the man Jenko Abandando was, God rest his soul. So I propose a peace, a truce. Let us cease all hostilities until your father is well again and can take part in these bargainings. The Tatalia family agrees upon my persuasions and my indemnities to forego justice for the son Bruno. We will have peace. Meanwhile, I have to make a living and will do a little trading in my business. I do not ask your cooperation, but I ask you, the Corleone family, not to interfere. These are my proposals. I assume you have the authority to agree to make a deal. Michael said in Sicilian, Tell me more about how you propose to start your business, exactly what part my family has to play in it, and what profit we can take from this business. You want the whole proposition in detail, then? Most important of all, I must have sure guarantees that no more attempts will be made on my father's life. Salazzo raised his hand expressively. What guarantees can I give you? I'm the hunted one. 
I've missed my chance. You think too highly of me, my friend. I am not that clever. Michael was sure now that the conference was only to gain a few days' time, that Salazzo would make another attempt to kill the Don. What was beautiful was that the Turk was underrating him as a punk kid. Michael felt that strange, delicious chill filling his body. He made his face look distressed. What is it? The wine went right to my bladder. I've been holding it in. Is it all right if I go to the bathroom? Salazzo was searching his face intently with his dark eyes. He reached over and roughly thrust his hand in Michael's crotch, under it and around, searching for a weapon. Michael looked offended. I frisked him. I frisked thousands of young punks. He's clean. Salazzo didn't like it. For no reason at all, he didn't like it. He glanced at the man sitting at a table opposite them and raised his eyebrows toward the door of the bathroom. The man gave a slight nod that he had checked it, that there was nobody inside. Don't take too long. Salazzo had marvelous antennae. He was nervous. Michael got up and went into the bathroom. The urinal had a pink bar of soap in it, secured by a wire net. He went into the booth. He really had to go. His bowels were loose. He did it very quickly, then reached behind the enamel water cabinet until his hand touched the small, blunt-nosed gun fastened with tape. He ripped the gun loose, remembering that Clemenza had said not to worry about leaving prints on the tape. He shoved the gun into his waistband and buttoned his jacket over it. He washed his hands and wet his hair. He wiped his prints off the faucet with his handkerchief. Then he left the toilet. Salazzo was sitting directly facing the door of the toilet, his dark eyes blazing with alertness. Michael gave a smile. With a sigh of relief, he said, Now I can talk. Captain McCluskey was eating the plate of veal and spaghetti that had arrived. The man on the far wall had been stiff with attention. Now he too relaxed visibly. Michael sat down again. He remembered Clemenza had told him not to do this, to come out of the toilet and blaze away. But either out of some warning instinct or sheer funk, he had not done so. He had felt that if he had made one swift move, he would have been cut down. Now he felt safe. And he must have been scared, because he was glad he was no longer standing on his legs. They had gone weak with trembling. Salazzo was leaning toward him. Michael, his belly covered by the table, unbuttoned his jacket and listened intently. He could not understand a word the man was saying. It was literally gibberish to him. His mind was so filled with pounding blood that no word registered. Underneath the table, his right hand moved to the gun tucked into his waistband, and he drew it free. At that moment, the waiter came to take their order, and Salazzo turned his head to speak to the waiter. Michael thrust the table away from him with his left hand, and his right hand shoved the gun almost against Salazzo's head. The man's coordination was so acute that he had already begun to fling himself away at Michael's motion. But Michael, younger, his reflexes sharper, pulled the trigger. The bullet caught Salazzo squarely between his eye and his ear, and when it exited on the other side, blasted out a huge gout of blood and skull fragments onto the petrified waiter's jacket. Instinctively, Michael knew that one bullet was enough. Salazzo had turned his head in that last moment, and he had seen the light of life die in the man's eyes as clearly as a candle goes out. Only one second had gone by as Michael pivoted to bring the gun to bear on McCluskey. The police captain was staring at Salazzo with phlegmatic surprise, as if this had nothing to do with him. He did not seem to be aware of his own danger. His veal-covered fork was suspended in his hand, and his eyes were just turning on Michael. And the expression on his face, in his eyes, held such confident outrage, as if now he expected Michael to surrender or to run away, that Michael smiled at him as he pulled the trigger. This shot was bad, not mortal. It caught McCluskey in his thick, bull-like throat, and he started to choke loudly, as if he had swallowed too large a bite of the veal. Then the air seemed to fill with a fine mist of sprayed blood as he coughed it out of his shattered lungs. Very coolly, very deliberately, Michael fired the next shot through the top of his white-haired skull. The air seemed to be full of pink mist. Michael swung toward the man sitting against the wall. This man had not made a move. He seemed paralyzed. Now he carefully showed his hands on top of the table and looked away. The waiter was staggering back toward the kitchen, an expression of horror on his face, staring at Michael in disbelief. Salazzo was still in his chair, the side of his body propped up by the table. McCluskey, his heavy body pulling downward, had fallen off his chair onto the floor. Michael let the gun slip out of his hand so that it bounced off his body and made no noise. He saw that neither the man against the wall nor the waiter had noticed him dropping the gun. He strode the few steps toward the door and opened it. Salazzo's car was parked at the curb still, but there was no sign of the driver. Michael turned left and around the corner. 
Headlights flashed on, and a battered sedan pulled up to him, the door swinging open. He jumped in, and the car roared away. He saw that it was Tessio at the wheel, his trim features hard as marble. Did you do the job on Salazzo? For that moment, Michael was struck by the idiom Tessio had used. It was always used in a sexual sense. To do the job on a woman meant seducing her. It was curious that Tessio used it now. Both of them. Sure. I saw their brains. There was a change of clothes for Michael in the car. Twenty minutes later, he was on an Italian freighter slated for Sicily. Two hours later, the freighter put out to sea, and from his cabin, Michael could see the lights of New York City burning like the fires of hell. He felt an enormous sense of relief. He was out of it now. The feeling was familiar, and he remembered being taken off the beach of an island his Marine Division had invaded. The battle had been still going on, but he had received a slight wound and was being ferried back to a hospital ship. He had felt the same overpowering relief then that he felt now. All hell would break loose, but he wouldn't be there. On the day after the murder of Salazzo and Captain McCluskey, the police captains and lieutenants in every station house in New York City sent out the word. There would be no more gambling, no more prostitution, no more deals of any kind until the murderer of Captain McCluskey was caught. Massive raids began all over the city. All unlawful business activities came to a standstill. Later that day, an emissary from the families asked the Corleone family if they were prepared to give up the murderer. They were told that the affair did not concern them. That night, a bomb exploded in the Corleone family mall in Long Beach, thrown from a car that pulled up to the chain, then roared away. That night also, two button men of the Corleone family were killed as they peacefully ate their dinner in a small Italian restaurant in Greenwich Village. The Five Families War of 1946 had begun. Book Two, Chapter Twelve Johnny Fontaine waved a casual dismissal to the manservant. See you in the morning, Billy. The colored butler bowed his way out of the huge dining room, living room, with its view of the Pacific Ocean. It was a friendly goodbye sort of bow, not a servant's bow, and given only because Johnny Fontaine had company for dinner. Johnny's company was a girl named Sharon Moore, a New York City Greenwich Village girl in Hollywood to try for a small part in a movie being produced by an old flame who had made the big time. She had visited the set while Johnny was acting in the Waltz movie. Johnny had found her young and fresh and charming and witty and had asked her to come to his place for dinner this evening. His invitations to dinner were already famous and had the force of royalty, and of course, she said yes. Sharon Moore obviously expected him to come on very strong because of his reputation, but Johnny hated the Hollywood piece-of-meat approach. He never slept with any girl unless there was something about her he really liked, except, of course, sometimes when he was very drunk and found himself in bed with a girl he didn't even remember meeting or seeing before. And now that he was thirty-five years old, divorced once, estranged from his second wife, with maybe a thousand pubic scalps dangling from his belt, he simply wasn't that eager. But there was something about Sharon Moore that aroused affection in him, and so he had invited her to dinner. He never ate much, but he knew young pretty girls ambitiously starved themselves for pretty clothes and were usually big eaters on a date, so there was plenty of food on the table. There was also plenty of liquor. Champagne in a bucket, scotch, rye, brandy, and liqueurs on the sideboard. Johnny served the drinks and the plates of food already prepared. When they had finished eating, he led her into the huge living room with its glass wall that looked out onto the Pacific. He put a stack of Ella Fitzgerald records on the hi-fi and settled on the couch with Sharon. He made a little small talk with her, found out about what she had been like as a kid, whether she had been a tomboy or boy crazy, whether she had been homely or pretty, lonely or gay. He always found these details touching. It always evoked the tenderness he needed to make love. They nestled together on the sofa, very friendly, very comfortable. He kissed her on the lips, a cool, friendly kiss. And when she kept it that way, he left it that way. Outside the huge picture window, he could see the dark blue sheet of the Pacific lying flat beneath the moonlight. Sharon asked, How come you're not playing any of your records? Johnny smiled at her. He was amused by her teasing him. I'm not that Hollywood. Play some for me. Or sing for me. You know, like the movies. I'll bubble up and melt all over you just like those girls do on the screen. Johnny laughed outright. When he had been younger, he had done just such things, and the result had always been stagey. The girls trying to look sexy and melting, making their eyes swim with desire for an imagined fantasy camera. He would never dream of singing to a girl now. For one thing, he hadn't sung for months. He didn't trust his voice. For another thing, 
Amateurs didn't realize how much professionals depended on technical help to sound as good as they did. He could have played his records, but he felt the same shyness about hearing his youthful, passionate voice as an aging, balding man running to fat feels about showing pictures of himself as a youth in the full bloom of manhood. My voice is out of shape, and honestly, I'm sick of hearing myself sing. They both sip their drinks. I hear you're great in this picture. Is it true you did it for nothing? Just a token payment. He got up to give her a refill on her brandy glass, gave her a gold monogrammed cigarette, and flashed his lighter out to hold the light for her. She puffed on the cigarette and sipped her drink, and he sat down beside her again. His glass had considerably more brandy in it than hers. He needed it to warm himself, to cheer himself, to charge himself up. His situation was the reverse of the lover's usual one. He had to get himself drunk instead of the girl. The girl was usually too willing, where he was not. The last two years had been hell on his ego, and he used this simple way to restore it, sleeping with a young, fresh girl for one night, taking her to dinner a few times, giving her an expensive present, and then brushing her off in the nicest way possible so that her feelings wouldn't be hurt. And then they could always say they had had a thing with the great Johnny Fontaine. It wasn't true love, but you couldn't knock it if the girl was beautiful and genuinely nice. He hated the hard, bitchy ones, the ones who screwed for him and then rushed off to tell their friends that they'd screwed the great Johnny Fontaine, always adding that they'd had better. What amazed him more than anything else in his career were the complacent husbands who almost told him to his face that they forgave their wives since it was allowed for even the most virtuous matron to be unfaithful with a great singing and movie star like Johnny Fontaine. That really floored him. He loved Ella Fitzgerald on records. He loved that kind of clean singing, that kind of clean phrasing. It was the only thing in life he really understood, and he knew he understood it better than anyone else on earth. Now, lying back on the couch, the brandy warming his throat, he felt a desire to sing. Not music, but to phrase with the records. Yet it was something impossible to do in front of the stranger. He put his free hand in Sharon's lap, sipping his drink from his other hand. Without any slyness, but with the sensualness of a child seeking warmth. His hand in her lap pulled up the silk of her dress to show milky white thigh above the sheer netted gold of her stockings. And as always, despite all the women, all the years, all the familiarity, Johnny felt the fluid, sticky warmness flooding through his body at that sight. The miracle still happened. And what would he do when that failed him as his voice had? He was ready now. He put his drink down on the long inlaid cocktail table and turned his body toward her. He was very sure, very deliberate, and yet tender. There was nothing sly or lecherously lascivious in his caresses. He kissed her on the lips while his hands rose to her breasts. His hand fell to her warm thighs, the skin so silky to his touch. Her returning kiss was warm but not passionate, and he preferred it that way right now. He hated girls who turned on all of a sudden as if their bodies were motors galvanized into erotic pumpings by the touching of a hairy switch. Then he did something he always did, something that had never yet failed to arouse him. Delicately and as lightly as it was possible to do so and still feel something, he brushed the tip of his middle finger deep down between her thighs. Some girls never even felt that initial move toward lovemaking. Some were distracted by it, not sure it was a physical touch because at the same time he always kissed them deeply on the mouth. Still others seemed to suck in his finger or gobble it up with a pelvic thrust. And of course, before he became famous, some girls had slapped his face. It was his whole technique, and usually it served him well enough. Sharon's reaction was unusual. She accepted it all, the touch, the kiss, then shifted her mouth off his, shifted her body ever so slightly back along the couch, and picked up her drink. It was a cool but definite refusal. It happened sometimes, rarely, but it happened. Johnny picked up his drink and lit a cigarette. She was saying something very sweetly, very lightly. It's not that I don't like you, Johnny. You're much nicer than I thought you'd be. And it's not because I'm not that kind of a girl. It's just that I have to be turned on to do it with a guy. You know what I mean? Johnny Fontaine smiled at her. He still liked her. And I don't turn you on? She was a little embarrassed. Well, you know, when you were so great singing and all, I was still a little kid. I sort of just missed you. I was the next generation. Honest, it's not that I'm goody-goody. If you were James Dean or somebody I grew up on, I'd have my panties off in a second. He didn't like her quite so much now. 
She was sweet, she was witty, she was intelligent, she hadn't fallen all over herself to screw for him or try to hustle him because his connections would help her in showbiz. She was really a straight kid. But there was something else he recognized. It had happened a few times before. The girl who went on a date with her mind all made up not to go to bed with him, no matter how much she liked him, just so that she could tell her friends, and even more, herself, that she had turned down a chance to screw for the great Johnny Fontaine. It was something he understood now that he was older, and he wasn't angry. He just didn't like her quite that much, and he had really liked her a lot. And now that he didn't like her quite so much, he relaxed more. He sipped his drink and watched the Pacific Ocean. I hope you're not sore, Johnny. I guess I'm being square. I guess in Hollywood a girl's supposed to put out just as casually as kissing a bow goodnight. I just haven't been around long enough. Johnny smiled at her and patted her cheek. His hand fell down to pull her skirt discreetly over her rounded silken knees. I'm not sore. It's nice having an old-fashioned date. Not telling what he felt. The relief at not having to prove himself a great lover. Not having to live up to his screened, godlike image. Not having to listen to the girl trying to react as if he really had lived up to that image. Making more out of a very simple, routine piece of ass than it really was. They had another drink, shared a few more cool kisses, and then she decided to go. Can I call you for a dinner some night? She played it frank and honest to the end. I know you don't want to waste your time and then get disappointed. Thanks for a wonderful evening. Someday I'll tell my children I had supper with the great Johnny Fontaine, all alone in his apartment. He smiled at her. And that you didn't give in. They both laughed. <laughs> They'll never believe that. And then Johnny, being a little phony in his turn, said, I'll give it to you in writing. Want me to? She shook her head. He continued on. Anybody doubts you? Give me a buzz on the phone. I'll straighten them right out. I'll tell them how I chased you all around the apartment, but you kept your honor, okay? He had finally been a little too cruel, and he felt stricken at the hurt on her young face. She understood that he was telling her that he hadn't tried too hard. He had taken the sweetness of her victory away from her. Now she would feel that it had been her lack of charm or attractiveness that had made her the victor this night. And, being the girl she was, when she told the story of how she resisted the great Johnny Fontaine, she would always have to add, with a wry little smile, of course, he didn't try very hard. So now, taking pity on her, he said, If you ever feel real down, give me a ring, okay? I don't have to shack up every girl I know. I will. She went out the door. He was left with a long evening before him. He could have used what Jack Waltz called the meat factory, the stable of willing starlets. But he wanted human companionship. He wanted to talk like a human being. He thought of his first wife, Virginia. Now that the work on the picture was finished, he would have more time for the kids. He wanted to become part of their life again. And he worried about Virginia, too. She wasn't equipped to handle the Hollywood sharpies who might come after her just so that they could brag about having screwed Johnny Fontaine's first wife. As far as he knew, nobody could say that yet. Everybody could say it about his second wife, though, he thought wryly. He picked up the phone. He recognized her voice immediately, and that was not surprising. He had heard it the first time when he was ten years old, and they had been in 4B together. Hi, Jeannie. You busy tonight? Can I come over for a little while? All right. The kids are sleeping, though. I don't want to wake them up. That's okay. I just wanted to talk to you. Her voice hesitated slightly. Then, carefully controlled, not to show any concern, she asked. Is it anything serious? Anything important? No. I finished the picture today, and I thought maybe I could just see you and talk to you. Maybe I could take a look at the kids, if you're sure they won't wake up. Okay. I'm glad you got that part you wanted. Thanks. I'll see you in about a half hour. When he got to what had been his home in Beverly Hills, Johnny Fontaine sat in the car for a moment, staring at the house. He remembered what his godfather had said, that he could make his own life what he wanted. Great chance if you knew what you wanted. But what did he want? His first wife was waiting for him at the door. She was pretty, petite and brunette, a nice Italian girl, the girl next door who would never fool around with another man, and that had been important to him. Did he still want her, he asked himself, and the answer was no. For one thing, he could no longer make love to her. Their affection had grown too old. And there were some things, nothing to do with sex, she could never forgive him. But they were no longer enemies. She made him coffee and served him homemade cookies in the living room. Stretch out on the sofa. You look tired. He took off his jacket and his shoes and loosened his tie while she sat in the chair opposite him with a grave little smile on her face. It's funny. What's funny? He asked her, sipping coffee and spilling some of it on his shirt. The great Johnny Fontaine, stuck without a date. 
The great Johnny Fontaine is lucky if he can even get it up anymore. It was unusual for him to be so direct. Is there something really the matter? Johnny grinned at her. I had a date with a girl in my apartment, and she brushed me off. And you know, I was relieved. To his surprise, he saw a look of anger pass over Jenny's face. Don't worry about those little tramps. She must have thought that was the way to get you interested in her. And Johnny realized with amusement that Jenny was actually angry with the girl who had turned him down. Ah, what the hell. I'm tired of that stuff. I have to grow up sometime. Now that I can't sing anymore, I guess I'll have a tough time with dames. I never got in on my looks, you know. You were always better looking than you photographed. Johnny shook his head. I'm getting fat and I'm getting bald. Hell, if this picture doesn't make me big again, I'd better learn how to bake pizzas. Or maybe we'll put you in the movies. You look great. She looked 35. A good 35, but 35. And out here in Hollywood, that might as well be a hundred. The young, beautiful girls throng through the city like lemmings, lasting one year, some two, some of them so beautiful they could make a man's heart almost stop beating until they opened their mouths, until the greedy hopes for success clouded the loveliness of their eyes. Ordinary women could never hope to compete with them on a physical level. And you could talk all you wanted to about charm, about intelligence, about chic, about poise. The raw beauty of these girls overpowered everything else. Perhaps, if there were not so many of them, there might be a chance for an ordinary, nice-looking woman. And since Johnny Fontaine could have all of them, or nearly all of them, Jenny knew that he was saying all this just to flatter her. He had always been nice that way. He had always been polite to women, even at the height of his fame, paying them compliments, holding lights for their cigarettes, opening doors. And since all this was usually done for him, it made it even more impressive to the girls he went out with. And he did it with all girls, even the one-night stands, I-don't-know-your-name girls. She smiled at him, a friendly smile. You already made me, Johnny. Remember? For twelve years. You don't have to give me your line. He sighed and stretched out on the sofa. No kidding, Jenny. You look good. I wish I looked that good. She didn't answer him. She could see he was depressed. Do you think the picture is okay? Will it do you some good? Johnny nodded. Yeah. It could bring me all the way back. If I get the Academy thing and play my cards right, I can make it big again even without the singing. Then maybe I can give you and the kids more dough. We have more than enough. I want to see more of the kids, too. I want to settle down a little bit. Why can't I come every Friday night for dinner here? I swear, I'll never miss one Friday. I don't care how far away I am or how busy I am. And then whenever I can, I'll spend weekends or, or maybe the kids can spend some part of their vacations with me. Jenny put an ashtray on his chest. It's okay with me. I never got married because I wanted you to keep being their father. She said this without any kind of emotion, but Johnny Fontaine, staring up at the ceiling, knew she said it as an atonement for those other things, the cruel things she had once said to him when their marriage had broken up, when his career had started going down the drain. By the way, guess who called me? Johnny wouldn't play that game. He never did. Who? You could take at least one lousy guess. Johnny didn't answer. Your godfather. Johnny was really surprised. He never talks to anybody on the phone. What did he say to you? He told me to help you. He said you could be as big as you ever were, that you were on your way back, but that you needed people to believe in you. I asked him, why should I? And he said, because you're the father of my children. He's such a sweet old guy, and they tell such horrible stories about him. Virginia hated phones, and she had had all the extensions taken out, except for the one in her bedroom and one in the kitchen. Now they could hear the kitchen phone ringing. She went to answer it. When she came back into the living room, there was a look of surprise on her face. It's for you, Johnny. It's Tom Hagen. He says it's important. Johnny went into the kitchen and picked up the phone. Yeah, Tom. Johnny, the Godfather wants me to come out and see you and set some things up that can help you out now that the picture's finished. He wants me to catch the morning plane. Can you meet it in Los Angeles? I have to fly back to New York the same night, so you won't have to worry about keeping your night free for me. Sure, Tom. And don't worry about me losing a night. Stay over and relax a bit. I'll throw a party and you can meet some movie people. He always made that offer. He didn't want the folks from his old neighborhood to think he was ashamed of them. Thanks, but I really have to catch the early morning plane back. Okay, you'll meet the 11.30 a.m. out of New York? Sure. Stay in your car. Send one of your people to meet me when I get off the plane and bring me to you. Right. He went back to the living room, and Jenny looked at him inquiringly. My godfather has some plans for me to help me out. He got me the part in the movie, I don't know how. But I wish he'd stay out of the rest of it. He went back onto the sofa. He felt very tired. Why don't you sleep in the guest bedroom tonight instead of going home? 
You can have breakfast with the kids, and you won't have to drive home so late. I hate to think of you all alone in that house of yours anyway. Don't you get lonely? I don't stay home much. She laughed. <laughs> then you haven't changed much. She paused and then said, Shall I fix up the other bedroom? Why can't I sleep in your bedroom? She flushed. No. She smiled at him, and he smiled back. They were still friends. When Johnny woke up the next morning, it was late. He could tell by the sun coming in through the drawn blinds. Never came in that way unless it was in the afternoon. Hey, Ginny, do I still rate breakfast? And far away, he heard her voice call, Just a second. And it was, just a second. She must have had everything ready, hot in the oven, the tray waiting to be loaded, because as Johnny lit his first cigarette of the day, the door of the bedroom opened, and his two small daughters came in, wheeling the breakfast cart. They were so beautiful, it broke his heart. Their faces were shining and clear, their eyes alive with curiosity and the eager desire to run to him. They wore their hair braided old-fashioned in long pigtails, and they wore old-fashioned frocks and white patent leather shoes. They stood by the breakfast cart watching him as he stubbed out his cigarette and waited for him to call and hold his arms wide. Then they came running to him. He pressed his face between their two fresh, fragrant cheeks and scraped them with his beard so that they shrieked. Jenny appeared in the bedroom door and wheeled the breakfast cart the rest of the way so that he could eat in bed. She sat beside him on the edge of the bed, pouring his coffee, buttering his toast. The two young daughters sat on the bedroom couch watching him. They were too old now for pillow fights or to be tossed around. They were already smoothing their must hair. Oh, Christ, he thought, pretty soon they'll be all grown up. Hollywood punks will be out after them. He shared his toast and bacon with them as he ate, giving them sips of coffee. It was a habit left over from when he had been singing with a band and rarely ate with him, so they liked to share his food when he had his odd hour meals, like afternoon breakfasts or morning suppers. The change around in food delighted them to eat steak and french fries at seven in the morning, bacon and eggs in the afternoon. Only Jenny and a few of his close friends knew how much he idolized his daughters. That had been the worst thing about the divorce and leaving home. The one thing he had fought about, and for, was his position as a father to them. In a very sly way, he had made Jenny understand he would not be pleased by her remarrying, not because he was jealous of her, but because he was jealous of his position as a father. He had arranged the money to be paid to her so it would be enormously to her advantage financially not to remarry. It was understood that she could have lovers as long as they were not introduced into her home life. But on this score, he had absolute faith in her. She had always been amazingly shy and old-fashioned in sex. The Hollywood gigolos had batted zero when they started swarming around her, sniffing for the financial settlement and the favors they could get from her famous husband. He had no fear that she expected a reconciliation because he had wanted to sleep with her the night before. Neither one of them wanted to renew their old marriage. She understood his hunger for beauty, his irresistible impulse toward young women far more beautiful than she. It was known that he always slept with his movie co-stars at least once. His boyish charm was irresistible to them, as their beauty was to him. You'll have to start getting dressed pretty soon. Tom's plane will be getting in. She shooed the daughters out of the room. Yeah. By the way, Ginny, you know I'm getting divorced? I'm going to be a free man again. She watched him getting dressed. He always kept fresh clothes at her house ever since they had come to their new arrangement after the wedding of Don Corleone's daughter. Christmas is only two weeks away. Shall I plan on you being here? It was the first time he had even thought about the holidays. When his voice was in shape, holidays were lucrative singing days. But even then, Christmas was sacred. If he missed this one, it would be the second one. Last year, he had been courting his second wife in Spain, trying to get her to marry him. Yeah. Christmas Eve and Christmas. He didn't mention New Year's Eve. That would be one of the wild nights he needed every once in a while, to get drunk with his friends. And he didn't want a wife along then. He didn't feel guilty about it. She helped him put on his jacket and brushed it off. He was always fastidiously neat. She could see him frowning because the shirt he had put on was not laundered to his taste. The cufflinks, a pair he had not worn for some time, were a little too loud for the way he liked to dress now. She laughed softly. Tom won't notice the difference. The three women of the family walked him to the door and out on the driveway to his car. The two little girls held his hands, one on each side. His wife walked a little behind him. She was getting pleasure out of how happy he looked. When he reached his car, he turned around and swung each girl in turn high up in the air and kissed her on the way down. Then he kissed his wife and got into the car. He never liked drawn-out goodbyes. Arrangements had been made by his PR man and aide. At his house, a chauffeured car was waiting, a rented car. In it were the PR man and another member of his entourage. 
Johnny parked his car and hopped in, and they were on their way to the airport. He waited inside the car while the PR man went out to meet Tom Hagen's plane. When Tom got into the car, they shook hands and drove back to his house. Finally, he and Tom were alone in the living room. There was a coolness between them. Johnny had never forgiven Hagen for acting as a barrier to his getting in touch with the Don when the Don was angry with him, in those bad days before Connie's wedding. Hagen never made excuses for his actions. He could not. It was part of his job to act as a lightning rod for resentments which people were too awed to feel toward the Don himself, though he had earned them. Your godfather sent me out here to give you a hand on some things. I wanted to get it out of the way before Christmas. Johnny Fontaine shrugged. The picture is finished. The director was a square guy and treated me right. My scenes are too important to be left on the cutting room floor just for Waltz to pay me off. He can't ruin a ten million dollar picture. So now everything depends on how good people think I am in the movie. Is winning this Academy Award so terribly important to an actor's career? Or is it just the usual publicity crap that really doesn't mean anything one way or the other? He paused. Except, of course, the glory. Everybody likes glory. Johnny Fontaine grinned at him. Except my godfather, and you. No, Tom, it's not a lot of crap. An Academy Award can make an actor for ten years. He can get his pick of roles. The public goes to see him. It's not everything, but for an actor, it's the most important thing in the business. I'm counting on winning it. Not because I'm such a great actor, but because I'm known primarily as a singer, and the part is foolproof. And I'm pretty good, too. No kidding. Tom Hagen shrugged. Your godfather tells me that the way things stand now, you don't have a chance of winning the award. Johnny Fontaine was angry. What the hell are you talking about? The picture hasn't even been cut yet, much less shown. And the Don isn't even in the movie business. Why the hell did you fly the 3,000 miles just to tell me that shit? He was so shaken, he was almost in tears. Johnny, I don't know a damn thing about all this movie stuff. Remember, I'm just a messenger boy for the Don. But we have discussed this whole business of yours many times. He worries about you, about your future. He feels you still need his help, and he wants to settle your problem once and for all. That's why I'm here now, to get things rolling. But you have to start growing up, Johnny. You have to stop thinking about yourself as a singer or an actor. You've got to start thinking about yourself as a prime mover, as a guy with muscle. Johnny Fontaine laughed and filled his glass. If I don't win that Oscar, I'll have as much muscle as one of my daughters. My voice is gone. If I had that back, I could make some moves. Oh, hell. How does my godfather know I won't win it? Okay, I believe he knows. He's never been wrong. Hagen lit a thin cigar. We got the word that Jack Waltz won't spend studio money to support your candidacy. In fact, he sent the word out to everybody who votes that he does not want you to win. But holding back the money for ads and all that may do it. He's also arranging to have one other guy get as much of the opposition votes as he can swing. He's using all sorts of bribes. Jobs, money, broads, everything. And he's trying to do it without hurting the picture, or hurting it as little as possible. Johnny Fontaine shrugged. He filled his glass with whiskey and downed it. Then I'm dead. Hagen was watching him with his mouth curled up with distaste. Drinking won't help your voice. Fuck you. Hagen's face suddenly became smoothly impassive. Then he said, Okay, I'll keep this purely business. Johnny Fontaine put his drink down and went over to stand in front of Hagen. I'm sorry I said that, Tom. Christ, I'm sorry. I'm taking it out on you because I want to kill that bastard Jack Waltz and I'm afraid to tell off my godfather. So I get sore at you. There were tears in his eyes. He threw the empty whiskey glass against the wall, but so weakly that the heavy shot glass did not even shatter, and rolled along the floor back to him, so that he looked down at it in baffled fury. Then he laughed. Jesus Christ. He walked over to the other side of the room and sat opposite Hagen. You know, I had everything my own way for a long time. Then I divorced Ginny and everything started going sour. I lost my voice, my records stopped selling, I didn't get any more movie work. And then my godfather got sore at me and wouldn't talk to me on the phone or see me when I came into New York. You were always the guy barring the path and I blamed you. But I knew you wouldn't do it without orders from the Don. But you can't get sore at him. It's like getting sore at God. So I curse you. But you've been right all along the line. And to show you I mean my apology, I'm taking your advice. No more booze until I get my voice back. Okay? The apology was sincere. Hagen forgot his anger. There must be something to this 35-year-old boy, or the Don would not be so fond of him. Forget it, Johnny. He was embarrassed at the depth of Johnny's feeling and embarrassed by the suspicion that it might have been inspired by fear, fear that he might turn the Don against him. And, of course, the Don could never be turned by anyone for any reason. His affection was mutable only by himself. Things aren't so bad. The Don says he can cancel out everything Waltz does against you, that you will almost certainly win the award. 
But he feels that won't solve your problem. He wants to know if you have the brains and balls to become a producer on your own, make your own movies from top to bottom. How the hell is he going to get me the award? How do you find it so easy to believe that Waltz can finagle it and your godfather can't? Now, since it's necessary to get your faith for the other part of our deal, I must tell you this, just keep it to yourself. Your godfather is a much more powerful man than Jack Waltz. And he is much more powerful in areas far more critical. How can he swing the award? He controls or controls the people who control all the labor unions in the industry, all the people or nearly all the people who vote. Of course you have to be good, you have to be in contention on your own merits. And your godfather has more brains than Jack Waltz. He doesn't go up to these people and put a gun to their heads and say, vote for Johnny Fontaine or you are out of a job. He doesn't strong arm where strong arm doesn't work or leaves too many hard feelings. He'll make those people vote for you because they want to. But they won't want to unless he takes an interest. Now just take my word for it that he can get you the award. And that if he doesn't do it, you won't get it. Okay. I believe you. And I have the balls and brains to be a producer, but I don't have the money. No bank would finance me. It takes millions to support a movie. When you get the award, start making plans to produce three of your own movies. Hire the best people in the business, the best technicians, the best stars, whoever you need. Plan on three to five movies. You're crazy. That many movies could mean 20 million bucks. When you need the money, get in touch with me. I'll give you the name of the bank out here in California to ask for financing. Don't worry, they finance movies all the time. Just ask them for the money in the ordinary way with the proper justifications like a regular business deal. They will approve. But first, you have to see me and tell me the figures and the plans, okay? Johnny was silent for a long time. Is there anything else? Hagen smiled. You mean, do you have to do any favors in return for a loan of $20 million? Sure you will. He waited for Johnny to say something. Nothing you wouldn't do anyway if the Don asked you to do it for him. The Don has to ask me himself if it's something serious, you know what I mean? I won't take your word or Sonny's for it. Hagen was surprised by this good sense. Fontaine had some brains after all. He had sense to know that the Don was too fond of him and too smart to ask him to do something foolishly dangerous, whereas Sonny might. Let me reassure you on one thing. Your godfather has given me and Sonny strict instructions not to involve you in any way in anything that might get you bad publicity through our fault. And he will never do that himself. I guarantee you that any favor he asks of you, you will offer to do before he requests it. Okay? Johnny smiled. Okay. Also, he has faith in you. He thinks you have brains, and so he figures the bank will make money on the investment, which means he will make money on it. So it's really a business deal. Never forget that. Don't go screwing around with the money. You may be his favorite godson, but twenty million bucks is a lot of dough. He has to stick his neck out to make sure you get it. Tell him not to worry. If a guy like Jack Waltz can be a big movie genius, anybody can. That's what your godfather figures. Can you have me driven back to the airport? I've said all I have to say. When you do start signing contracts for everything, hire your own lawyers. I won't be in on it. But I'd like to see everything before you sign, if that's okay with you. Also, you'll never have any labor troubles. That'll cut costs on your pictures to some extent. So when the accountants lump some of that in, disregard those figures. Do I have to get your okay on anything else? Scripts, stars, any of that? Hagen shook his head. No, it may happen that the Don would object to something, but he'll object to you direct if he does. But I can't imagine what that would be. Movies don't affect him at all in any way, so he has no interest. And he doesn't believe in meddling. That I can tell you from experience. Good. I'll drive you to the airport myself. And thank the Godfather for me. I'd call him up and thank him, but he never comes to the phone. Why is that, by the way? Hagen shrugged. He hardly ever talks on the phone. He doesn't want his voice recorded, even saying something perfectly innocent. He's afraid that they can splice the words together so that it sounds as if he says something else. I think that's what it is. Anyway, his only worry is that someday he'll be framed by the authorities, so he doesn't want to give him an edge. They got into Johnny's car and drove to the airport. Hagen was thinking that Johnny was a better guy than he figured. He'd already learned something, just his driving him personally to the airport proved that. The personal courtesy, something the Don himself always believed in. And the apology. That had been sincere. He had known Johnny a long time, and he knew the apology would never be made out of fear. Johnny had always had guts. That's why he had always been in trouble. With his movie bosses, and with his women. He was also one of the few people who was not afraid of the Don. Fontaine and Michael were maybe the only two men Hagen knew of whom this could be said. So, the apology was sincere. He would accept it as such. He and Johnny would have to see a lot of each other in the next few years. 
and Johnny would have to pass the next test, which would prove how smart he was. He would have to do something for the Don that the Don would never ask him to do or insist that he do as part of the agreement. Hagen wondered if Johnny Fontaine was smart enough to figure out that part of the bargain. After Johnny dropped Hagen off at the airport, Hagen insisted that Johnny not hang around for his plane with him, he drove back to Jenny's house. She was surprised to see him. But he wanted to stay at her place so that he would have time to think things out, to make his plans. He knew that what Hagen had told him was extremely important, that his whole life was being changed. He had once been a big star, but now, at the young age of 35, he was washed up. He didn't kid himself about that. Even if he won the award as best actor, what the hell could it mean at the most? Nothing if his voice didn't come back. He'd be just second rate, with no real power, no real juice. Even that girl turning him down. She had been nice and smart and acting sort of hip, but would she have been so cool if he had really been at the top? Now, with the Don backing him with dough, he could be as big as anybody in Hollywood. He could be a king. Johnny smiled. Hell, he could even be a Don. It would be nice living with Jenny again for a few weeks, maybe longer. He'd take the kids out every day, maybe have a few friends over. He'd stop drinking and smoking, really take care of himself. Maybe his voice would get strong again. If that happened, and with the Don's money, he'd be unbeatable. He'd really be as close to an old-time king or emperor as it was possible to be in America. And it wouldn't depend on his voice holding up or how long the public cared about him as an actor. It would be an empire rooted in money and the most special, the most coveted kind of power. Jenny had the guest bedroom made up for him. It was understood that he would not share her room, that they would not live as man and wife. They could never have that relationship again. And though the outside world of gossip columnists and movie fans gave the blame for the failure of their marriage solely to him, yet in a curious way, between the two of them, they both knew that she was even more to blame for their divorce. When Johnny Fontaine became the most popular singer and movie musical comedy star in motion pictures, it had never occurred to him to desert his wife and children. He was too Italian, still too old style. Naturally, he had been unfaithful. That had been impossible to avoid in his business and the temptations to which he was continually exposed. And despite being a skinny, delicate-looking guy, he had the wiry horniness of many small-boned Latin types. And women delighted him in their surprises. He loved going out with a demure, sweet-faced, virginal-looking girl and then uncapping her breasts to find them so unexpectedly, slopingly full and rich, lewdly heavy, in contrast to the cameo face. He loved to find sexual shyness and timidity in the sexy-looking girls, who were all fake motion like a shifty basketball player, vamping as if they had slept with a hundred guys, and then, when he got them alone, having to battle for hours to get in and do the job, and finding out they were virgins. And all these Hollywood guys laughed at his fondness for virgins. They called it an old guinea taste, square. And look how long it took to make a virgin give you a blowjob with all the aggravation, and then they usually turned out to be a lousy piece of ass. But Johnny knew that it was how you handled a young girl. You had to come on to her the right way. And then, what could be greater than a girl who was tasting her first dick and loving it? Ah, it was so great breaking them in. It was so great having them wrap their legs around you. Their thighs were all different shapes. Their asses were different. Their skins were all different colors and shades of white and brown and tan. And when he had slept with that young colored girl in Detroit, a good girl, not a hustler, the young daughter of a jazz singer on the same nightclub bill with him, she had been one of the sweetest things he had ever had. Her lips had really tasted like warm honey with pepper mixed in it. Her dark brown skin was rich, creamy, and she had been as sweet as God had ever made any woman, and she had been a virgin. And the other guys were always talking about blowjobs this and other variations, and he didn't really enjoy that stuff so much. He never liked a girl that much after they tried it that way. It just didn't satisfy him right. He and his second wife had finally not got along because she preferred the old 69 too much, to a point where she didn't want anything else, and he had to fight to stick it in. She began making fun of him and calling him a square, and the word got around that he made love like a kid. Maybe that was why that girl last night had turned him down. Well, the hell with it. She wouldn't be too great in the sack anyway. You could tell a girl who really liked to fuck, and they were always the best, especially the ones who hadn't been at it too long. What he really hated were the ones who had started screwing at 12 and were all fucked out by the time they were 20 and just going through the motions, and some of them were the prettiest of all and could fake you out. Jenny brought coffee and cake into his bedroom and put it on the long table in the sitting room part. He told her simply that Hagen was helping him put together the money credit for a producing package, and she was excited about that. He would be important again. 
but she had no idea of how powerful Don Corleone really was, so she didn't understand the significance of Hagen coming from New York. He told her Hagen was also helping with legal details. When they had finished the coffee, he told her he was going to work that night and make phone calls and plans for the future. He told her, Half of all this will be in the kids' names. She gave him a grateful smile and kissed him goodnight before she left his room. There was a glass dish full of his favorite monogrammed cigarettes, a humidor with pencil-thin black Cuban cigars on his writing desk. Johnny tilted back and started making calls. His brain was really whirring along. He called the author of the book, the best-selling novel, on which his new film was based. The author was a guy his own age who had come up the hard way and was now a celebrity in the literary world. He had come out to Hollywood expecting to be treated like a wheel and, like most authors, had been treated like shit. Johnny had seen the humiliation of the author one night at the Brown Derby. The writer had been fixed up with a well-known boozemy starlet for a date on the town and a sure shack up later. But while they were at dinner, the starlet had deserted the famous author because a ratty-looking movie comic had waggled his finger at her. That had given the writer the right slant on just who was who in the Hollywood pecking order. It didn't matter that his book had made him world famous. A starlet would prefer the crummiest, the rattiest, the phoniest movie wheel. Now, Johnny called the author at his New York home to thank him for the great part he had written in his book for him. He flattered the shit out of the guy. Then, casually, he asked him how he was doing on his next novel and what it was all about. He lit a cigar while the author told him about a specially interesting chapter and then finally said, Gee, I'd like to read it when you're finished. How about sending me a copy? Maybe I can get you a good deal for it. Better than you got with Waltz. The eagerness in the author's voice told him that he had guessed right. Waltz had chiseled the guy, given him peanuts for the book. Johnny mentioned that he might be in New York right after the holidays, and would the author want to come and have dinner with some of his friends? I know a few good-looking broads. The author laughed and said, okay. Next, Johnny called up the director and cameraman on the film he had just finished to thank them for having helped him in the film. He told them confidentially that he knew Waltz had been against him, and he doubly appreciated their help, and that if there was ever anything he could do for them, they should just call. Then he made the hardest call of all, the one to Jack Waltz. He thanked him for the part in the picture and told him how happy he would be to work for him any time. He did this merely to throw Waltz off the track. He had always been very square, very straight. In a few days, Waltz would find out about his maneuvering and be astounded by the treachery of this call, which was exactly what Johnny Fontaine wanted him to feel. After that, he sat at the desk and puffed at his cigar. There was whiskey on a side table but he had made some sort of promise to himself and Hagen that he wouldn't drink. He shouldn't even be smoking. It was foolish. Whatever was wrong with his voice probably wouldn't be helped by knocking off drinking and smoking. Not too much, but what the hell, it might help, and he wanted all the percentages with him, now that he had a fighting chance. Now, with the house quiet, his divorced wife sleeping, his beloved daughter sleeping, he could think back to that terrible time in his life when he had deserted them. Deserted them for a whore tramp of a bitch who was his second wife. But even now he smiled at the thought of her. She was such a lovely broad in so many ways. And besides, the only thing that saved his life was the day that he had made up his mind never to hate a woman, or, more specifically, the day he had decided he could not afford to hate his first wife and his daughters, his girlfriends, his second wife, and the girlfriends after that, right up to Sharon Moore brushing him off so that she could brag about refusing to screw for the great Johnny Fontaine. He had traveled with the band singing, and then he had become a radio star and a star of the movie stage shows, and then he had finally made it in the movies. And in all that time, he had lived the way he wanted to, screwed the women he wanted to, but he had never let it affect his personal life. Then he had fallen for his soon-to-be second wife, Margot Ashton. He had gone absolutely crazy for her. His career had gone to hell. His voice had gone to hell. His family life had gone to hell. And there had come the day when he was left without anything. The thing was, he had always been generous and fair, he had given his first wife everything he owned when he divorced her. He had made sure his two daughters would get a piece of everything he made, every record, every movie, every club date. And when he had been rich and famous, he had refused his first wife nothing. He had helped out all her brothers and sisters, her father and mother, the girlfriends she had gone to school with, and their families. He had never been a stuck-up celebrity. He had sung at the weddings of his wife's two younger sisters, something he hated to do. He had never refused her anything except the complete surrender of his own personality. And then, when he had touched bottom, when he could no longer get movie work, when he could no longer sing, when his second wife had betrayed him, he had gone to spend a few days with Ginny and his daughters. He had more or less flung himself on her mercy one night because he felt so lousy. That day, he had heard one of his recordings, and he had sounded so terrible 
that he accused the sound technicians of sabotaging the record. Until finally, he had become convinced that that was what his voice really sounded like. He had smashed the master record and refused to sing anymore. He was so ashamed that he had not sung a note except with Nino at Connie Corleone's wedding. He had never forgotten the look on Jenny's face when she found out about all his misfortunes. It had passed over her face only for a second, but that was enough for him never to forget it. It was a look of savage and joyful satisfaction. It was a look that could only make him believe that she had contemptuously hated him all these years. She quickly recovered and offered him cool but polite sympathy. He had pretended to accept it. During the next few days, he had gone to see three of the girls he had liked the most over the years, girls he had remained friends with and sometimes still slept with in a comradely way, girls he had done everything in his power to help, girls to whom he had given the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts or job opportunities. On their faces, he had caught that same fleeting look of savage satisfaction. It was during that time that he knew he had to make a decision. He could become like a great many other men in Hollywood, successful producers, writers, directors, actors, who preyed on beautiful women with lustful hatred. He could use power and monetary favors grudgingly, always alert for treason, always believing that women would betray and desert him, adversaries to be bested. Or he could refuse to hate women and continue to believe in them. He knew he could not afford not to love them, that something of his spirit would die if he did not continue to love women no matter how treacherous and unfaithful they were. It didn't matter that the women he loved most in the world were secretly glad to see him crushed, humiliated by a wayward fortune. It did not matter that in the most awful way, not sexually, they had been unfaithful to him. He had no choice. He had to accept them. And so he made love to all of them, gave them presents, hid the hurt their enjoyment of his misfortunes gave him. He forgave them, knowing he was being paid back for having lived in the utmost freedom from women and in the fullest flush of their flavor. But now, he never felt guilty about being untrue to them. He never felt guilty about how he treated Jenny, insisting on remaining the sole father of his children, yet never even considering remarrying her and letting her know that, too. That was one thing he had salvaged out of his fall from the top. He had grown a thick skin about the hurts he gave women. He was tired and ready for bed, but one note of memory stuck with him, singing with Nino Valente, and suddenly he knew what would please Don Corleone more than anything else. He picked up the phone and told the operator to get him New York. He called Sonny Corleone and asked him for Nino Valenti's number. Then he called Nino. Nino sounded a little drunk, as usual. Hey, Nino, how'd you like to come out here and work for me? I need a guy I can trust. Nino, kidding around, said, Gee, I don't know, Johnny. I got a good job on the truck. Boffing housewives along my route, picking up a clear hundred fifty every week. What you got to offer? I can start you at 500 and get you blind dates with movie stars. How's that? And maybe I'll let you sing at my parties. Yeah, okay, let me think about it. Let me talk it over with my lawyer and my accountant and my helper on the truck. Hey, no kidding around, Nino. I need you out here. I want you to fly out tomorrow morning and sign a personal contract for 500 a week for a year. Then if you steal one of my broads and I fire you, you pick up at least a year's salary, okay? There was a long pause. Nino's voice was sober. Hey, Johnny, you kidding? I'm serious, kid. Go to my agent's office in New York. They'll have your plane ticket and some cash. I'm going to call them first thing in the morning. So you go up there in the afternoon, okay? Then I'll have somebody meet you at the plane and bring you out to the house. Again, there was a long pause. And then Nino's voice, very subdued, uncertain, said, Okay, Johnny. He didn't sound drunk anymore. Johnny hung up the phone and got ready for bed. He felt better than any time since he had smashed that master record. Chapter 13 Johnny Fontaine sat in the huge recording studio and figured costs on a yellow pad. Musicians were filing in, all of them friends he had known since he was a kid singer with the bands. The conductor, top man in the business of pop accompaniment, and a man who had been kind to him when things went sour, was giving each musician bundles of music and verbal instructions. His name was Eddie Niels. He had taken on this recording as a favor to Johnny, though his schedule was crowded. Nino Valente was sitting at a piano, fooling around nervously with the keys. He was also sipping from a huge glass of rye. Johnny didn't mind that. He knew Nino sang just as well drunk as sober, and what they were doing today wouldn't require any real musicianship on Nino's part. Eddie Niels had made special arrangements of some old Italian and Sicilian songs, and a special job on the dual duet song that Nino and Johnny had sung at Connie Corleone's wedding. Johnny was making the record primarily because he knew that the Don loved such songs, and it would be a perfect Christmas gift for him. 
He also had a hunch that the record would sell in the high numbers, not a million, of course. And he had figured out that helping Nino was how the Don wanted his payoff. Nino was, after all, another one of the Don's godchildren. Johnny put his clipboard and yellow pad on the folding chair beside him and got up to stand beside the piano. Hey, Paisan! Nino glanced up and tried to smile. He looked a little sick. Johnny leaned over and rubbed his shoulder blades. Relax, kid. Do a good job today and I'll fix you up with the best and most famous piece of ass in Hollywood. Nino took a gulp of whiskey. Who's that, Lassie? Johnny laughed. No, Deanna Dunn. I guarantee the goods. Nino was impressed, but couldn't help saying with pseudo-hopefulness, You can't get Lassie? The orchestra swung into the opening song of the medley. Johnny Fontaine listened intently. Eddie Niels would play all the songs through in their special arrangements. Then would come the first take for the record. As Johnny listened, he made mental notes on exactly how he would handle each phrase, how he would come into each song. He knew his voice wouldn't last long. But Nino would be doing most of the singing. Johnny would be singing under him, except, of course, in the duet duel song. He would have to save himself for that. He pulled Nino to his feet, and they both stood by their microphones. Nino flubbed the opening. Flubbed it again. His face was beginning to get red with embarrassment. Johnny kidded him. Hey, you stalling for overtime? I don't feel natural without my mandolin. Johnny thought about that for a moment. Hold that glass of booze in your hand. It seemed to do the trick. Nino kept drinking from the glass as he sang, but he was doing fine. Johnny sang easily, not straining, his voice merely dancing around Nino's main melody. There was no emotional satisfaction in this kind of singing, but he was amazed at his own technical skill. Ten years of vocalizing had taught him something. When they came to the duet duel song that ended the record, Johnny let his voice go, and when they finished, his vocal cords ached. The musicians had been carried away by the last song, a rare thing for these calloused veterans. They hammered down their instruments and stamped their feet in approval as applause. The drummer gave them a ruffle of drums. With stops and conferences, they worked nearly four hours before they quit. Eddie Niels came over to Johnny. You sounded pretty good, kid. Maybe you're ready to do a record. I have a new song that's perfect for you. Johnny shook his head. Come on, Eddie, don't kid me. Besides, in a couple of hours, I'll be too hoarse to even talk. Do you think we'll have to fix up much of the stuff we did today? Nino will have to come into the studio tomorrow. He made some mistakes, but he's much better than I thought he would be. As for your stuff, I'll have the sound engineers fix anything I don't like, okay? Okay. When can I hear the pressing? Tomorrow night. Your place? Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. See you tomorrow. He took Nino by the arm and walked out of the studio. They went to his house instead of Jenny's. By this time, it was late afternoon. Nino was still more than half drunk. Johnny told him to get under the shower and then take a snooze. They had to be at a big party at 11 that night. When Nino woke up, Johnny briefed him. This party is a movie star Lonely Hearts Club. These broads tonight are dames you've seen in the movies as glamour queens millions of guys would give their right arms to screw. And the only reason they'll be at the party tonight is to find somebody to shack them up. Do you know why? Because they are hungry for it. They are just a little old. And just like every dame, they want it with a little bit of class. What's the matter with your voice? Every time after I sing a little bit, that happens. I won't be able to sing for a month now, but I'll get over the hoarseness in a couple of days. Tough, huh? Listen, Nino, don't get too drunk tonight. You have to show these Hollywood broads that my paisan buddy ain't weak in the poop. You gotta come across. Remember, some of these dames are very powerful in movies. They can get you work. It doesn't hurt to be charming after you knock off a piece. Nino was already pouring himself a drink. I'm always charming. He drained the glass. Grinning, he asked... No kidding. Can you really get me close to Deanna Dunn? Don't be so anxious. It's not going to be like you think. The Hollywood movie star Lonely Hearts Club, so-called by the young juvenile leads whose attendance was mandatory, met every Friday night at the palatial studio-owned home of Roy McElroy, press agent, or rather public relations counsel, for the Waltz International Film Corporation. Actually, it was McElroy's open house party. The idea had come from the practical brain of Jack Waltz himself. Some of his money-making movie stars were getting older now. Without the help of special lights and genius makeup men, they looked their age. They were having problems. They had also become, to some extent, desensitized physically and mentally. They could no longer fall in love. They could no longer assume the role of hunted women. They had been made too imperious by money, by fame, by their former beauty. Waltz gave his parties so that it would be easier for them to pick up lovers, one-night stands, who, if they had the stuff, could graduate into full-time bed partners and so work their way upward. 
Since the action sometimes degenerated into brawls or sexual excess that led to trouble with the police, Waltz decided to hold the parties in the house of the public relations counselor, who would be right there to fix things up, pay off newsmen and police officers, and keep everything quiet. For certain virile young male actors on the studio payroll, who had not yet achieved stardom or featured roles, attendance at the Friday night parties was a not always pleasant duty. This was explained by the fact that a new film yet to be released by the studio would be shown at the party. In fact, that was the excuse for the party itself. People would say, let's go over and see what the new picture so-and-so made is like. And so it was put in a professional context. Young female starlets were forbidden to attend the Friday night parties, or rather, discouraged. Most of them took the hint. Screenings of the new movies took place at midnight, and Johnny and Nino arrived at 11. Roy McElroy proved to be, at first sight, an enormously likable man, well-groomed, beautifully dressed. He greeted Johnny Fontaine with a surprised cry of delight. What the hell are you doing here? He said with genuine astonishment. Johnny shook his hand. I'm showing my country cousin the sights. Meet Nino. McElroy shook hands with Nino and gazed at him appraisingly. They'll eat him up alive. He led them to the rear patio. The rear patio was really a series of huge rooms whose glass doors had been opened to a garden and pool. There were almost a hundred people milling around, all with drinks in their hands. The patio lighting was artfully arranged to flatter feminine faces and skin. These were women Nino had seen on the darkened movie screens when he had been a teenager. They had played their part in his erotic dreams of adolescence. But seeing them now in the flesh was like seeing them in some horrible makeup. Nothing could hide the tiredness of their spirit and their flesh. Time had eroded their godhead. They posed and moved as charmingly as he remembered, but they were like wax fruit. They could not lubricate his glands. Nino took two drinks, wandered to a table where he could stand next to a nest of bottles. Johnny moved with him. They drank together until behind them came the magic voice of Deanna Dunn. Nino, like millions of other men, had that voice imprinted on his brain forever. Deanna Dunn had won two Academy Awards, had been in the biggest movie grocer made in Hollywood. On the screen, she had a feline feminine charm that made her irresistible to all men. But the words she was saying had never been heard on the silver screen. Johnny, you bastard. I had to go to my psychiatrist again because you gave me a one-night stand. How come you never came back for seconds? Johnny kissed her on her proffered cheek. You wore me out for a month. I want you to meet my cousin Nino, a nice strong Italian boy. Maybe he can keep up with you. Deanna Dunn turned to give Nino a cool look. Does he like to watch previews? Johnny laughed. I don't think he's ever had the chance. Why don't you break him in? Nino had to take a big drink when he was alone with Deanna Dunn. He was trying to be nonchalant, but it was hard. Deanna Dunn had the upturned nose, the clean-cut classical features of the Anglo-Saxon beauty. And he knew her so well, he had seen her alone in a bedroom, heartbroken, weeping over her dead flyer husband, who had left her with fatherless children. He had seen her angry, hurt, humiliated, yet with a shining dignity when a caddish Clark Gable had taken advantage of her, then left her for a sex pot. Deanna Dunn never played sex pots in the movies. He had seen her flushed with requited love, writhing in the embrace of the man she adored, and he had seen her die beautifully at least a half dozen times. He had seen her and heard her and dreamed about her, and yet he was not prepared for the first thing she said to him alone. Johnny is one of the few men with balls in this town. The rest are all fags and sick morons who couldn't get it up with a broad if you pumped a truckload of Spanish fly into their scrotums. She took Nino by the hand and led him into a corner of the room, out of traffic and out of competition. Then, still coolly charming, she asked him about himself. He saw through her. He saw that she was playing the role of the rich society girl who was being kind to the stable boy or the chauffeur, but who in the movie would either discourage his amatory interest if the part were played by Spencer Tracy, or throw up everything in her mad desire for him if the part were played by Clark Gable. But it didn't matter. He found himself telling her about how he and Johnny had grown up together in New York, about how he and Johnny had sung together on little club dates. He found her marvelously sympathetic and interested. Once, she asked casually, do you know how Johnny made that bastard Jack Waltz give him the part? Nino froze and shook his head. She didn't pursue it. The time had come to see the preview of a new Waltz movie. Deanna Dunn led Nino, her warm hand imprisoning his, to an interior room of the mansion that had no windows, but was furnished with about fifty small two-person couches scattered around in such a way as to give each one a little island of semi-privacy. Nino saw there was a small table beside the couch, 
and on the table were an ice bowl, glasses, and bottles of liquor, plus a tray of cigarettes. He gave Deanna Dunn a cigarette, lit it, and then mixed them both drinks. They didn't speak to each other. After a few minutes, the lights went out. He had been expecting something outrageous. After all, he'd heard the legends of Hollywood depravity, but he was not quite prepared for Deanna Dunn's voracious plummet on his sexual organ without even a courteous and friendly word of preparation. He kept sipping his drink and watching the movie, but not tasting, not seeing. He was excited in a way he had never been before, but part of it was because this woman servicing him in the dark had been the object of his adolescent dreams. Yet in a way, his masculinity was insulted. So when the world-famous Deanna Dunn was sated and had tidied him up, he very coolly fixed her a fresh drink in the darkness and lit her a fresh cigarette, and said in the most relaxed voice imaginable, This looks like a pretty good movie. He felt her stiffen beside him on the couch. Could it be she was waiting for some sort of compliment? Nino poured his glass full from the nearest bottle his hand touched in the darkness. The hell with that. She treated him like a goddamn male whore. For some reason now, he felt a cold anger at all these women. They watched the picture for another fifteen minutes. He leaned away from her so their bodies did not touch. Finally, she said in a low, harsh whisper, Don't be such a snotty punk. You liked it. You were as big as a house. Nino sipped his drink and said in his natural, offhand manner, That's the way it always is. You should see it when I get excited. She laughed a little and kept quiet for the rest of the picture. Finally, it was over and the lights went on. Nino took a look around. He could see there had been a ball here in the darkness, though oddly enough he hadn't heard a thing. But some of the dames had that hard, shiny, bright-eyed look of women who have just been worked over real good. They sauntered out of the projection room. Deanna Dunn left him immediately to go over and talk to an older man Nino recognized as a famous featured player. Only now, seeing the guy in person, he realized that he was a fag. He sipped his drink thoughtfully. Johnny Fontaine came up beside him. Hi, old buddy. Having a good time? Nino grinned. I don't know. It's different. Now, when I go back to the old neighborhood, I can say Deanna Dunn had me. Johnny laughed. She can be better than that if she invites you home with her, did she? Nino shook his head. I got too interested in the movie. But this time, Johnny didn't laugh. Get serious, kid. A dame like that can do you a lot of good. And you used to boff anything. Man, sometimes I still get nightmares when I remember those ugly broads you used to bang. Nino waved his glass drunkenly. Yeah, they were ugly, but they were women. Deanna Dunn, in the corner, turned her head to look at them. Nino waved his glass at her in greeting. Johnny Fontaine sighed. Okay, you're just a guinea peasant. Yeah, and I ain't gonna change. Nino said with his charmingly drunken smile. Johnny understood him perfectly. He knew Nino was not as drunk as he pretended. He knew that Nino was only pretending so that he could say things which he felt were too rude to say to his new Hollywood padrone when sober. He put his arm around Nino's neck and said affectionately, You wise guy, bum. You know you got an ironclad contract for a year and you can say and do anything you want and I can't fire you. You can't fire me? No. Then fuck you. For a moment, Johnny was surprised into anger. He saw the careless grin on Nino's face. But in the past few years, he must have gotten smarter, or his own descent from stardom had made him more sensitive. In that moment, he understood Nino, why his boyhood singing partner had never become successful, why he was trying to destroy any chance of success now that Nino was reacting away from all the prices of success, that in some way he felt insulted by everything that was being done for him. Johnny took Nino by the arm and led him out of the house. Nino could barely walk now. Johnny was talking to him soothingly. Okay, kid, you just sing for me. I want to make dough on you. I won't try to run your life. You do whatever you want to do, okay, paisan? All you got to do is sing for me and earn me money now that I can't sing anymore. You got that, old buddy? Nino straightened up. I'll sing for you, Johnny. I'm a better singer than you now. I was always a better singer than you. You know that? Johnny stood there thinking, so that was it. He knew that when his voice was healthy, Nino simply wasn't in the same league with him. Never had been in those years they had sung together as kids. He saw Nino was waiting for an answer, weaving drunkenly in the California moonlight. Fuck you. And they both laughed together, like the old days, when they had both been equally young. When Johnny Fontaine got word about the shooting of Don Corleone, he not only worried about his godfather, but also wondered whether the financing for his movie was still alive. He had wanted to go to New York to pay his respects to his godfather in the hospital, but he had been told not to get any bad publicity. That was the last thing Don Corleone would want. So he waited. A week later, a messenger came from Tom Hagen. Financing was still on, but for only one picture at a time. 
Meanwhile, Johnny let Nino go his own way in Hollywood and California, and Nino was doing all right with the young starlets. Sometimes Johnny called him up for a night out together, but never leaned on him. When they talked about the Don getting shot, Nino said to Johnny, You know, once I asked the Don for a job in his organization, he wouldn't give it to me. I was tired of driving a truck, and I wanted to make a lot of dough. You know what he told me? He says every man has only one destiny, and that my destiny was to be an artist, meaning that I couldn't be a racket guy. Johnny thought that one over. The Godfather must be just about the smartest guy in the world. He'd known immediately that Nino could never make a racket guy, would only get himself in trouble or get killed. Get killed with just one of his wisecracks. But how did the Don know that he would be an artist? Because, God damn it, he figured that someday I'd help Nino. And how did he figure that? Because he would drop the word to me, and I would try to show my gratitude. Of course, he never asked me to do it. He just let me know it would make him happy if I did it. Johnny Fontaine sighed. Now the Godfather was hurt, in trouble and he could kiss the Academy Award goodbye with Waltz working against him and no help on his side. Only the Don had the personal contacts that could apply pressure, and the Corleone family had other things to think about. Johnny had offered to help. Hagen had given him a curt no. Johnny was busy getting his own picture going. The author of the book he had starred in had finished his new novel and came west on Johnny's invitation to talk it over without agents or studios getting into the act. This is the end of disc number five. Please insert disc number six. This is disc number six. Johnny was busy getting his own picture going. The author of the book he had starred in had finished his new novel and came west on Johnny's invitation to talk it over without agents or studios getting into the act. The second book was perfect for what Johnny wanted. He wouldn't have to sing. It had a good gutsy story with plenty of dames and sex, and it had a part that Johnny instantly recognized as tailor-made for Nino. The character talked like Nino, acted like him, even looked like him. It was uncanny. All Nino would have to do would be to get up on the screen and be himself. Johnny worked fast. He found that he knew a lot more about production than he thought he did, but he hired an executive producer, a man who knew his stuff but had trouble finding work because of the blacklist. Johnny didn't take advantage, but gave the man a fair contract. He told the man, frankly, I expect you to save me more dough this way. So he was surprised when the executive producer came to him and told him the union rep had to be taken care of to the tune of $50,000. There were a lot of problems dealing with overtime and hiring, and the $50,000 would be well spent. Johnny debated whether the executive producer was hustling him, and then said, Send the union guy to me. The union guy was Billy Goff. Johnny said to him, I thought the union stuff was fixed by my friends. I was told not to worry about it at all. Who told you that? You know goddamn well who told me. I won't say his name, but if he tells me something, that's it. Well, things have changed. Your friend is in trouble, and his word don't go this far west anymore. Johnny shrugged. See me in a couple of days, okay? Goff smiled. Sure, Johnny. But calling in New York ain't gonna help you. But calling New York did help. Johnny spoke to Hagen at his office. Hagen told him bluntly not to pay. Your godfather will be sore as hell if you pay that bastard a dime. It'll make the Don lose respect, and right now he can't afford that. Can I talk to the Don? Will you talk to him? I gotta get the picture rolling. Nobody can talk to the Don right now. He's too sick. I'll talk to Sonny about fixing things up, but I'll make the decision on this. Don't pay that smart bastard a dime. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Annoyed, Johnny hung up. Union trouble could add a fortune to making the film and screw up the works generally. For a moment, he debated slipping Goff the 50 grand on the quiet. After all, the Don telling him something and Hagen telling him something and giving him orders were two different things. But he decided to wait for a few days. By waiting, he saved $50,000. Two nights later, Goff was found shot to death in his home in Glendale. There was no more talk of union trouble. Johnny was a little shaken by the killing. It was the first time the long arm of the Don had struck such a lethal blow so close to him. As the weeks went by and he became busier and busier with getting the script ready, casting the movie, and working out production details, Johnny Fontaine forgot about his voice, his not being able to sing. Yet, when the Academy Award nominations came out and he found himself one of the candidates, 
He was depressed because he was not asked to sing one of the songs nominated for the Oscar at the ceremony that would be televised nationally. But he shrugged it off and kept working. He had no hope of winning the Academy Award now that his godfather was no longer able to put pressure on, but getting the nomination had some value. The record he and Nino had cut, the one of Italian songs, was selling much better than anything he had cut lately. But he knew that it was Nino's success more than his. He resigned himself to never being able to again sing professionally. Once a week, he had dinner with Jenny and the kids. No matter how hectic things got, he never skipped that duty. But he didn't sleep with Jenny. Meanwhile, his second wife had finagled a Mexican divorce, and so he was a bachelor again. Oddly enough, he was not that frantic to bang starlets who would have been easy meat. He was too snobbish, really. He was hurt that none of the young stars, the actresses who were still on top, ever gave him a tumble. But it was good to work hard. Most nights he would go home alone, put his old records on the player, have a drink, and hum along with them for a few bars. He had been good. Damn good. He hadn't realized how good he was. Even aside from the special voice, which could have happened to anybody, he was good. He had been a real artist and never knew it, and never knew how much he loved it. He'd ruined his voice with booze and tobacco and broads just when he really knew what it was all about. Sometimes Nino came over for a drink and listened with him, and Johnny would say to him scornfully, You guinea bastard, you never sang like that in your life. And Nino would give him that curiously charming smile and shake his head and say, No, and I never will, in a sympathetic voice, as if he knew what Johnny was thinking. Finally, a week before shooting the new picture, the Academy Award night rolled around. Johnny invited Nino to come along, but Nino refused. Johnny said, Buddy, I never asked you a favor, right? Do me a favor tonight and come with me. You're the only guy who'll really feel sorry for me if I don't win. For one moment, Nino looked startled. Then he said, Sure, old buddy, I can make it. He paused for a moment and said, If you don't win, forget it. Just get as drunk as you can and I'll take care of you. Hell, I won't even drink myself tonight. How about that for being a buddy? Man, that's some buddy. The Academy Award night came and Nino kept his promise. He came to Johnny's house dead sober and they left for the presentation theater together. Nino wondered why Johnny hadn't invited any of his girls or his ex-wives to the award dinner, especially Ginny. Didn't he think Ginny would root for him? Nino wished he could have just one drink. It looked like a long, bad night. Nino Valenti found the whole Academy Award affair a bore until the winner of the Best Male Actor was announced. When he heard the words, Johnny Fontaine, he found himself jumping into the air and applauding. Johnny reached out a hand for him to shake, and Nino shook it. He knew his buddy needed human contact with someone he trusted, and Nino felt an enormous sadness that Johnny didn't have anyone better than himself to touch in his moment of glory. What followed was an absolute nightmare. Jack Waltz's picture had swept all the major awards, and so the studio's party was swamped with newspaper people and all the on-the-make hustlers, male and female. Nino kept his promise to remain sober, and he tried to watch over Johnny. But the women of the party kept pulling Johnny Fontaine into bedrooms for a little chat, and Johnny kept getting drunker and drunker. Meanwhile, the woman who had won the award for the best actress was suffering the same fate, but loving it more and handling it better. Nino turned her down, the only man at the party to do so. Finally, somebody had a great idea, the public mating of the two winners, everybody else at the party to be spectators in the stands. The actress was stripped down, and the other women started to undress Johnny Fontaine. It was then that Nino, the only sober person there, grabbed the half-clothed Johnny and slung him over his shoulder and fought his way out of the house and to their car. As he drove Johnny home, Nino thought that if that was success, he didn't want it. Book 3, Chapter 14 The Don was a real man at the age of twelve, short, dark, slender, living in the strange, moorish-looking village of Corleone in Sicily, he had been born Vito Andolini, but when strange men came to kill the son of the man they had murdered, his mother sent the young boy to America to stay with friends. And in the new land, he changed his name to Corleone, to preserve some tie with his native village. It was one of the few gestures of sentiment he was ever to make. In Sicily at the turn of the century, the Mafia was the second government, far more powerful than the official one in Rome. Vito Corleone's father became involved in a feud with another villager who took his case to the Mafia. The father refused to knuckle under and in a public quarrel killed the local Mafia chief. A week later, he himself was found dead, his body torn apart by Lupara blasts. 
A month after the funeral, Mafia gunmen came inquiring after the young boy, Vito. They had decided that he was too close to manhood, that he might try to avenge the death of his father in the years to come. The twelve-year-old Vito was hidden by relatives and shipped to America. There he was boarded with the Abandandos, whose son Genko was later to become consigliere to his Don. Young Vito went to work in the Abandando grocery store on Ninth Avenue in New York's Hell's Kitchen. At the age of 18, Vito married an Italian girl freshly arrived from Sicily, a girl of only 16, but a skilled cook, a good housewife. They settled down in a tenement on 10th Avenue near 35th Street, only a few blocks from where Vito worked, and two years later were blessed with their first child, Santino, called by all his friends Sonny because of his devotion to his father. In the neighborhood lived a man called Fanucci. He was a heavy-set, fierce-looking Italian who wore expensive light-colored suits and a cream-colored fedora. This man was reputed to be of the Black Hand, an offshoot of the Mafia which extorted money from families and storekeepers by threat of physical violence. However, since most of the inhabitants of the neighborhood were violent themselves, Fanucci's threats of bodily harm were effective only with elderly couples without male children to defend them. Some of the storekeepers paid him trifling sums as a matter of convenience. However, Fanucci was also a scavenger on fellow criminals, people who illegally sold Italian lottery or ran gambling games in their homes. The Abandando grocery gave him a small tribute, this despite the protests of young Jenko, who told his father he would settle the Fanucci hash. His father forbade him. Vito Corleone observed all this without feeling in any way involved. One day, Fanucci was set upon by three young men who cut his throat from ear to ear, not deeply enough to kill him, but enough to frighten him and make him bleed a great deal. Vito saw Fanucci fleeing from his punishers, the circular slash flowing red. What he never forgot was Fanucci holding the cream-colored fedora under his chin to catch the dripping blood as he ran, as if he did not want his suit soiled or did not want to leave a shameful trail of carmine. But this attack proved a blessing in disguise for Fanucci. The three young men were not murderers, merely tough young boys determined to teach him a lesson and stop him from scavenging. Fanucci proved himself a murderer. A few weeks later, the knife wielder was shot to death, and the families of the two other young men paid an indemnity to Fanucci to make him forswear his vengeance. After that, the tributes became higher, and Fanucci became a partner in the neighborhood gambling games. As for Vito Corleone, it was none of his affair. He forgot about it immediately. During World War I, when imported olive oil became scarce, Fanucci acquired a part interest in the Abandando grocery store by supplying it not only with oil, but imported Italian salami, hams, and cheeses. He then moved a nephew into the store, and Vito Corleone found himself out of a job. By this time, the second child, Federico, had arrived, and Vito Corleone had four mouths to feed. Up to this time, he had been a quiet, very contained young man who kept his thoughts to himself. The son of the grocery store owner, young Genko Abandando, was his closest friend, and to the surprise of both of them, Vito reproached his friend for his father's deed. Genko, flushed with shame, vowed to Vito that he would not have to worry about food, that he, Genko, would steal food from the grocery to supply his friend's needs. This offer, though, was sternly refused by Vito as too shameful, a son stealing from his father. The young Vito, however, felt a cold anger for the dreaded Fanucci. He never showed this anger in any way, but bided his time. He worked in the railroad for a few months, and then, when the war ended, work became slow and he could earn only a few days' pay a month. Also, most of the foremen were Irish and American and abused the workmen in the foulest language, which Vito always bore stone-faced as if he did not comprehend, though he understood English very well, despite his accent. One evening, as Vito was having supper with his family, there was a knock on the window that led to the open air shaft that separated them from the next building. When Vito pulled aside the curtain, he saw to his astonishment one of the young men in the neighborhood, Peter Clemenza, leaning out from a window on the other side of the shaft. He was extending a white-sheeted bundle. Clemenza said, Hey, paisan, hold these for me until I ask for them. Hurry up. Automatically, Vito reached over the empty space of the air shaft and took the bundle. Clemenza's face was strained and urgent. He was in some sort of trouble and Vito's helping action was instinctive, but when he untied the bundle in his kitchen, there were five oily guns staining the white cloth. He put them in his bedroom closet and waited. He learned that Clemenza had been taken away by the police. They must have been knocking on his door when he handed the guns over the air shaft. Vito never said a word to anyone, 
and of course his terrified wife dared not open her lips, even in gossip, for fear her own husband would be sent to prison. Two days later, Peter Clemenza reappeared in the neighborhood and asked Vito casually, Do you have my goods still? Vito nodded. He was in the habit of talking little. Clemenza came up to his tenement flat and was given a glass of wine, while Vito dug the bundle out of his bedroom closet. Clemenza drank his wine, his heavy, good-natured face alertly watching Vito. Did you look inside? Vito, his face impassive, shook his head. I'm not interested in things that don't concern me. They drank wine together the rest of the evening. They found each other congenial. Clemenza was a storyteller. Vito Corleone was a listener to storytellers. They became casual friends. A few days later, Clemenza asked the wife of Vito Corleone if she would like a fine rug for her living room floor. He took Vito with him to help carry the rug. Clemenza led Vito to an apartment house with two marble pillars and a white marble stoop. He used a key to open the door, and they were inside a plush apartment. Clemenza grunted, Go on the other side of the room and help me roll it up. The rug was a rich red wool. Vito Corleone was astonished by Clemenza's generosity. Together they rolled the rug into a pile, and Clemenza took one end while Vito took the other. They lifted it and started carrying it toward the door. At that moment, the apartment bell rang. Clemenza immediately dropped the rug and strode to the window. He pulled the drape aside slightly, and what he saw made him draw a gun from inside his jacket. It was only at that moment the astonished Vito Corleone realized that they were stealing the rug from some stranger's apartment. The apartment bell rang again. Vito went up alongside Clemenza so that he, too, could see what was happening. At the door was a uniformed policeman. As they watched, the policeman gave the doorbell a final push, then shrugged and walked away down the marble steps and down the street. Clemenza grunted in a satisfied way. Come on, let's go. He picked up his end of the rug, and Vito picked up the other end. The policeman had barely turned the corner before they were edging out the heavy oaken door and into the street with the rug between them. Thirty minutes later, they were cutting the rug to fit the living room of Vito Corleone's apartment. They had enough left over for the bedroom. Clemenza was an expert workman, and from the pockets of his wide, ill-fitting jacket, even then he liked to wear loose clothes, though he was not so fat, he had the necessary carpet-cutting tools. Time went on. Things did not improve. The Corleone family could not eat the beautiful rug. Very well, there was no work. His wife and children must starve. Vito took some parcels of food from his friend Genko while he thought things out. Finally, he was approached by Clemenza and Tessio, another young tough of the neighborhood. They were men who thought well of him, the way he carried himself, and they knew he was desperate. They proposed to him that he become one of their gang, which specialized in hijacking trucks of silk dresses after those trucks were loaded up at the factory on 31st Street. There was no risk. The truck drivers were sensible working men who, at the sight of a gun, flopped on the sidewalk like angels, while the hijackers drove the truck away to be unloaded at a friend's warehouse. Some of the merchandise would be sold to an Italian wholesaler. Part of the loot would be sold door-to-door -door in the Italian neighborhoods, Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, Mulberry Street, and the Chelsea District in Manhattan, all to poor Italian families looking for a bargain, whose daughters could never be able to afford such fine apparel. Clemenza and Tessio needed Vito to drive since they knew he chauffeured the Abandando grocery store delivery truck. In 1919, skilled automobile drivers were at a premium. Against his better judgment, Vito Corleone accepted their offer. The clinching argument was that he would clear at least a thousand dollars for his share of the job. But his young companions struck him as rash, the planning of the job haphazard, the distribution of the loot foolhardy. Their whole approach was too careless for his taste but he thought them of good, sound character. Peter Clemenza, already burly, inspired a certain trust, and the lean, saturnine Tessio inspired confidence. The job itself went off without a hitch. Vito Corleone felt no fear, much to his astonishment, when his two comrades flashed guns and made the driver get out of the silk truck. He was also impressed with the coolness of Clemenza and Tessio. They didn't get excited, but joked with the driver, told him if he was a good lad, they'd send his wife a few dresses. Because Vito thought it stupid to peddle dresses himself, and so gave his whole share of stock to the fence, he made only $700, but this was a considerable sum of money in 1919. The next day on the street, Vito Corleone was stopped by the cream-suited, white-fedora Fanucci. Fanucci was a brutal-looking man, and he had done nothing to disguise the circular scar that stretched in a white semicircle from ear to ear, looping under his chin. He had heavy, black brows and coarse features, which, when he smiled, 
were in some odd way amiable. He spoke with a very thick Sicilian accent. He said to Vito, Ah, young fellow, people tell me you're rich, you and your two friends. But don't you think you've treated me a little shabbily? After all, this is my neighborhood, and uh, you should let me wet my beak. He used the Sicilian phrase of the Mafia, Fari vagnare a pizzu. Pizzu means the beak of any small bird such as a canary. The phrase itself was a demand for part of the loot. As was his habit, Vito Corleone did not answer. He understood the implication immediately and was waiting for a definite demand. Fanucci smiled at him, showing gold teeth and stretching his noose-like scar tight around his face. He mopped his face with a handkerchief and unbuttoned his jacket for a moment as if to cool himself, but really to show the gun he carried stuck in the waistband of his comfortably wide trousers. Then he sighed and said, Give me five hundred dollars and I'll forget the insult. After all, young people don't know the courtesies to a man like myself. Vito Corleone smiled at him, and even as a young man, still unblooded, there was something so chilling in his smile that Fanucci hesitated a moment before going on. Otherwise, the police will come to see you. Your wife and children will be shamed and destitute. Of course. If my information as to your gains is incorrect, I'll dip my beak just a little. But no less than three hundred dollars. And don't try to deceive me. For the first time, Vito Corleone spoke. His voice was reasonable, showed no anger. It was courteous, as befitted a young man speaking to an older man of Fenucci's eminence. He said softly, My two friends have my share of the money. I'll have to speak to them. Fenucci was reassured. You can tell your two friends that I expect them to let me wet my beak in the same manner. Don't be afraid to tell them. Clemence and I know each other well. He understands these things. Let yourself be guided by him. He has more experience in these matters. Vito Corleone shrugged. He tried to look a little embarrassed. Of course. You understand this is all new to me. Thank you for speaking to me as a godfather. Fanucci was impressed. <laughs> You're a good fellow. He took Vito's hand and clasped it in both of his hairy ones. You have respect. A fine thing in the young. Next time speak to me first, eh? Perhaps I can help you in your plans. In later years, Vito Corleone understood that what had made him act in such a perfect, tactical way with Fanucci was the death of his own hot-tempered father, who had been killed by the Mafia in Sicily. But at that time, all he felt was an icy rage that this man planned to rob him of the money he had risked his life and freedom to earn. He had not been afraid. Indeed, he thought at that moment that Fanucci was a crazy fool. From what he had seen of Clemenza, that burly Sicilian would sooner give up his life than a penny of his loot. After all, Clemenza had been ready to kill a policeman merely to steal a rug, and the slender Tessio had the deadly air of a viper. But later that night, in Clemenza's tenement apartment across the air shaft, Vito Corleone received another lesson in the education he had just begun. Clemenza cursed, Tessio scowled, but then both men started talking about whether Fanucci would be satisfied with two hundred dollars. Tessio thought he might. Clemenza was positive. Now, that scar-faced bastard must have found out what we made from the wholesale who bought the dresses. Fanucci won't take a dime less than three hundred dollars. We'll have to pay. Vito was astonished, but was careful not to show his astonishment. Why do we have to pay him? What can he do to the three of us? We're stronger than him, we have guns. Why do we have to hand over the money we earn? Fanucci has friends, real brutes. He has connections with the police. He'd like us to tell him our plans because he could set us up for the cops and earn their gratitude. And they would owe him a favor. That's how he operates. And he has a license from Maranzala himself to work this neighborhood. Maranzala was a gangster often in the newspapers, reputed to be the leader of a criminal ring specializing in extortion, gambling, and armed robbery. Clemenza served wine that he had made himself. His wife, after putting a plate of salami, olives, and a loaf of Italian bread on the table, went down to sit with her women cronies in front of the building, carrying her chair with her. She was a young Italian girl, only a few years in the country, and did not yet understand English. Vito Corleone sat with his two friends and drank wine. He had never used his intelligence before as he was using it now. He was surprised at how clearly he could think. 
He recalled everything he knew about Fanucci. He remembered the day the man had had his throat cut and had run down the street holding his fedora under his chin to catch the dripping blood. He remembered the murder of the man who had wielded the knife and the other two having their sentences removed by paying an indemnity. And suddenly he was sure that Fanucci had no great connections, could not possibly have, not a man who informed to the police, not a man who allowed his vengeance to be bought off. A real mafioso chief would have had the other two men killed also. No, Fanucci had got lucky and killed one man, but had known he could not kill the other two after they were alerted, and so he had allowed himself to be paid. It was the personal, brutal force of the man that allowed him to levy tribute on the shopkeepers, the gambling games that ran in the tenement apartments. But Vito Corleone knew of at least one gambling game that had never paid Fanucci tributes, and nothing had ever happened to the man running it. And so it was Fanucci alone, or Fanucci with some gunmen hired for special jobs on a strictly cash basis, which left Vito Corleone with another decision, the course his own life must take. From this experience came his oft-repeated belief that every man has but one destiny. On that night, he could have paid Fanucci the tribute and have become again a grocery clerk with perhaps his own grocery store in the years to come. But destiny had decided that he was to become a Don and had brought Fanucci to him to set him on his destined path. When they finished the bottle of wine, Vito said cautiously to Clemenza and Tessio, If you like, why not give me two hundred dollars each to pay Fanucci? I guarantee he will accept that amount from me. Then leave everything in my hands. I'll settle this problem to your satisfaction. At once, Clemenza's eyes gleamed with suspicion. Vito said to him coldly, I never lie to people I have accepted as my friends. Speak to Fanucci yourself tomorrow. Let him ask you for the money, but don't pay him, and don't in any way quarrel with him. Tell him you have to get the money and will give it to me to give to him. Let him understand that you are willing to pay what he asks. Don't bargain. I'll quarrel over the price with him. There's no point making him angry with us if he's as dangerous a man as you say he is. They left it at that. The next day, Clemenza spoke with Fanucci to make sure that Vito was not making up the story. Then, Clemenza came to Vito's apartment and gave him the two hundred dollars. He peered at Vito Corleone and said, Fanucci told me nothing below three hundred dollars. How will you make him take less? Surely that's no concern of yours. Just remember that I have done you a service. Tessio came later. Tessio was more reserved than Clemenza, sharper, more clever, but with less force. He sensed something amiss, something not quite right. He was a little worried. He said to Vito Corleone, Watch yourself with that bastard of a black hand. He's tricky as a priest. You want me to be here when you hand him the money, as a witness? Vito Corleone shook his head. He didn't even bother to answer. He merely said to Tessio, Tell Fanucci I'll pay him the money here, in my house, at nine o'clock tonight. I'll have to give him a glass of wine and talk. Reason with him to take the lesser sum. Tessio shook his head. You won't have much luck. Fanucci never retreats. I'll reason with him. It was to become a famous phrase in the years to come. It was to become the warning rattle before a deadly strike. When he became a Don and asked opponents to sit down and reason with him, they understood it was the last chance to resolve an affair without bloodshed and murder. Vito Corleone told his wife to take the two children, Sonny and Fredo, down into the street after supper and on no account to let them come up to the house until he gave her permission. She was to sit on guard at the tenement door. He had some private business with Fanucci that could not be interrupted. He saw the look of fear on her face and was angry. Do you think you've married a fool? She didn't answer. She did not answer because she was frightened, not of Fanucci now, but of her husband. He was changing visibly before her eyes, hour by hour, into a man who radiated some dangerous force. He had always been quiet, speaking little, but always gentle, always reasonable, which was extraordinary in a young Sicilian male. What she was seeing was the shedding of his protective coloration of a harmless nobody, now that he was ready to start on his destiny. He had started late, he was twenty-five years old, but he was to start with a flourish. Vito Corleone had decided to murder Fanucci. By doing so, he would have an extra $700 in his bankroll. The $300 he himself would have to pay the Black Hand terrorist, and the $200 from Tessio, and the $200 from Clemenza. If he did not kill Fanucci, he would have to pay the man $700 cold cash. 
Fanucci alive was not worth $700 to him. He would not pay $700 to keep Fanucci alive. If Fanucci needed $700 for an operation to save his life, he would not give Fanucci $700 for the surgeon. He owed Fanucci no personal debt of gratitude. They were not blood relatives. He did not love Fanucci. Why for, then, should he give Fanucci $700? And it followed inevitably that since Fanucci wished to take $700 from him by force, why should he not kill Fanucci? Surely the world could do without such a person. There were, of course, some practical reasons. Fanucci might indeed have powerful friends who would seek vengeance. Fanucci himself was a dangerous man, not so easily killed. There were the police and the electric chair. But Vito Corleone had lived under a sentence of death since the murder of his father. As a boy of twelve, he had fled his executioners and crossed the ocean into a strange land, taking a strange name. And years of quiet observation had convinced him that he had more intelligence and more courage than other men though he had never had the opportunity to use that intelligence and courage. And yet he hesitated before taking the first step toward his destiny. He even packed the seven hundred dollars in a single fold of bills and put the money in a convenient side pocket of his trousers. But he put the money in the left side of his trousers. In the right-hand pocket, he put the gun Clemenza had given him to use in the hijacking of the silk truck. Finucci came promptly at nine in the evening. Vito Corleone set out a jug of homemade wine that Clemenza had given him. Finucci put his white fedora on the table beside the jug of wine. He unloosened his broad, multi-flowered tie, its tomato stains camouflaged by the bright patterns. The summer night was hot, the gaslight feeble. It was very quiet in the apartment. But Vito Corleone was icy. To show his good faith, he handed over the roll of bills and watched carefully as Fanucci, after counting it, took out a wide leather wallet and stuffed the money inside. Fanucci sipped his glass of wine. You still owe me two hundred dollars. His heavy-browed face was expressionless. Vito Corleone said in his cool, reasonable voice, I'm a little short. I've been out of work. Let me owe you the money for a few weeks. This was a permissible gambit. Fanucci had the bulk of the money and would wait. He might even be persuaded to take nothing more, or to wait a little longer. He chuckled over his wine. Ha! <laughs> You're a sharp young fellow. How is it I've never noticed you before? You're too quiet a chap for your own interest. I could find some work for you to do that would be very profitable. Vito Corleone showed his interest with a polite nod and filled up the man's glass from the purple jug. But Fanucci thought better of what he was going to say and rose from his chair and shook Vito's hand. Good night, young fellow. No hard feelings, eh? If I can ever do you a service, let me know. You've done a good job for yourself tonight. Vito let Fanucci go down the stairs and out the building. The street was thronged with witnesses to show that he had left the Corleone home safely. Vito watched from the window. He saw Fanucci turn the corner toward 11th Avenue and knew he was headed toward his apartment, probably to put away his loot before coming out on the streets again. Perhaps to put away his gun. Vito Corleone left his apartment and ran up the stairs to the roof. He traveled over the square block of roofs and descended down the steps of an empty loft building fire escape that left him in the backyard. He kicked the back door open and went through the front door. Across the street was Fanucci's tenement apartment house. The village of tenements extended only as far west as 10th Avenue. 11th Avenue was mostly warehouses and lofts rented by firms who shipped by New York Central Railroad and wanted access to the freight yards that honeycombed the area from 11th Avenue to the Hudson River. Fanucci's apartment house was one of the few left standing in this wilderness and was occupied mostly by bachelor trainmen, yard workers, and the cheapest prostitutes. These people did not sit in the street and gossip like honest Italians. They sat in beer taverns guzzling their pay. So Vito Corleone found it an easy matter to slip across the deserted 11th Avenue and into the vestibule of Fanucci's apartment house. There he drew the gun he had never fired and waited for Fanucci. He watched through the glass door of the vestibule, knowing Fanucci would come down 10th Avenue. Clemenza had showed him the safety on the gun, and he had triggered it empty. But as a young boy in Sicily, at the early age of nine, he had often gone hunting with his father, had often fired the heavy shotgun called the Lupara. It was his skill with the Lupata, even as a small boy, that had brought the sentence of death upon him by his father's murderers. Now, waiting in the darkened hallway, he saw the white blob of Fanucci crossing the street toward the doorway. Vito stepped back, shoulders pressed against the inner door that led to the stairs. He held his gun out to fire. 
His extended hand was only two paces from the outside door. The door swung in. Bonucci, white, broad, smelly, filled the square of light. Vito Corleone fired. The open door let some of the sound escape into the street. The rest of the gun's explosion shook the building. Fanucci was holding on to the sides of the door, trying to stand erect, trying to reach for his gun. The force of his struggle had torn the buttons off his jacket and made it swing loose. His gun was exposed, but so was a spidery vein of red on the white shirt front of his stomach. Very carefully, as if he were plunging a needle into a vein, Vito Corleone fired his second bullet into that red web. Fanucci fell to his knees, propping the door open. He let out a terrible groan, the groan of a man in great physical distress that was almost comical. He kept giving these groans. Vito remembered hearing at least three of them before he put the gun against Fanucci's sweaty, suety cheek and fired into his brain. No more than five seconds had passed when Fanucci slumped into death, jamming the door open with his body. Very carefully, Vito took the wide wallet out of the dead man's jacket pocket and put it inside his shirt. Then he walked across the street into the loft building, through that into the yard, and climbed the fire escape to the roof. From there he surveyed the street. Fanucci's body was still lying in the doorway, but there was no sign of any other person. Two windows had gone up in the tenement, and he could see dark heads poked out, but since he could not see their features, they had certainly not seen his. And such men would not give information to the police. Fanucci might lie there until dawn, or until a patrolman making the rounds stumbled on his body. No person in that house would deliberately expose himself to police suspicion or questioning. They would lock their doors and pretend they had heard nothing. He could take his time. He traveled over the rooftops to his own roof door and down to his own flat. He unlocked the door, went inside, and then locked the door behind him. He rifled the dead man's wallet. Besides the $700 he had given Fanucci, there were only some singles and a $5 note. Tucked inside the flap was an old $5 gold piece probably a luck token. If Fanucci was a rich gangster, he certainly did not carry his wealth with him. This confirmed some of Vito's suspicions. He knew he had to get rid of the wallet and the gun, knowing enough even then that he must leave the gold piece in the wallet. He went up on the roof again and traveled over a few ledges. He threw the wallet down one air shaft, and then he emptied the gun of bullets and smashed its barrel against the roof ledge. The barrel wouldn't break. He reversed it in his hand and smashed the butt against the side of a chimney. The butt split into two halves. He smashed it again, and the pistol broke into barrel and handle, two separate pieces. He used a separate air shaft for each. They made no sound when they struck the earth five stories below, but sank into the soft hill of garbage that had accumulated there. In the morning, more garbage would be thrown out of the windows, and with luck would cover everything. Vito returned to his apartment. He was trembling a little, but was absolutely under control. He changed his clothes, and, fearful that some blood might have splattered on them, he threw them into a metal tub his wife used for washing. He took lye and heavy brown laundry soap to soak the clothes and scrub them with the metal washboard beneath the sink. Then he scoured tub and sink with lye and soap. He found a bundle of newly washed clothes in the corner of the bedroom and mingled his own clothes with these. Then he put on a fresh shirt and trousers and went down to join his wife and children and neighbors in front of the tenement. All these precautions proved to be unnecessary. The police, after discovering the dead body at dawn, never questioned Vito Corleone. Indeed, he was astonished that they never learned about Fanucci's visit to his home on the night he was shot to death. He had counted on that for an alibi, Fanucci leaving the tenement alive. He only learned later that the police had been delighted with the murder of Fanucci and not too anxious to pursue his killers. They had assumed it was another gang execution and had questioned hoodlums with records in the rackets and a history of strong arm. Since Vito had never been in trouble, he never came into the picture. But if he had outwitted the police, his partners were another matter. Peter Clemenza and Tessio avoided him for the next week, for the next two weeks. Then they came to call on him one evening. They came with obvious respect. Vito Corleone greeted them with impassive courtesy and served them wine. Clemenza spoke first. Nobody's collecting from the store owners on Ninth Avenue. Nobody's collecting from the card games and the gambling in the neighborhood. Vito Corleone gazed at both men steadily, but did not reply. Tessio spoke. We could take over Fanucci's customers. They would pay us. Vito Corleone shrugged. Why come to me? I have no interest in such things. Clemenza laughed. Even in his youth, before growing his enormous belly, he had a fat man's laugh. He said now to Vito Corleone, <laughs> How about that gun I gave you for the truck job? Since you won't need it anymore, you can give it back to me. 
Very slowly and deliberately, Vito Corleone took a wad of bills out of his side pocket and peeled off five tens. Here, I'll pay you. I threw the gun away after the truck job. He smiled at the two men. At that time, Vito Corleone did not know the effect of this smile. It was chilling because it attempted no menace. He smiled as if it was some private joke only he himself could appreciate. But since he smiled in that fashion only in affairs that were lethal, and since the joke was not really private, and since his eyes did not smile, and since his outward character was usually so reasonable and quiet, the sudden unmasking of his true self was frightening. Clemenza shook his head. I don't want the money. Vito pocketed the bills. He waited. They all understood each other. They knew he had killed Fanucci, and though they never spoke about it to anyone, the whole neighborhood within a few weeks also knew. Vito Corleone was treated as a man of respect by everyone, but he made no attempt to take over the Fanucci rackets and tributes. What followed then was inevitable. One night, Vito's wife brought a neighbor, a widow, to the flat. The woman was Italian and of unimpeachable character. She worked hard to keep a home for her fatherless children. Her sixteen-year-old son brought home his pay envelope sealed to hand over to her in the old country style. Her seventeen-year-old daughter, a dressmaker, did the same. The whole family sewed buttons on cards at night at slave labor peace rates. The woman's name was Signora Colombo. Vito Corleone's wife said, The Signora has a favor to ask of you. She's having some trouble. Vito Corleone expected to be asked for money, which he was ready to give. But it seemed that Mrs. Colombo owned a dog which her youngest son adored. The landlord had received complaints on the dog barking at night and had told Mrs. Colombo to get rid of it. She had pretended to do so. The landlord had found out that she had deceived him and had ordered her to vacate her apartment. She had promised this time to truly get rid of the dog, and she had done so. But the landlord was so angry that he would not revoke his order. She had to get out, or the police would be summoned to put her out. And her poor little boy had cried so when they had given the dog away to relatives who lived in Long Island. All for nothing, they would lose their home. Vito Corleone asked her gently, Why do you ask me to help you? Mrs. Colombo nodded toward his wife. She told me to ask you. He was surprised. His wife had never questioned him about the clothes he had washed the night he had murdered Fanucci. He had never asked him where all the money came from when he was not working. Even now, her face was impassive. Vito said to Mrs. Colombo, I can give you some money to help you move. Is that what you want? The woman shook her head. She was in tears. All my friends are here. All the girls I grew up with in Italy. How can I move to another neighborhood with strangers? I want you to speak to the landlord to let me stay. Vito nodded. It's done, then. You won't have to move. I'll speak to him tomorrow morning. His wife gave him a smile, which he did not acknowledge, but he felt pleased. Mrs. Colombo looked a little uncertain. You're sure he'll say yes? The landlord? Signor Roberto? Of course he will. He's a good-hearted fellow. Once I explain how things are with you, he'll take pity on your misfortunes. Now, don't let it trouble you any more. Don't get so upset. Guard your health for the sake of your children. The landlord, Mr. Roberto, came to the neighborhood every day to check on the row of five tenements that he owned. He was a padrone, a man who sold Italian laborers just off the boat to the big corporations. With his profits, he had bought the tenements one by one. An educated man from the north of Italy, he felt only contempt for these illiterate southerners from Sicily and Naples who swarmed like vermin through his buildings, who threw garbage down the air shafts, who let cockroaches and rats eat away his walls without lifting a hand to preserve his property. He was not a bad man, he was a good husband and father, but constant worry about his investments, about the money he earned, about the inevitable expenses that came with being a man of property, had worn his nerves to a frazzle, so that he was in a constant state of irritation. When Vito Corleone stopped him on the street to ask for a word, Mr. Roberto was brusque, not rude, since any one of these southerners might stick a knife into you if you rubbed the wrong way, though this young man looked like a quiet fellow. Vito Corleone said, Signor Roberto, the friend of my wife, a poor widow with no man to protect her, tells me that for some reason she has been ordered to move from her apartment in your building. She is in despair. She has no money. She has no friends except those that live here. I told her that I would speak to you, that you are a reasonable man who acted out of some misunderstanding. She has gotten rid of the animal that caused all the trouble, so why shouldn't she stay? As one Italian to another, 
I ask you the favor. Signor Roberto studied the young man in front of him. He saw a man of medium stature, but strongly built, a peasant, but not a bandit, though he so laughingly dared to call himself an Italian. Roberto shrugged. I have already rented the apartment to another family for higher rent. I cannot disappoint them for the sake of your friend. Vito Corleone nodded in agreeable understanding. How much more a month? Five dollars. This was a lie. The railway flat, four dark rooms, rented for twelve dollars a month to the widow, and he had not been able to get more than that from the new tenant. Vito Corleone took a roll of bills out of his pocket and peeled off three tens. Here. Here is the six months increase in advance. You needn't speak to her about it. She's a proud woman. See me again in another six months. But of course you let her keep her dog. Like hell. And who the hell are you to give him your orders? Watch your manners. You'll be out on your Sicilian ass in the street there. Vito Corleone raised his hands in surprise. I'm asking you a favor, only that. One never knows when one might need a friend, isn't that true? Here. Take this money as a sign of my goodwill and make your own decision. I wouldn't dare to quarrel with it. He thrust the money into Mr. Roberto's hand. Do me this little favor. Just take the money and think things over. Tomorrow morning, if you want to give me the money back, by all means do so. If you want the woman out of your house, how can I stop you? It's your property, after all. If you don't want the dog in there, I can understand. I dislike animals myself. He patted Mr. Roberto on the shoulder. Do me this service, eh? I won't forget it. Ask your friends in the neighborhood about me. They'll tell you I'm a man who believes in showing his gratitude. But of course, Mr. Roberto had already begun to understand. That evening, he made inquiries about Vito Corleone. He did not wait until the next morning. He knocked on the Corleone door that very night, apologizing for the lateness of the hour, and accepted a glass of wine from Signora Corleone. He assured Vito Corleone that it had all been a dreadful misunderstanding, that of course Signora Colombo could remain in the flat, of course she could keep her dog. Who were those miserable tenants to complain about noise from a poor animal when they paid such a low rent? At the finish, he threw the thirty dollars Vito Corleone had given him on the table and said, in the most sincere fashion, Your good heart in helping this poor widow has shamed me, and I wish to show that I too have some Christian charity. Her rent will remain what it was. All concerned played this comedy prettily. Vito poured wine, called for cakes, wrung Mr. Roberto's hand, and praised his warm heart. Mr. Roberto sighed and said that having made the acquaintance of such a man as Vito Corleone restored his faith in human nature. Finally, they tore themselves away from each other. Mr. Roberto, his bones turned to jelly with fear at his narrow escape, caught the streetcar to his home in the Bronx and took to his bed. He did not reappear in his tenements for three days. Vito Corleone was now a man of respect in the neighborhood. He was reputed to be a member of the Mafia of Sicily. One day, a man who ran card games in a furnished room came to him and voluntarily paid him twenty dollars each week for his friendship. He had only to visit the game once or twice a week to let the players understand they were under his protection. Store owners who had problems with young hoodlums asked him to intercede. He did so and was properly rewarded. Soon, he had the enormous income for that time and place of one hundred dollars a week. Since Clemenza and Tessio were his friends, his allies, he had to give them each part of the money, but this he did without being asked. Finally, he decided to go into the olive oil importing business with his boyhood chum, Genco Abandando. Genco would handle the business, the importing of the olive oil from Italy, the buying at the proper price, the storing in his father's warehouse. Genco had the experience for this part of the business. Clemenza and Tessio would be the salesmen. They would go to every Italian grocery store in Manhattan, then Brooklyn, then the Bronx, to persuade store owners to stock Genco Pura olive oil. With typical modesty, Vito Corleone refused to name the brand after himself. Vito, of course, would be the head of the firm since he was supplying most of the capital. He also would be called in on special cases, where store owners resisted the sales talks of Clemenza and Tessio. Then Vito Corleone would use his own formidable powers of persuasion. For the next few years, Vito Corleone lived that completely satisfying life of a small businessman wholly devoted to building up his commercial enterprise in a dynamic, expanding economy. He was a devoted father and husband, but so busy he could spare his family little of his time. As Gen Copura olive oil grew to become the best-selling imported Italian oil in America, his organization mushroomed. 
like any good businessman, he came to understand the benefits of undercutting his rivals in price, barring them from distribution outlets by persuading store owners to stock less of their brands. Like any good businessman, he aimed at holding a monopoly by forcing his rivals to abandon the field or by merging with his own company. However, since he had started off relatively helpless economically, since he did not believe in advertising, relying on word of mouth, and since, if truth be told, his olive oil was no better than his competitors, he could not use the common strangleholds of legitimate businessmen. He had to rely on the force of his own personality and his reputation as a man of respect. Even as a young man, Vito Corleone became known as a man of reasonableness. He never uttered a threat. He always used logic that proved to be irresistible. He always made certain that the other fellow got his share of profit. Nobody lost. He did this, of course, by obvious means. Like many businessmen of genius, he learned that free competition was wasteful, monopoly efficient. And so, he simply set about achieving that efficient monopoly. There were some oil wholesalers in Brooklyn, men of fiery temper, headstrong, not amenable to reason, who refused to see, to recognize the vision of Vito Corleone, even after he had explained everything to them with the utmost patience and detail. With these men, Vito Corleone threw up his hands in despair and sent Tessio to Brooklyn to set up a headquarters and solve the problem. Warehouses were burned, truckloads of olive green oil were dumped to form lakes in the cobbled waterfront streets. One rash man, an arrogant Milanese, with more faith in the police than a saint has in Christ, actually went to the authorities with a complaint against his fellow Italians, breaking the ten-century-old law of omerta. But before the matter could progress any further, the wholesaler disappeared, never to be seen again, leaving behind, deserted, his devoted wife and three children, who, God be thanked, were fully grown and capable of taking over his business and coming to terms with the Genkopura Oil Company. But great men are not born great. They grow great. And so it was with Vito Corleone. When prohibition came to pass and alcohol forbidden to be sold, Vito Corleone made the final step from a quite ordinary, somewhat ruthless businessman to a great don in the world of criminal enterprise. It did not happen in a day, it did not happen in a year, but by the end of the prohibition period and the start of the Great Depression, Vito Corleone had become the godfather, the don, Don Corleone. It started casually enough. By this time, the Genco Pura Oil Company had a fleet of six delivery trucks. Through Clemenza, Vito Corleone was approached by a group of Italian bootleggers who smuggled alcohol and whiskey in from Canada. They needed trucks and delivery men to distribute their product over New York City. They needed delivery men who were reliable, discreet, and of a certain determination and force. They were willing to pay Vito Corleone for his trucks and for his men. The fee was so enormous that Vito Corleone cut back drastically on his oil business to use the trucks almost exclusively for the service of the bootlegger smugglers. This, despite the fact that these gentlemen had accompanied their offer with a silky threat. But even then, Vito Corleone was so mature a man that he did not take insult at a threat or become angry and refuse a profitable offer because of it. He evaluated the threat, found it lacking in conviction, and lowered his opinion of his new partners, because they'd been so stupid to use threats where none were needed. This was useful information to be pondered at its proper time. Again, he prospered. But more important, he acquired knowledge and contacts and experience, and he piled up good deeds as a banker piles up securities. For in the following years, it became clear that Vito Corleone was not only a man of talent, but in his way, a genius. He made himself the protector of the Italian families who set themselves up as small speakeasies in their homes, selling whiskey at 15 cents a glass to bachelor laborers. He became godfather to Mrs. Colombo's youngest son when the lad made his confirmation and gave a handsome present of a $20 gold piece. Meanwhile, since it was inevitable that some of his trucks be stopped by the police, Genco Abandando hired a fine lawyer with many contacts in the police department and the judiciary. A system of payoffs was set up. And soon, the Corleone organization had a sizable sheet, the list of officials entitled to a monthly sum. When the lawyer tried to keep this list down, apologizing for the expense, Vito Corleone reassured him. No, no. Get everyone on it, even if they can't help us right now. I believe in friendship, and I'm willing to show my friendship first. As time went by, the Corleone empire became larger. More trucks were added. The sheet grew longer. Also, the men working directly for Tessio and Clemenza grew in number. The whole thing was becoming unwieldy. 
Finally, Vito Corleone worked out a system of organization. He gave Clemenza and Tessio each the title of Capo Regime, or Captain, and the men who worked beneath them the rank of soldier. He named Genco Abandando his counselor, or consigliere. He put layers of insulation between himself and any operational act. When he gave an order, it was to Genco or to one of the Capo Regime alone. Rarely did he have a witness to any order he gave any particular one of them. Then he split Tessio's group and made it responsible for Brooklyn. He also split Tessio off from Clemenza and made it clear over the years that he did not want the two men to associate even socially, except when absolutely necessary. He explained this to the more intelligent Tessio, who caught his drift immediately, though Vito explained it as a security measure against the law. Tessio understood that Vito did not want his two capo regime to have any opportunity to conspire against him, and he also understood there was no ill will involved, merely a tactical precaution. In return, Vito gave Tessio a free hand in Brooklyn while he kept Clemenza's Bronx thief very much under his thumb. Clemenza was the braver, more reckless, the crueler man, despite his outward jollity, and needed a tighter ring. The Great Depression increased the power of Vito Corleone. And indeed, it was about that time he came to be called Don Corleone. Everywhere in the city, honest men begged for honest work in vain. Proud men demeaned themselves and their families to accept official charity from a contemptuous officialdom. But the men of Don Corleone walked the streets with their heads held high, their pockets stuffed with silver and paper money, with no fear of losing their jobs. And even Don Corleone, that most modest of men, could not help feeling a sense of pride. He was taking care of his world his people. He had not failed those who depended on him and gave him the sweat of their brows, risked their freedom and their lives in his service. And when an employee of his was arrested and sent to prison by some mischance, the unfortunate man's family received a living allowance, and not a miserly, beggarly, begrudging pittance, but the same amount the man earned when free. This, of course, was not pure Christian charity. Not his best friends would have called Don Carleone a saint from heaven. There was some self-interest in this generosity. An employee sent to prison knew he had only to keep his mouth shut, and his wife and children would be cared for. He knew that if he did not inform to the police, a warm welcome would be his when he left prison. There would be a party waiting in his home, the best of food, homemade ravioli, wine, pastries, with all his friends and relatives gathered to rejoice in his freedom. And sometime during the night, the consigliere, Genco Abandando, or perhaps even the Don himself, would drop by to pay his respects to such a stalwart, take a glass of wine in his honor, and leave a handsome present of money so that he could enjoy a week or two of leisure with his family before returning to his daily toil. Such was the infinite sympathy and understanding of Don Corleone. It was at this time that the Don got the idea that he ran his world far better than his enemies ran the greater world which continually obstructed his path. And this feeling was nurtured by the poor people of the neighborhood who constantly came to him for help to get on the home relief, to get a young boy a job or out of jail, to borrow a small sum of money desperately needed, to intervene with landlords who against all reason demanded rent from jobless tenants. Don Vito Corleone helped them all. Not only that, he helped them with goodwill, with encouraging words to take the bitter sting out of the charity he gave them. It was only natural then that when these Italians were puzzled and confused on who to vote for to represent them in the state legislature, in the city offices, in the Congress, they should ask the advice of their friend, Don Corleone, their godfather. And so he became a political power to be consulted by practical party chiefs. He consolidated this power with a far-seeing, statesmanlike intelligence by helping brilliant boys from poor Italian families through college, boys who would later become lawyers, assistant district attorneys, and even judges. He planned for the future of his empire with all the foresight of a great national leader. The repeal of Prohibition dealt this empire a crippling blow, but again he had taken his precautions. In 1933 he sent emissaries to the man who controlled all the gambling activities of Manhattan, the crap games on the docks, the shylocking that went with it as hot dogs go with baseball games, the bookmaking on sports and horses, the illicit gambling houses that ran poker games, the policy or numbers racket of Harlem. This man's name was Salvatore Maranzano, and he was one of the acknowledged Pezzo Novante, 90 calibers, or big shots of the New York underworld. The Corleone emissaries proposed to Maranzano an equal partnership beneficial to both parties. Vito Corleone, with his organization, his police, and political contacts, could give the Maranzano operations a stout umbrella and the new strength to expand into Brooklyn and the Bronx. But Maranzano was a short-sighted man and spurned the Corleone offer with contempt. 
The great Al Capone was Maranzano's friend, and he had his own organization, his own men, plus a huge war chest. He would not brook this upstart whose reputation was more that of a parliamentary debater than a true mafioso. Maranzano's refusal touched off the Great War of 1933, which was to change the whole structure of the underworld in New York City. At first glance, it seemed an uneven match. Salvatore Maranzano had a powerful organization with strong enforcers. He had a friendship with Capone in Chicago and could call on help in that quarter. He also had a good relationship with the Tatalia family, which controlled prostitution in the city and what there was of the thin drug traffic at that time. He also had political contacts with powerful business leaders who used his enforcers to terrorize the Jewish unionists in the garment center and the Italian anarchist syndicates in the building trades. Against this, Don Corleone could throw two small but superbly organized regime led by Clemenza and Tessio. His political and police contacts were negated by the business leaders who would support Maranzano. But in his favor was the enemy's lack of intelligence about his organization. The underworld did not know the true strength of his soldiers, and even were deceived that Tessio in Brooklyn was a separate and independent operation. And yet, despite all this, it was an unequal battle until Vito Corleone evened out the odds with one master stroke. Maranzano sent a call to Capone for his two best gunmen to come to New York to eliminate the upstart. Corleone family had friends and intelligence in Chicago who relayed the news that the two gunmen were arriving by train. Vito Corleone dispatched Luca Brasi to take care of them with instructions that would liberate the strange man's most savage instincts. Brasi and his people, four of them, received the Chicago hoods at the railroad station. One of Brasi's men procured and drove a taxicab for the purpose, and the station porter carrying the bags led the Capone men to this cab. When they got in, Brasi and another of his men crowded in after them, guns ready, and made the two Chicago boys lie on the floor. The cab drove to a warehouse near the docks that Brasi had prepared for them. The two Capone men were bound hand and foot, and small bath towels were stuffed into their mouths to keep them from crying out. Then Brasi took an axe from its place against the wall and started hacking at one of the Capone men. He chopped the man's feet off, then the legs at the knees, then the thighs where they joined the torso. Brasi was an extremely powerful man, but it took him many swings to accomplish his purpose. By that time, of course, the victim had given up the ghost, and the floor of the warehouse was slippery with the hacked fragments of his flesh and the gouting of his blood. When Brasi turned to his second victim, he found further effort unnecessary. The second Capone gunman, out of sheer terror, had impossibly swallowed the bath towel in his mouth and suffocated. The bath towel was found in the man's stomach when the police performed their autopsy to determine the cause of death. A few days later in Chicago, the Capones received a message from Vito Corleone. It was to this effect. You know now how I deal with enemies. Why does a Neapolitan interfere in a quarrel between two Sicilians? If you wish me to consider you as a friend, I owe you a service, which I will pay on demand. A man like yourself must know how much more profitable it is to have a friend who, instead of calling on you for help, takes care of his own affairs and stands ever ready to help you in some future time of trouble. If you do not wish my friendship, so be it. But then I must tell you that the climate in this city is damp, unhealthy for Neapolitans, and you are advised never to visit it. The arrogance of this letter was a calculated one. The Don held the Capones in small esteem as stupid, obvious cutthroats. His intelligence informed him that Capone had forfeited all political influence because of his public arrogance and the flaunting of his criminal wealth. The Don knew, in fact was positive, that without political influence, without the camouflage of society, Capone's world and others like it could be easily destroyed. He knew Capone was on the path to destruction. He also knew that Capone's influence did not extend beyond the boundaries of Chicago terrible and all-pervading as that influence there might be. The tactic was successful, not so much because of its ferocity, but because of the chilling swiftness, the quickness of the Don's reaction. If his intelligence was so good, any further moves would be fraught with danger. It was better, far wiser, to accept the offer of friendship with its implied payoff. The Capone sent back word that they would not interfere. The odds were now equal and Vito Corleone had earned an enormous amount of respect throughout the United States underworld with his humiliation of the Capones. For six months, he outgeneraled Maranzano. He raided the crap games under that man's protection, located his biggest policy banker in Harlem, and had him relieved of a day's play, not only in money, but in records. He engaged his enemies on all fronts. Even in the garment centers, he sent Clemenza and his men to fight on the side of the Unionists 
against the enforcers on the payroll of Maranzano and the owners of the dress firms. And on all fronts, his superior intelligence and organization made him the victor. Clemenza's jolly ferocity, which Corleone employed judiciously, also helped turn the tide of battle. And then, Don Corleone sent the held-back reserve of the Tessio regime after Maranzano himself. By this time, Maranzano had dispatched emissaries suing for a peace. Vito Corleone refused to see them, put them off on one pretext or another. The Maranzano soldiers were deserting their leader, not wishing to die in a losing cause. Bookmakers and Shylocks were paying the Corleone organization their protection money. The war was all but over. And then, finally, on New Year's Eve of 1933, Tessio got inside the defenses of Maranzano himself. The Maranzano lieutenants were anxious for a deal, and agreed to lead their chief to the slaughter. They told him that a meeting had been arranged in a Brooklyn restaurant with Corleone, and they accompanied Maranzano as his bodyguards. They left him sitting at a checkered table, morosely munching a piece of bread, and fled the restaurant as Tessio and four of his men entered. The execution was swift and sure. Maranzano, his mouth full of half-chewed bread, was riddled with bullets. The war was over. The Maranzano Empire was incorporated into the Corleone operation. Don Corleone set up a system of tribute, allowing all incumbents to remain in their bookmaking and policy number spots. As a bonus, he had a foothold in the unions of the Garment Center, which in later years was to prove extremely important. And, now that he had settled his business affairs, the Don found trouble at home. Santino Corleone, Sonny, was sixteen years old and grown to an astonishing six feet, with broad shoulders and a heavy face that was sensual, but by no means effeminate. But where Fredo was a quiet boy, and Michael, of course, a toddler, Santino was constantly in trouble. He got into fights, did badly in school, and finally, Clemenza, who was the boy's godfather and had a duty to speak, came to Don Corleone one evening and informed him that his son had taken part in an armed robbery, a stupid affair which could have gone very badly. Sonny was obviously the ringleader, the two other boys in the robbery his followers. It was one of the very few times that Vito Corleone lost his temper. Tom Hagen had been living in his home for three years, and he asked Clemenza if the orphan boy had been involved. Clemenza shook his head. Don Corleone had a car sent to bring Santino to his offices in the Genco Pura Olive Oil Company. For the first time, the Don met defeat. Alone with his son, he gave full vent to his rage, cursing the hulking sunny and Sicilian dialect, a language so much more satisfying than any other for expressing rage. He ended up with a question. What gave you the right to commit such an act? What made you wish to commit such an act? Sonny stood there, angry, refusing to answer. The Don said with contempt, And so stupid. What did you earn for that night's work? Fifty dollars each? Twenty dollars? You risked your life for twenty dollars, eh? As if he'd not heard these last words, Sonny said defiantly, I saw you kill Fanucci. Ah! The Don sank back in his chair. He waited. Sonny said, When Fanucci left the building, Mama said I could go up to the house. I saw you go up to the roof and I followed you. I saw everything you did. I stayed up there and I saw you throw away the wallet and the gun. The Don sighed. Well, then I can't talk to you about how you should behave. Don't you want to finish school? Don't you want to be a lawyer? Lawyers can steal more money with a briefcase than a thousand men with guns and masks. Sonny grinned at him. I want to enter the family business. When he saw that the Don's face remained impassive, that he did not laugh at the joke, he added hastily, I can learn how to sell olive oil. Still, the Don did not answer. Finally, he shrugged. Every man has one destiny. He did not add that the witnessing of Fanucci's murder had decided that of his son. He merely turned away and added quietly, Come in tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Genko will show you what to do. But Genko Abandando, with that shrewd insight that a consigliere must have, realized the true wish of the Don and used Sonny mostly as a bodyguard for his father, a position in which he could also learn the subtleties of being a Don. And it brought out a professional instinct in the Don himself, who often gave lectures on how to succeed for the benefit of his eldest son. Besides his oft-repeated theory that a man has but one destiny, the Don constantly reproved Sonny for that young man's outburst of temper. The Don considered a use of threats the most foolish kind of exposure, the unleashing of anger without forethought as the most dangerous indulgence. No one had ever heard the Don utter a naked threat. No one had ever seen him in an uncontrollable rage. It was unthinkable. And so, he tried to teach Sonny his own disciplines. He claimed that there was no greater natural advantage in life than having an enemy overestimate your faults, unless it was to have a friend underestimate your virtues. 
The Cabo regime, Clemenza, took Sonny in hand and taught him how to shoot and to wield a garrote. Sonny had no taste for the Italian rope. He was too Americanized. He preferred the simple, direct, impersonal Anglo-Saxon gun, which saddened Clemenza. But Sonny became a constant and welcome companion to his father, driving his car, helping him in little details. For the next two years, he seemed like the usual son entering his father's business. Not too bright, not too eager, content to hold down a soft job. Meanwhile, his boyhood chum and semi-adopted brother, Tom Hagen, was going to college. Fredo was still in high school. Michael, the youngest brother, was in grammar school. And baby sister Connie was a toddling girl of four. The family had long since moved to an apartment house in the Bronx. Don Corleone was considering buying a house in Long Island. But he wanted to fit this in with other plans he was formulating. Vito Corleone was a man with vision. All the great cities of America were being torn by underworld strife. Guerrilla wars by the dozen flared up, ambitious hoodlums trying to carve themselves a bit of empire. Men like Corleone himself were trying to keep their borders and rackets secure. Don Corleone saw that the newspapers and government agencies were using these killings to get stricter and stricter laws, to use harsher police methods. He foresaw that public indignation might even lead to a suspension of democratic procedures, which could be fatal to him and his people. His own empire internally was secure. He decided to bring peace to all the warring factions in New York City and then in the nation. He had no illusions about the dangerousness of his mission. He spent the first year meeting with different chiefs of gangs in New York, laying the groundwork, sounding them out, proposing spheres of influence that would be honored by a loosely bound confederated council. But there were too many factions, too many special interests that conflicted. Agreement was impossible. Like other great rulers and lawgivers in history, Don Corleone decided that order and peace were impossible until the number of reigning states had been reduced to a manageable number. There were five or six families too powerful to eliminate, but the rest, the neighborhood black hand terrorists, the freelance Shylocks, the strong arm bookmakers operating without the proper, that is to say, paid protection of the legal authorities, would have to go. And so he mounted what was in effect a colonial war against these people and threw all the resources of the Corleone organization against them. The pacification of the New York area took three years and had some unexpected rewards. At first, it took the form of bad luck. A group of mad dog Irish stick-up artists the Don had marked for extermination almost carried the day with sheer Emerald Isle Elan. By chance, and with suicidal bravery, one of these Irish gunmen pierced the Don's protective cordon and put a shot into his chest. The assassin was immediately riddled with bullets, but the damage was done. However, this gave Santino Corleone his chance. With his father out of action, Sonny took command of a troop, his own regime, with the rank of capo regime, and, like a young, untrumpeted Napoleon, showed a genius for city warfare. He also showed a merciless ruthlessness, the lack of which had been Don Corleone's only fault as a conqueror. From 1935 to 1937, Sonny Corleone made a reputation as the most cunning and relentless executioner the underworld had yet known. Yet for sheer terror, even he was eclipsed by the awesome man named Luca Brasi. It was Brasi who went after the rest of the Irish gunmen and single-handedly wiped them out. It was Brasi operating alone when one of the six powerful families tried to interfere and become the protector of the independence, who assassinated the head of that family as a warning. Shortly after, the Don recovered from his wound and made peace with that particular family. By 1937, peace and harmony reigned in New York City, except for minor incidents, minor misunderstandings, which were, of course, sometimes fatal. As the rulers of ancient cities always kept an anxious eye on the barbarian tribes roving around their walls, so Don Corleone kept an eye on the affairs of the world outside his world. He noted the coming of Hitler, the fall of Spain, Germany's strong-arming of Britain at Munich. Unblinkered by that outside world, he saw clearly the coming global war, and he understood the implications. His own world would be more impregnable than before. Not only that, fortunes could be made in time of war by alert, foresighted folk. But to do so, peace must reign in his domain while war raged in the world outside. Don Corleone carried his message through the United States. He conferred with compatriots in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cleveland, Chicago, Philadelphia, Miami, and Boston. He was the underworld apostle of peace. And by 1939, more successful than any pope, he had achieved a working agreement amongst the most powerful underworld organizations in the country. Like the Constitution of the United States, this agreement respected fully the internal authority of each member in his state or city. The agreement covered only spheres of influence and an agreement to enforce peace in the underworld. And so, when World War II broke out in 1939, when the United States joined the conflict in 1941, 
the world of Don Vito Corleone was at peace, in order, fully prepared to reap the golden harvest on equal terms with all the other industries of a booming America. The Corleone family had a hand in supplying black market OPA food stamps, gasoline stamps, even travel priorities. It could help get war contracts, and then help get black market materials for those garment center clothing firms who were not given enough raw material because they did not have government contracts. He could even get all the young men in his organization, those eligible for army draft, excused from fighting in the foreign war. He did this with the aid of doctors who advised what drugs had to be taken before physical examination, or by placing the men in draft-exempt positions in the war industries. And so the Don could take pride in his rule. His world was safe for those who had sworn their loyalty to him. Other men who believed in law and order were dying by the millions. This is the end of disc number six. Please insert disc number seven. This is disc number seven. And so the Don could take pride in his rule. His world was safe for those who had sworn their loyalty to him. Other men who believed in law and order were dying by the millions. The only fly in the ointment was that his own son, Michael Corleone, refused to be helped, insisted on volunteering to serve his own country. And, to the Don's astonishment, so did a few of his other young men in the organization. One of the men tried to explain this to his capo regime, said, This country has been good to me. Upon this story being relayed to the Don, he said angrily to the capo regime, I have been good to him. It might have gone badly for these people, but as he had excused his son Michael, so must he excuse other young men who so misunderstood their duty to their Don and to themselves. At the end of World War II, Don Corleone knew that again his world would have to change its ways, that it would have to fit itself more snugly into the ways of the other, larger world. He believed he could do this with no loss of profit. There was reason for this belief in his own experience. What had put him on the right track were two personal affairs. Early in his career, the then young Nazarene, only a baker's helper planning to get married, had come to him for assistance. He and his future bride, a good Italian girl, had saved their money and had paid the enormous sum of $300 to a wholesaler of furniture recommended to them. This wholesaler had let them pick out everything they wanted to furnish their tenement apartment, a fine, sturdy bedroom set with two bureaus and lamps. Also, the living room set of heavy stuffed sofa and stuffed armchairs, all covered with rich, gold-threaded fabric. Nazarini and his fiancée had spent a happy day picking out what they wanted from the huge warehouse crowded with furniture. The wholesaler took their money, their three hundred dollars wrung from the sweat of their blood, and pocketed it and promised the furniture to be delivered within the week to the already rented flat. The very next week, however, the firm had gone into bankruptcy. The great warehouse stocked with furniture had been sealed shut and attached for payment of creditors. The wholesaler had disappeared to give other creditors time to unleash their anger on the empty air. Nazarini, one of these, went to his lawyer, who told him nothing could be done until the case was settled in court and all creditors satisfied. This might take three years, and Nazarini would be lucky to get back ten cents on the dollar. Vito Corleone listened to this story with amused disbelief. It was not possible that the law could allow such thievery. The wholesaler owned his own palatial home and estate in Long Island, a luxurious automobile, and was sending his children to college. How could he keep the three hundred dollars of the poor baker Nazarene and not give him the furniture he had paid for? But to make sure, Vito Corleone had Genco Abandando check it out with the lawyers who represented the Genco Pura company. They verified the story of Nazarene. The wholesaler had all his personal wealth in his wife's name. His furniture business was incorporated, and he was not personally liable. True, he had shown bad faith by taking the money of Nazarene when he knew he was going to file bankruptcy. But this was a common practice. Under law, there was nothing to be done. Of course, the matter was easily adjusted. Don Corleone sent his consigliere, Genco Abandando, to speak to the wholesaler, and, as was to be expected, that wide-awake businessman caught the drift immediately and arranged for Nazarini to get his furniture. But it was an interesting lesson for the young Vito Corleone. The second incident had more far-reaching repercussions. In 1939, Don Corleone had decided to move his family out of the city. Like any other parent, he wanted his children to go to better schools and mix with better companions. For his own personal reasons, he wanted the anonymity of suburban life where his reputation was not known. 
He bought the mall property in Long Beach, which at that time had only four newly built houses, but with plenty of room for more. Sonny was formally engaged to Sandra and would soon marry. One of the houses would be for him. One of the houses was for the Don. Another was for Genco Abandando and his family. The other was kept vacant at the time. A week after the mall was occupied, a group of three workmen came in all innocence with their truck. They claimed to be furnace inspectors for the town of Long Beach. One of the Don's young bodyguards let the men in and led them to the furnace in the basement. The Don, his wife, and Sonny were in the garden taking their ease and enjoying the salty sea air. Much to the Don's annoyance, he was summoned into the house by his bodyguard. The three workmen, all big burly fellows, were grouped around the furnace. They had taken it apart. It was strewn around the cement basement floor. Their leader, an authoritative man, said to the Don in a gruff voice, Your furnace is in lousy shape. If you want us to fix it and put it together again, it'll cost you $150 for labor and parts, then we'll pass you to for county inspection. He took out a red paper label. We stamped a seal on it, see, then nobody from the county bothers you again. The Don was amused. It had been a boring, quiet week in which he had had to neglect his business to take care of such family details moving to a new house entailed. In more broken English than his usual slight accent, he asked, If I don't pay you, what happens to my furnace? The leader of the three men shrugged. We just leave the furnace the way it is now. He gestured at the metal parts strewn over the floor. The Don said meekly, Wait, I'll uh, get you your money. Then he went out into the garden and said to Sonny, uh, Listen, uh, there's uh, some men uh, working on the furnace. I don't understand uh, what they want. Uh, go in and uh, take care of the matter. It was not simply a joke. He was considering making his son his underboss. This was one of the tests a business executive had to pass. Sonny's solution did not altogether please his father. It was too direct, too lacking in Sicilian subtleness. He was the club, not the rapier. For as soon as Sonny heard the leader's demand, he held the three men at gunpoint and had them thoroughly bastinadoed by the bodyguards. Then he made them put the furnace together again and tidy up the basement. He searched them and found that they actually were employed by a house improvement firm with headquarters in Suffolk County. He learned the name of the man who owned the firm. Then he kicked the three men to their truck. Don't let me see you in Long Beach again. I'll have your balls hanging from your ears. It was typical of the young Santino, before he became older and crueler, that he extended his protection to the community he lived in. Sonny paid a personal call to the home improvement firm owner and told him not to send any of his men into the Long Beach area ever again. As soon as the Corleone family set up their usual business liaison with the local police force, they were informed of all such complaints and all crimes by professional criminals. In less than a year, Long Beach became the most crime-free town of its size in the United States. Professional stick-up artists and strong arms received one warning not to ply their trade in the town. They were allowed one offense. When they committed a second, they simply disappeared. The flim-flam home improvement chip artists, the door-to-door -door con men, were politely warned that they were not welcome in Long Beach. Those confident con men who disregarded the warning were beaten within an inch of their lives. Resident young punks who had no respect for law and proper authority were advised in the most fatherly fashion to run away from home. Long Beach became a model city. What impressed the Don was the legal validity of these sale swindles. Clearly there was a place for a man of his talents in that other world which had been closed to him as an honest youth. He took appropriate steps to enter that world. And so he lived happily on the mall in Long Beach, consolidating and enlarging his empire, until, after the war was over, the Turk Salazzo broke the peace and plunged the Don's world into its own war and brought him to his hospital bed. Book 4, Chapter 15 in the New Hampshire village, every foreign phenomenon was properly noticed by housewives peering from windows, storekeepers lounging behind their doors. And so, when the black automobile bearing New York license plates stopped in front of the Adams home, every citizen knew about it in a matter of minutes. Kay Adams, really a small-town girl despite her college education, was also peering from her bedroom window. She had been studying for her exams and preparing to go downstairs for lunch when she spotted the car coming up the street, and for some reason, she was not surprised when it rolled to a halt in front of her lawn. Two men got out, big burly men who looked like gangsters in the movies to her eyes, and she flew down the stairs to be the first at the door. She was sure they came from Michael or his family, and she didn't want them talking to her father and mother without any introduction. It wasn't that she was ashamed of any of Mike's friends, she thought. It was just that her mother and father were old-fashioned New England Yankees and wouldn't understand her even knowing such people. She got to the door just as the bell rang, 
and she called to her mother, I'll get it. She opened the door, and the two big men stood there. One reached inside his breast pocket like a gangster reaching for a gun, and the move so surprised Kay that she let out a little gasp. But the man had taken out a small leather case, which he flapped open to show an identification card. I'm Detective John Phillips from the New York Police Department. He motioned to the other man, a dark-complexioned man with very thick, very black eyebrows. This is my partner, Detective Siriani. Are you Miss Kay Adams? Kay nodded. May we come in and talk to you for a few minutes? It's about Michael Corleone. She stood aside to let them in. At that moment, her father appeared in the small side hall that led to his study. Kay, what is it? Her father was a gray-haired, slender, distinguished-looking man who not only was the pastor of the town Baptist Church, but had a reputation in religious circles as a scholar. Kay really didn't know her father well. He puzzled her, but she knew he loved her, even if he gave the impression he found her uninteresting as a person. Though they had never been close, she trusted him. So, she said simply, These men are detectives from New York. They want to ask me questions about a boy I know. Mr. Adams didn't seem surprised. Why don't we go into my study? We'd rather talk to your daughter alone, Mr. Adams. Now, that depends on Kay, I think. My dear, would you rather speak to these gentlemen alone, or would you prefer to have me present? Or perhaps your mother? Kay shook her head. I'll talk to them alone. You can use my study. Will you stay for lunch? The two men shook their heads. Kay led them into the study. They rested uncomfortably on the edge of the couch as she sat in her father's big leather chair. Detective Phillips opened the conversation. Miss Adams, have you seen or heard from Michael Corleone at any time in the last three weeks? The one question was enough to warn her. Three weeks ago, she had read the Boston newspapers with their headlines about the killing of a New York police captain and a narcotics smuggler named Virgil Salazzo. The newspaper had said it was part of the gang war involving the Corleone family. Kay shook her head. No, the last time I saw him he was going to see his father in the hospital. That was perhaps a month ago. The other detective said in a harsh voice, We know all about that meeting. Have you seen or heard from him since then? No. If you do have contact with him, we'd like you to let us know. It's very important we get to talk to Michael Corleone. I must warn you that if you do have contact with him, you may be getting involved in a very dangerous situation. If you help him in any way, you may get yourself in very serious trouble. Kay sat up very straight in the chair. Why shouldn't I help him? We're going to be married. Married people help each other. It was Detective Siriani who answered her. If you help, you may be an accessory to murder. We're looking for your boyfriend because he killed the police captain in New York, plus an informer the police officer was contacting. We know Michael Corleone is the person who did the shooting. Kay laughed. Her laughter was so unaffected, so incredulous, that the officers were impressed. Mike wouldn't do anything like that. He never had anything to do with his family. When we went to his sister's wedding, it was obvious that he was treated as an outsider, almost as much as I was. If he's hiding now, it's just so that he won't get any publicity, so that his name won't be dragged through all this. Mike is not a gangster. I know him better than you, or anybody else can know him. He's too nice a man to do anything as despicable as murder. He is the most law-abiding person I know, and I've never known him to lie. How long have you known him? Over a year. Kay was surprised when the two men smiled. I think there are a few things you should know. On the night he left you, he went to the hospital. When he came out, he got into an argument with a police captain who had come to the hospital on official business. He assaulted that police officer, but got the worst of it. In fact, he got a broken jaw and lost some teeth. His friends took him out to the Corleone family houses at Long Beach. The following night, the police captain he had to fight with was gunned down, and Michael Corleone disappeared. Vanished. We have our contacts. Our informers, they all point the finger at Michael Corleone, but we have no evidence for a court of law. The waiter who witnessed the shooting doesn't recognize a picture of Mike, but he may recognize him in person. And we have Salazzo's driver who refuses to talk, but we might make him talk if we have Michael Corleone in our hands. So we have all our people looking for him. The FBI is looking for him. Everybody's looking for him. So far, no luck. So we thought you might be able to give us a lead. I don't believe a word of it. But she felt a bit sick knowing the part about Mike getting his jaw broken must be true. Not that that would make Mike commit murder. Will you let us know if Mike contacts you? Kay shook her head. The other detective, Siriani, said roughly, We know you two have been shacking up together. We have the hotel records and witnesses. We we'll let that information slip to the newspapers. Your father and mother will feel pretty lousy. Real respectable people like that wouldn't think much of a daughter shacking up with a gangster. 
If you don't come clean right now, I'll call your old man in here and give it to him straight. Kay looked at him with astonishment. Then she got up and went to the door of the study and opened it. She could see her father standing at the living room window, sucking at his pipe. She called out, Dad, can you join us? He turned, smiled at her, and walked to the study. When he came through the door, he put his arm around his daughter's waist and faced the detectives. Yes, gentlemen? When they didn't answer, Kay said coolly to Detective Siriani, Give it to him straight, officer. Siriani flushed. M Mr. Adams, I'm telling you this for your daughter's good. She's mixed up with a hoodlum we have reason to believe committed a murder on a police officer. I'm just telling her she can get into serious trouble unless she cooperates with us. But she doesn't seem to realize how serious this whole matter is. Maybe you can talk to her. That is quite incredible. Siriani jutted his jaw. Your daughter and Michael Corleone have been going out together for over a year. They have stayed overnight in hotels together registered as man and wife. Michael Corleone is wanted for questioning in the murder of a police officer. Your daughter refuses to give us any information that may help us. Those are the facts. You can call them incredible, but I can back everything up. I don't doubt your word, sir. What I find incredible is that my daughter could be in serious trouble. Unless you're suggesting that she is a... Um, Here, his face became one of scholarly doubt. A maw, I believe it's called. Kay looked at her father in astonishment. She knew he was being playful in his donnish way, and she was surprised that he could take the whole affair so lightly. However, rest assured that if the young man shows his face here, I shall immediately report his presence to the authorities, as will my daughter. And now, if you will forgive us, our lunch is growing cold. He ushered the men out of the house with every courtesy and closed the door on their backs, gently but firmly. He took Kay by the arm and led her toward the kitchen, far in the rear of the house. Come, my dear. Your mother is waiting lunch for us. By the time they reached the kitchen, Kay was weeping silently, out of relief from strain at her father's unquestioning affection. In the kitchen, her mother took no notice of her weeping, and Kay realized that her father must have told her about the two detectives. She sat down at her place, and her mother served her silently. When all three were at the table, her father said grace with bowed head. Mrs. Adams was a short, stout woman, always neatly dressed, hair always set. Kay had never seen her in disarray. Her mother, too, had always been a little disinterested in her, holding her at arm's length. And she did so now. Kay, stop being so dramatic. I'm sure it's all a great deal of fuss about nothing at all. After all, the boy was a Dartmouth boy. He couldn't possibly be mixed up in anything so sordid. Kay looked up in surprise. How did you know Mike went to Dartmouth? You young people are so mysterious. You think you're so clever. We've known about him all along, but of course we couldn't bring it up until you did. But how did you know? She still couldn't face her father, now that he knew about her and Mike sleeping together. So she didn't see the smile on his face. We opened your mail, of course. Kay was horrified and angry. Now she could face him. What he had done was more shameful than her own sin. She could never believe it of him. Father, you didn't. You couldn't have. Mr. Adams smiled at her. I debated which was the greater sin, opening your mail or going in ignorance of some hazard my only child might be incurring. The choice was simple and virtuous. Between mouthfuls of boiled chicken, Mrs. Adams said, After all, my dear, you are terribly innocent for your age. We had to be aware, and you never spoke about him. For the first time, Kay was grateful that Michael was never affectionate in his letters. She was grateful that her parents hadn't seen some of her letters. I never told you about him because I thought you'd be horrified about his family. We were. By the way, has Michael gotten in touch with you? Kay shook her head. I don't believe he's guilty of anything. She saw her parents exchange a glance over the table. Then Mr. Adams said gently, If he's not guilty and he's vanished, then perhaps something else happened to him. At first, Kay didn't understand. Then she got up from the table and ran to her room. Three days later, Kay Adams got out of a taxi in front of the Corleone Mall in Long Beach. She had phoned. She was expected. Tom Hagen met her at the door, and she was disappointed that it was him. She knew he would tell her nothing. In the living room, he gave her a drink. She had seen a couple of other men lounging around the house, but not Sonny. She asked Tom Hagen directly. Do you know where Mike is? Do you know where I can get in touch with him? We know he's all right, but we don't know where he is right now. When he heard about that captain being shot, he was afraid they'd accuse him, so he just decided to disappear. He told me he'd get in touch in a few months. 
The story was not only false, but meant to be seen through. He was giving her that much. Did that captain really break his jaw? I'm afraid that's true. But Mike was never a vindictive man. I'm sure that had nothing to do with what happened. Kay opened her purse and took out a letter. Will you deliver this to him if he gets in touch with you? Hagen shook his head. If I accepted that letter and you told a court of law I accepted that letter, it might be interpreted as my having knowledge of his whereabouts. Why don't you just wait a bit? I'm sure Mike will get in touch. She finished her drink and got up to leave. Hagen escorted her to the hall, but as he opened the door, a woman came in from outside, a short, stout woman dressed in black. Kay recognized her as Michael's mother. She held out her hand. How are you, Mrs. Corleone? The woman's small black eyes darted at her for a moment. Then the wrinkled, leathery, olive-skinned face broke into a small, curt smile of greeting that was yet in some curious way truly friendly. Ah, you Mikey's little girl. She had a heavy Italian accent. Kay could barely understand her. You eat a something? Kay said no, meaning she didn't want anything to eat. But Mrs. Corleone turned furiously on Tom Hagen and berated him in Italian, ending with... You don't even give it his poor girl coffee, you disgrazia. She took Kay by the hand, the old woman's hand, surprisingly warm and alive, and led her into the kitchen. You have a coffee and eat something. Then somebody drive you home. A nice girl like you, I don't want you to take the train. She made Kay sit down and bustled around the kitchen, tearing off her coat and hat and draping them over a chair. In a few seconds, there was bread and cheese and salami on the table and coffee perking on the stove. I came to ask about Mike. I haven't heard from him. Mr. Hagen said nobody knows where he is, that he'll turn up in a little while. That's all we can tell her now, Ma. Mrs. Corleone gave him a look of withering contempt. Now you gonna tell me what to do? My husband gonna tell me what to do. God have mercy on him. She crossed herself. Is Mr. Corleone all right? Fine. Fine. He's getting old. He's getting foolish to let something like that happen. She tapped her head disrespectfully. She poured the coffee and forced Kay to eat some bread and cheese. After they drank their coffee, Mrs. Corleone took one of Kay's hands and her two brown ones. Mikey no gonna ride to you. You no gonna hear from Mikey. He hide two, three years, maybe more. Maybe much more. You go home to your family and find a nice young fellow. And get married. Kay took the letter out of her purse. Would you send this to him? The old lady took the letter and patted Kay on the cheek. Sure. Sure. Hagen started to protest, and she screamed at him in Italian. Then she led Kay to the door. There she kissed her on the cheek very quickly. You forget about Mikey. He no demand for you anymore. There was a car waiting for her with two men up front. They drove her all the way to her hotel in New York, never saying a word. Neither did Kay. She was trying to get used to the fact that the young man she had loved was a cold-blooded murderer and that she had been told by the most unimpeachable source, his mother. Chapter 16 Carlo Rizzi was punk sore at the world. Once married into the Corleone family, he'd been shunted aside with a small bookmaker's business on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. He'd counted on one of the houses in the mall on Long Beach. He knew the Don could move retainer families out when he pleased, and he had been sure it would happen, and he would be on the inside of everything. But the Don wasn't treating him right. The great Don, he thought with scorn. An old mustache Pete who'd been caught out on the street by gunmen like any dumb small-time hood. He hoped the old bastard croaked. Sonny had been his friend once, and if Sonny became the head of the family, maybe he'd get a break. Get on the inside. He watched his wife pour his coffee. Christ, what a mess she turned out to be. Five months of marriage and she was already spreading, besides blowing up, real guinea broads, all these Italians in the East. He reached out and felt Connie's soft, spreading buttocks. She smiled at him and he said contemptuously, You got more ham than a hog. It pleased him to see the hurt look on her face, the tears springing into her eyes. She might be the daughter of the great Don, but she was his wife. She was his property now, and he could treat her as he pleased. It made him feel powerful that one of the Corleones was his doormat. He had started her off just right. She had tried to keep that purse full of money presents for herself, and he had given her a nice black eye and taken the money from her. Never told her what he'd done with it, either. That might have really caused him trouble. 
Even now he felt just the slightest twinge of remorse. Christ, he'd blown nearly fifteen grand on a track and showgirl bimbos. He could feel Connie watching his back, and so he flexed his muscles as he reached for the plate of sweet buns on the other side of the table. He just polished off ham and eggs, but he was a big man and needed a big breakfast. He was pleased with the picture he knew he presented to his wife. Not the usual greasy, dark Ginzo husband, but crew-cut blonde, huge golden-haired forearms and broad shoulders and thin waist. And he knew he was physically stronger than any of those so-called hard guys that work for the family. Guys like Clemenza, Tessio, Rocco Lamponi, and that guy Pauly that somebody had knocked off. He wondered what the story was about that. Then, for some reason, he thought about Sonny. Man to man, he could take Sonny, he thought, even though Sonny was a little bigger and a little heavier. But what scared him was Sonny's rep, though he himself had never seen Sonny anything but good-natured and kidding around. Yeah, Sonny was his buddy. Maybe with the old Don gone, things would open up. He dawdled over his coffee. He hated this apartment. He was used to the bigger living quarters of the West, and in a little while he would have to go cross down to his book to run the noontime action. It was a Sunday, the heaviest action of the week, what with baseball going already and the tail end of basketball and the night trotters starting up. Gradually, he became aware of Connie bustling around behind him, and he turned his head to watch her. She was getting dressed up in the real New York City Ginzo style that he hated, a silk flower pattern dress with belt, showy bracelet and earrings, flouncy sleeves. She looked twenty years older. Where the hell are you going? She answered him coldly. To see my father out in Long Beach. He still can't get out of bed, and he needs company. Carlo was curious. Is Sonny still running the show? Connie gave him a bland look. What show? He was furious. You lousy little guinea bitch. Don't talk to me like that, or I'll beat that kid right out of your belly. She looked frightened and this enraged him even more. He sprang from his chair and slapped her across the face, the blow leaving a red welt. With quick precision, he slapped her three more times. He saw her upper lips split bloody and puff up. That stopped him. He didn't want to leave a mark. She ran into the bedroom and slammed the door, and he heard the key turning in the lock. He laughed and returned to his coffee. He smoked until it was time for him to dress. He knocked on the door and said, Open it up before I kick it in. There was no answer. Come on, I gotta get dressed. He could hear her getting up off the bed and coming toward the door. Then the key turned in the lock. When he entered, she had her back to him, walking back toward the bed, lying down on it with her face turned away to the wall. He dressed quickly and then saw she was in her slip. He wanted her to go visit her father. He hoped she would bring back information. What's the matter? A few slaps take all the energy out of you? She was a lazy slut. I don't want to go. Her voice was tearful. The words mumbled. He reached out impatiently and pulled her around to face him. And then he saw why she didn't want to go and thought maybe it was just as well. He must have slapped her harder than he figured. Her left cheek was blown up. The cut upper lip ballooned grotesquely puffy and white beneath her nose. Okay, but I won't be home until late. Sunday's my busy day. He left the apartment and found a parking ticket on his car, a $15 green one. He put it in the glove compartment with the stack of others. He was in a good humor. Slapping the spoiled little bitch around always made him feel good. It dissolved some of the frustration he felt at being treated so badly by the Corleones. The first time he had marked her up, he'd been a little worried. She'd gone right out to Long Beach to complain to her mother and father and to show her black eye. He had really sweated it out. But when she came back, she had been surprisingly meek, the dutiful little Italian wife. He had made it a point to be the perfect husband over the next few weeks, treating her well in every way, being lovey and nice with her, banging her every day, morning and night. Finally, she had told him what had happened, since she thought he would never act that way again. She had found her parents coolly unsympathetic and curiously amused. Her mother had had a little sympathy and had even asked her father to speak to Carlo Rizzi. Her father had refused. She is my daughter, he had said, but now she belongs to her husband. He knows his duties. Even the king of Italy didn't dare to meddle with the relationship of husband and wife. Go home and learn how to behave so that he will not beat you. Connie had said angrily to her father, Did you ever hit your wife? She was his favorite and could speak to him so imprudently. He had answered, She never gave me reason to beat her. And her mother had nodded and smiled. She told them how her husband had taken the wedding present money and never told her what he did with it. Her father had shrugged and said, 
I would have done the same if my wife had been as presumptuous as you. And so she had returned home a little bewildered, a little frightened. She had always been her father's favorite, and she could not understand his coldness now. But the Don had not been so unsympathetic as he pretended. He made inquiries and found out what Carlo Rizzi had done with the wedding present money. He had men assigned to Carlo Rizzi's bookmaking operation who would report to Hagen everything Rizzi did on the job. But the Don could not interfere. How expect a man to discharge his husbandly duties to a wife whose family he feared? It was an impossible situation, and he dared not meddle. Then, when Connie became pregnant, he was convinced of the wisdom of his decision, and felt he never could interfere, though Connie complained to her mother about a few more beatings, and the mother finally became concerned enough to mention it to the Don. Connie even hinted that she might want a divorce. For the first time in her life, the Don was angry with her. He is the father of your child. What can a child come to in this world if he has no father, he said to Connie. Learning all this, Carlo Rizzi grew confident. He was perfectly safe. In fact, he bragged to his two writers on the book, Sally Rags and Coach, about how he bounced his wife around when she got snotty, and saw their looks of respect that he had the guts to manhandle the daughter of the great Don Corleone. But Rizzi would not have felt so safe if he had known that when Sonny Corleone learned of the beatings, he had flown into a murderous rage and had been restrained only by the sternest and most imperious command of the Don himself, a command that even Sonny dared not disobey, which was why Sonny avoided Rizzi, not trusting himself to control his temper. So, feeling perfectly safe on this beautiful Sunday morning, Carlo Rizzi sped cross town on 96th Street to the east side. He did not see Sonny's car coming the opposite way toward his house. Sonny Corleone had left the protection of the mall and spent the night with Lucy Mancini in town. Now, on the way home, he was traveling with four bodyguards, two in front and two behind. He didn't need guards right beside him. He could take care of a single direct assault. The other men traveled in their own cars and had apartments on either side of Lucy's apartment. It was safe to visit her as long as he didn't do it too often. But now that he was in town, he figured he would pick up his sister Connie and take her out to Long Beach. He knew Carlo would be working at his book, and the cheap bastard wouldn't get her a car, so he'd give his sister a lift out. He waited for the two men in front to go into the building and then followed them. He saw the two men in back pull up behind his car and get out to watch the streets. He kept his own eyes open. It was a million to one shot that the opposition even knew he was in town, but he was always careful. He had learned that in the 1930s war. He never used elevators. They were death traps. He climbed the eight flights to Connie's apartment, going fast. He knocked on her door. He had seen Carlo's car go by and knew she would be alone. There was no answer. He knocked again, and then he heard his sister's voice, frightened, timid. Who is it? The fright in the voice stunned him. His kid sister had always been fresh and snotty, tough as anybody in the family. What the hell had happened to her? It's Sonny. The bolt inside slid back, and the door opened, and Connie was in his arms, sobbing. He was so surprised, he just stood there. He pushed her away from him and saw her swollen face, and he understood what had happened. He pulled away from her to run down the stairs and go after her husband. Rage flamed up in him, contorting his own face. Connie saw the rage and clung to him, not letting him go, making him come into the apartment. She was weeping out of terror now. She knew her older brother's temper and feared it. She had never complained to him about Carlo for that reason. Now she made him come into the apartment with her. It was my fault. I started a fight with him and I tried to hit him, so he hit me. He really didn't try to hit me that hard. I walked into it. Sonny's heavy, cupid face was under control. You going to see the old man today? She didn't answer, so he added, I thought you were, so I dropped over to give you a lift. I was in the city anyway. She shook her head. I don't want them to see me this way. I'll come next week. Okay. He picked up her kitchen phone and dialed a number. I'm getting a doctor to come over here and take a look at you and fix you up. In your condition, you have to be careful. How many months before you have the kid? Two months. Sonny, please don't do anything. Please don't. Sonny laughed. His face was cruelly intent. Don't worry, I won't make your kid an orphan before he's born. He left the apartment after kissing her lightly on her uninjured cheek. On East 112th Street, a long line of cars were double-parked in front of a candy store that was the headquarters of Carlo Rizzi's book. On the sidewalk in front of the store, fathers played catch with small children they had taken for a Sunday morning ride and to keep them company as they placed their bets. 
When they saw Carla Risi coming, they stopped playing ball and bought their kids ice cream to keep them quiet. Then they started studying the newspapers that gave the starting pitchers, trying to pick out winning baseball bets for the day. Carlo went into the large room in the back of the store. His two writers, a small wiry man called Sally Rags and a big husky fellow called Coach, were already waiting for the action to start. They had their huge lined pads in front of them ready to write down bets. On a wooden stand was a blackboard with the names of the 16 big league baseball teams chalked on it, paired to show who was playing against who. Against each pairing was a blocked out square to enter the odds. Carlo asked Coach, Is the store phone tapped today? Coach shook his head. Uh, tap is still off. Carlo went to the wall phone and dialed a number. Sally Rags and Coach watched him impassively as he jotted down the line, the odds on all baseball games for that day. They watched him as he hung up the phone and walked over to the blackboard and chalked up the odds against each game. Though Carlo did not know it, they had already gotten the line and were checking his work. In the first week in his job, Carlo had made a mistake in transposing the odds onto the blackboard and had created that dream of all gamblers, a middle. That is, by betting the odds with him and then betting against the same team with another bookmaker at the correct odds, the gambler could not lose. The only one who could lose was Carlo's book. That mistake had caused a $6,000 loss in the book for the week and confirmed the Don's judgment about his son-in-law. He had given the word that all of Carlo's work was to be checked. Normally, the highly placed members of the Corleone family would never be concerned with such an operational detail. There was at least a five-layer insulation to their level. But since the book was being used as a testing ground for the son-in-law, it had been placed under the direct scrutiny of Tom Hagen, to whom a report was sent every day. Now, with the line posted, the gamblers were thronging into the back room of the candy store to jot down the odds on their newspapers next to the games printed there with probable pictures. Some of them held their little children by the hand as they looked up at the blackboard. One guy who made big bets looked down at the little girl he was holding by the hand and said teasingly, Who do you like today, honey, Giants or the Pirates? The little girl, fascinated by the colorful name, said, Are Giants stronger than Pirates? The father laughed. A line began to form in front of the two writers. When a writer filled one of his sheets, he tore it off, wrapped the money he had collected in it, and handed it to Carlo. Carlo went out the back exit of the room and up a flight of steps to an apartment which housed the candy store owner's family. He called in the bets to his central exchange and put the money in a small wall safe that was hidden by an extended window drape. Then he went back down into the candy store after having first burned the bet sheet and flushed its ashes down the toilet bowl. None of the Sunday games started before 2 p.m. because of the blue laws. So, after the first crowd of bettors, family men who had to get their bets in and rush home to take their families to the beach, came the trickling of bachelor gamblers or the diehards who condemned their families to Sundays in the hot city apartments. These bachelor bettors were the big gamblers. They bet heavier and came back around 4 o'clock to bet the second games of doubleheaders. They were the ones who made Carlos Sundays a full-time day with overtime, though some married men called in from the beach to try and recoup their losses. By 1.30, the betting had trickled off so that Carlo and Sally Rags could go out and sit on the stoop beside the candy store and get some fresh air. They watched the stickball game the kids were having. A police car went by. They ignored it. This book had very heavy protection at the precinct and couldn't be touched on a local level. A raid would have to be ordered from the very top, and even then, a warning would come through in plenty of time. Coach came out and sat beside them. They gossiped a while about baseball and women. Carlo said laughingly, <laughs> I had to bat my wife around again today, teach her who's boss. Coach said casually. She's knocked up pretty big now, ain't she? Yeah, I just slapped her face a few times. I didn't hurt her. He brooded for a moment. She thinks she can boss me around. I don't stand for that. There were still a few betters hanging around, shooting the breeze, talking baseball, some of them sitting on the steps above the two riders and Carlo. Suddenly, the kids playing stickball in the street scattered. A car came screeching up the block into a halt in front of the candy store. It stopped so abruptly that the tires screamed, and before it had stopped, almost, a man came hurtling out of the driver's seat, moving so fast that everybody was paralyzed. The man was Sonny Corleone. His heavy, cupid-featured face with its thick, curved mouth was an ugly mask of fury. In a split second, he was at the stoop and had grabbed Carlo Rizzi by the throat. He pulled Carlo away from the others, trying to drag him into the street. But Carlo wrapped his huge, muscular arms around the iron railings of the stoop and hung on. 
He cringed away, trying to hide his head and face in the hollow of his shoulders, his shirt ripped away in Sonny's hand. What followed then was sickening. Sonny began beating the cowering Carlo with his fists, cursing him in a thick, rage-choked voice. Carlo, despite his tremendous physique, offered no resistance, gave no cry for mercy or protest. Coach and Sally Rags dared not interfere. They thought Sonny meant to kill his brother-in-law and had no desire to share his fate. The kids playing stickball gathered to curse the driver who had made them scatter, but now were watching with awestruck interest. They were tough kids, but the sight of Sonny in his rage silenced them. Meanwhile, another car had drawn up behind Sonny's, and two of his bodyguards jumped out. When they saw what was happening, they too dared not interfere. They stood alert, ready to protect their chief if any bystanders had the stupidity to try to help Carlo. What made the sight sickening was Carlo's complete subjection. But it was perhaps this that saved his life. He clung to the iron railings with his hands so that Sonny could not drag him into the street, and despite his obvious equal strength, still refused to fight back. He let the blows rain on his unprotected head and neck until Sonny's rage ebbed. Finally, his chest heaving, Sonny looked down at him and said, You dirty bastard! You ever beat up my sister again, I'll kill you! These words released the tension. Because, of course, if Sonny intended to kill the man, he would never have uttered the threat. He uttered it in frustration because he could not carry it out. Carlo refused to look at Sonny. He kept his head down and his hands and arms entwined in the iron railing. He stayed that way until the car roared off and he heard Coach say in his curiously paternal voice, Okay, Carlo, come on into the store. Let's get out of sight. It was only then that Carlo dared to get out of his crouch against the stone steps of the stoop and unlock his hands from the railing. Standing up, he could see the kids look at him with the staring, sickened faces of people who had witnessed the degradation of a fellow human being. He was a little dizzy, but it was more from shock, the raw fear that had taken command of his body. He was not badly hurt despite the shower of heavy blows. He let Coach lead him by the arm into the back room of the candy store and put ice on his face, which, though it was not cut or bleeding, was lumpy with swelling bruises. The fear was subsiding now, and the humiliation he had suffered made him sick to his stomach so that he had to throw up. Coach held his head over the sink, supported him as if he were drunk, then helped him upstairs to the apartment and made him lie down in one of the bedrooms. Carlo never noticed that Sally Rags had disappeared. Sally Rags had walked down to Third Avenue and called Rocco Lamponi to report what had happened. Rocco took the news calmly and in his turn called his capo regime, Pete Clemenza. Clemenza groaned. Oh, Christ! That goddamn Sonny and his temper! But his finger had prudently clicked down on the hook so that Rocco never heard his remark. Clemenza called the house in Long Beach and got Tom Hagen. Hagen was silent for a moment and then he said, Send some of your people and cars out on the road to Long Beach as soon as you can, just in case Sonny gets held up by traffic or an accident. When he gets sore like that, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Maybe some of our friends on the other side will hear he was in town. You never can tell. Yeah, by the time I could get anybody on the road, Sonny will be home. That goes for the Tatalias, too. I know, but if something out of the ordinary happens, Sonny may be held up. Do the best you can, Pete. Grudgingly, Clemenza called Rocco Lamponi and told him to get a few people in cars and cover the road to Long Beach. He himself went out to his beloved Cadillac and with three of the platoon of guards who now garrisoned his home, started over the Atlantic Beach Bridge toward New York City. One of the hangers-on around the candy store, a small better on the payroll of the Tatalia family, as an informer, called the contact he had with his people. But the Tatalia family had not streamlined itself for the war. The contact still had to go all the way through the insulation layers before he finally got to the capo regime who contacted the Tatalia chief. By that time, Sonny Corleone was safely back in the mall in his father's house in Long Beach, about to face his father's wrath. Chapter 17 The War of 1947 between the Corleone family and the five families combined against them proved to be expensive for both sides. It was complicated by the police pressure put on everybody to solve the murder of Captain McCluskey. It was rare that operating officials of the police department ignored political muscle that protected gambling and vice operations. But in this case, the politicians were as helpless as the general staff of a rampaging, looting army whose field officers refused to follow orders. This lack of protection did not hurt the Corleone family as much as it did their opponents. The Corleone group depended on gambling for most of its income and was hit especially hard in its numbers or policy branch of operations. The runners who picked up the action were swept into police nets and usually given a medium shellacking before being booked. 
Even some of the banks were located and raided with heavy financial loss. The bankers, 90 calibers in their own right, complained to the Capo Regime, who brought their complaints to the family council table. But there was nothing to be done. The bankers were told to go out of business. Local Negro freelancers were allowed to take over the operation in Harlem, the richest territory, and they operated in such scattered fashion that the police found it hard to pin them down. After the death of Captain McCluskey, some newspapers printed stories involving him with Salazzo. They published proof that McCluskey had received large sums of money in cash shortly before his death. These stories had been planted by Hagen, the information supplied by him. The police department refused to confirm or deny these stories, but they were taking effect. The police force got the word through informers, through police on the family payroll, that McCluskey had been a rogue cop. Not that he had taken money or clean graft. There was no rank-and-file onus to that, but that he had taken the dirtiest of dirty money, murder and drugs money. And in the morality of policemen, this was unforgivable. Hagen understood that the policeman believes in law and order in a curiously innocent way. He believes in it more than does the public he serves. Law and order is, after all, the magic from which he derives his power. Individual power, which he cherishes, as nearly all men cherish individual power. And yet, there is always the smoldering resentment against the public he serves. They are at the same time his ward and his prey. As wards, they are ungrateful, abusive, and demanding. As prey, they are slippery and dangerous, full of guile. As soon as one is in the policeman's clutches, the mechanism of the society the policeman defends marshals all its resources to cheat him of his prize. The fix is put in by politicians. Judges give lenient suspended sentences to the worst hoodlums. Governors of the states and the President of the United States himself give full pardons, assuming that respected lawyers have not already won his acquittal. After a time, the cop learns. Why should he not collect the fees these hoodlums are paying? He needs it more. His children. Why should they not go to college? Why shouldn't his wife shop in more expensive places? Why shouldn't he himself get the sun with a winter vacation in Florida? After all, he risks his life, and that is no joke. But usually, he draws the line against accepting dirty graft. He will take money to let a bookmaker operate. He will take money from a man who hates getting parking tickets or speeding tickets. He will allow call girls and prostitutes to ply their trade for a consideration. These are vices natural to man. But usually, he will not take a payoff for drugs, armed robberies, rape, murder, and other assorted perversions. In his mind, these attack the very core of his personal authority and cannot be countenanced. The murder of a police captain was comparable to regicide. But when it became known that McCluskey had been killed while in the company of a notorious narcotics peddler, when it became known that he was suspected of conspiracy to murder, the police desire for vengeance began to fade. Also, after all, there were still mortgage payments to be made, cars to be paid off, children to be launched into the world. Without their sheet money, policemen had to scramble to make ends meet. Unlicensed peddlers were good for lunch money. Parking ticket payoffs came to nickels and dimes. Some of the more desperate even began shaking down suspects, homosexuals, assaults and batteries, in the precinct squad rooms. Finally, the brass relented. They raised the prices and let the families operate. Once again, the payoff sheet was typed up by the precinct bagman, listing every man assigned to the local station and what his cut was each month. Some semblance of social order was restored. It had been Hagen's idea to use private detectives to guard Don Corleone's hospital room. These were, of course, supplemented by the much more formidable soldiers of Tessio's regime. But Sonny was not satisfied even with this. By the middle of February, when the Don could be moved without danger, he was taken by ambulance to his home in the mall. The house had been renovated so that his bedroom was now a hospital room with all equipment necessary for any emergency. Nurses, specially recruited and checked, had been hired for round-the-clock care, and Dr. Kennedy, with the payment of a huge fee, had been persuaded to become the physician in residence to this private hospital, at least until the Don would need only nursing care. The mall itself was made impregnable. Button men were moved into the extra houses. The tenants sent on vacations to their native villages in Italy, all expenses paid. Freddy Corleone had been sent to Las Vegas to recuperate and also to scout out the ground for a family operation in the luxury hotel gambling casino complex that was springing up. Las Vegas was part of the West Coast Empire, still neutral, and the Don of that empire had guaranteed Freddy's safety there. The New York Five families had no desire to make more enemies by going into Vegas after Freddy Corleone. They had enough trouble on their hands in New York. Dr. Kennedy had forbade any discussion of business in front of the Don. This edict was completely disregarded. 
The Don insisted on the council of war being held in his room. Sonny, Tom Hagen, Pete Clemenza, and Tessio gathered there the very first night of his homecoming. Don Corleone was too weak to speak much, but he wished to listen and exercise veto powers. When it was explained that Freddy had been sent to Las Vegas to learn the gambling casino business, he nodded his head approvingly. When he learned that Bruno Tattaglia had been killed by Corleone button men, he shook his head and sighed. But what distressed him most of all was learning that Michael had killed Salazzo and Captain McCluskey and had then been forced to flee to Sicily. When he heard this, he motioned them out, and they continued the conference in the corner room that held the law library. Sonny Corleone relaxed in the huge armchair behind the desk. I think we'd better let the old man take it easy for a couple of weeks, until a doc says he can do business. He paused. I'd like to have it going again before it gets better. We had the go-ahead from the cops to operate. The first thing is the policy banks in Harlem. The black boys up there had their fun. Now we have to take it back. They screwed up the works, but good, just like they usually do when they run things. A lot of their runners didn't pay off winners. They drive up in Cadillacs and tell their players they got to wait for their dough, or maybe just pay them half what they win. I don't want any runner looking rich to his players. I don't want them dressing too good. I don't want them driving new cars. I don't want them welching on paying a winner. And I don't want any freelancers staying in business. They give us a bad name. Tom, let's get that project moving right away. Everything else will fall in line as soon as you send out the word that the lid is off. There are some very tough boys up in Harlem. They got a taste of the big money. They won't go back to being runners or sub-bankers again. Sonny shrugged. Just give their names to Clemenza. That's his job. Straighten them out. It was Tessio who brought up the most important question. Once we start operating, the five families start their raids. They'll hit our bankers in Harlem and our bookmakers on the east side. They may even try to make things tough for the garment center outfits we service. This war is going to cost a lot of money. Maybe they won't. They know we'll hit them right back. I've got peace feelers out, and maybe we can settle everything by paying an indemnity for the Tatalia kid. We're getting the cold shoulder on those negotiations. They lost a lot of dough the last few months, and they blame us for it, with justice. I think what they want is for us to agree to come in on the narcotics trade, to use the family influence politically. In other words, Salazzo's deal minus Salazzo. But they won't broach that until they've hurt us with some sort of combat action. Then, after we've been softened up, they figure we'll listen to a proposition on narcotics. No deal on drugs. The Don said no, and it's no until he changes it. Then we're faced with a tactical problem. Our money is out in the open, bookmaking and policy. We can be hit. But the Tatalia family has prostitution and call girls in the dock unions. How the hell are we going to hit them? The other families are in some gambling, but most of them are in the construction trades, shylocking, controlling the unions, getting the government contracts. They get a lot from strong arm and other stuff that involves innocent people. Their money isn't out in the street. The Tatalia nightclub is too famous to touch. It would cause too much of a stink. And with the Don still out of action, their political influence matches ours. So we've got a real problem here. It's my problem, Tom. I'll find the answer. Keep the negotiation alive and follow through on the other stuff. Let's go back into business and see what happens. Then we'll take it from there. Clemenza and Tessio have plenty of soldiers. We can match the whole five families, gun for gun, if that's the way they want it. We'll just go to the mattresses. There was no problem getting the freelance Negro bankers out of business. The police were informed and cracked down, with a special effort. At that time, it was not possible for a Negro to make a payoff to a high police or a political official to keep such an operation going. This was due to racial prejudice and racial distrust more than anything else. But Harlem had always been considered a minor problem, and its settlement was expected. The five families struck in an unexpected direction. Two powerful officials in the garment unions were killed, officials who were members of the Corleone family. Then, the Corleone family Shylocks were barred from the waterfront piers, as were the Corleone family bookmakers. The Longshoremen's Union locals had gone over to the five families. Corleone bookmakers all over the city were threatened to persuade them to change their allegiance. The biggest numbers banker in Harlem, an old friend and ally of the Corleone family, was brutally murdered. There was no longer any option. Sonny told his capo regime to go to the mattresses. Two apartments were set up in the city and furnished with mattresses for the button men to sleep on, a refrigerator for food and guns and ammunition. Clemenza staffed one apartment and Tessio the other. All family bookmakers were given bodyguard teams. The policy bankers in Harlem, however, had gone over to the enemy, and at the moment nothing could be done about that. All this cost the Corleone family a great deal of money, and very little was coming in. As the next few months went by, 
Other things became obvious. The most important was that the Corleone family had overmatched itself. There were reasons for this. With the Don still too weak to take apart, a great deal of the family's political strength was neutralized. Also, the last ten years of peace had seriously eroded the fighting qualities of the two capa regime, Clemenza and Tessio. Clemenza was still a competent executioner and administrator, but he no longer had the energy or the youthful strength to lead troops. Tessio had mellowed with age and was not ruthless enough. Tom Hagen, despite his abilities, was simply not suited to be a consigliere in a time of war. His main fault was that he was not a Sicilian. Sonny Corleone recognized these weaknesses in the family's wartime posture, but could not take any steps to remedy them. He was not the Don, and only the Don could replace the Capo Regime and the Consigliere. And the very act of replacement would make the situation more dangerous, might precipitate some treachery. At first, Sonny had thought of fighting a holding action until the Don could become well enough to take charge. But with the defection of the policy bankers, the terrorization of the bookmakers, the family position was becoming precarious. He decided to strike back. But he decided to strike right at the heart of the enemy. He planned the execution of the heads of the five families in one grand tactical maneuver. To that purpose, he put into effect an elaborate system of surveillance of these leaders. But after a week, the enemy chiefs promptly dived underground and were seen no more in public. The five families and the Corleone Empire were in stalemate. Chapter 18 Amerigo Bonacera lived only a few blocks from his undertaking establishment on Mulberry Street, and so always went home for supper. Evenings he returned to his place of business, dutifully joining those mourners paying their respects to the dead who lay in state in his somber parlors. He always resented the jokes made about his profession, the macabre technical details, which were so unimportant. Of course, none of his friends or family or neighbors would make such jokes. Any profession was worthy of respect to men who for centuries earned bread by the sweat of their brows. Now at supper with his wife in their solidly furnished apartment, gilt statues of the Virgin Mary with their red glass candles flickering on the sideboard, Bonacera lit a camel cigarette and took a relaxing glass of American whiskey. His wife brought steaming plates of soup to the table. The two of them were alone now. He had sent his daughter to live in Boston with her mother's sister, where she could forget her terrible experience and her injuries at the hands of the two ruffians Don Corleone had punished. As they ate their soup, his wife asked, Are you going back to work tonight? Amerigo Bonacera nodded. His wife respected his work, but did not understand it. She did not understand that the technical part of his profession was the least important. She thought, like most other people, that he was paid for his skill in making the dead look so lifelike in their coffins. And indeed, his skill in this was legendary. But even more important, even more necessary, was his physical presence at the wake. When the bereaved family came at night to receive their blood relatives and their friends beside the coffin of their loved one, they needed Amerigo Bonacera with them. For he was a strict chaperone to death. His face always grave, yet strong and comforting, his voice unwavering, yet muted to a low register, he commanded the mourning ritual. He could quiet grief that was too unseemly. He could rebuke unruly children whose parents had not the heart to chastise. Never cloying in the tender of his condolences, yet never was he offhand. Once a family used Amerigo Bonacera to speed a loved one on, they came back to him again and again, and he never, never deserted one of his clients on that terrible last night above ground. Usually he allowed himself a little nap after supper. Then he washed and shaved afresh, talcum powder generously used to shroud the heavy black beard, a mouthwash always. He respectfully changed into fresh linen, white gleaming shirt, the black tie, a freshly pressed dark suit, dull black shoes and black socks. And yet the effect was comforting instead of somber. He also kept his hair dyed black, an unheard of frivolity in an Italian male of his generation, but not out of vanity simply because his hair had turned a lively pepper and salt, a color which struck him as unseemly for his profession. After he finished his soup, his wife placed a small steak before him with a few forkfuls of green spinach, oozing yellow oil. He was a light eater. When he finished this, he drank a cup of coffee and smoked another camel cigarette. Over his coffee, he thought about his poor daughter. She would never be the same. Her outward beauty had been restored, but there was a look of a frightened animal in her eyes that had made him unable to bear the sight of her. And so they had sent her to live in Boston for a time. Time would heal her wounds. Pain and terror was not so final as death, as he well knew. His work made him an optimist. He had just finished the coffee when his phone in the living room rang. His wife never answered it when he was home, so he got up and drained his cup and stubbed out his cigarette. 
As he walked to the phone, he pulled off his tie and started to unbutton his shirt, getting ready for his little nap. Then he picked up the phone and said with quiet courtesy, Hello? The voice on the other end was harsh, strained. This is Tom Hagen. I'm calling for Don Corleone at his request. Amerigo Bonacera felt the coffee churning sourly in his stomach, felt himself going a little sick. It was more than a year since he had put himself in the debt of the Don to avenge his daughter's honor, and in that time the knowledge that he must pay that debt had receded. He had been so grateful seeing the bloody faces of those two ruffians that he would have done anything for the Don. But time erodes gratitude more quickly than it does beauty. Now Bonacera felt the sickness of a man faced with disaster. Yes, I understand. I'm listening. He was surprised at the coldness in Hagen's voice. The consigliere had always been a courteous man, though not Italian. But now he was being rudely brusque. You owe the Don a service. He has no doubt that you will repay him, that you will be happy to have this opportunity. In one hour, not before, perhaps later, he will be at your funeral parlor to ask for your help. Be there to greet him. Don't have any people who work for you there. Send them home. If you have any objections to this, speak now and I'll inform Don Corleone. He has other friends who can do him this service. Amerigo Bonacera almost cried out in his fright. How can you think I would refuse the Godfather? Of course, I'll do anything he wishes. I haven't forgotten my debt. I'll go to my business immediately, at once. Hagen's voice was gentler now, but there was something strange about it. Thank you. The Don never doubted you. The question was mine. Oblige him tonight, and you can always come to me in any trouble. You'll earn my personal friendship. This frightened Amerigo Bonacera even more. The Don himself is coming to me tonight? Yes. Then he's completely recovered from his injuries, thank God. His voice made it a question. There was a pause at the other end of the phone. Then Hagen's voice said very quietly, Yes. There was a click, and the phone went dead. Bonacera was sweating. He went into the bedroom and changed his shirt and rinsed his mouth, but he didn't shave or use a fresh tie. He put on the same one he had used during the day. He called the funeral parlor and told his assistant to stay with the bereaved family using the front parlor that night. He himself would be busy in the laboratory working area of the building. When the assistant started asking questions, Bonacera cut him off very curtly and told him to follow orders exactly. He put on his suit jacket and his wife, still eating, looked up at him in surprise. I have work to do. She did not dare question him because of the look on his face. Bonacera went out of the house and walked the few blocks to his funeral parlor. This building stood by itself on a large lot with a white picket fence running all around it. There was a narrow roadway leading from the street to the rear, just wide enough for ambulances and hearses. Bonacera unlocked the gate and left it open. Then he walked to the rear of the building and entered it through the wide door there. As he did so, he could see mourners already entering the front door of the funeral parlor to pay their respects to the current corpse. Many years ago, when Bonacera had bought this building from an undertaker planning to retire, there had been a stoop of about ten steps that mourners had to mount before entering the funeral parlor. This had posed a problem. Old and crippled mourners determined to pay their respects had found the steps almost impossible to mount. So the former undertaker had used the freight elevator for these people, a small metal platform that rose out of the ground beside the building. The elevator was for coffins and bodies. It would descend underground, then rise into the funeral parlor itself, so that a crippled mourner would find himself rising through the floor beside the coffin as other mourners moved their black chairs aside to let the elevator rise through the trap door. Then, when the crippled or aged mourner had finished paying his respects, the elevator would again come up through the polished floor to take him down and out again. Amerigo Bonacera had found this solution to the problem unseemly and penny-pinching. So, he had had the front of the building remodeled, the stoop done away with, and a slightly inclining walk put in its place. But, of course, the elevator was still used for coffins and corpses. In the rear of the building, cut off from the funeral parlor and reception rooms by a massive soundproof door, was the business office, the embalming room, a storeroom for coffins, and a carefully locked closet holding chemicals and the awful tools of his trade. Bonacera went to the office, sat at his desk, and lit up a camel, one of the few times he had ever smoked in this building. Then he waited for Don Corleone. He waited with a feeling of the utmost despair, for he had no doubt as to what services he would be called upon to perform. For the last year, the Corleone family had waged war against the five great mafia families of New York, and the carnage had filled the newspapers. Many men on both sides had been killed. Now the Corleone family had killed somebody so important that they wished to hide his body, make it disappear, and what better way than to have it officially buried by a registered undertaker? 
and Amerigo Bonacera had no illusions about the act he was to commit. He would be an accessory to murder. If it came out, he would spend years in jail. His daughter and wife would be disgraced. His good name, the respected name of Amerigo Bonacera, dragged through the bloody mud of the Mafia War. He indulged himself by smoking another camel, and then he thought of something even more terrifying. When the other Mafia families found out that he had aided the Corleones, they would treat him as an enemy, they would murder him, and now he cursed the day he had gone to the Godfather and begged for his vengeance. He cursed the day his wife and the wife of Don Corleone had become friends. He cursed his daughter and America and his own success, and then his optimism returned. It could all go well. Don Corleone was a clever man. Certainly everything had been arranged to keep the secret. He had only to keep his nerve. For, of course, the one thing more fatal than any other was to earn the Don's displeasure. He heard tires on gravel. His practiced ear told him a car was coming through the narrow driveway and parking in the backyard. He opened the rear door to let them in. The huge, fat man, Clemenza, entered, followed by two very rough-looking young fellows. They searched the rooms without saying a word to Bonacera. Then Clemenza went out. The two young men remained with the undertaker. A few moments later, Bonacera recognized the sound of the heavy ambulance coming through the narrow driveway. Then Clemenza appeared in the doorway, followed by two men carrying a stretcher, and Amerigo Bonacera's worst fears were realized. On the stretcher was a corpse, swaddled in a gray blanket, but with bare yellow feet sticking out the end. Clemenza motioned the stretcher-bearers into the embalming room, and then, from the blackness of the yard, another man stepped into the lighted office room. It was Don Corleone. The Don had lost weight during his illness, and moved with a curious stiffness. He was holding his hat in his hands, and his hair seemed thin over his massive skull. He looked older, more shrunken than when Bonacera had seen him at the wedding, but he still radiated power. Holding his hat against his chest, he said to Bonacera, Well, old friend, are you ready to do me this service? Bonacera nodded. The Don followed the stretcher into the embalming room, and Bonacera trailed after him. The corpse was on one of the guttered tables. Don Corleone made a tiny gesture with his hat, and the other men left the room. Bonacera whispered, What do you wish me to do? Don Corleone was staring at the table. I want you to use all your powers, all your skill as you love me. I do not wish his mother to see him as he is. He went to the table and drew down the gray blanket. Amerigo Bonacera, against all his will, against all his years of training and experience, let out a gasp of horror. On the embalming table was the bullet-smashed face of Sonny Corleone. The left eye, drowned in blood, had a star fracture in its lens. The bridge of his nose and left cheekbone were hammered into pulp. For one fraction of a second, the Don put out his hand to support himself against Bonacera's body. See how they have massacred my son. Chapter 19 Perhaps it was the stalemate that made Sonny Corleone embark on the bloody course of attrition that ended in his own death. Perhaps it was his dark, violent nature given full reign. In any case, that spring and summer he mounted senseless raids on enemy auxiliaries. Tatalia family pimps were shot to death in Harlem. Dock goons were massacred. Union officials who owed allegiance to the five families were warned to stay neutral. And when the Corleone bookmakers and Shylocks were still barred from the docks, Sonny sent Clemenza and his regime to wreak havoc upon the longshore. This slaughter was senseless because it could not affect the outcome of the war. Sonny was a brilliant tactician and won his brilliant victories. But what was needed was the strategical genius of Don Corleone. The whole thing degenerated into such a deadly guerrilla war that both sides found themselves losing a great deal of revenue and lives to no purpose. The Corleone family was finally forced to close down some of its most profitable bookmaking stations, including the book given to son-in-law Carlo Rizzi for his living. Carlo took to drink and running with chorus girls and giving his wife Connie a hard time. Since his beating at the hands of Sonny, he had not dared to hit his wife again, but he had not slept with her. Connie had thrown herself at his feet, and he had spurned her, as he thought, like a Roman with exquisite patrician pleasure. He had sneered at her, Go call your brother and tell him I won't screw you. Maybe he'll beat me up until I get a hard-on. But he was in deadly fear of Sonny, though they treated each other with cold politeness. Carlo had the sense to realize that Sonny would kill him, that Sonny was a man who could, with the naturalness of an animal, kill another man, while he himself would have to call up all his courage, all his will to commit murder. It never occurred to Carlo that because of this he was a better man than Sonny Corleone. 
if such terms could be used. He envied Sonny his awesome savagery, a savagery which was now becoming a legend. Tom Hagen, as the consigliere, disapproved of Sonny's tactics and yet decided not to protest to the Don simply because the tactics, to some extent, worked. The five families seemed to be cowed, finally, as the attrition went on, and their counterblows weakened and finally ceased altogether. Hagen at first distrusted this seeming pacification of the enemy, but Sonny was jubilant. I'll pour it on, and then those bastards will come begging for a deal. Sonny was worried about other things. His wife was giving him a hard time because the rumors had gotten to her that Lucy Mancini had bewitched her husband, and though she joked publicly about her Sonny's equipment and technique, he had stayed away from her too long, and she missed him in her bed, and she was making life miserable for him with her nagging. In addition to this, Sonny was under the enormous strain of being a marked man. He had to be extraordinarily careful in all his movements, and he knew that his visits to Lucy Mancini had been charted by the enemy. But here, he took elaborate precautions, since this was the traditional vulnerable spot. He was safe there, though Lucy had not the slightest suspicion. She was watched 24 hours a day by men of the Santino regime, and when an apartment became vacant on her floor, it was immediately rented by one of the most reliable men of that regime. The Don was recovering, and would soon be able to resume command. At that time, the tide of battle must swing to the Corleone family. This Sonny was sure of. Meanwhile, he would guard his family's empire, earn the respect of his father, and, since the position was not hereditary to an absolute degree, cement his claim as heir to the Corleone empire. But the enemy was making its plans. They too had analyzed the situation, and had come to the conclusion that the only way to stave off complete defeat was to kill Sonny Corleone. They understood the situation better now and felt it was possible to negotiate with the Don, known for his logical reasonableness. They had come to hate Sonny for his bloodthirstiness, which they considered barbaric. Also, not good business sense. Nobody wanted the old days back again with all its turmoil and trouble. One evening, Connie Corleone received an anonymous phone call, a girl's voice, asking for Carlo. Who is this? The girl on the other end giggled. I'm a friend of Carlo's. I just wanted to tell him... I can't see him tonight. I have to go out of town. You lousy bitch! You lousy tramp bitch! There was a click on the other end. Carlo had gone to the track for that afternoon, and when he came home in the late evening, he was sore at losing and half drunk from the bottle he always carried. As soon as he stepped into the door, Connie started screaming curses at him. He ignored her and went in to take a shower. When he came out, he dried his naked body in front of her and started dolling up to go out. Connie stood with hands on hips, her face pointy and white with rage. You're not going any place. Your girlfriend called and said she can't make it tonight. You lousy bastard. You have the nerve to give your horse my phone number. I'll kill you, you bastard. She rushed at him, kicking and scratching. He held her off with one muscular forearm. You're crazy. But she could see he was worried as if he knew the crazy girl he was screwing would actually pull such a stunt. She was kidding around, some nut. Connie ducked around his arm and clawed at his face. She got a little bit of his cheek under her fingernails. With surprising patience, he pushed her away. She noticed he was careful because of her pregnancy, and that gave her the courage to feed her rage. She was also excited. Pretty soon, she wouldn't be able to do anything. The doctor had said no sex for the last two months, and she wanted it before the last two months started. Yet her wish to inflict a physical injury on Carlo was very real, too. She followed him into the bedroom. She could see he was scared, and that filled her with contemptuous delight. You're staying home. You're not going out. Okay, okay. He was still undressed, only wearing his shorts. He liked to go around the house like that. He was proud of his V-shaped body, the golden skin. Connie looked at him hungrily. He tried to laugh. <laughs> you gonna give me something to eat, at least? That mollified her his calling on her duties, one of them at least. She was a good cook. She'd learned that from her mother. She sautéed veal and peppers, preparing a mixed salad while the pan simmered. Meanwhile, Carlo stretched out on his bed to read the next day's racing form. He had a water glass full of whiskey beside him, which he kept sipping at. Connie came into the bedroom. She stood in the doorway as if she could not come close to the bed without being invited. Food is on the table. Still reading the racing form, he said, I'm not hungry yet. It's on the table. Stick it up your ass. He drank off the rest of the whiskey in the water glass, tilted the bottle to fill it again. He paid no more attention to her. Connie went into the kitchen, picked up the plates filled with food, and smashed them against the sink. The loud crashes brought Carlo in from the bedroom. 
He looked at the greasy veal and peppers splattered all over the kitchen walls, and his finicky neatness was outraged. You filthy guinea spoiled brat. Clean that up right now or I'll kick the shit out of you. Like hell I will. She held her hands like claws, ready to scratch his bare chest to ribbons. Carlo went back into the bedroom, and when he came out he was holding his belt doubled in his hand. Clean it up. This is the end of disc number seven. Please insert disc number eight. This is disc number eight. Clean that up right now or I'll kick the shit out of you. Like hell I will. She held her hands like claws, ready to scratch his bare chest to ribbons. Carlo went back into the bedroom, and when he came out he was holding his belt doubled in his hand. Clean it up. There was no mistaking the menace in his voice. She stood there, not moving, and he swung the belt against her heavily padded hips, the leather stinging, but not really hurting. Connie retreated to the kitchen cabinets, and her hand went into one of the drawers to haul out the long bread knife. She held it ready. Even the female Corleones are murderers. He put the belt down on the kitchen table and advanced toward her. She tried a sudden lunge, but her pregnant heavy body made her slow, and he eluded the thrust she aimed at his groin in such deadly earnest. He disarmed her easily, and then he started to slap her face with a slow, medium-heavy stroke so as not to break the skin. He hit her again and again as she retreated around the kitchen table trying to escape him, and he pursued her into the bedroom. She tried to bite his hand, and he grabbed her by the hair to lift her head up. He slapped her face until she began to weep like a little girl with pain and humiliation. Then he threw her contemptuously onto the bed. He drank from the bottle of whiskey still on the night table. He seemed very drunk now. His light blue eyes had a crazy glint in them, and finally Connie was truly afraid. Carlos straddled his legs apart and drank from the bottle. He reached down and grabbed a chunk of her pregnant heavy thigh in his hand. He squeezed very hard hurting her and making her beg for mercy. You're fat as a pig. With disgust, he walked out of the bedroom. Thoroughly frightened and cowed, she lay in the bed, not daring to see what her husband was doing in the other room. Finally, she rose and went to the door to peer into the living room. Carlo had opened a fresh bottle of whiskey and was sprawled on the sofa. In a little while, he would drink himself into sodden sleep, and she could sneak into the kitchen and call her family in Long Beach. She would tell her mother to send someone out here to get her. She just hoped Sonny didn't answer the phone. She knew it would be best to talk to Tom Hagen or her mother. It was nearly ten o'clock at night when the kitchen phone in Don Corleone's house rang. It was answered by one of the Don's bodyguards, who dutifully turned the phone over to Connie's mother. But Mrs. Corleone could hardly understand what her daughter was saying. The girl was hysterical, yet trying to whisper so that her husband in the next room would not hear her. Also, her face had become swollen because of the slaps, and her puffy lips thickened her speech. Mrs. Corleone made a sign to the bodyguard that he should call Sonny, who was in the living room with Tom Hagen. Sonny came into the kitchen and took the phone from his mother. Yeah, Connie. Connie was so frightened, both of her husband and of what her brother would do, that her speech became worse. She babbled, Sonny, just sent a car to bring me home. I'll tell you then. It's nothing, Sonny. Don't you come. Send Tom. Please, Sonny. It's nothing. I just want to come home. By this time, Hagen had come into the room. The Don was already under a sedated sleep in the bedroom above, and Hagen wanted to keep an eye on Sonny in all crises. The two interior bodyguards were also in the kitchen. Everybody was watching Sonny as he listened on the phone. There was no question that the violence in Sonny Corleone's nature rose from some deep, mysterious, physical well. As they watched, they could actually see the blood rushing to his heavily corded neck, could see the eyes film with hatred, the separate features of his face tightening, growing pinched. Then... His face took on the grayish hue of a sick man fighting off some sort of death, except that the adrenaline pumping through his body made his hands tremble. But his voice was controlled, pitched low, as he told his sister, You wait there, you just wait there. He hung up the phone. He stood there a moment, quite stunned with his own rage. Then he said, The fucking son of a bitch, the fucking son of a bitch. He ran out of the house. Hagen knew the look on Sonny's face. All reasoning power had left him. At this moment, Sonny was capable of anything. Hagen also knew that the ride into the city would cool Sonny off, make him more rational. 
but that rationality might make him even more dangerous, though the rationality would enable him to protect himself against the consequences of his rage. Hagen heard the car motor roaring into life, and he said to the two bodyguards, Go after him. Then he went to the phone and made some calls. He arranged for some men of Sonny's regime living in the city to go up to Carlo Rizzi's apartment and get Carlo out of there. Other men would stay with Connie until Sonny arrived. He was taking a chance, thwarting Sonny, but he knew that Don would back him up. He was afraid that Sonny might kill Carlo in front of witnesses. He did not expect trouble from the enemy. The five families had been quiet too long, and obviously were looking for peace of some kind. By the time Sonny roared out of the mall in his Buick, he had already regained, partly, his senses. He noted the two bodyguards getting into a car to follow him, and approved. He expected no danger. The five families had quit counterattacking, were not really fighting anymore. He had grabbed his jacket in the foyer, and there was a gun in a secret dashboard compartment of the car. The car registered in the name of a member of his regime, so that he, personally, could not get into any legal trouble. But he did not anticipate needing any weapon. He did not even know what he was going to do with Carlo Rizzi. Now that he had a chance to think, Sonny knew he could not kill the father of an unborn child, and that father his sister's husband, not over a domestic spat. Except that it was not just a domestic spat. Carlo was a bad guy, and Sonny felt responsible that his sister had met the bastard through him. The paradox in Sonny's violent nature was that he could not hit a woman, and had never done so. That he could not harm a child or anything helpless. When Carlo had refused to fight back against him that day, it had kept Sonny from killing him. Complete submission disarmed his violence. As a boy, he had been truly tender-hearted. That he had become a murderer as a man was simply his destiny. But he would settle this thing once and for all, Sonny thought, as he headed the Buick toward the causeway that would take him over the water from Long Beach to the parkways on the other side of Jones Beach. He always used this route when he went to New York. There was less traffic. He decided he would send Connie home with the bodyguards, and then he would have a session with his brother-in-law. What would happen after that, he didn't know. If the bastard had really hurt Connie, he'd make a cripple out of the bastard. But the wind coming over the causeway, the salty freshness of the air, cooled his anger. He put the window down all the way. He had taken the Jones Beach causeway, as always, because it was usually deserted this time of night, at this time of year, and he could speed recklessly until he hit the parkways on the other side and even there traffic would be light. The release of driving very fast would help dissipate what he knew was a dangerous tension. He had already left his bodyguard's car far behind. The causeway was badly lit. There was not a single car. Far ahead, he saw the white cone of the manned toll booth. There were other toll booths beside it, but they were staffed only during the day, for heavier traffic. Sonny started breaking the Buick, and at the same time searched his pockets for change. He had none. He reached for his wallet, flipped it open with one hand, and fingered out a bill. He came within the arcade of light, and he saw, to his mild surprise, a car in the toll booth slot blocking it, the driver obviously asking some sort of directions from the toll taker. Sonny honked his horn, and the other car obediently rolled through to let his car slide into the slot. Sonny handed the toll taker the dollar bill and waited for his change. He was in a hurry now to close the window. The Atlantic Ocean air had chilled the whole car. But the toll-taker was fumbling with his change. The dumb son of a bitch actually dropped it. Head and body disappeared as the toll-man stooped down in his booth to pick up the money. At that moment, Sonny noticed that the other car had not kept going, but had parked a few feet ahead, still blocking his way. At that same moment, his lateral vision caught sight of another man in the darkened toll-booth to his right. But he did not have time to think about that, because two men came out of the car parked in front and walked toward him. The toll collector still had not appeared. And then, in the fraction of a second before anything actually happened, Santino Corleone knew he was a dead man. And in that moment, his mind was lucid, drained of all violence, as if the hidden fear, finally real and present, had purified him. Even so, his huge body, in a reflex for life, crashed against the Buick door, bursting its lock. The man in the darkened toll booth opened fire and the shots caught Sonny Corleone in the head and neck as his massive frame spilled out of the car. The two men in front held up their guns now. The man in the darkened toll booth cut his fire, and Sonny's body sprawled on the asphalt with the legs still partly inside. The two men each fired shots into Sonny's body, then kicked him in the face to disfigure his features even more, to show a mark made by a more personal human power. Seconds afterward, all four men, 
the three actual assassins and the bogus toll collector, were in their car and speeding toward the Meadowbrook Parkway on the other side of Jones Beach. Their pursuit was blocked by Sonny's car and body in the toll gate slot. But when Sonny's bodyguards pulled up a few minutes later and saw his body lying there, they had no intention to pursue. They swung their car around in a huge arc and returned to Long Beach. At the first public phone off the causeway, one of them hopped out and called Tom Hagen. He was very curt and very brisk. Sonny's dead. They got him at the Jones Beach toll. Hagen's voice was perfectly calm. Okay, go to Clemenza's house and tell him to come here right away. He'll tell you what to do. Hagen had taken the call in the kitchen with Mama Corleone bustling around preparing a snack for the arrival of her daughter. He had kept his composure, and the old woman had not noticed anything amiss. Not that she could not have if she wanted to, but in her life with the Don, she had learned it was far wiser not to perceive, that if it was necessary to know something painful, it would be told to her soon enough. And if it was a pain that could be spared her, she could do without. She was quite content not to share the pain of her men. After all, did they share the pain of women? Impassively, she boiled her coffee and set the table with food. In her experience, pain and fear did not dull physical hunger. In her experience, the taking of food dulled pain. She would have been outraged if a doctor had tried to sedate her with a drug, but coffee and a crust of bread were another matter. She came, of course, from a more primitive culture. And so, she let Tom Hagen escape to his corner conference room, and once in that room, Hagen began to tremble so violently he had to sit down with his legs squeezed together, his head hunched into his contracted shoulders, hands clasped together between his knees, as if he were praying to the devil. He was, he knew now, no fit consigliere for a family at war. He had been fooled, faked out by the five families and their seeming timidity. They had remained quiet, laying their terrible ambush. They had planned and waited, holding their bloody hands no matter what provocation they had been given. They had waited to land one terrible blow, and they had. Old Jenko Abandando would never have fallen for it. He would have smelled a rat. He would have smoked them out, tripled his precautions. And through all this, Hagen felt his grief. Sonny had been his true brother, his savior, his hero, when they had been boys together. Sonny had never been mean or bullying with him, had always treated him with affection, had taken him in his arms when Salazzo had turned him loose. Sonny's joy at that reunion had been real. That he had grown up to be a cruel and violent and bloody man was, for Hagen, not relevant. He had walked out of the kitchen because he knew he could never tell Mama Corleone about her son's death. He had never thought of her as his mother as he thought of the Don as his father and Sonny as his brother. His affection for her was like his affection for Freddie and Michael and Connie. The affection for someone who has been kind but not loving. But he could not tell her. In a few short months, she had lost all her sons, Freddy exiled to Nevada, Michael hiding for his life in Sicily, and now Santino dead. Which of the three had she loved most of all? She'd never shown. It was no more than a few minutes. Hagen got control of himself again and picked up the phone. He called Connie's number. It rang for a long time before Connie answered in a whisper. Hagen spoke to her gently. Connie, this is Tom. Wake your husband up. I have to talk to him. Tom, is Sonny coming here? No, Sonny's not coming there. Don't worry about that. Just wake Carlo up and tell him it's very important I speak to him. Tommy beat me up. I'm afraid he'll hurt me again if he knows I called home. He won't. Uh, he'll talk to me and I'll straighten him out. Everything will be okay. Tell him it's very important, very, very important he come to the phone, okay? It was almost five minutes before Carlo's voice came over the phone, a voice half slurred by whiskey and sleep. Hagen spoke sharply to make him alert. Listen, Carlo, I'm going to tell you something very shocking. Now prepare yourself, because when I tell it to you, I want you to answer me very casually, as if it's less than it is. I told Connie it was important, so you have to give her a story. Tell her the family has decided to move you both to one of the houses in the mall and to give you a big job. That the Don has finally decided to give you a chance in the hope of making your home life better. You got that? There was a hopeful note in Carlo's voice as he answered. Yeah, okay. In a few minutes, a couple of my men are going to knock on your door to take you away with them. Tell them I want them to call me first. Just tell them that. Don't say anything else. I'll instruct them to leave you there with Connie, okay? Yeah, yeah, I got it. His voice was excited. The tension in Hagen's voice seemed to have finally alerted him that the news coming up was going to be really important. Hagen gave it to him straight. They killed Sonny tonight. Don't say anything. Connie called him while you were asleep and he was on his way over there. But I don't want her to know that. Even if she guesses it, I don't want her to know it for sure. She'll start thinking it's all her fault. 
Now, I want you to stay with her tonight and not tell her anything. I want you to make up with her. I want you to be the perfect, loving husband. And I want you to stay that way until she has her baby at least. Tomorrow morning, somebody, maybe you, maybe the Don, maybe her mother, will tell Connie that her brother got killed. And I want you by her side. Do me this favor, and I'll take care of you in the times to come. You got that? Sure, Tom, sure. Listen, me and you always got along. I'm grateful, understand? Yeah. Nobody will blame your fight with Connie for causing this. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. He paused, and softly, encouragingly, Go ahead now. Take care of Connie. He broke the connection. He had learned never to make a threat. The Don had taught him that. But Carlo had gotten the message all right. He was a hair away from death. Hagen made another call to Tessio, telling him to come to the mall in Long Beach immediately. He didn't say why, and Tessio did not ask. Hagen sighed. Now would come the part he dreaded. He would have to waken the Don from his drugged slumber. He would have to tell the man he most loved in the world that he had failed him, that he had failed to guard his domain and the life of his eldest son. He would have to tell the Don everything was lost unless the sick man himself could enter the battle. For Hagen did not delude himself. Only the great Don himself could snatch even a stalemate from this terrible defeat. Hagen didn't even bother checking with Don Corleone's doctors. It would be to no purpose. No matter what the doctors ordered, even if they told him that the Don could not rise from his sickbed on pain of death, he must tell his adopted father and then follow him. And, of course, there was no question about what the Don would do. The opinions of medical men were irrelevant now. Everything was irrelevant now. The Don must be told, and he must either take command or order Hagen to surrender the Corleone power to the five families. And yet, with all his heart, Hagen dreaded the next hour. He tried to prepare his own manner. He would have to be in all ways strict with his own guilt. To reproach himself would only add to the Don's burden. To show his own grief would only sharpen the grief of the Don. To point out his own shortcomings as a wartime consigliere would only make the Don reproach himself for his own bad judgment for picking such a man for such an important post. He must, Hagen knew, tell the news, present his analysis of what must be done to rectify the situation, and then keep silent. His reactions thereafter must be the reactions invited by his Don. If the Don wanted him to show guilt, he would show guilt. If the Don invited grief, he would lay bare his genuine sorrow. Hagen lifted his head at the sound of motors, cars rolling up onto the mall. The Capo Regime were arriving. He would brief them first, and then he would go up and wake Don Corleone. He got up and went to the liquor cabinet by the desk and took out a glass and bottle. He stood there for a moment so unnerved he could not pour the liquid from bottle to glass. Behind him, he heard the door to the room close softly, and turning, he saw, fully dressed for the first time since he had been shot, Don Corleone. The Don walked across the room to his huge leather armchair and sat down. He walked a little stiffly. His clothes hung a little loosely on his frame. But to Hagen's eyes, he looked the same as always. It was almost as if by his will alone the Don had discarded all external evidence of his still weakened frame. His face was sternly set with all its old force and strength. He sat straight in the armchair. And he said to Hagen, Give me a drop of anisette. Hagen switched bottles and poured them both a portion of the fiery, licorice-tasting alcohol. It was peasant, homemade stuff, much stronger than that sold in stores, the gift of an old friend who every year presented the Don with a small truckload. My wife was weeping before she fell asleep. Outside my window I saw my capo regime coming to the house, and it was midnight. So, consigliere of mine, I think you should tell your Don what everyone knows. I didn't tell Mama anything. I was about to come up and wake you and tell you the news myself. In another moment I would have come to waken you. But you needed a drink first. Yes. You had your drink. You can tell me now. There was just the faintest hint of reproach for Hagen's weakness. They shot Sonny on the causeway. He's dead. Don Corleone blinked. For just the fraction of a second, the wall of his will disintegrated, and the draining of his physical strength was plain on his face. Then he recovered. He clasped his hands in front of him on top of the desk and looked directly into Hagen's eyes. Tell me everything that happened. He held up one of his hands. No. Wait until Clemence and Tessio arrive so you won't have to tell it all again. 
It was only a few moments later that the two Kappa regime were escorted into the room by a bodyguard. They saw at once that the Don knew about his son's death because the Don stood up to receive them. They embraced him as old comrades were permitted to do. They all had a drink of anisette, which Hagen poured them before he told them the story that night. Don Corleone asked only one question at the end. Is it certain my son is dead? Clemenza answered. Yes. The bodyguards were of Santino's regime, but picked by me. I questioned him when they came to my house. They saw his body in the light of the toll house. He could not live with the wounds they saw. They placed their lives in forfeit for what they say. Don Corleone accepted this final verdict without any sign of emotion, except for a few moments of silence. Then he said, None of you are to concern yourselves with this affair. None of you are to commit any acts of vengeance. None of you are to make any inquiries to track down the murderers of my son without my express command. There will be no further acts of war against the five families without my express and personal wish. Our family will cease all business operations and cease to protect any of our business operations until after my son's funeral. Then, we will meet here again and decide what must be done. Tonight, we must do what we can for Santino. We must bury him as a Christian. I will have friends of mine arrange things with the police and all other proper authorities. Clemenza, he will remain with me at all times as my bodyguard, you and the men of your regime. Tessio, he will guard all other members of my family. Tom, I want you to call Amerigo Bonacera and tell him I will need his services at some time during this night. Wait for me at his establishment. It may be an hour, two hours, three hours. Do you all understand that? The three men nodded. Clemenza, get some men and cars and wait for me. I will be ready in a few minutes. Tom, you did well. In the morning I went to Constanzia with her mother. Make arrangements for her and her husband to live in the mall. Have Sandra's friends, the women, go to her house to stay with her. My wife will go there also when I have spoken with her. My wife will tell her the misfortune, and the women will arrange for the church to say their masses and prayers for his soul. The Don got up from his leather armchair. The other men rose with him, and Clemenza and Tessio embraced him again. Hagen held the door open for the Don, who paused to look at him for a moment. Then the Don put his hand on Hagen's cheek, embraced him quickly, and said in Italian, You've been a good son. You comfort me telling Hagen that he had acted properly in this terrible time. The Don went up to his bedroom to speak to his wife. It was then that Hagen made the call to Amerigo Bonacera for the undertaker to redeem the favor he owed to the Corleones. Book 5, Chapter 20 The death of Santino Corleone sent shockwaves through the underworld of the nation, and when it became known that Don Corleone had risen from his sickbed to take charge of the family affairs, when spies at the funeral reported that the Don seemed to be fully recovered, the heads of the five families made frantic efforts to prepare a defense against the bloody retaliatory war that was sure to follow. Nobody made the mistake of assuming that Don Corleone could be held cheaply because of his past misfortunes. He was a man who had made only a few mistakes in his career and had learned from every one of them. Only Hagen guessed the Don's real intentions and was not surprised when emissaries were sent to the five families to propose a peace not only to propose a peace, but a meeting of all the families in the city and with invitations to families all over the United States to attend. Since the New York families were the most powerful in the country, it was understood that their welfare affected the welfare of the country as a whole. At first, there were suspicions. Was Don Corleone preparing a trap? Was he trying to throw his enemies off their guard? Was he attempting to prepare a wholesale massacre to avenge his son? But Don Corleone soon made it clear he was sincere. Not only did he involve all the families in the country in this meeting, but made no move to put his own people on a war footing or to enlist allies. And then he took the final irrevocable step that established the authenticity of these intentions and assured the safety of the Grand Council to be assembled. He called on the services of the Bocchicchio family. The Bocchicchio family was unique in that once a particularly ferocious branch of the Mafia in Sicily, it had become an instrument of peace in America. Once a group of men who earned their living by a savage determination, they now earned their living in what perhaps could be called a saintly fashion. The Bocchicchio's one asset was a closely knit structure of blood relationships, 
a family loyalty severe even for a society where family loyalty came before loyalty to a wife. The Bocchicchio family, extending out to third cousins, had once numbered nearly 200 when they ruled the particular economy of a small section of southern Sicily. The income for the entire family then came from four or five flour mills, by no means owned communally, but assuring labor and bread and a minimal security for all family members. This was enough, with intermarriages, for them to present a common front against their enemies. No competing mill, no dam that would create a water supply to their competitors or ruin their own selling of water was allowed to be built in their corner of Sicily. A powerful land-owning baron once tried to erect his own mill strictly for his personal use. The mill was burned down. He called on the Carabinieri and higher authorities, who arrested three of the Bocchicchio family. Even before the trial, the manor house of the baron was torched. The indictment and accusations were withdrawn. A few months later, one of the highest functionaries in the Italian government arrived in Sicily and tried to solve the chronic water shortage of that island by proposing a huge dam. Engineers arrived from Rome to do surveys while watched by grim natives, members of the Bocchicchio clan. Police flooded the area, housed in a specially built barracks. It looked like nothing could stop the dam from being built, and supplies and equipment had actually been unloaded in Palermo. That was as far as they got. The Bocchicchios had contacted fellow Mafia chiefs and extracted agreements for their aid. The heavy equipment was sabotaged, the lighter equipment stolen. Mafia deputies in the Italian parliament launched a bureaucratic counterattack against the planners. This went on for several years, and in that time Mussolini came to power. The dictator decreed that the dam must be built. It was not. The dictator had known that the Mafia would be a threat to his regime, forming what amounted to a separate authority from his own. He gave full powers to a high police official who promptly solved the problem by throwing everybody into jail or deporting them to penal work islands. In a few short years, he had broken the power of the Mafia simply by arbitrarily arresting anyone even suspected of being a mafioso, and so also brought ruin to a great many innocent families. The Bocchicchios had been rash enough to resort to force against this unlimited power. Half of the men were killed in armed combat, the other half deported to penal island colonies. There were only a handful left when arrangements were made for them to emigrate to America via the clandestine underground route of jumping ship through Canada. There were almost 20 immigrants, and they settled in a small town not far from New York City in the Hudson Valley, where, by starting at the very bottom, they worked their way up to owning a garbage hauling firm and their own trucks. They became prosperous because they had no competition. They had no competition because competitors found their trucks burned and sabotaged. One persistent fellow who undercut prices was found buried in the garbage he'd picked up during the day, smothered to death. But as the men married to Sicilian girls, needless to say, children came, and the garbage business, though providing a living, was not really enough to pay for the finer things America had to offer. And so, as a diversification, the Bocchicchio family became negotiators and hostages in the peace efforts of warring mafia families. A strain of stupidity ran through the Bocchicchio clan, or perhaps they were just primitive. In any case, they recognized their limitations and knew they could not compete with other mafia families in the struggle to organize and control more sophisticated business structures like prostitution, gambling, dope, and public fraud. They were straight-from-the-shoulder people who could offer a gift to an ordinary patrolman but did not know how to approach a political bagman. They had only two assets, their honor and their ferocity. And Bocchicchio never lied, never committed an act of treachery. Such behavior was too complicated. Also, a Bocchicchio never forgot an injury and never left it unavenged, no matter what the cost. And so, by accident, they stumbled into what would prove to be their most lucrative profession. When warring families wanted to make peace and arrange a parley, the Bocchicchio clan was contacted. The head of the clan would handle the initial negotiations and arrange for the necessary hostages. For instance, when Michael had gone to meet Salazzo, a Bocchicchio had been left with the Corleone family as surety for Michael's safety, the service paid for by Salazzo. If Michael were killed by Salazzo, then the Bocchicchio male hostage held by the Corleone family would be killed by the Corleones. In this case, the Bocchicchios would take their vengeance on Salazzo as the cause of their clansmen's death. Since the Bocchicchios were so primitive, they never let anything, any kind of punishment, stand in their way of vengeance. They would give up their own lives, and there was no protection against them if they were betrayed. A Bocchicchio hostage was guilt-edged insurance. And so now, when Don Corleone employed the Bocchicchios as negotiators and arranged for them to supply hostages for all the families to come to the peace meeting, there could be no question as to his sincerity. There could be no question of treachery. The meeting would be safe as a wedding. 
hostages given, the meeting took place in the director's conference room of a small commercial bank whose president was indebted to Don Corleone, and indeed some of whose stock belonged to Don Corleone, though it was in the president's name. The president always treasured that moment when he had offered to give Don Corleone a written document proving his ownership of the shares to preclude any treachery. Don Corleone had been horrified. He told the president, I would trust you with my whole fortune. I would trust you with my life and the welfare of my children. It is inconceivable to me that you would ever trick me or otherwise betray me. My whole world, all my faith in my judgment of human character would collapse. Of course, I have my own written record so that if something should happen to me, my heirs would know that you hold something in trust for them. But I know that even if I were not here in this world to guard the interests of my children, you would be faithful to their needs. The president of the bank, though not Sicilian, was a man of tender sensibilities. He understood the Don perfectly. Now, the Godfather's request was the president's command. And so, on a Saturday afternoon, the executive suite of the bank, the conference room with its deep leather chairs, its absolute privacy, was made available to the families. Security at the bank was taken over by a small army of hand-picked men wearing bank guard uniforms. At 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, the conference room began to fill up. Besides the five families of New York, there were representatives from ten other families across the country, with the exception of Chicago, that black sheep of their world. They had given up trying to civilize Chicago, and they saw no point in including those mad dogs in this important conference. A bar had been set up and a small buffet. Each representative to the conference had been allowed one aide. Most of the dons had brought their consiglieres as aides, so there were comparatively few young men in the room. Tom Hagen was one of those young men, and the only one who was not Sicilian. He was an object of curiosity, a freak. Hagen knew his manners. He did not speak. He did not smile. He waited on his boss, Don Corleone, with all the respect of a favorite earl waiting on his king, bringing him a cold drink, lighting his cigar, positioning his ashtray, with respect but no obsequiousness. Hagen was the only one in that room who knew the identity of the portraits hanging on the dark paneled walls. They were mostly portraits of fabulous financial figures done in rich oils. One was of Secretary of the Treasury Hamilton. Hagen could not help thinking that Hamilton might have approved of this peace meeting being held in a banking institution. Nothing was more calming, more conducive to pure reason, than the atmosphere of money. The arrival time had been staggered for between 9.30 to 10 a.m. Don Corleone, in a sense the host, since he had initiated the peace talks, had been the first to arrive. One of his many virtues was punctuality. The next to arrive was Carlo Tramonte who had made the southern part of the United States his territory. He was an impressively handsome middle-aged man, tall for a Sicilian, with a very deep sunburn, exquisitely tailored and barbered. He did not look Italian. He looked more like one of those pictures in the magazines of millionaire fishermen lolling on their yachts. The Tramonti family earned its livelihood from gambling, and no one meeting their Don would ever guess with what ferocity he had won his empire. Emigrating from Sicily as a small boy, he had settled in Florida, and grown to manhood there, employed by the American syndicate of southern small-town politicians who controlled gambling. These were very tough men, backed up by very tough police officials, and they never suspected that they could be overthrown by such a greenhorn immigrant. They were unprepared for his ferocity and could not match it, simply because the rewards being fought over were not, to their minds, worth so much bloodshed. Tremonti won over the police with bigger shares of the gross. He exterminated those redneck hooligans who ran their operation with such a complete lack of imagination. It was Tremonti who opened ties with Cuba and the Batista regime and eventually poured money into the pleasure resorts of Havana gambling houses, whorehouses, to lure gamblers from the American mainland. Tremonti was now a millionaire many times over and owned one of the most luxurious hotels in Miami Beach. When he came into the conference room, followed by his aide, an equally sunburned consigliere, Tremonti embraced Don Corleone, made a face of sympathy to show he sorrowed for the dead son. Other Dons were arriving. They all knew each other. They had met over the years, either socially or when in the pursuit of their businesses. They had always showed each other professional courtesies, and in their younger, leaner days had done each other little services. The second Don to arrive was Joseph Zalouki from Detroit. The Zalouki family, under appropriate disguises and covers, owned one of the horse racing tracks in the Detroit area. They also owned a good part of the gambling. Zalouki was a moon-faced, amiable-looking man who lived in a $100,000 house in the fashionable Gross Point section of Detroit. One of his sons had married into an old, well-known American family. Zalouki, like Don Corleone, was sophisticated. 
Detroit had the lowest incidence of physical violence of any of the cities controlled by the families. There had been only two executions in the last three years in that city. He disapproved of traffic in drugs. Zaluki had brought his consigliere with him, and both men came to Don Corleone to embrace him. Zaluki had a booming American voice with only the slightest trace of an accent. He was conservatively dressed, very businessman, and with a hearty goodwill to match. He said to Don Corleone, Only your voice could have brought me here. Don Corleone bowed his head in thanks. He could count on Zaluki for support. The next two Dons to arrive were from the West Coast, motoring from there in the same car since they worked together closely in any case. They were Frank Falcone and Anthony Molinari, and both were younger than any of the other men who would come to the meeting, in their early forties. They were dressed a little more informally than the others. There was a touch of Hollywood in their style, and they were a little more friendly than necessary. Frank Falcone controlled the movie unions and the gambling at the studios, plus a complex of pipeline prostitution that supplied girls to the whorehouses of the states in the far west. It was not in the realm of possibility for any Don to become showbiz, but Falcone had just a touch. His fellow Dons distrusted him accordingly. Anthony Molinari controlled the waterfronts of San Francisco and was preeminent in the empire of sports gambling. He came of Italian fisherman stock and owned the best San Francisco seafood restaurant, in which he took such pride that the legend had it he lost money on the enterprise by giving too good value for the prices charged. He had the impassive face of the professional gambler, and it was known that he also had something to do with dope smuggling over the Mexican border, and from the ships plying the lanes of the Oriental Oceans. Their aides were young, powerfully built men, obviously not counselors, but bodyguards, though they would not dare to carry arms to this meeting. It was general knowledge that these bodyguards knew karate, a fact that amused the other dons but did not alarm them in the slightest, no more than if the California dons had come wearing amulets blessed by the Pope though it must be noted that some of these men were religious and believed in God. Next arrived the representative from the family in Boston. This was the only Don who did not have the respect of his fellows. He was known as a man who did not do right by his people, who cheated them unmercifully. This could be forgiven. Each man measures his own greed. What could not be forgiven was that he could not keep order in his empire. The Boston area had too many murders, too many petty wars for power, too many unsupported freelance activities. It flouted the law too brazenly. If the Chicago Mafia were savages, then the Boston people were gavunis, or uncouth louts, ruffians. The Boston Don's name was Dominic Panza. He was short, squat. As one Don put it, he looked like a thief. The Cleveland Syndicate, perhaps the most powerful of the strictly gambling operations in the United States, was represented by a sensitive-looking elderly man with gaunt features and snow-white hair. He was known, of course, not to his face, as the Jew, because he had surrounded himself with Jewish assistants rather than Sicilians. It was even rumored that he would have named a Jew as his consigliere if he had dared. In any case, as Don Corleone's family was known as the Irish Gang because of Hagen's membership, so Don Vincent Forlenz's family was known as the Jewish family, with somewhat more accuracy. But he ran an extremely efficient organization, and he was not known ever to have fainted at the sight of blood, despite his sensitive features. He ruled with an iron hand in a velvet political glove. The representatives of the five families of New York were the last to arrive, and Tom Hagen was struck by how much more imposing, impressive, these five men were than the out-of-towners, the Hicks. For one thing, the five New York Dons were in the old Sicilian tradition. They were men with a belly, meaning figuratively power and courage, and literally physical flesh, as if the two went together as indeed they seem to have done in Sicily. The five New York Dons were stout, corpulent men with massive leonine heads, features on a large scale, fleshy, imperial noses, thick mouths, heavy, folded cheeks. They were not too well tailored or barbered. They had the look of no-nonsense, busy men without vanity. There was Anthony Stracci, who controlled the New Jersey area and the shipping on the west side docks of Manhattan. He ran the gambling in Jersey and was very strong with the Democratic political machine. He had a fleet of freight-hauling trucks that made him a fortune primarily because his trucks could travel with a heavy overload and not be stopped and fined by highway weight inspectors. These trucks helped ruin the highways, and then his road-building firm, with lucrative state contracts, repaired the damage wrought. It was the kind of operation that would warm any man's heart, business of itself, creating more business. Stracci, too, was old-fashioned and never dealt in prostitution. But because his business was on the waterfront, it was impossible for him not to be involved in the drug-smuggling traffic. 
Of the five New York families opposing the Corleones, his was the least powerful but the most well-disposed. The family that controlled Upper New York State that arranged smuggling of Italian immigrants from Canada, all upstate gambling, and exercised veto power on state licensing of racing tracks was headed by Otilio Cuneo. This was a completely disarming man with the face of a jolly, round peasant baker whose legitimate activity was one of the big milk companies. Cuneo was one of those men who loved children and carried a pocket full of sweets in the hopes of being able to pleasure one of his many grandchildren or the small offspring of his associates. He wore a round fedora with the brim turned down all the way round like a woman's sun hat, which broadened his already moon-shaped face into the very mask of joviality. He was one of the few dons who had never been arrested and whose true activities had never even been suspected, so much so that he had served on civic committees and had been voted as Businessman of the Year for the State of New York by the Chamber of Commerce. The closest ally to the Tatalia family was Don Emilio Barzini. He had some of the gambling in Brooklyn and some in Queens. He had some prostitution. He had strong arm. He completely controlled Staten Island. He had some of the sports betting in the Bronx and Westchester. He was in narcotics. He had close ties to Cleveland and the West Coast, and he was one of the few men shrewd enough to be interested in Las Vegas and Reno, the open cities of Nevada. He also had interests in Miami Beach and Cuba. After the Corleone family, his was perhaps the strongest in New York, and therefore in the country. His influence reached even to Sicily. His hand was in every unlawful pie. He was even rumored to have a toehold in Wall Street. He had supported the Tatalia family with money and influence since the start of the war. It was his ambition to supplant Don Corleone as the most powerful and respected mafia leader in the country, and to take over part of the Corleone empire. He was a man much like Don Corleone, but more modern, more sophisticated, more businesslike. He could never be called an old mustache Pete, and he had the confidence of the newer, younger, brasher leaders on their way up. He was a man of great personal force, in a cold way, with none of Don Corleone's warmth, and he was perhaps at this moment the most respected man in the group. The last to arrive was Don Philip Tataglia, the head of the Tataglia family that had directly challenged the Corleone power by supporting Salazzo, and had so nearly succeeded. And yet, curiously enough, he was held in a slight contempt by the others. For one thing, it was known that he had allowed himself to be dominated by Salazzo, had in fact been led by the nose by that fine Turkish hand. He was held responsible for all this commotion, this uproar, that had so affected the conduct of everyday business by the New York families. Also, he was a sixty-year-old dandy and woman chaser, and he had ample opportunity to indulge his weaknesses. For the Tatalia family dealt in women. Its main business was prostitution. It also controlled most of the nightclubs in the United States and could place any talent anywhere in the country. Philip Tatalia was not above using strong arm to get control of promising singers and comics and muscling in on record firms. But prostitution was the main source of the family income. His personality was unpleasant to these men. He was a whiner, always complaining of the costs in his family business. Laundry bills, all those towels ate up the profits, but he owned the laundry firm that did the work. The girls were lazy and unstable, running off, committing suicide. The pimps were treacherous and dishonest and without a shred of loyalty. Good help was hard to find. Young lads of Sicilian blood turned up their noses at such work, considered it beneath their honor to traffic and abuse women. Those rascals who would slit a throat with a song in their lips and the cross of an Easter palm in the lapel of their jackets. So Philip Tatalia would rant on to audiences unsympathetic and contemptuous. His biggest howl was reserved for authorities who had it in their power to issue and cancel liquor licenses for his nightclubs and cabarets. He swore he had made more millionaires than Wall Street with the money he had paid those thieving guardians of official seals. In a curious way, his almost victorious war against the Corleone family had not won him the respect it deserved. They knew his strength had come first from Salazzo and then from the Barzini family. Also, the fact that with the advantage of surprise, he had not won complete victory was evidence against him. If he had been more efficient, all this trouble could have been avoided. The death of Don Corleone would have meant the end of the war. It was proper, since they had both lost sons in their war against each other, that Don Corleone and Philip Tatalia should acknowledge each other's presence only with a formal nod. Don Corleone was the object of attention, the other men studying him to see what mark of weakness had been left on him by his wounds and defeats. The puzzling factor was why Don Corleone had sued for peace after the death of his favorite son. It was an acknowledgment of defeat. It would almost surely lead to a lessening of his power. But they would soon know. There were greetings, 
There were drinks to be served, and almost another half hour went by before Don Corleone took his seat at the polished walnut table. Unobtrusively, Hagen sat in the chair slightly to the Don's left and behind him. This was the signal for the other Dons to make their way to the table. Their aides sat behind them, the consigliere up close, so that they could offer any advice when needed. Don Corleone was the first to speak, and he spoke as if nothing had happened, as if he had not been grievously wounded and his eldest son slain, his empire in a shambles, his personal family scattered, Freddy in the west and under the protection of the Molinari family, and Michael secreted in the wastelands of Sicily. He spoke, naturally, in Sicilian dialect. I want to thank you all for coming. I consider it a service done to me personally, and I am in the debt of each and every one of you. And so, I will say at the beginning that I am here not to quarrel or convince, but only to reason, and, as a reasonable man, do everything possible for us all, to part friends here, too. I give my word on that, and some of you who know me well know that I do not give my word lightly. Oh, well, let's get down to business. We are all honorable men here. We don't have to give each other assurances as if we were lawyers. He paused. None of the others spoke. Some were smoking cigars, others sipping their drinks. All of these men were good listeners, patient men. They had one other thing in common. They were those rarities, men who had refused to accept the rule of organized society, men who refused the dominion of other men. There was no force, no mortal man who could bend them to their will unless they wished it. They were men who guarded their free will with wiles and murder. Their wills could be subverted only by death, or the utmost reasonableness. Don Corleone sighed. How did things ever go so far? Well, no matter. A lot of foolishness has come to pass. It was so unfortunate, so unnecessary. But let me tell what happened as I see it. He paused to see if someone would object to his telling his side of the story. Thank God my health has been restored and maybe I can help set this affair aright. Perhaps my son was too rash, too headstrong. I don't say no to that. Anyway, let me just say that Salazzo came to me with a business affair in which he asked me for my money and my influence. He said he had the interest of the Tataria family. The affair involved drugs, in which I have no interest. I'm a quiet man, and such endeavors are too lively for my taste. I explained this to Salazzo. With all respect for him and the Tataria family, I gave him my no. With all courtesy, I told him his business would not interfere with mine, that I had no objection to his earning his living in this fashion. He took it ill and brought misfortune down on all our heads. Well, that's life. Everyone here could tell his own tale of sorrow. That's not to my purpose. Don Corleone paused and motioned to Hagen for a cold drink, which Hagen swiftly furnished him. Don Corleone wet his mouth. I'm willing to make the peace. Tataria has lost his son. I have lost his son. We are quits. What would the world come to if people kept carrying grudges against all reason? That has been the cross of Sicily, where men are so busy with vendettas they have no time to earn bread for their families. It's foolishness. So... I say now, let things be as they were before. I have not taken any steps to learn who betrayed and killed my son. Given peace, I will not do so. I have a son who cannot come home when I must receive assurances that when I arrange matters so that he can return safely, that there will be no interference, no danger from the authorities. Once that's settled, maybe we can talk about other matters that interest us and do ourselves, all of us. A profitable service today. Corleone gestured expressively, submissively, with his hands. That is all I want. It was very well done. It was the Don Corleone of old, reasonable, pliant, soft-spoken. But every man there had noted that he had claimed good health, which meant he was a man not to be held cheaply despite the misfortunes of the Corleone family. It was noted that he had said the discussion of other business was useless 
until the peace he asked for was given. It was noted that he had asked for the old status quo, that he would lose nothing despite his having got the worst of it over the past year. However, it was Emilio Barzini who answered Don Corleone, not to tell you. He was curt and to the point without being rude or insulting. That is all true enough, but there's a little more. Don Corleone is too modest. The fact is that Solazzo and the Italians could not go into their new business without the assistance of Don Corleone. In fact, his disapproval injured them. That's not his fault, of course. The fact remains that the judges and politicians who would accept the favors from Don Corleone, even on drugs, would not allow themselves to be influenced by anybody else when it came to narcotics. Salazzo couldn't operate if he didn't have some insurance of his people being treated gently. Yeah, we all know that. We would all be poor men otherwise. And now that they have increased the penalties, the judges and the prosecuting attorneys drive a hard bargain when one of our people get in trouble with the narcotics. Even a Sicilian sentenced to twenty years might break the Omer Tar and talk his brains out. That can't happen. Don Corleone controls all that apparatus. His refusal to let us use it is not the act of a friend. He takes the bread out of the mouths of our families. Times have changed. It's not like the old days when everyone can go his own way. If Corleone has all of the judges in New York, then he must share them or let us others use them. Certainly he can present a bill for such services. <laughs> We're not communists, after all. Eh? <laughs> but he has to let us draw water from the well. It's that simple. When Barzini had finished talking, there was a silence. The lines were now drawn. There could be no return to the old status quo. What was more important was that Barzini, by speaking out, was saying that if peace was not made, he would openly join the Tatalias in their war against the Corleone. And he had scored a telling point. Their lives and their fortunes depended upon their doing each other's services. The denial of a favor asked by a friend was an act of aggression. Favors were not asked lightly, and so could not be lightly refused. Don Corleone finally spoke to answer. My friends, I didn't refuse out of spite. You all know me. When have I ever refused an accommodation? That's simply not in my nature. What I had to refuse this time. Why? Because I think this drug business will destroy us in the years to come. There's too much strong feeling about such traffic in this country. It's not like whiskey or gambling or even women, which most people want and is forbidden them by the Pezzanavanti of the church and the government. But drugs are dangerous for everyone connected with them. It could jeopardize all of the business. And let me say... I am flattered by the belief that I am so powerful with the judges and law officials that I wish it were true. I do have some influence, but many of the people who respect my counsel might lose this respect if drugs become involved in our relationship. They are afraid to be involved in such business, and they have strong feelings about it. Even policemen who help us in gambling and other things will refuse to help us in drugs. So... To ask me to perform a service in these matters is to ask me to do a disservice to myself. But I'm willing to do even that. If all of you think it proper in order to adjust other matters. When Don Corleone had finished speaking, the room became much more relaxed with more whisperings and crosstalk. He had conceded the important point. He would offer his protection to any organized business venture in drugs. He was, in effect, agreeing almost entirely to Salazzo's original proposal if that proposal was endorsed by the national group gathered here. It was understood that he would never participate in the operational phase, nor would he invest his money. He would merely use his protective influence with the legal apparatus. But this was a formidable concession. The Don of Los Angeles, Frank Falcone, spoke to answer. There's no way of stopping our people from going into that business. They go in on their own, and they get in trouble. There's too much money in it to resist. So it's more dangerous if we don't go in. At least if we control it, we can cover it better, organize it better, make sure it causes less trouble. Being in it is not so bad. There has to be control. There has to be protection. There has to be organization. 
We can't have everybody running around doing just what they please, like a bunch of anarchists. The Don of Detroit, more friendly to Corleone than any of the others, also now spoke against his friend's position in the interest of reasonableness. I don't believe in drugs. For years I paid my people extra so they wouldn't do that kind of business. But it didn't matter. It didn't help. Somebody comes to them and says, I have powders. If you put up to three, four thousand dollar investment, we can make fifty thousand distributing. Who can resist such a profit? And they are so busy with their little side business, they neglect the work I pay them to do. There's more money in drugs. It's getting bigger all the time. There's no way to stop it, so we have to control the business and keep it respectable. I don't want any of it near schools. I don't want any of it sold to children. That is an infamita. In my city, I would try to keep the traffic in the dark people, the colored. They are the best customers, the least troublesome, and they are animals anyway. They have no respect for their wives or their families or for themselves. Let them lose their souls with drugs. But something has to be done. We just can't let people do as they please and make trouble for everyone. This speech of the Detroit Don was received with loud murmurs of approval. He had hit the nail on the head. You couldn't even pay people to stay out of the drug traffic. As for his remarks about children, that was his well-known sensibility, his tender-heartedness speaking. After all, who would sell drugs to children? Where would children get the money? As for his remarks about the coloreds, that was not even heard. The Negroes were considered of absolutely no account, of no force whatsoever. That they had allowed society to grind them into the dust proved them of no account, and his mentioning them in any way proved that the Don of Detroit had a mind that always wavered toward irrelevancies. All the Don spoke. All of them deplored the traffic in drugs as a bad thing that would cause trouble, but agreed there was no way to control it. There was simply too much money to be made in the business. Therefore, it followed that there would be men who would dare anything to dabble in it. That was human nature. It was finally agreed. Drug traffic would be permitted, and Don Corleone must give it some legal protection in the East. It was understood that the Barzini and Tatalia families would do most of the large-scale operations. With this out of the way, the conference was able to move on to other matters of a wider interest. There were many complex problems to be solved. It was agreed that Las Vegas and Miami were to be open cities where any of the families could operate. They all recognized that these were the cities of the future. It was also agreed that no violence would be permitted in these cities and that petty criminals of all types were to be discouraged. It was agreed that in momentous affairs, in executions that were necessary but might cause too much of a public outcry, the execution must be approved by this council. It was agreed that button men and other soldiers were to be restrained from violent crimes and acts of vengeance against each other on personal matters. It was agreed that families would do each other's services when requested, such as providing executioners technical assistance in pursuing certain courses of action, such as bribing jurors, which in some instances could be vital. These discussions, informal, colloquial, and on a high level, took time and were broken by lunch and drinks from the buffet bar. Finally, Don Barzini sought to bring the meeting to an end. That's the whole matter, then. We have the peace, and let me pay my respects to Don Corleone, whom we have all known over the years as a man of his word. If there are any more differences, we can meet again. We need not to become foolish again. On my part, the road is new and fresh. I'm glad this is all settled. Only Philip Tatalia was a little worried still. The murder of Santino Corleone made him the most vulnerable person in this group if war broke out again. He spoke at length for the first time. I've agreed to everything here. I'm willing to forget my own misfortune. But I would like to hear some strict assurances from Corleone. Will he attempt any individual vengeance? When time goes by and his position perhaps becomes stronger... Will he forget that we have sworn our friendship? How am I to know that in three or four years he won't feel that he's been ill-served, forced against his will to this agreement, and so free to break it? Will we have to guard against each other all the time, or can we truly go in peace with peace of mind? Would Corleone give us all his assurances, as I now give mine? It was then that Don Corleone gave the speech that would be long remembered, and that reaffirmed his position as the most far-seeing statesman among them. 
so full of common sense, so direct from the heart into the heart of the matter. In it, he coined a phrase that was to become as famous, in its way, as Churchill's Iron Curtain, though not public knowledge until more than ten years later. For the first time, he stood up to address the council. He was short and a little thin from his illness. Perhaps his sixty years showed a bit more, but there was no question that he had regained all his former strength and had all his wits. What matter of men are we, then, if we do not have our reason? We are all no better than beasts in a jungle, if that were the case. But we have reason. We can reason with each other. And we can reason with ourselves. To what purpose would I start all these troubles again, the violence and the turmoil? My son is dead. And that is the misfortune. And I must bear it. Not make the innocent world around me suffer with me. And so I say, I give my honor that I will never seek vengeance. I will never seek knowledge of the deeds that have been done in the past. I will leave here with a pure heart. Let me say that we must always look to our interests. We are all men who have refused to be fools, who have refused to be puppets dancing on a string, pulled by the men on high. We have been fortunate here in this country. Already most of our children have found a better life. Some of you have sons who are professors, scientists, musicians. And you are fortunate. Perhaps your grandchildren will become the new Pesinovanti. None of us here want to see our children follow in our footsteps. It's too hard a life. They can be as others. Their position and security won by our courage. I have grandchildren now, and I hope their children may someday, who knows, be a governor, a president. Nothing's impossible here in America, but we have to progress with the times. The time has passed for guns and killings and massacres. We have to be cunning, like the business people. There's more money in it, and it's better for our children and our grandchildren. As for our own deeds, we are not responsible for the ninety calibers, the pets and the bodies who take it upon themselves to decide what we shall do with our lives, who declare wars they wish us to fight in to protect what they own. Who is to say, we should obey the laws they make for their own interest, and to our hurt. And who are they, then, to meddle when we look after our own interests? Sona Cosa Nostra. These are our own affairs. We will manage our world for ourselves because it is our world, Cosa Nostra. And so, we have to stick together to guard against outside meddlers. Otherwise, they will put the ring in our nose. As they have put the ring in the nose of all the millions of Neapolitans and other Italians in this country. For this reason, I forego my vengeance for my dead son. For the common good. I swear, now that as long as I am responsible for the actions of my family, there will not be one finger lifted against any man here without just cause and utmost provocation. I am willing to sacrifice my commercial interests for the common good. This is my word. This is my honor. And there are those of you here who know I have never betrayed either. But I have a selfish interest. My youngest son had to flee, accused of Salazzo's murder and that of a police captain. I must now make arrangements so that he can come home with safety, cleared of all these false charges. That is my affair, and I will make those arrangements. I must find a real culprit, perhaps, or perhaps I must convince the authorities of his innocence. Perhaps the witnesses and informants will recant their lies. But again, I say, this is my affair. I believe I will be able to bring my son home. But let me say this. I am a superstitious man, a ridiculous feeling, but I must confess it here. And so if some unlucky accident should befall my youngest son, if some police officer should accidentally shoot him, if he should hang himself in his cell, if new witnesses appear to testify to his guilt... My superstition will make me feel that it was the result of the ill will still borne me by some people here. Let me go further. If my son is struck by a bolt of lightning, 
I will blame some of the people here. If his plane should fall into the sea, or his ship sink beneath the waves of the ocean, if he should catch a mortal fever, if his automobile should be struck by a train. Such is my superstition, and I would blame the ill will felt by people here. Gentlemen, that ill will, that bad luck, I could never forgive. But aside from that, let me swear by the souls of my grandchildren that I will never break the peace we have made. After all, are we or are we not better men than those Petsonavanti who have killed countless millions of men in our lifetime? With this, Don Corleone stepped from his place and went down the table to where Don Philip Tatalia was sitting. Tatalia rose to greet him, and the two men embraced, kissing each other's cheeks. The other Dons in the room applauded and rose to shake hands with everybody in sight and to congratulate Don Corleone and Don Tatalia on their new friendship. It was not perhaps the warmest friendship in the world. They would not send each other Christmas gift greetings, but they would not murder each other. That was friendship enough in this world, all that was needed. Since his son Freddy was under the protection of the Molinari family in the West, Don Corleone lingered with the San Francisco Don after the meeting to thank him. Molinari said enough for Don Corleone to gather that Freddy had found his niche out there, was happy, and had become something of a ladies' man. He had a genius for running a hotel, it seemed. Don Corleone shook his head in wonder, as many fathers do, when told of undreamed-of talents in their children. Wasn't it true that sometimes the greatest misfortunes brought unforeseen rewards? They both agreed that this was so. Meanwhile, Corleone made it clear to the San Francisco Don that he was in his debt for the great service done in protecting Freddy. He let it be known that his influence would be exerted so that the important racing wires would always be available to his people, no matter what changes occurred in the power structure in the years to come. An important guarantee, since the struggle over this facility was a constant open wound, complicated by the fact that the Chicago people had their heavy hand in it. But Don Corleone was not without influence even in the land of barbarians, and so his promise was a gift of gold. It was evening before Don Corleone, Tom Hagen, and the bodyguard chauffeur, who happened to be Rocco Lampone, arrived at the mall in Long Beach. When they went into the house, the Don said to Hagen, Our driver, that man Lampone, keep an eye on him. He's a fellow worth something better, I think. Hagen wondered at this remark. Lampone had not said a word all day, had not even glanced at the two men in the back seat. He had opened the door for the Don, the car had been in front of the bank when they emerged, he had done everything correctly, but no more than any well-trained chauffeur might do. Evidently the Don's eye had seen something he had not seen. The Don dismissed Hagen and told him to come back to the house after supper, but to take his time and rest a little, since they would put in a long night of discussion. He also told Hagen to have Clemenza and Tessio present. They should come at 10 p.m., not before. Hagen was to brief Clemenza and Tessio on what had happened at the meeting that afternoon. At ten, the Don was waiting for the three men in his office, the corner room of the house with its law library and special phone. There was a tray with whiskey bottles, ice, and soda water. The Don gave his instructions. We made the peace this afternoon. I gave my word and my honor, and that should be enough for all of you. But our friends are not so trustworthy, so let's all be on our guard still. We don't want any more nasty little surprises. The Don turned to Hagen. You've let the Bokikio hostages go? Hagen nodded. I called Clemenza as soon as I got home. Corleone turned to the massive Clemenza. The Capo Regime nodded. I released them. Tell me, Godfather, is it possible for Sicilian to be as dumb as the Bokikios pretend to be? Don Corleone smiled a little. They are clever enough to make a good living. Why is it so necessary to be more clever than that? It's not the Bokikios who cause the troubles of this world, but it's true. They haven't got the Sicilian head. They were all in a relaxed mood now that the war was over. Don Corleone himself mixed drinks and brought one to each man. The Don sipped his carefully and lit up a cigar. I want nothing set forth to discover what happened to Sonny. That's done with and to be forgotten. I want all cooperation with the other families, even if they become a little greedy and we don't get our proper share in things. I want nothing to break this peace, no matter what the provocation, until we found a way to bring Michael home. And I want that to be first thing on your minds. Remember this. When he comes back, he must come back in absolute safety. I don't mean from the Tatarias or the Barzinis. What I'm concerned about are the police. Sure, 
We can get rid of the real evidence against him. That waiter won't testify, nor that spectator or a gunman or whatever he was. The real evidence is the least of our worries since we know about it. What we have to worry about is the police framing false evidence because their informers have assured them that Michael Corleone is the man who killed their captain. Very well. We have to demand that the five families do everything in their power to correct this belief of the police. All their informers who work with the police must come up with new stories. I think after my speech this afternoon, they will understand it is to their interest to do so. But that's not enough. We have to come up with something special, so Michael won't ever have to worry about that again. Otherwise, there's no point in him coming back to this country. So, let's all think about that. That's the most important matter. Now, any man should be allowed one foolishness in his life. I have had mine. I want all the land around the mall bought, the houses bought. I don't want any man able to look out his window into my garden even if it's a mile away. I want a fence around the mall and I want the mall to be on full protection all the time. I want a gate in that fence. In short, I wish now to live in a fortress. Let me say to you now that I will never go into this city to work again. I will be semi-retired. I feel an urge to work in the garden, to make a little wine when the grapes are in season. I want to live in my house. The only time I leave is to go on a little vacation or to see someone on important business and then I want all precautions taken. Now, don't take this amiss. I'm not preparing anything. I'm being prudent. I've always been a prudent man. There's nothing I find so little to my taste as carelessness in life. Women and children can afford to be careless. Men cannot. Be leisurely. In all these things, no frantic preparations to alarm our friends. It can be done in such a way as to seem natural. Now, I'm going to leave things more and more up to each of you three. I want the Santino regime disbanded and the men placed in your regimes. And that should reassure our friends and show that I mean peace. Tom, I want you to put together a group of men who will go to Las Vegas and give me a full report on what is going on out there. Tell me about Fredo, what's really happening out there. I hear I wouldn't recognize my own son. It seems he's a cook now, that he amuses himself with young girls more than a grown man should. Well, he was always too serious when he was young, and he was never the man for family business. But let's find out what really can be done out there. Hagen said quietly, Should we send your son-in-law? After all, Carlo is a native of Nevada. He knows his way around. Don Corleone shook his head. No. My wife is lonely here without any of her children. I want Constanzi and her husband moved into one of the houses on the mall. I want Carlo given a responsible job. Maybe I've been too harsh on him and... Don Corleone made a grimace. I'm short of sons. Take him out of the gambling and put him in with the unions where he can do some paperwork and a lot of talking. He's a good talker. There was the tiniest note of contempt in the Don's voice. Hagen nodded. Okay, Clemenza and I will go over all the people and put together a group to do the Vegas job. Do you want me to call Freddy home for a few days? The Don shook his head. What for? My wife can still cook our meals. Let him stay out there. The three men shifted uneasily in their seats. They had not realized Freddy was in such severe disfavor with his father, and they suspected it must be because of something they did not know. Don Corleone sighed. I hope to grow some good green peppers and tomatoes in the garden this year. More than we can eat. I'll make you presents of them. I want a little peace. A little quiet and tranquility from my old age. Well, that's all. Have another drink if you like. It was a dismissal. The men rose. Hagen accompanied Clemenza and Tessio to their cars and arranged meetings with them to thrash out the operational details that would accomplish the stated desires of their Don. Then he went back into the house where he knew Don Corleone would be waiting for him. This is the end of disc number eight. Please insert disc number nine.